Siglo Gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with Siglo Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Siglo. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood Signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, The Deadly Innocent. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Have you ever hated a man enough to kill him? No? Well, that's the kind of hate that grows with the years grows and grows into an all-consuming passion. That's the way it was with Lambert Dean. He has wanted to kill someone for 25 years. That's why he has come down to the offices of the Mammoth Construction Company at 9 o'clock at night. That's why he's chatted casually with the old night watchman who took him up in the elevator, chatting oh so casually. But he thought out every word in advance. The night watchman will remember them later, just a little later. There should be just a crack of light showing under the door of the president's office. Yes, there it is. And Lambert is going toward it. So you've never wanted to kill a man. Listen. You may get a few pointers. Hello, Joe. Huh? Oh? What are you doing here? Why, did I startle you, Joe? I'm so sorry. What do you mean by busting into my office? Can't you knock? Oh, sure, Joe. I'd never think of walking into the president's office without knocking during working hours. <laughs> I didn't think it'd matter tonight. Any time I'm here is working hours. Remember that if you want to hang on to your job. Now get out. Well, don't you want to know why I came down tonight? I do not. Any fool could take care of the bookkeeping department in the daytime. If you have to work nice to keep up with simple routine, that's your lookout. Oh, I don't have to work on them. They're all fixed up, just the way I want them. I, uh, I came here to tell you about them, Joe. Well, you can keep it. The books will wait till tomorrow. Better listen now, if you want to hear it at all. How many times have I got to tell you to get... What do you mean, better listen? Tomorrow will be too late. You'd better listen, Joe. Yeah, maybe I had. What are you up to? Anything wrong with the books? (laughs) Ha, ha. You're a smart guy, Joe. You always were. Even back when you were a kid in Nicker. Oh, for the love of Pete, if you're going to start raking up past history... The sooner you let me talk, the sooner you'll get it over with. And if you've got anything to say, say it. My time's valuable. Is it? (laughs) Yes, you were smart, making up to me when we were kids. You were my pal. You looked after me. Never let anybody bully me. Uh, Your dad had dough. Mine didn't. Uh Uh-huh. It was worth having you hung around my neck if it got me the kind of life I wanted. And it did, didn't it? Pretty soon, you just about moved in on us. When I went to college, Dad sent you, too. Good, kind Joe Carson, who always looked after poor little me. All right, all right, so you finally tumbled to it. What of it? When Dad got wiped out and we had to leave school and hunt work, you didn't drop me. (laughs) I'm no fool. You still belonged on the right side of the tracks. You knew the folks that counted. Sure, Joe, sure, you were smart. I knew the men with the jobs to give. I found out about old Jennings needing a bookkeeper down here at Mammoth. Only when I got around to applying, they already had a new bookkeeper. You. Well, if you were dope enough to tell me about it, you deserved what you got. Maybe I wouldn't have seen the future in a piddling little bookkeeping job if you hadn't run off of the mouth about that, too. I'm going to be the bright young man who catches Jennings' eye, Joe. I'm going to marry Betsy Jennings. Someday I'll own Mammoth, lock, stock, and barrel. You haven't got Mammoth yet, smart guy. No, just all the rest. Give me time. Old man Jennings is on his last legs, and you know it. Now get out. You're fired. Haven't you forgotten the books, Joe? I'll check them by myself. Now out. No. Get out, or I'll... No, I'm not going. You are. What? This is the end of the line for you, Joe. Tomorrow, I'll move into your office. Pretty soon, I'll move into your house with Betty. 
Before long, I'll own Mammoth. <laughs> You're crazy. Like a fox. I'm going to kill you, Joe. Signal goes as far as before the war. Yes, Signal gasoline still goes as far as before the war. But how can it, I hear you asking? How can it when certain gasoline ingredients are reserved for war? Well, that's what I want to tell you. You see, it's true. Certain of the more volatile ingredients, such as isopentane, have been reserved for war. That's why Signal Oil Company is frank to admit no gasoline today can promise you all the pep and anti-knock performance you found in pre-war Signal gasoline, and which you'll be enjoying again in even further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But when it comes to mileage, that's another story. For today's Signal formula contains not only all the high-energy components that gave pre-war Signal its superior mileage, but in addition, new hydrocarbons rich in mileage have been added. That's why it's a fact. The famous Signal formula still places the emphasis on mileage. That's why it's just as true today as it was before the war. You do go farther with Signal gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. They say even the humblest worm will turn if you step on him hard enough. You didn't think of that, did you, Joe Carson, when you used your pal for a stepladder, stole his job, his girl, the life he planned. You weren't quite smart enough. You're alone in your office now with the night pressing around you, alone with the turned worm. He's going to kill you, Joe. Sit down, Joe. Drop that gun, you crazy fool. Sit down. That's better. Wouldn't like you to be uncomfortable. You've got a nice, easy chair to die in, Joe. The president's chair. Now, Lamb. Lamb, listen. Let's talk this thing over. Mm. We're both businessmen. Maybe we can make a deal. <laughs> when old man Jennings kicks off, there'll be plenty for both of us. Now, come on, put down that gun. If we put down this it. gun? Why, Joe, I like it. Huh? Feels good in the hand. A sweet gun, Joe. But, uh... The day you bought it, you signed your death warrant. You know that? Would you like to know about it? That's right, Lambert. Tell Joe about it. Don't let him die without knowing how smart you've been for a change. Remind him of the day Mr. Jennings retired from the business. The day Joe put that gun in his desk drawer and bragged that the payroll would be safe. Joe's own gun in Joe's own desk with Mr. Jennings for a witness. Convenient, wasn't it? But don't stop there. Tell him your whole plan. Tell him about that day two months ago when you started on your careful, deadly trail. <coughs> Hello, Mr. Dean. Have a good lunch? Uh, no, not very, I'm afraid. Nothing seems to agree with me these days. Uh, you may go to your own lunch now, Miss Neal. Okay. If you ask me, your stomach would be a lot better off without all those pills you keep stuffing down your neck. I was not aware that I'd asked you, Miss Neal. Well, it's your stomach. Bye. Back soon. Uh, Miss Neal. Hmm? Have you seen my tablets? They don't seem to be in my pocket. I'm sure I had them this morning. I remember taking a couple when I got to the office. Oh, sure I've seen them. You left them on the water cooler. Uh, Big boy Carson raised Kane about it when he went out to eat. Say, what's he got against you anyhow? Against me? Oh, you must be mistaken, Miss Neal. Joe is my friend. We were boyhood friends. Then why is he always picking on you and yelling at you? Looks to me like he wants to run you out of here. Only he doesn't dare as long as the old man's alive. Miss Neal, I cannot allow you to speak like that about my friend. Now that Mr. Carson is in sole charge of the business, he's naturally under a strain. We, we must all make allowances. Oh, yeah. Here, I hid your pills under the stuff on your desk. Oh. How many do you want? Two? Put out your hand. Uh, thank you. Now, you sit still. I'll bring you some water. Now, that's very... One moment. Hmm? These aren't my tablets. Why, sure they are. They're right out of your bottle. That little brown bottle you're always hauling out. See? Yes, that's my bottle, but the tablets... Uh, mine were white, too, but considerably smaller. I showed you one yesterday. Don't you remember? Remember one tablet from another? Oh, honest, Mr. Dean. Well, gee, you're right. 
Yours had some kind of trade name stamped on them. These are perfectly plain. Uh, that's... That's strange, isn't it? Somebody's playing a dirty trick on you. Probably thought it'd be a good joke to give you something that really upset your tummy. Why, I can't believe it. Say, there's Mr. Carson. What? Joe? That's it, I'll bet you anything. It'd be just like him. Oh, now, Miss Neal, please. We have no proof that Mr. Carson had anything to do with this. He saw the bottle, didn't he? He yelled about it, and he hates you. You know he does. Uh, these tablets may be perfectly harmless. Harmless? Oh, golly. You don't suppose Mr. Carson would... Oh, no, 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 no. Don't let your imagination run away with you. But, Mr. Dean, he obviously wants to get now, rid please, of you. please, Miss Neal. I forbid you to speak of this to anyone. I'm going to destroy these tablets at once, and uh, we'll forget all about it. Well, it's your funeral. But if it was me, I'd have those pills analyzed. <laughs> That's right, Lambert. That was step one along the trail leading to Joe's untimely death. But don't stop there. Before you pull the trigger, tell him the whole story. Tell him about step two. Hey, look out! Oh, oh, look where you're going, can't you? Oh, did you see that? You all right, mister? Uh, yes, I... I think I... It didn't hit me. Boy... You got luck to burn. If you hadn't jumped like a grasshopper, that car made mincemeat out of you. Well, I was walking along close to the pavement. Somebody shoved me hard. Then I was out in the street in that car. Well, what do you know? Hey, I guess it could happen easy enough with all these crowds on the sidewalk. Yes, easy enough. Uh, you didn't happen to notice who was behind me. <laughs> in all that gang? Look, mister, there were dozens of people. Businessmen and ladies shopping and... Well, I thought you might have seen one special person. He'd... He'd be a big man, a gray hat and top coat. You'd notice him. Wait a minute. You mean that shove wasn't no accident? This guy was out to get you? Uh, I'd rather not say any more. Well, if that's the way it was. Let me think. Let me think here. Seems to me I do remember a gray hat. A big man, around 45, with a red face. Yeah. Yeah, he'd have to be big to stand out in the crowd, wouldn't he? Red face. Sure, sure, I remember now. Perhaps you saw the face towering over me? Towering over you? Yes. Oh, he must have been for me to pick him out special. Hey, that puts the fellow right smack behind you. I thought so. Uh, thank you, Mr... Uh... Robinson's name. D.L. Robinson. Robinson. Uh, you're going to report this to the police, ain't you? I could go along with you and tell them what i seen. Well, uh, not just yet. I, I can't be sure. Uh, if I was in your shoes, I wouldn't wait to be so all-fired sure. Anybody start shoving me under cards, oh, boy. Please, I... please, I'll call on you if I need you. In the meantime, perhaps you'd, you'd better have my name, too. It's Dean Lambert Dean. You remember? In in case of accident. Lambert Dean. Uh, you bet I won't forget. Darn if I could take a thing like this in my stride. Uh, if I was you, I'd be yelling for the police so loud they'd hear me in Jericho. <laughs> Nice work, Lambert. That was step two, and it was easy. All you had to do was plant an idea and watch it grow. Little Miss Neal was already sorry for you because Joe Carson kept bawling you out. Easy to make her think a few soda mint tablets might be poison, especially since you destroyed the evidence. Easy to step off the curbing into the path of a car and then convince an excited witness that you were pushed, pushed by a big florid man like Joe Carson... Only what's the motive, Lambert? Why should Joe attempt to kill you? The police will want to know. You waited, didn't you? Waited until this very afternoon when Joe Carson was out and old Mr. Jennings made one of his rare visits to the office. Come in. Well, Lambert, come in, my boy. Uh, Mr. Jennings, uh, may I speak to you privately? Why, certainly. But if it's anything about the business, you'd better wait until Joe gets back. He's in charge now, you know. No, I... I... I'd rather Joe didn't know about this. Uh, not just yet, Mr. Jennings. Uh, Mr. Jennings, I shall have to ask you to treat this conversation as confidential. Very well. Mr. Jennings, I have reason to believe that two attempts have been made upon my life. What did you say? Somebody's trying to kill me, sir. I'm sure of it. Good heavens, Lambert. Yes, sir. That's just the way I felt. I couldn't believe it the first time, but it happened again. But why should anyone want to kill you? Well, there isn't any reason. Unless... Unless my death would cover up for someone else. Cover what up? 
Well, I got to thinking about it, Mr. Jennings. There wasn't any funny business going on around here until after you retired. I got to wondering if somebody had just waited until you were out of the way. And this afternoon, I checked over my books for the last few weeks, and I found discrepancies, sir. Discrep... You mean... Somebody has altered my figures. On several occasions, somebody's done a good job of forging my handwriting. There's a lot more money paid out than I ever handled. How much? Well, so far, I found $17,000. Who did it? Someone in the office? One of the staff? That's just it. The books are locked in the safe right here in your office. Perhaps I should say Joe's office, except when they're actually in my hands. Then it had to be someone who knew the combination of the safe. Well, now you can see why somebody wanted me out of the way, can't you? These altered figures look like mine. If I died, uh, you wouldn't hunt any further, you see. Every, everybody would believe that I took the money, gambled it away, and committed suicide. Someone who knew the combination. Uh, no one knew it except you and me and Joe. That's clear enough for me. What are you going to do? I'm going to call the police. This is my company. Whoever steals from me will pay for it, even if it's a member of my own family. Uh, Mr. Jennings, you promised to keep this confidential. You can't expect me to keep a thing like this to myself. But you can't afford to make a mistake. It might not be the... Uh, person we think. No. No, I wouldn't want to. What shall I do, Lambert? Leave it to me, sir. I've got an appointment tonight with the person. If he did it, I'll get the proof. You're going to see him alone? Yes, sir. Well, that could be dangerous. You say he's already tried to kill you twice? I know, but I've got to clear my name, sir. If, if anything should go wrong... I've written the whole thing down for you. The attempts on my life, the names of the people who were with me at the time, the altered books, and... Here, here, sir. I thought if you'd put it in your personal lock compartment in the safe, it would give you the whole story. To be opened in case of my death. Lambert, the risk, I can't but let I don't you... worry about me, sir. I can take care of myself. If you'll just give me the keys to your compartment. The safe's already open. Very well. Take them, Lambert. Put the letter there yourself. I, I think I, I'll rest a few minutes before I go home. Poor old Mr. Jennings. It's a shock to him to find out his son-in-law is a thief. You forged a fine, strong chain of circumstantial evidence, haven't you, Lambert? Just one more link and you'll be ready to kill... You won't overlook that last link, will you? Not a careful man like you, Lambert. Uh, evening, Mr. Dean. Uh, you working late tonight, too? Uh, good evening, Bill. Well, not exactly working. I have an appointment. Uh, Mr. Carson here, yes? Yep, yep. Took him up about a half hour ago. Uh, come on over the elevator. I'll ride you up. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd uh, sure steer clear of Mr. Carson tonight, though, if I was you. Why? Why, he told me, plain as a whistle, he didn't want nobody coming near him. Didn't want anybody to come near him, except me. Uh, looky here, Mr. Dean. You don't mean... There's been some mighty funny talk going around this building. Talk? That little Miss Neal that works in your bookkeeping department. She's been spreading it around about somebody wanting to bump you off. Of course, I didn't pay no mind to her at the time. Her women always... Bill. Bill, I want you to do something for me. Why... Sure, Mr. Dean. It's a warm night. The window in Mr. Carson's office on the second floor will probably be open. Uh, now, you stay in your cubbyhole on the first floor and keep your window open, too. If you hear anything, well, out of the way... Don't you worry. I'll get up there so fast you can't see me for dust. No, no. Call the police. <laughs> you want to get killed, too? Killed? Me? Oh, Mr. Dean. Now, now, you'll be all right if you do as I say. Get the police here if you hear anything funny. Yes, sir, Mr. Dean. Oh, sure. Now, well, take me up to the second floor. Yes, sir. Don't forget, Bill. I'll be glued to my window, Mr. Dean. That's right, Lambert. Now you've done it. Now you've told Joe the whole story right up to this minute. 
Well, it's almost time to pull the trigger, Lambert. But don't be in too much of a hurry. Yeah. Yeah, well, there you are, Joe. That's the whole story. The watchman's waiting downstairs right now. I worked the whole thing out, as you can see. Why, you... You framed me. That's a smart boy, right the first time. (laughs) Why don't you congratulate me? You ought to appreciate smart work. I never stole anything. Just my job, my girl, my whole life. I came up here to check the bids. I didn't make any appointment with you. Who's going to believe that? You plan to kill me. You could claim you discovered a shortage. That when you accused me, I went for you. You had to shoot me in self-defense. But, Lamb, I didn't. I never... Only you won't be around to put in a claim. Old Bill is going to hear something, all right. Just one shot. Just one. When the police get here, they'll find you dead. I accused you, Joe. You see? You went for your gun. And I went for you. In the tussle, the gun went off. <laughs> so sorry, Joe. Oh, you're crazy. You're crazy, Lamb. Am crazy. I? Well, somebody's going to run the business after your uh, regrettable demise. I've been here nearly as long as you have. Who knows it better than me? Somebody's sure to console your widow one of these days. I've known her since I was a kid. I'm stepping into your shoes, Joe. Now... Wait. Wait, Lamb. Listen to me. That letter. You're counting on that? Oh, yes. I'm a careful man. Lamb, the police won't find that letter. It's gone. And you haven't got a case without that letter. Ah, come on, bright boy. Can't you do better than that? But I tell you, it's gone. I destroyed it. I found it tonight. In old man Jennings' compartment? (laughs) Don't make me laugh. But I've got a key to it. He had it made for me when he stopped working. Look, Lamb, I'll show you. Keep your hands out of your pockets. Oh, I only want to show you. I've got it right here. Keep your hands up. I want you. Right here in my pocket. (laughs) (sighs) Did you think you could kid me, Joe? Think you could stop me with that cock and bull story? Why don't you answer, Joe? Through talking? For good? I'd better get a move on. It'll be a minute or two before the police get here, but I want to be sure. Gun right beside him. Won't matter if my prints are under two. We tussle for it. Let's see now. His pockets. Now, what was he going for in his pockets? If he had another gun, better make sure. Keys. He was going after his keys. No, no, no. Don't get excited. <clears throat> he couldn't have had the key to Mr. Jennings' compartment. He couldn't. This one. It can't be. But it looks like... If that letter's gone, it, it can't be the key. But it is. The key to Mr. Jennings' locked compartment in the safe. Now, what about the letter, Lambert? Did Joe find it and destroy it? Take it easy, Lambert. Don't get so excited. right. Fifteen left. Thirty-five right. Five left. Now, the compartment. It won't fit. The key won't... It does. Well, get it open. Get it open. I put it right on top and it isn't there. Maybe slid down behind the other stuff. This isn't here. Oh, yes, Lambert. The letter's gone. But there's no reason to get so excited. It doesn't matter. You've still got a case. You've planted the evidence very carefully. Don't lose your head, Lambert. You think your case will sound funny without the letter to back it up? You're getting more upset the more you think of it. And the police will be here any minute. Watch out, you'll ruin everything you've built up so carefully. But you can't see that, can you? Wait, Lambert, wait. Hey, look, there he goes. Out of my way. Hey, you, stop. The fire escape, he's getting away down the fire escape. Come on, Fred. Okay, stop, won't you? Can you see him? Not halfway. Get your flashlight on him. Yeah. How's that? Okay. Stop, I tell you. Get him, Fred. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a question for you drivers. Does your windshield look different lately? Has something new been added? 
<laughs> I'm talking about the new 1945 federal use stamp. It's time for it, you know. And it's also time to pick up one of Signal's free use stamp protectors if you want to be sure of getting yours. Signal Oil Company had these neat, transparent little shields made up to protect your use stamp from moisture and scuffing. So it will stay on without peeling through a whole year of wear and window washing. Every car needs one. But like all things in wartime, quantities are naturally limited. And that's why I'd suggest that you get yours this week, tomorrow if possible. Just drive into any of the friendly stations displaying Signal's yellow and black circle sign. And say, I'd like one of Signal's use stamp protectors that was offered free on the Whistler. And now... Back to the Whistler. So Lambert's revenge wasn't complete. He killed Joe, but he himself was killed by the police when he ran from them. He'd counted on that letter to prove he'd killed Joe in self-defense. When the letter was gone, he lost his head. You see, the unexpected had happened. It so frequently does in murders. Remember that when you think you'd like to kill somebody. Poor Lambert, if he'd only had a minute to think. Oh, well, we're through with the books, Mr. Jennings. The figures had been tampered with? Sure, the original figures have been changed. We talked to the witnesses, too. That girl in your office, the fellow that witnessed the street accident, and your watchman. I guess there isn't much doubt about what happened. There is none to my mind. Lambert must have accused Joe of theft. Perhaps he was even unwise enough to tell Joe about the letter he had left in my care. Lambert was a good man, a responsible man, but mentally a little slow. Yeah, the way I figure it, Carson knew the game was up. He must have got the drop on Mr. Dean and held him up while he got set for a getaway. Well, the safe was open and the stuff in your private box was scattered all over the place. I kept money for my personal use there. Sometimes fairly large sums. Joe knew it. I'd had a key made for him so that he could bring me cash from time to time when I was unable to get to the office. Well, I can understand Carson's death. That was an accident when they fought over the gun. What I don't get is why Lambert Dean ran out on us. I don't like shooting down innocent men. You mustn't blame yourself. You couldn't have known. As I said, Lambert was not quick. I suppose he thought he could not prove Joe had attacked him. Oh, we might not have either, without that letter. Yes, it's a fortunate thing I remembered that Joe had the key to my compartment. Of course, I removed the letter at once and took it home with me. A very fortunate thing. Otherwise, we might never have known what happened. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Sally Thorson, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The 
Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, murder will shout. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Murder is born in many places, most of them quite ordinary. Sometimes it's born in a smoke-filled hotel room, sometimes around a nightclub table, but more often it begins in a small secret place, because murder is a secret thing at first. Take, for example, a small, unobserved telephone booth in the back of a chain drugstore. The one in which a small-time racketeer, Peanut Marola, is talking. Well, Peanut Marola speaking. Yeah, yeah, I got all the dope. It shouldn't be a tough proposition to swing. The garage is out in the suburbs, in the Oakdale district, where the houses are far apart and everybody minds his own business. Nice place to work. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, this guy who owns the place, George Kramer, is single and lives by himself out in a little house on 71st Street. Yesterday, I counted only three cars that stopped in. That ain't enough to buy him a good breakfast. What? Well, the place is plenty big, but empty. Hey, here's an interesting angle I got on it. Seems that some small fry businessman named Albion, if I got the jerk's name right, has got some kind of a mortgage on the place. It might give us some trouble. Eh? Yeah, I'll get busy on it. Now, I'll call you when I got something definite. Don't worry. It'll be easy pickings. Yes, that's the way murder is born. In an ordinary way. Nothing unusual about it. A small-time racketeer makes a phone call to talk over a business deal. And that's the beginning. Maybe if George Kramer had known, things might have been different. But he didn't. In his little garage in the Oakdale section, he was sound asleep, slumped in his office chair. Kramer! Uh, huh? Kramer, wake up! Uh, what's that? Oh, oh, Mr. Albion! Yeah. You were asleep. Asleep in the middle of the day. How do you expect to make any money like that? Well, Mr. Albion, I was up half the night last night doing a hurry-up ring job on an Oldsmobile. You never saw an Oldsmobile last night. And the last ring job you did was probably six months ago. Probably out carousing around last night. Ah, you know I don't go out nights, Mr. Albion. Well, anyway, you haven't got a single car in your garage to work on, and you fall asleep in the middle of the day because you're tired. (laughs) Why don't you go out and stir up some business? Now, look here, Mr. Albion. You stick to your business and I'll stick to mine. Right now, this things This happens are... to be my business. I'm trying to tell you that things are tough in the garage business these days. Look, you know I'm having a tough time of it. Why do you come in here every day and burn my ear? Can't you leave me alone? I'll leave you alone for the next week. But let me give it to you in black and white. I've loaned you in various amounts a total of $2,000, which is more than I've come to think this place is worth. You agreed to pay it back. With interest. Of course. One week from today, you owe me $2,000. But... But I thought you were going to carry it along until I got back on my feet. I've been waiting six months for you to get back on your feet, and you show no signs of ever making it. I'll, I'll, I'll pay the interest. I'll pay it faithfully. Haven't I always paid it? What good is the interest if I lose the principal? Oh, you you won't lose it. Honest, Mr. Albion, I promise you, you won't lose it. I think I've already lost it. Unless I can do something with this garage myself. Well, I have to be going along now. I have business to do. I'll see you in a week, Kramer. Wait a minute. You... You wouldn't take the garage away from me. Wouldn't I? Oh, you, you've got a lot of money. You, you don't need it. That's beside the point. A debt is a debt. Yeah, but what, what would you do with the garage if you had it? I'd sell it to someone who could run it profitably. Oh, you wouldn't. I'll be back in a week. Have some money for me. Mr. Albion. Yes? I... I could kill you. <laughs> Well,
with the prologue of tonight's story, Murder Will Shout, the Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales of the Whistler. But first, I know you Whistler fans will be interested to hear of the growing popularity of this program. The Whistler is now tops on the coast. The latest program popularity survey of all radio programs shows no other single Pacific Coast program has more listeners than the Whistler. Yes, people do know a good thing when they see it and when they hear it, too. And that goes for gasoline and auto lubrication, too. For 14 years, so many drivers have been switching to Signal products that today, Signal dealers serve six western states from Canada to Mexico. But what's of most importance to you is the reason for this swing to Signal. What the Signal products and Signal dealers have that accounts for this growing popularity? Well, throughout 14 years, the name Signal has stood for the absolute top quality in gasoline and auto lubricants. Even now... With certain ingredients reserved for war, Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline is still the finest gasoline that can be made today with the emphasis still on mileage. And experienced Signal dealers, being in business for themselves, have a real reason for giving your car more thorough, more conscientious service that will keep you their satisfied customer. There you have it. Two genuine reasons why Signal serviced cars do go farther. Two reasons why when today's cars must last out the duration, your neighborhood signal dealer is a man you should know, too. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, murder gets its start in simple and ordinary ways. For instance, there's murder in the heart of George Kramer. And once the thought occurs, the next step is easy, if the opportunity presents itself. And in this case, it does very soon. And in the person of Peanut Marola. You're George Kramer? Yeah, that's right. Something wrong with your car I can fix? Not exactly. Got a couple of minutes? Time is all I've got. Good. Mind if I sit down? Well, what do you want? I want to talk over some business. Oh, well then sit down. Sit down by all means. Thanks. Things kind of tough in the garage business these days? Oh, they're not what they used to be. But I managed to get along. But not in the way you used to get along, eh? Uh, Not exactly. Look, uh, what are you getting at? Can you use a little ready cash, no references, co-signers, very little collateral? <laughs> Who couldn't on those arrangements? My name is Marola, Peanut Marola. Oh, I'm glad to meet you. Now, where does this ready cash come in? You sound like a smart man, Kramer. Mind if I talk turkey? Oh, go ahead. I can't lose anything listening. Has Mr. Albion been bothering you lately? Uh- How'd you know about him? Well, I kind of looked into things and found out that Albion holds some kind of a mortgage on this place. Is that right? That's right. How much? Two thousand dollars. It's a nice little sum. Keeps you awake nights, doesn't it? Huh. Awake at night and asleep in the daytime. Well, if you want to let me, I can fix it so you can sleep at night and spend your days buying expensive clothes. Hmm. What sort of a proposition is it? Ever hear of the black market? You mean where you buy meat without giving any ration points? No, the black market in automobiles. I didn't know there was one. Well, there is, and it's big time, and there's big money in it. Well, where do I fit in? Now, look, pal, you have a nice big garage in a quiet neighborhood where nobody bothers you. We get the cars any way we can, and then we sell them for anything we can get. And it's always a lot. We need some place to keep them until they're sold. You just want to store them here? Sure, it's a cinch. A guy drives into your garage with a car and asks you to fix it up, see? When it's ready, the same guy calls for it again. Looks like a legitimate business. Nobody knows that anything out of the ordinary is happening. Well, how much fixing up is there to do? Eh, Not much. You change a few numbers, switch a couple of wheels, and maybe splash a little paint on now and then. What about the police? Nothing to worry about, pal. When they get suspicious, we just move to another garage. But while we work here, there's plenty in it for you. How much? A hundred on a car. Good enough? (laughs) Sounds too good to be true. Well, is it a deal? 
It's a deal if you advance me $2,000 to pay off Albion with. This is strictly a cash and carry business, chum. We don't advance nobody nothing. Well, then it's no go. In a week, Albion will have this garage and you won't be able to use it. Yeah? Getting tough on you, eh? Hmm. Yeah, we wouldn't want our plans upset now, would we, pal? There's a cheaper way of paying off the debt than by me giving you the money. Yeah? How? Simple. Maybe Mr. Albion just disappears someday. Do you mean... Yeah, sure. Oh, oh no, no, I, I, I couldn't do that. No? Maybe you won't have to. Maybe we'll do it for you. You'll... You'll do it for me? Sure, in my business, there's nothing to it. Then all your problems would be solved. Well, I, I don't know. But, well, if I said okay, what would we do first? Well, the first thing you do is... Just so that we can sort of pass the buck back and forth in a nice way, you understand. In case somebody starts poking his nose into our business, we've got to have at least two partners in this garage. What do you mean? Well, what I mean is this. you got to make me a 50-50 partner in this business establishment. You mean you want me to sign over half of this garage to you? That's the idea. Oh, now, wait, wait a minute. I'm not getting into anything that's going to end up with me losing this garage. No, sir. All I want to do is make some money and in a hurry... Now, if that's what you're... In- Slow down, Kramer. Don't get all excited. Nobody's trying to cut you out of your garage. In this business, the more partners you have, the better it is. I'm not going to move in permanently. As soon as the racket wears thin, we dissolve the partnership and the garage goes back to you. Oh, oh well, in that case, everything's all right. I'll, I'll make any sort of an arrangement you want. <laughs> I thought you would. Well, I'm going to skip downtown and get in touch with a mouthpiece who will draw up the papers. I'll bring him back this afternoon for you to sign. See you later. Marola. Just a minute. Yeah? Aren't you, uh, forgetting something? Forgetting what? Mr. Albion. <laughs> well, what do you know? I almost forgot about Mr. Albion. Well, don't you worry, pal. We'll take care of him in due time. Uh, look, I, I know you know your business, but I know Mr. Albion. I've uh, been doing some thinking. Uh, I've got an idea. Yeah? Okay, spill it. Well, this guy Albion has a lot of money, but just the same he's too tight to buy a car of his own, so he always rides the bus everywhere he goes. Now, the end of the Oakdale line doesn't quite reach his house, and he has to walk a half mile along the highway from the end of the line in order to get home. You can't bump a guy in broad daylight on the highway. Oh, you, you don't have to. Every Saturday night, he always stays in town and takes the last bus home at 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock in the morning, that halfway, half mile of highway he walks is uh, deserted. Yeah. yeah, I get it. Quite a setup. All we do is run over him and make it look like a hit-and-run case. The easiest thing in the world. But an automobile leaves a lot of clues behind. Who's worrying about clues? We just pick some car up off the street, use it, and then abandon it somewhere. Let some other sucker worry about taking the rap. Well, I, I, I don't want to know too much about it. You just go ahead and handle it in your own way. Wait a minute. Today's Saturday. Yeah. Mr. Albion takes the bus tonight. Okay. Don't worry about a thing, pal. I'll take care of all the little business details. It'll be a sin. You heard what the man said, Kramer. He said it's a sin. He ought to know because he's an old hand at this business of getting inconvenient people conveniently out of the way. It's an art the way Peanut Marola does it. The art of murder. Yes, and since it's going to mean so much to you, you should be here to see it. Those two cars parked at the side of the road, waiting for the bus to stop, drop its lone passenger, turn around and head back for town. And when it does, there's a quick flicker of light, and the first car, driven by a friend of Marola's, starts down the road. His headlights pick up Mr. Albion walking along the right side of the pavement. Then, Marola in the second car, the stolen car, starts... Walking along the highway, Albion hears the first one come up and pass him. The noise of the first one hasn't died down before Marola roars in. The rapid succession of sounds confuses Albion just enough 
He doesn't step off the road quite fast enough. And except for a slight bump, there's nothing to it. I'm looking for George Kramer. I'm George Kramer. My identification, Lieutenant Clark, headquarters precinct. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. You hear about my car. Yes, yes, the car. That's right. You reported it stolen. Yes. Last night, I left it parked in front of my house like I always do. I don't have a garage on my property yet. And when I came out to drive to work this morning, it was gone. It was a green Chrysler sedan. License uh, 6G4537. Yes, that's right. I just finished putting on that paint job two days ago. Yeah, had it in the shop a week, fixing it up. I reported the theft as soon as I could hitch a ride over here and telephone. Yeah, I uh, came right out when we got the report. Funny, we were just checking up on the ownership of your car when you called. You you mean you found it already? Yeah, yeah, we found it even before you reported it. Uh, Do you ever drive out around uh, Miller Highway, Mr. Kramer? Miller Highway? Why, no, no, I haven't been out that way for months. You uh, weren't driving out there last night around two. Why, oh, no, no, of course not. I, I was in bed and my, my, my car was stolen. Yeah, sure, sure, well. Well, you may be telling me the truth, Mr. Kramer, and maybe you're trying to be pretty smart. I don't know which, but uh, either way, I think you'd better come down to the station with me. Get your hat and lock up the place. Oh, but wait, wait a minute. You mean you're arresting me? Well, let's say we're going to hold you for questioning. But why? For what? For hit and run. Maybe you can explain to the boys down there how your car happened to be found parked 300 yards from where a guy was run over and killed. And the front of it was covered with bloodstains. <laughs> Well, George Kramer, that's what happens sometimes when you think about murder. It doesn't uh, come out just the way you expected it. You don't know what this is all about yet, but you do know that there's only one person who can explain it to you. So when you get to the police station and after they've booked you and taken you to your cell, you ask him to call Peanut Marola, and pretty soon he comes. Five minutes, Marola. Okay, I won't stay long. Hiya, Kramer. Marola, what is this? They've got me in here for manslaughter. My car was the one you used to run down Albion. Shut up, you fool. Well, I want somebody to hear you. Well, before I'll take the blame for this, I'll make sure somebody hears me. I'll tell them you were driving that car, not me. Listen, small fry. What do you want to go flying off the handle for? More than one way to beat the record. But you used my automobile. Why? It was an accident. One of those things that happens once in a century. I was doing just like I told you I was going to do. I came out to your end of town and stole the first car I found on that dark street. How was I to know you lived on that street and it was your car I was taking? Good Lord, you expect me to believe that? Look, all you gotta do is tell them that you weren't driving your car last night and get an alibi. Tell them you were someplace else. That's what I told them, told them that I was home. But they don't believe me and I got no proof. Okay, look, tell them you were mistaken about the time. Tell him you spent the night until 2 o'clock at the Lido nightclub down on Foster and Green Streets. You get a dozen people to swear that both of us were there until 2. You tell him I drove you home in my car. Well, is, is that any good? They can't do a thing to you. They gotta prove you were driving that car. They won't be able to break an alibi like that. Got it straight now? Yeah, I... I was at the Lido nightclub until 2 with you and some friends... You, you back me up now. Sure, I'll back you up. You got nothing to worry about, pal. That's right, Kramer. You don't have a thing to worry about. That is, unless spending the rest of your life in prison worries you. Amateurs like you shouldn't get mixed up in murder, George. But of course... Your friend Marola, your good friend Marola, has everything figured out. Marola's an old hand at this business, and he doesn't seem to be excited, so don't you worry about a thing. Hello? 
Peanut Marola speaking. Yeah, I'm at the Hall of Justice. I just up to the jail talking with him. Listen to this. He believes that I took his car by mistake. <laughs> How can you lose when you work with characters like that? Huh? Let him talk all he wants to. What can he do to us? I got an alibi that he couldn't break if he talked a year. Besides, the cops have an open and shut case against him. I'll give him about two days to clear it up. Then we'll have the garage to ourselves and it'll be easy sailing. Huh? Yeah, he signed the papers all right yesterday. Yeah. Everything's great. But that's not all of tonight's story. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, a question. Have you forgotten anything lately? Just anything? Well, of course, we all forget occasionally... And suppose you had 32 different things to remember, like the service station operator who lubricates the average modern car. It'd be mighty easy to forget one of those parts, wouldn't it? And you know what that'd mean. Going without lubrication might wear out some vital part, some part you can't replace today. That's why signal gasoline dealers don't trust to memory when they lubricate your car. Instead, they use the famous signal check chart on which the maker of your car lists each part and the exact lubricant it should have. And your dealer isn't satisfied with checking each part against the chart just once. No, sir. He checks each part twice. So not a single part can be overlooked and go without lubricant. And when I say lubricant, I mean the nine specialized lubricants that signal dealers use to assure all parts the long, trouble-free life the maker of your car built into them. It's just another example of Signal Gasoline Dealer's more conscientious service to help your car go farther. Another reason why a good man for you to know today is your neighborhood Signal Gasoline Dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, George Kramer... Now you know what murder is like. How it starts as a fleeting, almost meaningless wish in your mind and builds into a noose around your neck. You're in jail charged with manslaughter. And Marola, the man who actually did the killing, who double-crossed you with a frame-up, is going scot-free. Or is he? Everything's great, he said a minute ago to someone on the telephone. But now as he hangs up and steps out of the phone booth, Well, what do you know? Peanut Marola. Huh? Oh. oh, nice to see you once in a while when you're not in trouble, if that's possible. Yeah, Lieutenant Clark, you ought to quit the police force and go on the stage. You're so funny. So long. Uh, wait a minute, Marola. Yeah? Aren't you being a little unsociable? Step across the hall here to my office where we can talk. Come on. I got nothing to talk to you about. Sit down. I think you have. For instance, you know a guy named George Kramer? Sure, I know him. He's my partner in the garage business. Oh, that's sort of a new one for you, isn't it, Marola? Maybe, and maybe I like it. Yeah, maybe. You were just in talking to Kramer, weren't you? Sure, naturally. If my partner gets in trouble, naturally I'm going to see him, see what I can do. You, uh, they get anything to do? Seems like there's not much I can do. He got out of line, you caught him. Looks like an open and shut case. What can I do? Uh, I was wondering if you'd say that. Yeah? What else would I say? Knowing you, nothing. I just wanted to be sure this was the way I figured it. What do you mean, the way you figured it? How else could you figure it? You got the guy red-handed. I think maybe we have. You say you went into partnership with Kramer in his garage? Yeah, sure. He needed some dough, so I bought in. I figured it might be a good investment. Oh, I'm sure you must have. Hmm. But didn't you know that Kramer already owed another investor some money? Sure, I heard about it. But that was Kramer's own personal affair. It had nothing to do with our deal. Uh-huh. After you talked to Kramer, one of my boys went in to see him. He's changed his story about where he was last night. Says he was with you down at the Lido nightclub until two. Then you drove him home. He says that? He's nuts. You know the Lido's been closed for two weeks. Pulled it up because of the curfew. 
And I didn't see Kramer last night. I can prove where I was. Sure, sure. I'm certain you can. You always were good at alibis. Hey, listen, Clark. Take it easy. Just a couple of questions more. One, did you ever drive Kramer's car? Why? Suppose I did. Oh, nothing. I just wanted to check. You see, we found some fingerprints on the steering wheel that weren't Kramer's. I just thought they might be yours. Oh, uh, I... Yeah, as a matter of fact, they might be. I, I did drive it once. When? Oh, about a week ago. Think again. Kramer's car was in the shop being fixed. Up until two days ago. Uh, yeah, I... I guess it must have been later, uh, a couple of days ago. Yeah, it must have been. Lieutenant Clark. Yeah? Okay, thanks. Well, it's nice you told me about driving the car, Marola. That was the file room. Those were your fingerprints. When I heard you talk to Kramer, I had him pull your prints and check. Okay, so they were my prints. I just... But you got nothing on me. I just said... Okay, so I'm getting sick of this. I told you what connection I got with Kramer. It's strictly business. My partner, see? But I got nothing to do with him going out and bumping off a guy he owes money to. So I'm through answering questions, you get me? Now, wait a minute. Just one more. Answer this one, Marola, if you can. How did you know Mr. Albion, the guy Kramer owed money to, was the one that was killed? Uh, uh, I read the paper. The only paper that carried the story was the Morning Herald. Here. Read what it says. You hit and run drive early this morning... Hit and killed it. Go on. Read it. Yeah. An unidentified man. On. Yes, Marola. Until 20 minutes ago, even I didn't know who he was. So how could you have? Unless you had something to do with it. Listen, Clark. I, I tell you, I didn't. Kramer... Kramer told me who it was. Yes. Well, maybe Kramer will tell us a lot more when he hears how you've been trying to frame him. This is one time, Marola, when you depended too much on an alibi. You forgot too many other things, important things, like the fingerprints on the steering wheel. You forgot to find out that it would have been next to him too impossible for George Kramer to have driven that car last night. You see, he has a very advanced case of night blindness. Rare, but very real. And it prevents him from driving after dark. Now, with his help, our case against you won't be hard to prove. at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale, the curious story of Checkmate for Murder. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with story by John Hayes, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking and suggesting you let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, The Return of the Innocent. I am The Whistler. 
And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. It's almost midnight behind the dark, cold walls of the state penitentiary. The warden and the chaplain, Father Maloney, have just about finished the last of a series of weekly talks with Phil Carter. A series of Saturday night suppers which have been occurring for ten years. This is Phil Carter's last night as a prisoner. And he listens to the chaplain praise the many good things Phil has done for the men inside these walls. And, too, it's amazing, Phil. You've raised the morale of the men here by 50%. Increased the quality of the food and the quantity without a raise in budget from the state. Thank you, Father Maloney. You've instituted recreational and vocational reforms that have endeared you to every man in the place. Your warden? Yes, indeed, Father. Phil is a wizard with figures, an economic wizard. Everything he did, he figured out first on a piece of paper. Phil, I had a talk with the governor today. I don't know what you're planning to do, but... Well, if you'd like to stay on here, we can make it more interesting. Stay on, warden? Don't you think 15 years here has been enough? Yes, I know what you mean. I've spent 20 years behind these walls myself. Well, if you decide, after you look around outside... If you want to come back, there's a good salary waiting for you, Phil. What are your plans, my boy? Why, Father? Why do you ask that? Phil, the warden and I have been talking about you for a long time now. We're convinced that you came here an innocent man. We believe in you. No man with your attributes, your character, could be a thief. A juggler of books and accounts. That's right, Phil. We think you were framed. But we're, uh, worried about your leaving... We feel, well, that you might get yourself into some, some real trouble and come back to us in a way we, we wouldn't like to see. And you're offering me this permanent job with the state because you think I've figured out who railroaded me and will seek revenge on that person. Well, now we... Yeah. Well, I have figured it out. I know now who really did it. I know who was responsible for my spending 15 years here. But, gentlemen, on my word of honor, I won't touch a hair of that person's head. When I get tired of roaming around, I may accept your offer as director of prison economy, but I doubt it. I've had enough of prison for one lifetime. Midnight, Phil. You're a free man. The car's waiting to take you to the station. Thanks. Good night, gentlemen. And please don't worry about me. All my intentions are of the best. <laughs> Whistler fans, can you answer this question? Who brings you the Whistler? I hope you said Signal Oil Company. Because we of the cast have a little favor we hope you'll do for us. You see, radio surveys show that the Whistler has been getting more and more popular each week until today. No program on the West Coast has more listeners than the Whistler. Now, that's mighty good news. We hope it means you're really enjoying this program. If so, then as a favor to us, won't you please tell your neighborhood signal dealer that you enjoy the Whistler? Or probably you already know your signal dealer. If not, my bet is you'll agree he's a good man to know. Because being in business for himself, he does the most conscientious job he can in servicing cars. And today, with his thorough experience, plus finer quality signal products, He's doing a great job helping today's aging cars run better and last longer. Yes, and he'll be mighty pleased to know you enjoy the program he's bringing you. So won't you drop in this week and tell your signal dealer you enjoy the Whistler. He'll appreciate it, and we of the cast will appreciate your favor. And now, the Whistler... So you know now, Phil Carter, who the person is who caused you to spend 15 years in prison for something you did not do. It's Jeff Gilroy, isn't it? 
You and Jeff Gilroy were junior members of your brother Alan Carter's firm. You and Jeff Gilroy kept the books, but you were nominally the head bookkeeper. So the shortages and the juggling pointed to you, Phil, didn't they? Now, Jeff is dominating the business and your brother as well. And soon, Alan will be out on the street. Nothing can be proved against Jeff. There will be no evidence after 15 years. Jeff has undoubtedly seen to that. You might as well forget it. Just drop into the office and see your brother, Alan. Gilroy and Carter? No, Mr. Gilroy is not in. Gilroy and Carter? No, Mr. Carter's not in at the moment. He'll be back in half an hour. Oh, pardon me, miss. Mr. Carter not in, nor Mr. Gilroy? No, Mr. Carter is out for a while, and Mr. Gilroy has gone to see his doctor. Oh, isn't Mr. Gilroy feeling well? No, Mr. Gilroy has had a number of attacks lately, and he's been visiting the doctor several times. <laughs> Just who are you? Why, I'm Mr. Jones. I had an appointment with him. Well, he never returns to the office when he goes to the doctor's. I presume he's gone to Dr... What is his name, Dr... Uh, Dr. Benton. Yes, Dr. Benton. He's in the... Uh... In the Hellman building. He's a specialist, I think. Specialist? Oh, of course. Dr. Benton, in the Hellman building. I'll try to catch him there. Well, if you care to see Mr. Alan Carter, he'll be back in a short while. No, thank you. If I miss Mr. Gilroy, I'll come back in the morning. Good day. <laughs> So, Jeff Gilroy is not well, eh? Visiting a specialist. And what kind of a specialist? The telephone directory lists Dr. Benton as a cardiologist. A heart specialist. So you stand, staring for a few moments, Phil. Something is going through your mind. What is it? A few minutes later, you're standing in the third floor hall of the Hellman building. A man comes out of Dr. Benton's office. It's Jeff Gilroy. Yes, there he is, Phil, a man you hate. Jeff Gilroy, puffy and fat from too much high living. But you turn aside. He doesn't see you as he steps into the elevator and disappears. Then another minute or so, and you, Phil Carter, are standing in Dr. Benton's consultation room. Sit down, uh, Mr. Gilroy. Gilroy. Well, uh, that's strange. I mean the Gilroy. Well, I was told my brother Jeff had come here. I've just arrived in town, haven't seen him for 15 years or more. They said at his office that he was here. Yes, he left just a few minutes ago. Oh? Well, I'm quite disturbed about the sign on your door. Are you a heart specialist, Doctor? I am. Well, there's never been anyone in our family afflicted with heart trouble. How serious is it? Well, Jeff Gilroy is in a bad condition. Myocarditis. Inflammation of the heart muscle. What can be done about it? Mm, he's a stubborn man. Doubt that anything can be done about it. His, his blood pressure is most alarming. He... Works too much and drinks too much. And if he doesn't get away from his office and take a rest very soon, he'll go out like a light. And he's overweight, too. You mean he's liable to drop dead? Yes, yes. A few minutes ago, I was able to impress him sufficiently so that he promised to take it easier. Well, thanks, Doctor. I'll see if there's something I can do about that. Good afternoon. Well, there's a sardonic smile on your lips as you leave the doctor's. This is what might be called poetic justice, isn't it, Phil? Jeff Gilroy liable to drop dead at any moment. It's more than you'd hope for, but can you leave it at that, Phil? After all the hours of hating him, can you leave it at that? No. Phil Carter steps into a telephone booth and makes a call. A call to Jeff Gilroy's home. Just a short talk with old David the butler. But it'll be enough, won't it, Phil? You'd like to be there when Jeff arrives, wouldn't you? Good evening, Mr. Gilroy. How do you feel? Oh, I don't know, David. I always seem to feel worse when I visit that specialist, thanks. All he does is try to scare me into thinking I'm falling apart mentally and physically. Well, you have had several bad attacks lately, sir. Oh, boss, you're as bad as that specialist. Forget it. Anybody call? Uh, yes, sir. There was a gentleman from the insurance company called this afternoon. Insurance company? What insurance company? I don't know, sir. He, he said the office informed him you'd gone home for the afternoon. Well, what did he want? He wanted to tell you that his company couldn't issue that policy on your life. What? On my life? I haven't applied for a policy. He said to tell you that 100000 was a large policy, and they'd found it necessary to check up on your condition and learn that you were much too bad a risk 
because of your heart condition. Who was this man? Did he tell you? Why, yes, he, he told me, and he told me the name of his company, but I can't remember either, sir. I thought you'd know about oh, it. Oh, confound you, David. You're an old fool. I should have gotten rid of you years ago. Uh, sorry, sir. $100,000 policy, eh? And they checked on my condition. Give me that phone. <laughs> Dr. Benton speaking. Doctor, this is Jeffrey Gilroy. Just what do you mean by shooting your mouth off to other people about my so-called heart condition? What? Why, I don't understand, Mr. Gilroy. Have you told my partner, Alan Carter, about my condition? I have never met your partner. I've told no one except your brother this afternoon. My brother? I never had a brother. That man was an investigator from an insurance company. Oh, oh well, I, uh, I'm sorry about that. But try to get yourself under control, Mr. Gilroy. I've warned you about the results of excitement. Yes, all right. Goodbye. Well, how do you like that? Now, who would want to take out a $100,000 policy on... Except... Hmm. So that's my partner, Alan Carter. Ah. Hello? Alan, you get over to my place immediately. What? What? Who is this? It's Jeff Gilroy, your partner. Get over here, now. <laughs> Well, Alan, what delayed you? Delayed me, Jeff? I couldn't have come any faster. Well, what's wrong with you? Your face is red as fire. Why shouldn't it be? What do you mean by trying to take out an insurance policy on my life without consulting me? What kind of a scheme have you got up your sleeve? I? An insurance policy on you? Well, why should I attempt to do anything like that? Did you figure it was an easy way to pick up 100000 Well, I'll tell you this much. I'm going to outlive you. What do you think of that? Jeff, you're absolutely out of your mind. I don't even know what you're talking about. Now, now, take it easy. <laughs> An insurance investigator went to that specialist I've been visiting. The man posed as my brother and got the dope from the doctor that I had heart trouble. Heart trouble? I didn't know that. No? Then the insurance agent called here and explained that they couldn't issue a policy on my life. Well, if I took it out or applied for a policy, why would they call you? Wouldn't they call me about that? Huh? Oh. Well, I never thought of that. I... I certainly didn't apply for a policy. I know you're in a bad condition, but such a thought never occurred to me. So you think I'm in a bad condition? Well, any fool could see that. You're too stubborn to take a rest. You won't listen to anyone, not even a specialist. And if you haven't applied for a policy, why did that insurance agent call here? Who was he? What company? Oh, I don't know. That stupid old David can't remember. Jeff, Jeff, you're shaking like a leaf. Come on, man, buck up. Oh, Alan, I've, I've got the strangest feeling of sort of a premonition. Premonition? Of what? I don't know. I don't know how to express it. Disaster. Disaster? Concerning yourself? Or the business? Myself. And it isn't my heart condition that worries me. Oh, nonsense. You're imagining things, Jeff. Come on, let's go down to the club. We'll mix with some of the boys and try to forget all this. It'll do you good. All right. I'll go. I may even stay at the club for the night. I I don't know why, but I don't want to stay in this place all alone. Are you afraid to be alone, Jeff? I don't know what's come over me, but I'm going to stay at the club. <laughs> Well, Phil Carter, it's too bad you couldn't have been listening in on that scene between your brother Alan and his partner, Jeff Gilroy. You'd have known just how well your plan was developing. But your guess is pretty good, and you're determined to follow it through anyway. You sit across from Jeff's home and watch the two men leave. You follow them to the club, and later you watch Alan leave. Jeff stayed at the club. You found that out. And so you wait until you're sure he's in bed and... Hello? Hello? Hello, who is this? <laughs> Hello? Hello, what? Who? Hello? Hello, who is this? What do you mean by calling up in the middle of the night? What is all this? <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Hello? Hello? Stop it. Do you hear? Stop it. I'm a sick man. You can't do this to me. Stop it. <laughs> For God's sake, what are you doing? Who is this? Who? Hello. Hello. Who is this? Hello. Good morning, Jeff. It's Alan. <laughs> What's the matter? Alan? Don't you feel well, Jeff? Alan, I, I haven't slept a wink all night. Somebody's been calling me, getting me up, and then just laughing until I'm nearly frantic. I don't know what's going on. Take it easy, old fellow. Someone's just playing a joke on you. A uh, joke? Or maybe it's just a mistake. Anyway, maybe this is just what you need. What? I'm up at my mountain place. 
I got one of those terrific sinus attacks about midnight and drove up here during the night. High altitude always helps. Uh-huh. It's nice and quiet up here, Jeff. I decided to stay a couple of weeks. It's just what you need. Come on up. But I don't feel like driving, Alan. I'd like to, but I... I know. But I called the Crosby Motor livery, and there's a car waiting for you in front of the club now. Pile in as you are and come on up. You'll be here in a few hours. It's nice and quiet. Just what you need. All right, Alan. All right. I'll leave immediately. Goodbye. It worked, didn't it, Phil? He didn't recognize your voice. You always did talk enough like Alan to fool people if you wanted to, even Jeff. And he's fooled, all right, because he's headed for the Carter Lodge in the mountains where Phil Carter is waiting. Yes, you've arranged quite a reception, haven't you, Phil? With a roaring log fire in the fireplace and everything. Very pleasant for a stormy day like this one. Then you disconnected the telephone, didn't you? So Jeff's rest won't be disturbed. And took a single thirty-eight cartridge from the ammunition box next to the gun rack. So you're all ready when the hired limousine pulls up around three o'clock in the afternoon and Jeff is there. But then you don't greet him, do you? No, you let him wander around calling for Alan and wondering. Alan! Alan, where are you? It takes him several minutes to find the notes you left him. Gone to the village for supplies. Back in a few hours. Alan. Oh. Jeff walks about nervously for a while, and at last, becoming exhausted, he drops in a chair and falls into a fretful sleep. Two hours pass. Jeff jumps up with a start after searching the place to see if Alan has arrived as he rushes to the phone. Hello? 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 Uh. There, there's a door. Reach for the shield and... Huh? It... Ben! Ben, what's the matter with you? Put down that rifle. You know me? Well, I don't know you. I'm the caretaker. I'm Jeff Gilroy. Jeff Gilroy. Hey, Jeff Gilroy, eh? I knew a Jeff Gilroy once. The funny thing, though, looked a little like you. I'm the same Jeff Gilroy, you crazy man. Well, now, how did you know my name was Ben? I'm Jeff Gilroy. Now, put up that gun. I'm nervous enough as it is. Where's Mr. Carter? Mr. Carter? Uh, Alan Carter? Certainly, my partner. Why, he's in, uh, he's at his office. He's not at his office, he's here. Is he? I ain't seen him. Uh, when did he get here, Mr. Gilroy? He called me at ten o'clock this morning and asked me to come up here. He called from here. Why, how could he do that? Oh. How long has this phone been out of order? It ain't out of order. Leastwise, it weren't at twelve o'clock noon today. I called Mr. Carter at his office at noon. At, at noon? From this phone? Why, sure. I wanted to know if he was planning to come up here the next three days. I wanted to visit my sister in the village. And... And what did he say? Oh, he said he wouldn't be up here for a couple of weeks. Who built that big fire? What? I thought you did. No, I didn't. Well, I gotta run along now. If you want me, I'll be at my cabin a half mile up the mountain. Just up the main road and turn off when you come to the big signal oil station. I'll see you in the morning. Good night. <laughs> Phil watches Jeff Gilroy's nervous pacing about the room for a while. Then he reconnects the phone wire, slips to the upstairs phone, and calls his brother Alan in the city. Hello? Hello, Alan. Did you get that note suggesting you check over the financial affairs of your company instead of playing so much golf? Yes, I got it. But have you checked on those affairs yet? Yes, I have. Who is this? (laughs) I'm the man you wouldn't believe. Fifteen years ago, I'm the man you prosecuted. I'm your brother, Phil. Phil? What? Where are you? Oh, I'm in town. I've been out a few days. How does it feel to find out you prosecuted the wrong man? Well, there's no proof of any irregularity. <laughs> there was no proof fifteen years ago, Alan. Now I'm going to get the proof myself. So long, Alan. Phil? Phil? Phil Carter slips back to the head of the stairs and enjoys himself by watching Jeff Gilroy's increasing tension, his heavy, labored breathing. Jeff is terribly worried. 
He manages to place more wood on the fire, but tries his best to keep away from the windows. About 8.30. Hello. Hello? Jeff, this is Alan. Alan? Where are you? I'm at the office. Office? Well, you asked me to come up here to the lodge. I've been at the lodge all day. What did you leave for? I haven't been at the lodge for a week or more. But you called me from here this morning. What's the matter with you, Jeff? I just called the club and they told me where you were. Are you out of your mind? I... I don't know, Alan. I, I don't know, but I... I just heard some interesting news, Jeff. My brother Phil was paroled three days ago. Phil? Phil, that's it. That's what's been going on. It's Phil. He's after me. What are you talking about? He hates me. He thinks I had something to do with his prison sentence. Alan, I can't stay here alone. Come and get me. Come and get me. Do you hear? Yes, I hear. I'll come. Goodbye. Alan. Alan, hello. Hello. Hello, Jeff. Phil. Phil. Don't. Don't. Don't what? Jeff. That's a gun in your pocket, I know. Please don't. Jeff, Please, take do... that chair facing the fireplace. Now Just... sit down and try to relax. <laughs> or can you relax in your last hour as Jeff? Last hours? Phil. Look, Phil, listen to me. I... Sit down. Yes. Yes, there. I'm a sick man, Phil, a sick man. Then you won't mind, perhaps, what's going to happen. It... You're going to sit there. And I'm going to stand here in front of the fire, and you're going to tell me all about it. A confession is sometimes good for one's soul. Confession? What are you talking about? Don't play innocent, Jeff. Not after those 15 years I spent. It's too late to play innocent. Phil, Phil, honestly, I don't know what you're talking about. I... On the exact don't stroke of 12, I'm going to put a bullet about... through you, Jeff. No. And you know why. No, Phil, no, no, you know you can't. Come on, Jeff, talk. You be talk. You can't. Talk. <laughs> There it is, Jeff. Hmm? It's starting to strike 12. You've only got a few more seconds to start talking. Go on, Jeff. Go on, tell me all about it. No. Tell me how you sent an innocent man to prison for a crime you committed. No, Phil, no. No, I didn't. You're wrong. Please, Phil, you've got to listen to me. Confession or not, Jeff, you're going to die in a few seconds. I've waited 15 years for this. Phil, no, no, Phil. No. Ten. Eleven. Please, Phil. Please, I'm on my knees. Now, Jeff, no, now. No, no. <laughs> Stone dead. And not a mark on you, Jeff. I didn't even touch you. Not a hair on your head. That's not all to tonight's story. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, the Office of War Information has asked Signal Oil Company to inform car owners there will be 40% fewer new tires for civilian drivers during April, May, and June than during the past three months. And President Roosevelt has warned that the only way to be sure your car will be kept running is to make your present equipment last. Well, fortunately, tires can be retreaded more than once if the inner carcass is in sound condition. Small injuries should be repaired promptly before they spread and weaken the tire. And the tread must not be worn too thin before retreading. Because surveys show that three out of every four tires today need either some kind of repair or retreading, you'll be wise to have your tires thoroughly inspected. Your signal gasoline dealer, being a trained expert at tire care, will not only be glad to inspect your tires, but he's completely equipped for all types of tire repair and retreading. All of the top quality that the name Signal stands for. But most important, don't put off this tire service until your car is laid up. Plan now to make your tires last by having them signal service this week. And now... Back to the Whistler. Well, Phil Carter, you accomplished your purpose, didn't you? You avenged your injustice and still kept your promise to the warden. Jeff Gilroy is dead and you didn't touch a hair on his head. No. 
You only dropped that thirty-eight cartridge into the fire where it exploded harmlessly. But was it, it was enough. Too much for Jeff's heart. It wasn't exactly murder, was it? Except you did know his heart was weak. Another thing, Phil. Didn't it surprise you a little, the fact that Jeff wouldn't confess? Didn't that make you stop and wonder a little? It should have. But then you found that out soon enough. It was just a few minutes after twelve. You were just about to leave the lodge when your brother Alan arrived. You were in the hallway and he didn't see you. But he saw Jeff slumped over the chair in front of the fire. And as he walked up, you saw the gun he had in his hand. All right, Jeff. Don't move. Just give it to me quick. What is this that you and Phil are trying to pull? Thought you were pretty smart, didn't you, getting me up here on a trick like this. Well, I came, but I'm ready for you. If you two think you can pin that embezzlement on me after all these years and all the trouble I've taken to cover up, I'll kill you both before I'll admit anything. And you can't prove a thing. Neither of you. You hear me? You can't prove a thing on me. Jeff. Jeff! He can't hear you, Alan. He's dead. Stay where you are. You needn't be afraid of me, Alan. I won't do anything to you. You you killed him? The coroner's jury will say he died of a heart attack. But you frightened him to death. Yes. For something he didn't do. Something you did. I... Don't worry, Alan. It doesn't matter anymore. For 15 years, I've hated the wrong man. Now there's nothing left. I won't cause you any trouble. You needn't shoot me or worry about me. What do you mean? I'm going back. Back to prison? Yes. They offered me a job there. I just killed a man. I'm going back. For the rest of my life. It's really where I belong, you know. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with story by J. Donald Wilson, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting you let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, to rent danger. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. When in the editorial offices of the Cincinnati Gazette, the news was received that Killer Carter, 
the gang murderer had escaped from the penitentiary in Columbus and that he had been at large for 24 hours. It was decided that Danny Pearson, star reporter, was to be sent up to the Capitol to cover the manhunt that was sure to follow. Danny borrowed a car from Clem Tracy, the rewrite man, and headed north late on Friday afternoon. Car trouble held him up, and at one o'clock he was still far from his destination. He was getting too sleepy to drive. So when he saw the tourist sign in front of the lonely farmhouse, he made his decision. He'd stop, get a few hours of sleep, and continue into Columbus in the early hours of morning. He pulled in the lane, parked the car, and went up onto the porch. It took a few moments to rouse anyone, but finally the door opened and there stood a woman. What do you want? Uh, good evening. I was driving along the road looking for a place to stay for the night, and I saw your tourist sign out front, so I thought I'd stop and see if you had any room. Why don't you drive on to the city? Well, I'm too tired to drive that distance tonight. I'm afraid I'd fall asleep at the wheel. You do have a room, don't you? I guess so. Cost you two dollars in advance. Oh, that's all right. And I don't serve any meals here. Well, I'm not hungry, and I'll be leaving in the morning before breakfast. All right, come in. Uh, is it okay to leave my car in the driveway here? It'll be safe there. Nobody will steal it. Come in. She certainly isn't very friendly, Danny, is she? But a room is a room, and it'll be nice and quiet here for the night. The house is large and dingy and eerily quiet. Almost too quiet. Here it is. You'll find everything neat and clean. There's a bathroom to the right of the bed and plenty of towels and soap. Oh, uh, thank you. Looks fine. Did you leave your luggage in the car? Uh, no, I don't have any luggage with me. I'm traveling light. Well, I guess anyone who drives an expensive car like yours can do anything he likes. <laughs> I'm going to bed myself right away, so if there's anything else you want, you'd better think of it now. Uh, well, thanks, but there's nothing else I need. Good night, Mrs. Good night. Oh, fine. Your hostess is hospitable, isn't she? But don't worry about it. People are sometimes like that on the farm. Not used to talking much. They prefer action because actions speak louder and longer than words. And the bed is soft and comfortable. That's the main thing. Just made for your night's rest. Who's there? I said, who's there? Just me. Well, hello. Who are you? My name is is Claire Monroe. Well, Claire, do you make a habit of walking into strange men's rooms in the middle of the night? I, I want to talk to you. Huh? What are you so nervous about? I'm afraid she'll find me in here. She? The lady who showed you the room. Then why don't you leave? Because I have to talk with you. Okay, go ahead, talk. I don't know where to start. Just tell me that you're lonesome. You don't have any excitement on the farm. You're looking for something to do. It's an old routine. Oh, it's nothing like that. I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but I've got to ask you. Will you take me away with you when you go? Me? Why should I? Because I have to get away from here. I never want to see this house again as long as I live. Why don't you just run away? You don't need me. Because I don't have a car and I don't have any money. My mother would have me picked up by the police. She'd tell them I wasn't of age. Well... Are you? I'm 23 years old, but I can't prove it. Why not? Because I'm an adopted child, and I don't know where I was born. And my mother... Call that lady my mother. She'd lie about my age just to keep me from going away. Well, how do I know you're of age? Look at me. Do I look 17? No, I'll have to admit you don't. I know I'm 23 years old, but she won't let me go. Well, why do you want to run away? Because... Because that lady... My foster mother, last night, she murdered my foster father. Whistler fans, we members of the cast certainly owe you a great big thanks tonight. In fact, two of them. Two weeks ago, you'll recall, we asked a favor of you. Asked if you'd be kind enough to drop in on the folks who are bringing you the Whistler, your signal gasoline dealer and tell him how you like this program. 
Well, since then, signal gasoline dealers all the way from Canada to Mexico have been telling us how many of you stopped at their station and expressed enthusiasm for the Whistler. So, naturally, we of the cast are mighty happy and mighty grateful to you. Oh, but that's only the half of it. You see, during the past month, the popularity of the Whistler has continued to increase so much that now, according to the latest radio popularity survey, more people listen to the Whistler than to any other West Coast program. Yes, the Whistler is now way out in front. So, for your loyalty, thanks again to all of you from all of us. And now, back to the Whistler. Danny Pearson had driven up from Cincinnati looking for a murderer, but he hadn't expected to find one so soon, nor to find another one than the one he was looking for. But you never know what you'll find when you stop at a lonely farmhouse where they take in tourists, Danny. You lie there in your bed as a good-looking young girl asks your protection from her murdering foster mother. If this is a gag, it's a pretty rugged one. Look, baby, let's break this up. I don't feel like playing games. i got to get some sleep. You don't believe me, but I'm telling you the truth. Ever since they adopted me, they've done nothing but fight with one another. You've seen my mother. You can tell how cold and strong she is. Well, my father was just as weak as she is strong. She bullied him for years, mostly because he didn't make a lot of money. All she cares about is money. And because we never had any, she hates everything and everybody, especially my father. But how do you know she killed him? Did you see her? No, she threatened more than once to kill him, though. Last night I was in bed and I heard a shot. I wasn't sure whether or not I dreamed it, so I didn't get up to see. But when I came down this morning, she said that he had left and wasn't coming back. That he'd gone out west somewhere. That didn't sound like him because he was born and brought up in this part of the country and he wouldn't leave it for anything. Well, how in the world do you know he's dead? You know, in law, you have to produce a body. I haven't seen it, but I think I know where it is. Oh? Where? Today I was walking out on the farm, and I noticed a patch of grounds up in the edge of the woods that was recently dug up. And when she saw me out there, she got very angry, ordered me into the house. I'm positive she killed him and buried him there. Oh! What are you doing in this man's room? I was just... just talking to him, that's all. Up to your father's tricks, weren't you? You're just like She him. was just talking to Stealing from the guests, sneaking in to rob them or worse. No, I only wanted to talk. He was just telling me about the shows and things in the city. Get back to your room and stay there. Get. If I catch you in here again, you'll wish your head stayed there. And as for you, young man, you'd better watch your step or you'll be in trouble. Oh, now, look. Wait, Justice. <laughs> Well, Danny, cozy little situation you stepped to, into, isn't it? A girl, pretty but strange, who accuses her foster mother of being a murderess. Mrs. Monroe, in turn, accuses the daughter of being like her father, who evidently made a habit of robbing his tourist guests in their sleep. And how about that, Danny? She did sneak into your room. Did she come to talk, uh, as she said, or to rob you? And what's it all about, anyway? Who can you believe? But there is one thing you know. You're going to get up, get dressed, and get out of this place as fast as you can. That drive into town doesn't look half as far now. But just as you're about to leave, you see something slip under your door. A piece of paper, a note. Go on, Danny. Pick it up and read it. Please, you've got to believe me. I need your help. My room's across the hall. Clear. Boom. That's right. Crumple it up and throw it away, Danny. But wait a minute. Suppose she is telling the truth. Suppose she is in danger. You couldn't go off and leave her like this. Especially not as pretty a girl as Claire. Claire? Claire? Yes? It's me, Danny. Danny Pearson. Don't put on a light. Get dressed and come on with me. I am dressed. Oh, come on. Where are we going? You're going to show me where you think your father was buried. So 
the two of you move cautiously out of the house into the darkness of the outside night. You pick up a shovel at the barn and start up the path through a field of sharp, tough hay. You keep looking over your shoulder, afraid that she might see you and come out of the house after you. Why should you be afraid of her? Well, if she killed a man once, she could do it again. Finally, you reach the woods and... Claire points out the patch of ground she thinks her mother made into a graveyard. This is it, right here. I wish we could see a little better. We'll see too well, I'm afraid. This ground isn't very hard. The shovel sinks right into it. I told you it would. If the boss could see me now. Why I'm doing it, I'll never know. Maybe it's because you like me. What, what makes you think that? Because... You'd have run away. You'd have gone back to sleep after she took me away. Back to sleep? Hey, tell me. Is what she said about your foster father true? You mean about him stealing from the guests? Yes. She hounded him about money so that he finally took to that to satisfy her. When tourists came, he'd wait till they were asleep and then slip in and rob them. Yeah, but didn't anybody ever catch him? Not that we ever knew of. He only took part of their money, not all of it. So they didn't miss it until they'd left. And then they had no proof. Sweet little racket. Maybe somebody caught on and that's why he went out west. I don't think so. Because we didn't have any tourists here last night. At least not that I know of. It's possible, though, isn't it? You could have taken somebody in after you were a slave. Yes, it's possible. Then he might have tried to rob them. And they caught him and he had to leave hurriedly. That could account for his disappearance. Yes, but... Hey, I just hit something. Oh, Danny. I got hold of it. Here it comes. It's his coat. My father's coat. Yeah? Just when I had it figured out another way. Danny, don't dig anymore. I'm getting scared. I couldn't stand to look at it. Don't dig anymore. Just fill it in. We, we found out what we wanted to find out. Please fill it in. Take it easy, baby. I don't like this any more than you do. I'm just doing it because you wanted me to. I couldn't bear to look at it. Don't dig anymore. Okay, I'll fill it in. I guess we've seen enough to know you were right. So you put the coat back where you found it, Danny, and fill in the hole again. You pat the dirt down again, just as you found it, and start back for the house. On the way back to the house, Claire holds your arm tightly. And you notice for the first time how soft and warm she is. Of course, she's trembling a little bit, but who wouldn't? Danny, will you promise to take me away tomorrow? I couldn't stand another night here. Where would I take you? What would I do with you when I got you there? I, I, I got enough to do without taking care of somebody else. Take me to some place far away, some city. I'll get a job and take care of myself. Don't worry about that. Just get me away from here. Your mother might accuse me of kidnapping. <laughs> Once she knew I wasn't ever coming back, I don't think she'd even care. Please, Danny, don't make me stay here. I'm afraid. She might even do something to me if she finds out I know what happened. You've got to help me. All right, all right. I'm a sucker, but I'll do it. But remember this. Once I get you out of here, you're strictly on your own. I got enough things to worry about without trying to take care of you. Oh, thank you, Danny. Thank you. Mm. We'll leave the first thing in the morning. No, we'll leave tonight, right now. That's awfully sad. Well, you wanted to get out of here, didn't you? I'm leaving right now. You can do what you want. Come or stay. I'll go with you. Yeah, we're almost at the house. Don't even bother to go inside and get anything. She might hear you. Here, here's my car. We'll just jump in and beat it. You game? Yes. All right, now be quiet. We'll get in the car and let it roll backwards into the road. Just a minute. Surprise. You didn't think I'd let you get away, did you? Hey, put that shotgun down. It might go off. It might if you start anything. Now listen here, Mrs. Monroe. You this... thought I was asleep, didn't you? I had better sense. I watched you leave the house together and I had a pretty good idea you weren't coming back. So What? What do you think you're doing with that gun? Maybe I'm protecting my daughter from a fast-talking stranger. I can take care of myself. That remains to be seen. And as for you young men, I want you to get back in your car, drive off, and never come around here again. That's a very good idea. I'll buy that. Should have left here a long time ago. I'm going with him. You stay where you are. I'm old enough to do what I want to do. I'm going to leave and you can't stop me. You don't think so? You wouldn't dare pull that trigger. 
put your foot on that running board and try me. Hey, now, look, girl. You There's keep no... out of this. Maybe I'm doing this as much to protect you from her. I don't need any wait, protection. Wait, wait. Listen, somebody's coming. It's a car. Yeah. Hey, looks like they're turning into your lane. Both of you get in the car, quick. Keep your lights out. Drive it in the barn. Show him where it is, Claire, and shut the door after you. Pardon me, ma'am. Yes? I'm a police officer. What can I do for you? We're chasing a man. We think he came up this way. You seen any strangers around lately? Uh, what did he do? He escaped from the state penitentiary. Is he dangerous? He's a cold-blooded murderer. He escaped yesterday, and we've tracked him down to this vicinity. He's been driving stolen cars. Last we heard, he was driving a big, rich-looking convertible he picked up in Columbus. Have you seen him? No. Nobody stopped here. Didn't even see anybody passing the road. No. Oh. Well, he's in this neighborhood somewhere. But, say, didn't you know about this before? I mean, I thought you did when I saw you with your shotgun here. Oh. Oh, no, I... I just saw you coming up the lane. And I like to be prepared for strangers this time of night. Yeah, sure. It is pretty late. And you ought to be in bed. I don't let this keep you up. You needn't worry about Carter. We'll get him. I won't worry. Oh, that's fun. Say, what are those tire tracks on the ground? Where? There, where my flashlight's pointing. They go toward the barn. Those are tractor tire marks. Oh. Well, I'm sorry that I bothered you, ma'am, but, well, we've got a job to do. That's all right, mister. Wish I could have helped you some. We'll keep looking. Good night, ma'am. Okay, Al, let's go. Too bad you couldn't hear what was being said, Danny, waiting in the barn. But while the lady and the officer were talking, you had some things to say to Claire. What are we going to do now? Nothing. Just wait. You see who that is out there? A man got out of a car and he's talking to her. Do you know who he is? No, but he's got a flashlight. Wait a minute. Something on his coat lapel flashes. I think it's a badge. It must be the police. What are we going to do? I told you, nothing. Murder is a matter of proof. Until we can prove that your mother murdered your father, we don't have a leg to stand on. Anyway, I told you I don't want to get mixed up in it. I, I got enough to worry about myself. It's all right with me. All I want to do is get out of here. Okay. Well, just figure some way to get that gun away from your mother. Danny, the men are leaving. They're driving down to the road. She's coming back to the barn. All right, just sit tight. And wait. They're gone. Oh, so they're gone. I suppose you're breathing easier now. Maybe I am, and maybe I'm not. Will you stop pointing that gun at us? I will when I've finished what I'm going to do. You won't get away with shooting anybody. You ought to know. I don't intend to stand here talking all night. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want the both of you to get in that car and drive to Kingdom Come if you can. I never want to see either one of you again as long as I live. You've changed your mind. Oh, that suits me. Come on, Danny, let's get out of here while we've got the chance. Heaven knows what she might do. Okay, let's go. Just a minute. What? Before you go, Claire, I think there's something you ought to know about your fine new friend. I know all I want to know about him. Do you know what he really is? He's a murderer. A mur he escaped from the state prison yesterday, and the police are looking for him. They'll get him sooner or later. They always do. What do you think of that? I don't believe it. And even if it were true, I, I don't care. Where did you pick up this routine about me being a murderer? Don't listen to her, Danny. I believe you. What if I was a murderer? Wouldn't make the slightest difference in the world to me. Because, Danny, I'm in love with you. Do you know what you're saying? Yes, I know what I'm saying. Come on, let's get out of here. She gives me the jitters. Don't I, though? Okay, if that's the way everybody wants it, we'll go. I don't know what we'll do, but... I'll figure out something. You better think hard. Hurry up, Danny. Yes, hurry up. You'll get caught quicker that way. All right, everybody stand where you are. Oh. Put that gun down, lady. Andy? Yes? 
You and I'll go around the other side of the barn. All three of you stand over there. Dave, see if they have any guns. No guns on that one. Uh, no guns, Sheriff. No guns, eh? Good. Now, don't misunderstand me. There might not be anything wrong here, but I had to come back and take a look. It's pretty unusual for a woman to be walking around outside at 2 o'clock in the morning with a shotgun. Now, out with it. What's going on? What are you hiding in the barn for? Who's this car belong to? Come on, start talking, somebody. Here's the murderer you're looking for. There he is, and there's the car. Why didn't you tell me that when I was here before? Because I thought there might be a reward for him, and I wanted to collect it myself. She didn't, because she was going to let him get away. Who are you? My daughter, Claire Monroe. All right. Now, who are you? Danny Pearson. Do you have to use that light? Keep man? him covered, Dave. What are you doing here? Stopped here for the night. They rent rooms to tourists. I don't recommend it. Where do you live? Cincinnati. What do you do for a living? Newspaper reporter. I was on my way here to cover the car to break. Here's my press card. Now, let's see. Mm-hmm. Daniel J. Pearson, Cincinnati Gazette. How are you? All right, take it back. Where'd you get this car? I borrowed it from another reporter in Cincinnati. Okay. I told you he was the man you're looking for. Don't let him fool you with a good story. He's not fooling us, lady. He's not the man we're looking for. The guy we want is at least 45 years old. This fellow isn't even 30 yet. Well, I guess I made a mistake all around. Just a man. Sheriff, you looking for a murderer? I'm always looking for a murderer. All right, then. Go ahead, Claire. Tell him. What? Oh, Danny, I... Go ahead. Has to come out sooner or later. Come on, young lady. If there's anything to tell, let's have it. Well... Well, that woman, my foster mother, murdered my father. What? Are you crazy? No. No, last night I heard a shot. And then this morning when I came down, she said he'd gone away. Out west. He wouldn't do that. He would But he did. I found the note he left on the old typewriter in the hall when I came down this morning. Hmm. Did you hear the shot, too? I... I don't know. I thought I dreamed it. She heard it all right. She killed him. Danny and I just found the body buried up in the woods. What? Oh, no. No! All right. Keep her covered, Al. Wait a minute, officer. If this woman had murdered her husband, why did she take the chance of giving me a room tonight? Knowing that I might learn something. Why wouldn't she have run away? Or killed the girl, too, to cover up. But then he... On the other hand, Claire here never once mentioned going to the police about the murder. She was willing to run away with me a few minutes ago. Even though she thought I was a murderer. And she knew exactly where the body was buried. She could have written the note to her mother. Danny. Danny, you mean you think I... Yes, I do. Officer, this is the woman you want. She murdered her foster father. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, because yesterday marked the opening of a six weeks drive to check auto brakes sponsored by the International Association of Chiefs of Police... Signal Oil Company believes you'll want full information on just what this drive means to you. With today's cars averaging seven years old, faulty brakes are threatening to increase America's already large number of traffic accidents, which kill over 20,000 men, women, and children per year, injure another 800,000, and cost a billion and a quarter dollars. What's more, when a car is damaged or wrecked in an accident today, parts are often not available to repair it. And there are no new cars to replace it. So it means an even further strain on the transportation America must have to see us through the war. That's why traffic officers in every state plan to check every car involved in a moving traffic violation or accident. So the time to have the safety of your brakes checked by a competent brake expert is now. Your cooperation in this brake drive may prevent an accident that could cost you your car. Or your life. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Danny.
Tony turned out to be quite a detective, didn't he? He saw through Claire all the time and figured the whole thing out. But wait, did he? Well, not exactly. Because, you see, when they dug up the grave at the edge of the woods, they found Mr. Monroe's clothes. But the body was someone else's. In fact, when the police identified it, it was the body of Killer Carter. Yes, Killer Carter escaped convict. And when they'd put out a dragnet and caught up with Claire's very much alive foster father, they got the whole story. Danny had figured it exactly right once. Killer Carter had stopped at the tourist home late that night. Neither Claire nor her foster mother knew about it. When the old man started to pull his usual robbery, Carter caught him. In the struggle, Carter was shot and killed in self-defense. But not knowing who his victim was, Mr. Monroe got scared, buried him after changing clothes with him, wrote the note to his wife, and took off in Carter's stolen car. Knowing nothing of Carter's presence in the house, Claire had suspected her mother, and Mrs. Monroe had suspected Claire of murdering a man who wasn't dead and was a fugitive from a crime that wasn't a crime in the police books. The killing of an escaped convict in self-defense. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with story by John Hayes, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting you let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer... Bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, meet Mr. Death. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Nineteen fifteen was a big year for a lot of people in New York City. Herman Arnold, for instance, 
Herman Arnold, the gambler, was murdered. And because of that, it was a big year for Jerry Mason, drugstore clerk. Yes, 1915 was the year Jerry Mason met Mr. Death. You see, just before he died, Herman Arnold persuaded Jerry Mason to embezzle $1,800 from the safe at Thatcher's drugstore where he worked. He was going to double it overnight. That's what Jerry told Laurie Crane, his girlfriend. Only then the news came. Arnold was murdered. The money was gone. And all Laurie could say was... Jerry, maybe we'd better run. Leave town. Are you crazy? They'd catch us sooner or later. Now think of something now. Let me alone. Yes, if it hadn't been for Herman Arnold and his foolproof scheme for doubling that embezzled money, Jerry Mason might never have met Mr. Death. But the meeting was in the cards that night in April, 1915. Everything that happened was in preparation for the meeting. Herman Arnold's death, Mr. Thatcher's coming back from his vacation, and after Laurie's phone call... Hello? Oh, sorry, I kept you waiting. The phone... Yeah... Got some aspirin? Yeah, sure. There you are, 25. Open kind of late tonight, aren't you? Here. Yeah, I was about to close up when you came in. That's 25 out of... Hey! What's the matter? Well, you, you gave me a $1,000 bill. Yeah, I know. There's something else I want to buy besides aspirin. Well, I can't make change for this. You can keep the change. Huh? And there are four more just like that one for you. When you deliver. I don't get it, mister. We alone? Wait a minute. Yeah, we're alone. You're pretty hard up for dough, ain't you? Small matter of 1,800 bucks. Who told you? Never mind, I know. There's something we want to buy, Mr. Mason. You're the only guy in town who sells it. Yeah? This ain't ordinary merchandise, Mr. Mason. I understand you have a regular customer by the name of Ted Townley. Yeah, the newspaper columnist. What's he buy here? Has his prescriptions filled? What kind of prescription? Chloral hydrate. He can't sleep at night without it. Pretty powerful drug, ain't it? Not in small doses. I put it up for him in capsule. I see. What about large doses? What do you mean? I mean, if he was accidentally to take a capsule, well, it was loaded with maybe three times as much as usual. Oh, well, that wouldn't happen. I'm very careful. Eight grains is Suppose all I... you accidentally loaded one of them capsules, Mr. Mason. Oh. Get it? I see. You want to buy a... a murder? It's only murder when you get caught. Now, if Mr. Townley was to be found the next morning dead with an overdose of chloral hydrate in him, what would you say? That is, if you was holding the post-mortem. Well, I'd check the rest of the capsules in the box. Uh Uh-huh. And suppose you found them all kosher. Then I'd say he took more than one on purpose. Is it worth five grand? I don't know. Five grand just to load one capsule and slip it in his next prescription? All right, I'll do it. You're smart, Mr. Mason. I'll have the other four grand for you within an hour after Mr. Townley wakes up dead. Good night, Mr. Mason. Five thousand dollars. I'm okay. I better close up now. Uh, pardon me. How'd you get in here? I came in through the side door. I've been looking at the magazines over there behind the rack. I'd I'd like to purchase this. How long have you been here? Oh, half an hour or more. I hope you don't mind. That man who just left? Yes, I saw him. I didn't want to interrupt. You both seem to be so interested. You heard what we were saying? Oh, I didn't pay much attention. You see, I'm quite excited. I'm going on a trip to Europe. I take this issue of travel, if you don't mind. It, it has a remarkable article on Syria. Ha, have you ever been to Europe, Mr. Mason? How do you know my name? Oh, I happen to hear that gentleman call you, Mr. Mason. Is that all you heard? Well, what's the matter, Mr. Mason? I, I'm dreadfully sorry if I eavesdropped, but it was entirely unintentional. I see. Uh, magazine's 25 cents. Uh, yes, uh, 20, uh, there you are. Thanks. I'm I'm so excited about my trip, I can hardly close my eyes at night. It's a good thing I don't do this very often. They say a large proportion of American businessmen die prematurely because they can't sleep at night. What made you say that? Oh, it's true. You know, Mr. Mason, this will be the first time in my life I've left New York State, except for a trip or two to Jersey City, of course. <laughs> no wonder I'm excited, eh? When are you leaving? May 1st. Oh, say, I uh, I wonder if you'd do me a favor. What? Uh, well, the next issue of Travel has an article on English inns. 
I wonder if you'd be kind enough to put one aside for me. Okay, I'll save you. Oh, I'll come in for it. It should be a week or so, shouldn't it? Or just before the first of May. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll be going. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry about being so touchy. You know, that, that other customer, he kind of had me on edge, kept talking in riddles. You hear what he was telling me? Well, just a word now and then. Enough to... To what? To know it was none of my business. <laughs> Good night, Mr. Mason. I'll be back on April 30th for the magazine. Friends, as you sit listening to the whistler, you hear only sounds. You hear a certain creaking, and in your mind you picture a slowly opening door. Or the sound of a motor accelerating, and you visualize a car driving off. All right, here's a test for you. See if you can picture in your mind the trademark of the sponsor of this program, your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. I'll give you two seconds. Well, you were right. If you visualized a black circle with yellow letters spelling out the words signal gasoline, and, of course, a traffic signal in the center, which is why we say let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. What's more, that's a mighty good sign to look for these days. Because there you'll find not only Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline, but the full line of Signal specialized lubricants. Really conscientious service, too, by experienced Signal dealers. More eager to please you because they're in business for themselves. So let the black and yellow Signal Circle be your insurance of the protection your car needs to last out the duration. And now... Back to the Whistler. So Jerry Mason didn't close the store that night after the little man had left with his travel magazine. He just stood there at the counter thinking for a long time. Then he went back to the pharmacy department and took down a jar of chloral hydrate and a few gelatin capsules. Yes, it could be done easily. Simple as ABC. The easiest five grand he'd ever make in his life. Or perhaps the hardest. That little man with a travel book. How much had he heard? You watched him carefully, Jerry. It wasn't a sign he knew anything. Go home and get some sleep. Forget about Laurie waiting for you at her apartment. Forget about the little man... Just go home and get some sleep. Two o'clock. Forget about the little man, Jerry. Just an innocent old fuddy-duddy who happened to stroll in that side door at the wrong time. Go on, get some sleep. He knows. He must know. He knew your name, didn't he? If he could hear that, he could hear the rest. That is, if he was listening. Wait a minute. Get hold of yourself. Are you going to toss over five grand because of a crazy hunch and go to prison for embezzlement when Thatcher starts looking for that 1800? Are you yellow? Don't be stupid. Get some sleep. Yes. Get some sleep. <laughs> Look like a ghost. I couldn't sleep all night. I gotta decide right now. Tell me he'll be in here for his prescription any minute. We made a wrong guess, Jerry. About the 1800. I know, I know. I love you, Jerry. Don't let them drag you down any farther. But what about Thatcher's money? Jerry, it's murder. If I get caught, it's murder. I just can't get that guy with the magazine out of my mind. Townley, the big man, Jerry. They won't pass it off without a question. He knows too much about too many people. Well, there can only be one answer, I tell you. The guy's an addict and everybody knows that people like that die from overdoses every day. I'm a cinch. If that little guy with the glasses is as dumb as he looks. Morning, Jerry. Oh, Mr. Townley. How's newspaper business? Rotten, thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, this is my fiancée, Miss Crane. 
Miss Crane? How do you do? A word of advice, Miss Crane. Keep him away from the newspaper business. Fate worse than death. Uh, how about my chemicals, Jerry? Yes, sir. If you can wait, I'll have it for you in just a minute. Okay. I really mean it, Miss Crane. You do? Maybe she's right, Jerry. Maybe you'd better forget the whole mess. And yes, throw away $5,000. More money than you'll ever have if you live to be a hundred. Townley's a nice guy. Be ashamed to bump him off. Maybe Thatcher will listen to reason about the discrepancy. Let you off easy. Yes. Take that capsule out and look at it for a minute. 5,000 bucks. Right in the palm of my hand. Five thousand. All right, Mr. Townley. There's one for good measure. It's done, Jerry. No way of changing it now. And even you're surprised when it pays off only two nights later. Two more nights without sleep, by the way. It's about midnight when you hear someone at the door. Oh, now, who could that be at this time of night? Yes? You Jeremiah T. Mason? That's right. Sorry to get you out of bed this time of night, Mr. Mason. I'm Hodges, Homicide Bureau. Homicide? Don't be alarmed. Just making a routine investigation. It hasn't come out in the papers yet, but Ted Townley, the columnist, was found dead in his apartment this afternoon. Overdose of sleeping powder. I see. Well, come in, please. Thanks. Down? Yeah. Well, only be a minute. I understand you're employed by the Thatcher Drug Company where Tomley got his prescriptions filled. Yes. As a matter of fact, I usually put them up myself. What was the drug? Chloral hydrate. Mm-hmm. How long had he been taking it? Oh, I think about five years. I see. <gasps> Excuse me for a minute. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Hello? Mr. Mason? Yes. Yeah. You did a nice job. Oh, oh, don't apologize, Laurie. You didn't get me out of bed. Inspector Hodges of the Homicide Squad is here. I get you. It seems Townley, the columnist, was found dead in his apartment. I'll address that door to General Delivery. Name of Charles Henshaw. Got it? Yes, that's it. He got the drug from us. That's why the inspector's here. Take it easy, pal. Remember, they ain't got a thing on you. So long. All right. Good night, dear. I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, sorry, Inspector. That's yeah, okay. Nothing irregular about the case, of course. Stomach contents analyzed as chloral hydrate. Doctor tells me you'd had trouble with Townley. Said the guy was turning into a regular addict. Well, if there's anything I can do... Ah, uh, forget it. This will probably close it up. Don't think you'll even have to testify. Well, thanks a lot, Mason. Sorry I had to disturb you. Well, that's quite all right, Inspector. Good night, Mason. Hey, better get back to bed and get some sleep. You look like you've had a hard day. Yes, try and sleep, Jerry. You're exhausted. Your arms and legs ache with fatigue and your brain keeps spinning like a top. It's there every time you close your eyes. Black and white circles, like a whirling rifle target, with a little man in glasses grinning at the center. Sleep. Jerry, sleep, sleep. <laughs> well, what's this, Jerry? Could you be dreaming that you're walking in Central Park alone? There's not a breath of air. The leaves of the trees hang limp and motionless. It's too quiet to be real. Oh, Mason. Huh? What? Townley. Mr. Townley, you can't... Oh, yes, I can. Here, I want you to meet a friend of mine. Why, you... No, no. Oh, yes, yes, we've met before, Mr. Townley. I happened in the drugstore on the night Mr. Mason made arrangements for your uh, departure. Mason, I want you to meet Mr. Death. Mr. Death? Right. Odd name, isn't it? Death, D-E-A-T-H. You see, I've retained Mr. Death to handle my case. 
He specializes in cases of this kind. You know, double crosses, cold-blooded murders, that sort of thing. He's a man of exceptional ability. I was lucky to get him. What do you mean? Mr. Death is what you might call a, a retributionist. Precisely. A retributionist. Uh, deal in retribution, evening up old scores. Rather uncommon practice. Uh, yes. Uh, you see, Mr. Mason, we operate on the premise that it's still murder, even if you don't get caught. No. Oh, no, 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 relax, Mr. Mason. You haven't a thing to worry about. Everything is taken care of. All the details can be worked out before I leave on my trip. Uh, you've, uh, uh, you've, uh, uh, seen this issue of travel, Mr. Mason. Remarkable article on Syria. No, you're wrong. I have nothing to We're do with it. We're not angry at you, Mason. For that matter, you did me a favor. I much prefer this to the newspaper business. There's no reason why we can't handle this matter of retribution as a nice, friendly little deal. Of course, of course we will. Now, now, let's talk about your trip. My trip? My one passion is travel, Mr. Mason, and I suspect you have hidden leaning toward it yourself, so I've arranged for you to take a trip, too. No, no. It'll be a much more interesting trip than mine, I assure you. I don't have the itinerary as yet. No, go away. Go away! <laughs> No, no, go! 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 It was a dream. It was only a dream. Laurie. Laurie, you have no idea what it was like. They both grinned at me and talked about retribution and a long trip. Well? What? I shouldn't say I told you so, I guess. There was no other way out, Laurie. I know. I suppose I'm as guilty as you are. You you just aren't a murderer, Jerry. You haven't got the right kind of a mind. This was so real. You've got to get hold of yourself. It's done and there's nothing we can do to change it. Now, now where's the money? Here. I picked it up at the post office this morning. Small bill. Good. I'll return it to the safe. Mr. Thatcher might get in early. You'll have it all ready for him. And I'll be back later this afternoon. Now, you've got to get some sleep. I know, but every time I close my eyes, I see him. Forget him, will you? I told you, it's only your imagination. All right. I'll go to sleep. Oh, before you go, fix me another bromide, will there, Mr. Mason. I'm sorry to intrude, but there are still a few things we should discuss. Go away. You're not real. <laughs> you, you're just like all the others. The, the others? Yes, I suppose, I suppose it's just one of the problems every retributionist has to put up with. Nobody believes he's real. Purely a philosophical problem, of course. What? Depends on what you mean by real. But uh, that isn't getting us anywhere, is it? Now, let's see. Mm, uh, Mr. Townley uh, left me several instructions here. Oh, by the way, by the way, he sends his apologies. He wasn't able to come this afternoon. What do you mean, instructions? Oh, of course. I, I haven't had a chance to explain how uh, retributionists operate, have I? No. Well, we, uh, uh, we're we like architects, Mr. Mason. Architects? Precisely. You see, we get a general picture of the client's needs... Then we present a plan. Plan for what? A blueprint for retribution, of course. You see, I have yours right here. Uh, Mr. Townley has approved of it, by the way. I see. Suppose I don't approve. Oh, that, that won't affect it one way or the other. <laughs> you see, Mr. Mason, once the plan is prepared and approved, the subject has nothing to do but wait. I've, uh, I've taken such an interest in your case, I've prepared a rather, uh, original plan. <laughs> if I do say so myself. <laughs> You're pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Oh, nothing is more certain than retribution, Mr. Mason. Now, let's see, let's... Oh, yes, I, uh, I wanted to discuss the time element with you. It's been rather important in your case. We uh, usually work over a period of years, but it happens that I, I want to take advantage of uh, an unusual opportunity. <laughs> Your date has been set, 
at April 30th. That's tomorrow. Yes. The blueprint. Let me see it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. That's out of the question. Well, it's not a plan at all. It's a travel magazine. Give it to me. I said you can't touch it, Mr. Mason. Oh, no. All right. Try. <laughs> you see, you can't touch the plan, Mr. Mason. All you can do is uh, wait. Just wait. Jerry? Jerry, Jerry, it's me, Larry. Open the door. Jerry, Mr. Thatcher's back. About an hour after I put the money in the safe. I told him you were sick. April 30th, he said. Tomorrow. What? Well, what's the matter? Nothing to do but wait, huh? Tomorrow, he's coming back for that travel magazine, the one I saved for him. Well, you're out of your mind. I'm okay. Listen... Go back and tell Thatcher I'm going to work all day tomorrow. Tell him to stay home and unpack anything. What are you going to do? I got a date, Laurie. A date with Mr. Death. A date with Mr. Death. But remember you were dreaming, Jerry. But now the dream's getting all mixed up with reality. That's the way your mind gets all mixed up. You're going on your nerves now... Five days without sleep. Five days on double bromides. Your muscles ache and there's a throbbing pain at the base of your skull. And though you don't sleep the rest of the night, Mr. Death's still there, grinning at you from the center of the black and white rifle target, waiting for tomorrow. He doesn't know you're not going to take it lying down, that there's something you can do besides wait, something he might not expect when he comes in as he promised. He would pick up the new travel magazine. You stagger through the next day, and finally, just as before, the door opens at about closing time. Uh, hello there, Mr. Mason. Oh, it's you. I, I hope you remembered about the travel magazine. Yes, I remembered. Here you are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mason. Twenty-five. Yes. Say, where do you live? Up on East 78th Street, near the river. Oh, I... I live up that way. I'm about to close up now. I'll take you home. Oh, fine, fine. Uh, why are you stopping here by the river, Mr. Mason? All right, Mr. Death. It's April 30th. What do you mean? You heard what we were talking about that night, didn't you? Got the whole works. Uh, Lean back and wait. Just sit around and wait for you to spring the works on the cops. Tell them I killed Ted Townley. Did you have that in mind for April 30th, huh? Tonight, maybe? I I didn't. Oh, yes, you did, Mr. Death. Retribution, huh? Well, maybe this is something you forgot to put in your blueprint. No, 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 Mr. No, 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 no. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, a question. If you could have your gasoline tailored to order, just what characteristic would you consider most important? Well, today, under gasoline rationing, the chances are you'd say mileage, which explains why so many drivers have been changing to the West's most longer, most famous longer mileage motor fuel, Signal Go Farther Gasoline. You see, for years, drivers who have kept a careful record of gasoline mileage have found they do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Now, naturally, with certain gasoline ingredients reserved for war, no gasoline today can give you all the zip and anti-knock quality you found in pre-war Signal Gasoline, and which you'll be enjoying again in even further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But this much you can be sure of. Just as they've been doing for the past 14 years, Signal Oil Company is still producing the finest gasoline that can be made today. And the famous Signal formula still places the emphasis on mileage. So to make sure you're getting the most miles from every ration coupon, 
Stop at the station wearing the black and yellow Signal Circle and get your best buy today. Signal Go Farther Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. There's nothing to worry about now, Jerry. Mr. Death is out of your life for good, deep in the river with a hundred-pound chain around his neck, and there are no prying friends or relatives to inquire for him. You can sleep now, and it's wonderful, isn't it? No more leering faces. No more blueprints, just the good, solid black velvet of sleep. Twenty-four hours of it, just like a baby. The old bounce is back the next night, and you can smile again. Jerry, you're sure it was... Don't worry, baby. They'll never find him. Oh, man, I feel like a million bucks. Oh, by the way, I'm going on a trip. Mr. Thatcher told me I needed a vacation. Trip? Where? Well, look what I found in Mr. Death's pocket. Complete grand tour. First cabin all the way. Well, but you can't use that ticket the name. No, you don't know me, baby. But what about passport? Took care of that, too. Oh, you're taking a chance, Jerry. Oh, no, no. I wouldn't miss this for the world. After all, Lori, it isn't every day a guy picks up a free ride on a boat like the Lusitania. Yes, you really got yourself a free ride, Jerry. But perhaps that was part of the blueprint, too. The luxury liner Lusitania and that German torpedo off the coast of Ireland. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer... Bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, accident according to plan. I am The Whistler, and I know many things. For I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. There are many kinds of jealousy and none of them are good. The jealous one in love is the most frequent. But there is another more terrible jealousy. Yes that of a man for his co-worker. Tom Reddick was jealous of Charles Fremont's cleverness, his ability to succeed. 
Always when there was applause for a job well done, Charles Fremont was patted on the back, fated, given a raise. Charles, Charles, you did it again. Boys, uh, I don't know what we'd have done without that building. I only wish more of the men had your ability. Oh, thank you, Mr. Winston. I appreciate your kindness. Oh, not since, my boy. Charles, I'd like you to take over general managership of the plant. Effective next week. Uh Oh, congratulations, Charles. That's when the jealousy reaches a sickening height. When the man of whom you're jealous gets your job. Tom Reddick had been the general manager of the plant. But Tom Reddick hadn't been able to arrange the lease on the new building. Hadn't been able to do anything but his job the best way he could. Slowly and often blunderingly. And when he lost the job, that's when Tom Reddick knew he had to kill Charles Fremont. Be careful, Tom. Remember you're a slow, blundering thinker. But this time, you have a plan that's beautiful in its simplicity. You'll have a few drinks with Charles that evening and offer to drive him home from work. And at the railroad crossing out on the highway, you'll get rid of Charles Fremont. It will look accidental. Charles will be out of the way and you'll get your job back. So, after work that evening, you stop Charles in the washroom. Hello, Charlie. Congratulations on the promotion. Oh, thanks, Tom. I'm awfully sorry, fella, replacing you this way. It doesn't seem fair somehow. Don't be silly. I was never comfortable being general manager anyway. I'm more of a shop man. Feel strange when I'm not around machines. Oh, I'm glad you're taking it this way, old man. You know, if I thought it was going to bother you, I'd rather not have the job. It really doesn't mean that much to me. Now cut that out. You're the man for the job and you take it. Hey, let me buy you a drink and we'll toast your promotion and my return to the shops. Well, uh, I should be getting home. Oh, come on. A drink will only take a few minutes. Well, okay. Let's go. This isn't going to be hard at all, is it, Tom? He sympathizes with you and you've convinced him he deserves the job. So there are no hard feelings, are there, Tom? That's it. Take him in for a drink. Then suggest the ride home. The train passes that crossing at 6.30, so don't dawdle over your drinks. Here's looking at you, Charlie. Best of luck. Thanks, Tom. (coughs) Oh, uh, that could be a bad habit. Let me buy you one. Oh, it's almost six. I really... Oh, come on. Don't make me hang around here alone waiting for that train. Tell you what. I'll let you buy me a drink if you let me drive you home. Well, that's darn decent of you. You're getting the worst of the bargain, though. Not at all. It's a pleasure. Take you right to your door. It's only a few blocks out of the way. So you have your drinks and get into the car with Charlie. Drive out of the lot, through town, and out onto the highway. If you time it right, you'll arrive at the crossing just at 6.30. If the train is on time, the signals will be going, and you'll have to stop the car. It'll be easy to tap Charlie over the head with a wrench you have in the side pocket. Then you can get out, set the gears, and run the car in front of the train. It's the same train you take when you go home evenings without your car. So you'll just climb aboard in the excitement and go on home. When the story comes out, you'll just say that Charlie wanted to borrow your car for the evening and you let him, seeing as how he was a good and close friend of yours. Can't tell you how grateful I am, old man. I've gotten to hate that train trip. Forget it. Maybe we can fix it so you won't ever have to take the train. Oh, that'll be fine. Oh, 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 those drinks made me sleepy. We have another 30 minutes of driving to do. Why don't you take a little nap? Yeah, yeah. I think I will, if you don't mind. Not at all. You just take a little nap. This is even easier than you figured it, isn't it, Tom? He's sleepy from the drinks, and he dozes right off. Now you won't have to tap him with a wrench. You drive at normal speed, and soon the railroad crossing is just ahead of you. No sign of the train yet. Maybe it was early tonight, Tom. Maybe the train has already gone past the crossing. 
No. There's the signal. The train has passed the far curve. It's coming. Everything is in your favor now. Charlie is sleeping soundly. The road is empty of cars. And the railroad was kind enough to put one of their new automatic signals at the crossing. And here comes the train. But maybe all the noise has awakened Charlie. You get the wrench out of the side pocket just in case and... Charlie? Charlie? He doesn't hear you. He's sound asleep. The train is close enough now. You get out of the car, put it in gear. The car lurches forward, you slam the door. And it's done. Whistler fans, don't look now, but right near your home is one of the sponsors of this program. Yes, I mean your signal gasoline dealer, that friendly station wearing the black circle sign with the big yellow letter spelling signal gasoline. And he's a man you should know these days, not only because he brings you the Whistler, but also because at stations wearing signal's yellow and black circle sign you'll find the West's famous longer mileage gasoline, Signal Go Farther gasoline. And after all, what's more important these days than getting the most miles you can from every gasoline stamp? So make it a point before next week's Whistler broadcast to get acquainted with your Signal gasoline dealer. Prove for yourself what more and more thousands of wise Western drivers are constantly discovering, that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, you did it, Tom Reddick. You've killed Charlie Fremont. He's lying in that flaming wreck that was your automobile. And you hide there in the bushes until it's clear and you can sneak on the train. No one will know. No one saw you. You did it perfectly. But you keep rubbing your ankle, Tom. Does it hurt? Maybe you twisted it, jumping down into the bushes alongside the road. But it'll be all right, won't it? Nothing can go wrong now. The crime is done and done well. It looks clear now. So you decide to run for it to get on the train. Hey, Mac, you hear something? What? I said, did you hear something? Did you hear somebody yell? No, no, come on, Larry. There must have been someone in that car. A car don't run into a train all by itself. Ah, we hit that car awful hard. He must have been thrown clear. I thought I heard him moaning. Take him over there. All right, you look over there. I'll keep looking around here. Well, the guy might still be alive, you know, if he got thrown clear. Oh, why don't you just stop talking so much and look a little bit harder? Oh, you got no sympathy. Guy is probably in great pain if he is still alive, but you don't care. <laughs> hey, Max. Max, I did hear something. Right over here. What are you fellas doing over there? We're looking for the victim. Find him over here. He's over here, Larry. Come on. I just heard something right come here. Come on, come on. They found him. Stop playing hide-and-seek in them bushes. He's over here. Hey, is he still alive? No, he's dead. And no wonder. Take a look at him. You're all right, Tom. They didn't see you. You're still all right. But that fellow they call Larry, the fellow that heard you moan when your ankle was hurt, he might remember it later. So you change all your plans. You try to sneak away, even with a bad ankle. Hey, Max! Max, look, there goes somebody running over that way. Huh? Where? Hey, you're right. Hey, hey, you stop! Hey! Come on, Max, let's catch him. What's he doing around here running? We'll find out. Come on, yeah. after him. Hey, hey, wait a minute, you! Well, he's slipping. Hey, maybe he was in the car, too. Uh, why is he running away? I don't know. We'll ask him when we catch him. Hey, hey, wait a minute, uh, wait a minute. Huh? Hey, what's the matter with you? Can't a guy run if he wants to? Do you have to go running after well, him? Well, maybe he knows something. Knows something about what? Uh, you always make a big mystery about everything. Now, what would he know something about? About the guy that was dead. 
They say a guy that's doing all the running might have had something to do with it. Oh, you sound like a regular detective. Stop with that stuff already. The train's late. Let's go back and help. Wait a minute. I think we ought to catch that running guy. Oh, he's gone. He was probably running because he was late for his dinner. Now, cut it out and let's go back to the wreck. It's still all right, Tom. You got away, but that was awfully close. You hadn't figured on the ankle or a snoopy person. Now you've got to change all your plans. You can't get back to where the train is, and your ankle is swollen from the running you did. But there's a bus stop down the road, and the bus goes right by your house. It's not far to the bus stop. Just walk slowly, and you'll make it all right. There's the bus waiting to leave. You get in and take your seat. Evening, Mr. Reddick. Haven't seen you in a long time. It's all right, Tom. In a few minutes, you'll be home. You forgot, Tom. You can't go right home. The bus has to pass the railroad crossing, too, and the train is at the railroad crossing. You'll have to wait until they get your car off the track. Have to wait a few minutes, folks. Sorry. Hey, Mac. Yeah? What happened? Car ran into the train. They killed the guy driving it. Really? Anybody hurt? I told you. Kill the guy. I mean on the train. Anybody hurt on the train? No. Hey, open the door, will you? Two of us got to go with you and tell the widow what happened. Yeah. Get then. Hey, Max, come on. Okay, okay. Gee, I sure hate to have to tell that dame what happened, Larry. Shouldn't the police or somebody do it? No, it's better we should. It's bad enough what happened without the police going to the house. Well, okay. Get in. Where do you want to go? The name of the deceased was Fremont. Charles Fremont. Lives on North Brookside Avenue. I passed a couple of blocks from there. Awful, ain't it? Ah, well, you know how it is. People don't pay no attention to signals at all. Yeah. It's awful, but serves a guy right for not paying attention. Hey, here's a good seat. Yeah. Hey, buddy, that right? What? I was just telling the driver what a terrible thing it is. Oh, yeah, terrible. Hey, do I know you? Seems like I've seen you somewhere. I, I don't remember. I don't think well, so. Well, I meet a lot of people. I guess no. Did you see the accident? Oh, me? Yeah, I did. I seen the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, right. it was terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, my friend Max here and I were out taking a hike when we saw the accident. It was quite a joke. A guy driving the car. There's a guy I feel sorry for. He was a pretty young guy. Really? Yeah. Maybe uh, 35. Me and Max here are going to tell his wife. I think it's better if we go than if the police were to go. The least you can do, you know. Yeah, it's the least you can do. You know, it's a funny thing. The guy wasn't driving his own car. It was some other guy's car. Yeah, can you imagine letting a guy your car to drive and then he gets killed in it and wrecks your car? Especially now when it's so hard to get cars. Guy named Reddick. Tom Reddick. What? The guy that owned the car. His name was Tom Reddick. Yeah, we're going to tell him too. Okay, folks, all clear. Here we go. That's not good, Tom. Things are piling up. Things you hadn't counted on. This man saw you running away, and now he's going to tell Charles Fremont's wife that he's dead. And then he's going to look for you to tell you your car has been wrecked. Why do some people always have to butt in, making you change plans? You've got to get out of that bus and get away. Get home before this Larry does, and some way get Hazel out of the house so that there'll be no one home. When Larry gets there. Beachwood, Beachwood Avenue. Good night, Mrs. Nelson. I'll get out here, too. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Reddick. I forgot you were here. That's all right. Excuse me, I'm late. It's awful about Mr. Freeman. Awful. Good night. Hey, driver, just a minute. Hey, what'd you call that guy? Mr. Reddick? Reddick, yeah. Hey, what's his face name? I don't know. Why? That car was owned by a guy named Reddick, that's why. Hey, stop the bus. Well, what difference does that make? Oh, that's his... Max, come on. Come on, I want to talk to that guy named Reddick. 
Yeah, we gotta tell that woman you said. Where you going now? Guy that just got off was named Reddick. So his name is Reddick. I don't follow you. Oh. Why don't we just go home and forget all about this? It's none of our business anyway. Come on, come on. Don't you understand? I tell this guy all about the accident, who was driving the car, and who owned the car. And he never said anything about his name being Reddick. And the guy that owned that car, his name was Reddick. Didn't say anything, then he's just a guy named Reddick who didn't own the car. Say, what's got into you? Oh. I never thought of that. You mean he could be perhaps Harry Reddick, and he didn't even know this Tom Reddick that owned the car, huh? Yeah, now you're getting smart. It's a fine time to get smart after we get off the bus. Now we gotta walk to the widow's house. Well, while we're walking, we can think of what to say to poor Mrs. Fremont. Ah, that's a terrible thing to happen to a lady, losing her hubby so suddenly. Yeah, but I still don't think this is any of our business. And besides, my missus is going to be awful sore at me coming home so late. Now, look, when you explain to her what you were doing, she'll be very proud of you. Not every man has the heart to do what we're going to do. Yeah, you mean it's not every man who's such a budinsky to do what we're going to do. Ah. We could walk right back to the corner and get right on that bus and go right home. No. I gotta tell the widow what happened. Hey, I know. Now what? Look at that street sign. This here is Hillbrook Street. Oh, that's very nice, I'm sure. Hillbrook Street is where this Reddick guy lives. Tom Reddick. Let's go tell him first what happened to his car, huh? Maybe he can help us tell Mrs. Fremont. He must know her husband, her dead husband, must have been a friend to borrow the car. Yeah, in fact, maybe he'll go tell her and we can go home. Yeah, now let me see. This house is number 479. Uh, what number that guy say he lives oh, at? Oh, I don't remember. Why don't we just forget all about it, Larry? Why do you want to butt I in? I think it was number 456. Let me see. I wrote it down here. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Number 456. All right, which way do we go? I guess it's down here. Hey, look, that guy up ahead of us has got a bad leg. Oh, you're driving me crazy. Now, what difference does that it make? It don't make no difference. What's the matter with you? Can't I remark to a friend that a guy up ahead has a bad leg? Oh, you're always remarking something. Sometimes I wish you'd shut up. Max, that's not nice. Well, I do. Here's 460. Hey, look, the guy with the bad leg, he's finally home. See? He's turning into the house down there. Yeah, but he's not going in, see? Hey, he just stopped to look at the number. Hey, that's that other Reddick guy, the one on the bus. Well, he's not going in that house, and that's number 456. Yeah, it is. Well, I hope they got insurance on their car. That was close, Tom. You saw them just in time. So you just kept walking until they go in the house, and then you come back and wait for them to leave. They'll tell Hazel all about it. And after they leave, you can go in. Tell her you loaned the car to Charles Fremont and came home on the streetcar and bus. You're late because the bus got stopped at the crossing. You had no idea that your car was the one wrecked by the train or that Charles Fremont was dead. Now those men are coming out of your house. Keep back and they won't see you behind the hedge. That was a real nice lady. She was upset. Well, of course she was upset. You know, it makes me feel kind of silly talking to people I don't even know. Well, it's a good thing we did. We might have gone right over to the widow's house. Hey, which way did she say it was a police station? Four blocks to the left. We better hurry. Yeah. The police station. Why are they going to the police station? What did they talk to Hazel about? Who are those two men, Tom, and why do they keep following you? Better hurry in the house, Tom, and see what was said. Hazel? Hazel, I'm home. Well, it's about time. Where have you been? Dinner's burned to a crisp, and it cost 30 red now, points. Now, don't start screaming again. I got stuck on the bus. There was an accident at the railroad crossing. Who are those men I saw leaving the house? So you lent your car to Charlie Fremont. You won't let me drive because you don't think I'm careful enough. But you lent the car to Charlie Fremont. How'd you know? Who are those two men that... That accident you saw from the bus, that was your car. Charlie Fremont had an accident in your car and got killed at that railroad crossing. What? Well, I had no idea that... Well, he did. What you loan it to him for? I can understand you're driving him home if you want to, but what you loan him the car for? You were coming home and he was coming home. Why'd you come home together? He told me he was going over to the other side of town to see a customer. How did I know he was going to come right home? Let me smell your breath. What? You had a few drinks, didn't you? I thought you had. 
You and that Charlie Fremont. You just stop and have a cocktail before dinner and keep the dinner waiting until it's not fit to eat. Then come home and tell me some fantastic story about loaning the car to Charlie Fremont. What are you talking about? Those men over here. They asked me if we had any relatives living around us. I told them the only relative we had was my sister in California. That it must have been you they talked with on that bus. Maybe you can fool some people, but you can't fool me. I know you, Tom Reddick. You were in that car, and you got scared because you were both drunk. I told you I lent Charlie the car. How many times do I have to tell you I lent Charlie the car? Those two men told me about you. They saw you there at the railroad crossing. One of those men talked to you on the bus, and you made believe you'd never seen him before. Made believe you didn't even know people named Charlie Fremont and Tom Reddick. You're just a good-for-nothing drunk, and I wish I never married you. Look, look, Hazel, there's no sense in getting upset about this. Sure, I was in the car. We had a couple of drinks in town before coming home. Charlie insisted on it. I got scared when we had the accident, so I ran. You're not going to go and tell, now, are you? I most certainly am. I never did like Charlie Fremont. And his wife. That no good. Calling me up in the middle of the afternoon to crow over me. Mrs. Fremont called you up? To crow over me. Bragging about how her Charlie got your job away from you. He takes your job away from you, so you go and have a drink with him to celebrate. Stop it! What's the matter with you? Aren't you ever happy? Don't you have any feeling toward me at all? What's that? I'm sure I don't know. It's the doorbell. Answer it. I'm not home. Don't you dare order me around, you drunk. Don't you dare even talk to me. Shut up. Yes? Uh, good evening. We thought that... Hey, Max. It's the guy. Yeah, maybe you were right. What do you want here? Who are you? Hey, now, look, Mr. Reddick. Why didn't you tell us on the bus who you were? We were just trying to help you. It's none of your business who I am. Now, get out of here. No, no, no. Take it easy, Mr. Reddick. Somebody has to do these unpleasant things, and me and Max here thought we would. The least you can do. He was in that car. I told you he was. Hazel, so shut up. I will not shut up. You were in that car. You told me you were. You're so smart. Having a drink with a man who takes your job away from you. Mr. Reddick lost his job? Oh, gee, I'm sorry Mr. to hear Mr. Fremont that. got his job, so he had a drink with him to celebrate. And then they were drunk and had that accident. Wait a minute. You mean, you mean that Mr. Fremont got Mr. Reddick's job away from him? And they had some drinks together, and then they were both in the car when I hit the train? Sure they were. Only Mr. Reddick ran away. Maybe he ran away because... Hey, wait a minute. Max, Max, he's trying to... Whatever. Get him, Max. He can't run far. He's got a bum ankle. Yeah, yeah, okay. There he goes down the lawn. Follow him, Max. Hey, look. Look, he fell. Leave me alone. Uh, Leave uh, me alone. I'm sorry, Mr. Reddick, but I think we'd better take you to the police station. I think you murdered Mr. Fremont. <laughs> Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to make clear just what we mean by the more conscientious service your car gets from a signal gasoline dealer. For example, take Larry Duty's signal gasoline station in Oakland, California. While checking your water and oil, Larry's also busy making sure that excessive grease and corrosion isn't clogging your cooling system or that a loose or fraying fan belt isn't about to give you trouble, or that acid corrosion isn't eating your battery cables. And while he's testing your tires, he's on the alert for any little breaks in the rubber that could spread and ruin the tire. What's more, there's a good reason why you'll find these, plus many more unasked-for extras, not only at Larry Duty's signal station in Oakland, but right at your own neighborhood signal dealer. You see, being in business for himself your signal dealer will go out of his way to keep you pleased so that you remain his regular customer. You can prove this for yourself by looking up the station in your neighborhood wearing Signal's black and yellow circle sign. And there never was a more important time to do this than now, when your car needs Signal's more thorough service to help it last out the duration. And now, back to the Whistler. <laughs> Well, Tom, you bungled your perfect plan, didn't you? But then you never were any good at planning. That's why Charlie got ahead of you. And of course, you let the little man who was always butting in make you so nervous that you gave yourself away. But when you got to the police station, you really thought fast for once. You kept your mouth shut and let them believe what they wanted to. Your wife's story helped. 
You were drunk. The accident happened. You weren't hurt. But you got scared and ran away. Maybe they'll believe that. And all you'll get will be a few years for manslaughter. Maybe they'll believe it. But even as you think it, you know very well they won't. The motive is too apparent. Charlie got your job, so you killed him. No, Tom. You won't get away with it. And so as you sit in your cell and brood over the fate that awaits you, you make up your mind. And you start resolutely into action. The small barred window is high over your head. And as you strain, you think of that little man who was always butting in. The little man who caused all your troubles. And you can almost hear his voice. Sure, sure, we know. We'll only be a minute. We got something very important to tell him. Ready, Kerr. Huh? Well, he's in 214. Boy, he'll really be glad to see us. Yeah, you bet. We just came to your topsy. The coroner's a topsy. We got news for Mr. Reddick. Yeah? What kind of news? Well, there was something fishy about the accident where Mr. Fremont got killed. They had an autopsy. Yeah, and, and they found out something. They don't really have anything on Mr. Reddick. They're going to let him go. Yeah, let him go? Sure, and we came right over to tell him. When they had the autopsy, they found Mr. Fremont wasn't murdered at all. He was dead when the train hit the car. He wasn't supposed to drink, and he died of a heart attack 20 minutes before the accident while he was still riding in the car. No kidding? Well, he'll be glad to hear that. Here's his... Hey! Hey, Mr. Reddick! Well, what do you know about that? Mr. Reddick went and hung himself. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The curious story of a friendly case of blackmail. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Bruce Elliott, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Escape to Danger. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadow. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. To Frederick Pontiac, an American citizen caught in Germany by the war, death came slowly and painfully, of starvation and torture in a cellar of a Nazi prison camp. But death was not the end for Frederick Pontiac. It was the beginning of a new and bizarre chapter. For he died only a few days too early. And his body was hardly cold before his captors saw the handwriting on the wall. Put there by Allied Shell. Yes, the Nazis' hours were numbered. And they all knew. And that was when a plan was hatched in the brain of Commander Ernst von Muller, commandant of the prison, 
A man high on the list of war criminals. Where is the man, Doctor? In the cellar. He died last night. I think he'll do. I must look at him first. We will have to hurry. The American swine will be here soon. They are storming the hill now. Yeah, yeah. You have the dossier on... Uh, what's the man's name, Doctor? Pontiac. Friedrich Pontiac. Yeah, I have it. Friedrich Pontiac. Yeah. Friedrich Pontiac. This one is Friedrich Pontiac. See? Nein, nein. He was an old man. But see, Commander, the bone structure, the hair and eyes. Of course, he is very thin now. And he has aged. But you will see by the dossier he is but 40. Your age. And you will see by the photograph and the dossier there is a striking resemblance to yourself. You won't need to change your face, Herr Commandant. Let me see the dossier, Doctor. Here. Thank you. Friedrich Pontiac, born Zurich, Switzerland, 1905. Attended school in Geneva, 1911 to 1918. Emigrated to America in 1918 with his parents and attended school in New York in 1918 to 1924. Hmm. In 1926, he became United States citizen. He went to work in his father's drugstore until 1928. When his father died and the business was sold from 1928 to 1932... He did various odd jobs. In 1933, he entered Germany. Mm-hmm. He spoke German well. Mm-hmm, that's good. In English with an accent. Good. The Fatherland made use of him in the chemical factory in Berlin, where his work was unsatisfactory. He drank too much. Mm. And had fits of melancholia. This became worse until in 1941, he was of no further use to us. And so was sentenced for inefficiency to hard labor here at this camp. Excellent, Herr Doctor, excellent. I think it will work. I will have to attend to the fingerprints, Herr Commandant. <coughs> it uh, may be rather painful for you. I understand, Herr Doctor. It does not matter. From now on, I shall be Frederick Pontiac, American citizen. <laughs> Question. How many times do you have to see a thing before you remember it? Well, here's an interesting test for you Whistler fans to check up on your alertness and memory. Time and again, probably right in your own neighborhood, you've seen and read the big trademark that identifies signal gasoline dealers who bring you the Whistler. But test yourself. Can you remember that trademark well enough to describe it now? Well, think a moment. Do you visualize a big black circle sign with yellow letters spelling signal gasoline? And in the center, a traffic signal reading go, reminding you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. That yellow and black circle sign is a mighty good sign to keep in mind these days, because with gasoline mileage still an important factor in today's driving, signal go farther gasoline offers your best way to get most miles per ration coupon. So next time you invest one of your gas stamps, try Signal Gasoline. Prove in your own car what more and more wise Western drivers are discovering. That you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. So Frederick Pontiac, dead in a Nazi prison, is born again. And Commander Ernst von Muller, Nazi war criminal, is no more. He commands the last desperate defense of the prison. Just long enough for the mutilation of his fingerprints. It's a painful operation, but it's worth it, von Muller. Or should I say Pontiac? Because now, when the Americans arrive and find you lying among all your dead companions... Your mutilated fingers make the picture all the more convincing. And in an almost unbelievably short time, you're standing on the dock in New York. Everything's been perfect so far. No one suspected you. They hardly even questioned you back in Germany. If you can just get through the customs men. 
Frederick Pontiac? Yes, sir. I'm Frederick Pontiac. Relax. There's no need to click your heels here. You're in America now, back home. Hmm. Silly of me. Forgive me. It's been a long time. You look very pale. What's the matter? Are you frightened? Sea voyages disagree with me. I think it's perhaps seasickness. Take it easy. We all know how much you've been through. We want to make things as easy as possible for you. Thank you. Uh, why do you want me? It's only that your passport has expired. You'll have to fill out this form. Oh, I see you can't. Your hands are injured. Very well, just answer the questions. I'll write them in. Frederick Pontiac, age? Frederick Pontiac, born 1905, May 16th. Attended school in Switzerland, 1911 to 1918. Came to America... Oh, wait a minute. One at a time. First, where were you born? Zurich, 1905, May 16th. 16th. Your father's name, nationality? Um... Franklin Pontiac, American. Mother's name and nationality? Maiden name. Uh, Sarah Smith, Swiss. Where'd you attend school? Geneva and New York. The names of the schools and how many years in high school and what grades, please? What grades? I don't remember now. You will have to excuse me. I have a se severe migraine headache. All right, then. You just sign it or just make a mark. It'll be all right. Just sign here. Uh, yeah. That's it. Thank you. Take it and best of luck to you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, just a minute. Where's your luggage? You've got to have it inspected for the customs. I don't have any. Just the clothes on my back. Oh, all right. I'll fill out your papers. Make a cross here where it says to sign. Yes, thank you very oh, much. That's nothing. Glad to help. Good luck to you. Thank you. Pardon me, sir. Aren't you Frederick Pontiac? Oh, yes. My name is Mitchell, Mr. Pontiac. How do you do? Glad to meet you uh, at last. Yes? Uh, I'm sorry to have to give you this after all you've been through, but uh, can't be helped. What is it? I, I can't open it. Oh, well, um, uh, suppose we step over here a moment? Um, my hands. Uh... It's a court order, Mr. Pontiac. I'm Mrs. Pontiac's lawyer. When you deserted her in 1933, she got a divorce. You owe $12,000 back alimony to my client. Like I say, I'm sorry about greeting you back home with this, but <laughs> that's my business. $12,000? But that's impossible for me to pay. Oh, come, come, Mr. Pontiac. Don't let's have trouble. We've been nice about this. We never slapped a lien on your bank like Mrs. Pontiac wrote you we had. We want to do things right by you. So, uh, what do you say? We get in my car and run over to the bank, and get that safe deposit box out, and you pay off like a gentleman. Safe deposit box at my bank? Yes, I know you're a little secret. You can't fool me, Pontiac. I know about the money you have in the state and county bank on 84th Street. Yes, Mr. Pontiac, I found out about that. Oh, my, my wife told you. <laughs> Shall we say trade secrets and that a little birdie whispered it to me? But you don't have to worry about me. No, just so long as I get my fee and the money for my client. Now, what do you say we run over to 84th Street right now? Very well. <laughs> minute you thought you were found out. But no, Mitchell thinks you are, Pontiac. So you enter the lawyer's long, sleek black sedan and settle back in the soft upholstery. You ought to be happy, Von Muller. This man you have so cunningly changed places with has money in the bank that he kept secret. Isn't that fortunate? Why are you so worried as you drive to 84th Street? Could it be the wife you didn't know about? And as you stand in the magnificent, opulent interior of the bank manager's office, why do you feel the butterflies fluttering in your stomach and a panicky urge to escape? Good afternoon, gentlemen. This is Mr. Frederick Pontiac, Mr. Crane. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Pontiac? Mr. Pontiac has a safe deposit box here. Been here since 1933. Been in Europe since that date. Had quite an ordeal within a German concentration camp. How dreadful for you, Mr. Pontiac. I've read about these places... Glad you got out all right. Thank you, Mr. Crane. Now that he's back, Mr. Pontiac would like to open his safe deposit box. Oh, certainly. You have the key, Mr. Pontiac? The key? Oh, no. Uh, they took everything from me. Well, do you remember the number? Yes, the number. Uh, uh, you haven't forgotten the number, have you? I'm trying to remember my memories and what it was since... Oh, uh, of course, of course. Well, uh, I can look it up in my file here. Uh, in the meantime, perhaps you'll sign this form? Yes, you see, my hands have been injured, but I'll do the best I can. Oh, yes, I... I see, um... 
Well, uh, uh, have you some other means of identification? You see, I, I wasn't manager here in 33. I, I suppose I could get Miller over. He, he was manager here in 33. He'd remember you. A uh, remarkable memory that man has. Never forgets a face. Nobody could fool him. Uh, just a formality. I... Uh, you have your passport, haven't you, Mr. Pontiac? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, that's enough, isn't it, Mr. Crane? You can check on that. Uh, well, yes, I, I think in this case we can make an exception. Uh, here it is. Uh, uh, <coughs> yes, uh, Well, uh, you've aged since this photo was taken, haven't you? It's an old photo, <laughs> yes. Well, that seems all in order. I think you can have your deposit box, Mr. Pontiac. It's uh, number 173. Will you step this way, please? Thank you. Here it is. One seventy-three. Ah, there you are. Let me know when you're finished. Thank you. Mm-hmm. $150,000. All in thousand-dollar bills. Uh, suppose I take the 12000 while you have it handy? Very well. Here's 12000 Mm-hmm. And the matter of my fee, Mr. Pontiac? How much? Uh, five grand. Five grand? Yeah, five thousand dollars. Uh, I know it's expensive, but I'm a good man. You know, I can keep my mouth shut. Uh, count it yourself. Uh, my hands hurt. Okay. One... Two, three, four, five, and one for luck. Thank you, Mr. Pontiac. Now, uh, can I drive you anywhere? Uh, where are you staying? Uh, thank you, yes. Any good hotel will do. I've had a rather trying day. Well, how about the Continental Plaza? Nice view of the park, swell bar, good restaurant. Yes, yes. Uh, that will do satisfactorily, I'm sure. Uh, it has been a very hard day. That will be good for rest. Very good. Look, uh, Mr. Pontiac, uh, I'll give you a tip. Yes? Don't stay in town too long. It might be unhealthy for you. Uh, what do you mean, unhealthy? You haven't forgotten Lucky Chandler, have you? Huh? Lucky Chandler? Oh, yes, yes, Chandler. Yeah, Lucky Chandler. Lahef hasn't forgotten. As soon as he hears you're in town, he'll pay you a visit. If you oh, me. yes, yes, the hit. Yes. Your arrival, it was in the papers this evening. Um, how do you mean, uh, pay me a visit? Uh, unhealthy for me? Uh, Forget it, chum. It was just a hint. You know me. I can keep my mouth shut. I don't want any trouble. Yes, I, I see. But you don't see, do you, Herr von Muller? You don't know who these men are, the hip and lucky Chandler. What does Mitchell mean, unhealthy? You don't know, do you? But you're too tired to worry now. So you go to your hotel suite and fall into a fitful sleep. And in the morning? How can that be? Yes? What is it? Good morning, Mr. Pontiac. I was calling to let you know your wife is on her way up to your room. My wife? Yes, sir. Mrs. Pontiac is on her way up. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Gloria, your ex-wife. Remember me? You can't come in. Oh, Freddy, don't be silly. I only wanted to say hello and take a look at you. Get away. I order you out. I just wanted to say I'm sorry about the Mitchell greeting you with the court order. It wasn't my idea. Out, I say. Get out. I don't want to speak with you. I don't want to see you. Get out. Now, look, Freddy, don't push me. I, I said get to... out. And stay away from me. Well, what's the matter with you? Are you sick? Change. Go away. All right. I'll be back, Freddy. Worry about you. Emma rushes me back. Yes. What is it, please? That you, Pontiac? Yes. This is Lahef. Your pal, Lahef. Hello. How are you? What the devil do you care how I feel, you double crossing rat? You gonna come across with the dough? Or do you want me to take it out of your hide? And then refresh the cop's memory about Chandler's death. About Chandler's death? Yeah, you don't think they've forgotten, do you? Sure, 12 years is a long time, but not long enough. What do you want from me? My cut. 75,000 leaves of best lettuce. I'll be around for it at noon. 
You see, you have it there. Hello. 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 Refresh the cop's memory about Chandler's death. Got him, Himmel. Pontiac killed him. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Pontiac was a murderer. Now, I'm Pontiac. <laughs> well, what are you going to do now, Von Muller? In America, murder carries a death penalty. And you just escaped from that. You were rather clumsy the way you got rid of Pontiac's wife. You must be more careful how you deal with Lehiff. He must be gotten rid of also. He is a very real danger to you, Von Muller. So you work out a plan quickly. You go out to the drugstore, purchase some rat poison and some liquor. When you get back, you mix a drink and wait for Lehiff. It's noon now. And you look from the window across Central Park and watch the traffic creeping below and wait. You know it won't be long now. Come in. Good morning, Mr. Lehiff. Never mind the formalities, Pontiac. What's the idea of having a blinds drawn? Oh, you'll excuse it, I'm sure. I have a severe headache. I can imagine. Oh, will you join me in a little drink? It's a long time since we met. Let's stall it, Pontiac. I came for my money. Hand it over. Oh, of course. Here you are. I have it ready for you. Count it. I won't bother to count it. It better be right. There's one dollar missing. Oh, I wouldn't take that chance. Hey, here's a brandy and soda. Come, let's drink to the future and let bygones be bygones. I wouldn't drink with you. All I want from you is what I have coming, nothing else. Goodbye, Mr. Double Cross Pontiac. But wait, wait, please. <laughs> You're slipping, Ernst. Things aren't going exactly right, are they? You had him right in your net. And then he walked out with the bait. And now what? Pontiac double-crossed him. Maybe now he'll double-cross Pontiac. You. He didn't go to the police before because he wanted the money. But now, he may be on his way there now. You've got to do something. Quick, Ernst von Muller. Hurry. Look in the phone book. Then call. My name is Pontiac, Frederick Pontiac. I want a seat on the plane to Argentina as soon as possible. I have to get there at once. It's very urgent. Yes, sir. Travel's pretty heavy, but I think we can arrange that. Do you have your visa? Visa? No. Get me one. That takes about one month, sir. Well, Mexico. Do I need a visa for Mexico? No, sir. Not if you're a citizen of the United States, are you? Of course I'm a citizen. Well, we can arrange that if your passport is in order. It's, uh, it's run out. They are sending me a new one. You should wait until you receive the new one. How long will it be before they send it to me? About a month as a rule. Can't I go without and they send it on to me? Mm, yes, that could be arranged, I think. I'll call you back when I've made inquiries, Mr. Pontiac. The wait is not long, but you fidget nervously through it. Then suddenly everything's all right again. They've reserved you a place on the Mexico plane. You'll have plenty of time to make it to the airport. And still the police haven't arrived. You hurry downstairs. Step up to pay your bill. Here, miss, I telephone. You have my bill ready? Uh, yes, Mr. Pontiac. Twenty-seven fifty-five. Mm, you keep the change, miss. Oh, thank you, Mr. Pontiac. Um... Those two men by the door, they're detectives. They were just asking about you. Detectives? Asking about me? Yes, sir. Is my taxi here yet? Uh, no, sir. Good evening, sir. Lahip has told the police. Yes, he's told them about Pontiac. But they won't stop you now. You've come too far to be caught. You only have to lose those detectives. And then Mexico City. You'll be free, able to start all over again without Pontiac's stupid involvements. Shouldn't be hard. There must be a way. You can't stay here to die for Pontiac's crime. Hurry, Ernst. Hurry. <laughs> But 
these men are worse than your Gestapo, aren't they? Uh, you try everything you can think of. Taking a taxi cab, switching cabs, doubling back, ducking into a movie theater and out a back entrance. But they're still there. You go down into the subway, try to lose them in the crowd. They're still following you. You can't get rid of them. And suddenly the panic begins to grow. It's almost time for the plane to leave. You've got to get to the airport. Maybe you can lose them there. Maybe. Frederick Pontiac? Yes, yes, that's my name. All right, sir, your reservation is in order. Now, if you'll leave your bag here, we'll check it. I'll just carry it with me. Oh, I'm afraid we'll have to weigh it anyway. You may as well leave it here. There'll be a short wait before you can board the plane. A wait? Yes, sir. We'll call you when it's ready. Wait. But you don't want to wait, do you, Ernst? There are those two men over there. You have to get on the plane and get away. But you know down in your heart that you never will. They're just waiting for that. As you step up to board the plane, they'll arrest you, Ernst. You know that. You're trapped, Ernst. You walk down to the washroom trying to think of something to do. But you can't. You know you're trapped. You escaped from Germany in trial as a war criminal. And now you're going to have to stand trial as a murderer. Might have been a lot easier the other way. You know what they do to murderers here. You might have escaped that over there. Yes, that's it. Of course. And so, as you look up into the mirror and see the two men enter the washroom, you know, finally, what to do. Look, you. You men are following me. Yeah? What about it? And I know why. But you're wrong. You'll never hang me for that murder. Murder? What's he talking Wait. about? No. No, you don't trick me that way. You know what I'm talking about. But you will never convict me of a murder. Because you're after the wrong man. I am not Frederick Pontiac. No. No. No, no. You must believe me. I'm not Frederick Pontiac. Then who are you? I'm Ernst von Miller. Commander Ernst von Miller of the German Navy. I escaped from Germany as Frederick Pontiac. But Frederick Pontiac is dead. You... You don't believe me. But you must. Take me to the military authorities. The federal police. But not... Not for murder. I'm only an escaped prisoner of war. I can prove it, I'm sure. Yeah? Okay, brother. You just might be telling the truth. Maybe you'd better come along with us. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, if your car is beginning to look and feel its age, did you know that down at your neighborhood signal station there's a veritable fountain of youthful ideas, a line of products for bringing back your car's sparkle and pep? For instance, Whiz Motor Rhythm actually dissolves carbon binder, thus freeing sticky valves and rings and giving you a cleaner motor that runs smoother and quieter and uses less gas. Then there's radiator cleaner and conditioner that removes clogging sludge, rust, and scale from your radiator, putting your cooling system in shape for hottest summer driving. And your signal dealer's famous Venus Auto Polish cleans and waxes in one easy operation, bringing back new car luster and color while it protects the finish. But these are just three of your signal dealer's many car pepper-uppers. Next time you stop at one of the friendly stations displaying Signal's yellow and black circle sign, why not look over the rest of his fine quality automotive accessories? Each plays a part in your Signal gasoline dealer's complete service to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Ernst von Muller, you gave yourself up. Yes, you'll go back to Germany to stand trial as a war criminal. And when you read the newspapers about the fate of other commandants of German prison camps, you wonder if perhaps you didn't make the wrong choice. 
You might have been even more sure of it if you could have heard a certain telephone conversation the day you were captured. Miss Reagan, Mrs. Pontiac, this oh. is Reagan. Oh, the private detective I hired. Yes. I've got plenty to report, Mrs. Reagan. We tailed your husband like you asked us to. You were right. Oh, yes? Yeah, there was something screwy about him. He wasn't your husband at all. What? And we tailed him to the airport. He was just about to leave for Mexico. What? I'll never know why he didn't. That would have been the end of our case. But just before the plane was to leave, he surrendered himself to us. Well, who could it have been? He, he was some like... German Navy officer, escaped and masquerading as your husband. Did he say anything about my husband? Yes. He said Mr. Pontiac died in his prison camp. So that's it. Yeah. Now, the thing I'll never be able to figure out was he kept talking about a murder. What? Said we wouldn't pin a murder rap on him because he wasn't Pontiac. You know what he was talking about? I have no idea. Uh, I haven't either. I thought the only thing Pontiac was mixed up in was that racetrack scandal back in 1933 when Le Hef went to prison for poisoning a horse. The odds on derby favorite, Lucky Chandler. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of signal, gasoline, and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by James Sussex, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking. And suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Murder is Blind. I am The Whistler, and I know many things. For I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Most people are blind. Yes, they're blind to the shortcomings of someone close to them. Someone sometimes to their own. That was the way with the three women who lived in the old Hopkins house on the hill. Three very different women. But all of them blind to the characters of the others. There was Lorna Hopkins, mistress of the house. Warm, sincere Lorna. Happy in her coming marriage to Gregory. There was Patsy Hopkins, Lorna's cousin. Whose only happiness is in herself, her youth, her loveliness. And old Fräulein, the old German housekeeper who has been Patsy's governess. And who had found happiness in serving her with years of devotion. None of them really knew the others. All of them were a little blind. That is, until it happened. It started the night Patsy was helping Lorna with her hair. There. That's finished. Fräulein can help you with the rest. Now what? Gregory. He's waiting in the living room. 
do keep him company like a good girl, Patsy. Oh, really, Lorna? It's a bit tiresome playing substitute. Besides, he doesn't want to see me. Of course he does. Be an angel and try to keep him consoled till I get dressed. Listen. Greg playing the phonograph? To Sally Serenade. Lovely, isn't it? Is it? Greg once said it was a musical description of me. <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> he can say such nice things. Oh, look, Patsy, I'm not nearly ready. Do run down and pay the poor man a little attention like a good girl. Oh. You're pretty sure of yourself. Sure about what, Pat? Nothing. I'll go. Hello, Patsy. Oh, don't get up, Greg. Lorna's still dressing. In the meantime, I'm supposed to entertain you. <laughs> you always have. Thanks. You're leaving for New York soon, aren't you? Yeah, in a few days. Mother wants me to handle some of her affairs. I'll be back after a while. For Lorna? Oh, of course. We expect to be married in Mother's home, you know. After that, the honeymoon. Some place in the North Woods. Some place where we can be together, far away from everybody. <laughs> What a picture. How beautifully sentimental. Do you know, my dear, you're beginning to tire me dreadfully. I, I've suspected that before. What's the matter with us, Patsy? Is there something the matter? Oh, we used to get along together so well. Lately, we, we don't seem to understand each other at all. Shall we talk about something else? No. Something's come between us. Ever since I became engaged to Lorna. That has nothing to do with it. Well, of course not, but what is it, Pat? What's going on, anyway? Nothing, I tell you. I, I... Oh, for heaven's sake, stop that thing. Take that sickening record off. Well, sure, sure, Pat. I, I always thought you liked it. Turn it off! Greg. Yes? I want you to do something for me. Sure. Anything. I want you to go back to New York. Well, but I am, Pat. I'm leaving toward the end of the month. I mean now. Today. Today? Yes. Well, what's the matter, Patsy? Don't you even like me anymore? Like you? Oh, why, you fool, I love you. What? From the first day we met. Haven't you seen it? This is incredible. You can't mean this. I never meant anything more in my life. I know I'm shameless, Greg, but I can't help it. Greg. What about Lorna? Oh, Lorna will never make you happy, never. She's good and sweet and kind, but goodness and sweetness can be tiresome. Yes, and kindness, too. I know Lorna, Greg, and I know you. In a year, you'd grow to hate her. Please, Pets, please, you mustn't say these things. But it's true. I've got to say these things. Don't you see, my darling? I'm, I'm thinking of your happiness. Yes, and Lorna's, too. And you? And of mine. I have the right to think of mine, haven't I, Greg? We needn't hurt Lorna too much. You'd go away, go back to New York, and, and after a while, six months, I'd come to you. Hmm. And, uh, Lorna? She would have forgiven me? When she saw we were happy, what else could she do? Oh, Patsy, I'm trying hard to believe that you can't mean all this. Oh, but I do, I do. I love you, Greg. I love you so much that you must know it, feel it. Then I'm sorry for you. I can't tell you how sorry. It's Lorna. There can't be anyone else that never will be. Oh, but you don't love her. You can't love her. You love me. You you do. I know you do. Oh, Greg, my Stop darling. Stop it. Do you think for a minute I'd give up Lorna for you? Oh, Greg. She doesn't deserve this kind of deal from your Patsy. She's taken you into our home. For years, she's cared for you like a sister. What? Oh, it's cheap. Oh, don't, please. Put your arms around me. Greg, I'm right. I know I'm right. You slapped me. Yes. So? Now listen, Patsy. You listen to me. Yes? This is important. Remember it. Yes? You'll never marry Lorna. Do you understand? No. 
If I can't have you, she'll not have you. Will you please tell your cousin I'm waiting for her? Remember that, Gregory. Conundrums. We've all played the old game in which someone describes a thing and you guess what it is. For example, someone says, It's round, it's black, and it has big yellow letters on it, spelling something that helps your car go farther. Well, of course, you Whistler fans know, that signals yellow and black circle sign, which identifies the friendly signal gasoline dealers who bring you this program. And friends... In today's game of trying to make ration gasoline go farther, remembering that signal sign is your surest way to win most miles per gas stamp. You see, in keeping with its 14-year tradition of quality, Signal Oil Company is still bringing you the very finest gasoline that can be marketed under wartime conditions. And the famous signal formula still places the emphasis on mileage. So to stretch those gas stamps, try signal in your car. Prove for yourself that it's not just a slogan, it's a fact. You do go farther with Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. Gregory would be difficult, that he would reject your love, did you? You were sure that he would fall just as all the other men in your life had fallen. But that's the way things go, Patsy. The one you really want is always the one who doesn't respond. And now as you lie in your lonely room, your thoughts aren't very pleasant, are they? You are sleeping, Miss Patricia? No, Fraulein. Come in if you wish. I've come to see what it is that's making my little girl unhappy. There is something, isn't there, yes? Unhappy? Why do you think that, Fräulein? Fräulein can always tell. What is it, my baby? Nothing. You're imagining things. So? Ah, you are so much like your mother. One minute laughing and gay, her eyes shining, and the next, poof, when she becomes sad. Was she really very pretty? Pretty and clever. And sometimes unhappy like you. Often she thought your papa didn't love her. She only knew, really knew, when it was almost too late. When she was dying? Yes. Then your papa almost went crazy. He hadn't paid attention to her headaches. He thought she was pretending them to get sympathy. But later on, when she became blind... Poor mother. Brain tumor must be a horrible thing. She didn't suffer too greatly. Headaches, yes. And her eyes became so big, so staring. The pupils so dilated. And father? He went all to pieces. Cried just like a little boy. Your mama died happy. For toward the end, she knew how much he really loved her. He really did love her. Till the day he died. Oh, I've upset you talking about your mama. No, Fraulein, I'm glad. I'm glad you told me. What's in your mind now, Patsy? Why do you leave your bed, go to the dressing table, and stare deeply, searchingly into its mirror? Your eyes slowly widen and you shudder a little bit. After a while, you return to your bed, and your eyes hold a curious, furtive expression, as though, Patsy, you were hiding a guilty secret. And in the days that follow... I've kept you waiting, haven't I, Greg? I'm sorry, really. Oh, forget it. Anything the matter? Mm, nothing serious. I've been upstairs comforting Patsy. Patsy? Poor girl, she's having such a headache. <laughs> I know, Greg. That's why I called you. I'd counted on seeing you, too. But Patsy has a splitting headache. We'll make it tomorrow, shall we? It's Patsy again, Greg. I'm sorry. I'll call you later. There is something. 
something the matter with Patsy, Greg. I'm sure of it. These pains, these spells of dizziness, they worry me. Ah, I can see that. But don't you think you're inclined to exaggerate her condition? After all, everybody has headaches, you yes, know? Yes, I know, but not like Patsy's. They're doing something terrible to her. She looks badly, Greg. Her eyes seem so strange. I... I don't like it. This is something new, then? Her eyes, yes. But her headaches, well... She told me she's been having them for weeks. She said nothing because she didn't want to worry me. I see. These attacks, when she has one, she's practically helpless. Oh, she's so dependent on me, Greg. Yes, and always at a time when I want to take you to dinner out of the theater. That's not fair, Greg. Perhaps not, but are you being fair with me? I don't understand. I'm leaving for New York in a day or two, but that seems to make very little difference to you. Oh, that's not true. Let's not quarrel, Gregory. I'm not quarreling. All this nonsense is getting too much for me. If anything was seriously wrong with a girl... I don't think there is. Not as bad as she pretends. Frankly, I think she's putting on an act of some kind. <coughs> What's that? Patsy! Miss Lorna, hurry, come to me, please. What is it, Fräulein? It's Miss Patsy. She can't see. Oh, Miss Lorna, she's blind. Blind. <coughs> And now, Gregory, you're ashamed and remorseful, aren't you? You'd give anything to recall yesterday's words spoken so bitterly to Lorna. Those scornful phrases doubting the sincerity of Patsy's illness. You thought Patsy's headaches were a game, the sort a willful woman might play for sympathy or attention. Didn't you, Gregory? And now, as you look down at her white face and into her tragic, unseeing eyes, a deep wave of sympathy comes over you. You feel helpless in the shocking tragedy before you, don't you, Gregory? There's no fever, Greg. At least that's one thing to be thankful for. She slept a little last night. Didn't you, dear? Toward morning, I did. The pain seemed to go away then. Do I look terrible, Greg? Terrible? Oh, no, you could never look that bad. A little pale, perhaps. Your eyes. Yes, do they pain you? They seem so big, the pupils so dilated. Tell me, what did the doctor say? She won't have a doctor. Fräulein and I are almost crazy. I won't have one. I won't. He'll operate. I know he will. Please, Lorna. I... But we must find out what this condition is. Do be reasonable, dear. Is there anyone in town, a good eye doctor, who'd know about this kind of thing? No, there isn't. There's no one. Now, Patsy, there is one, and you know it. He's considered very fine. I won't have him. He's old and... and oh, you want me to die just like my mother? Don't you care what happens to me? Do you see, Greg? What do you want us to do, Pastor? I don't know. Well, we must do something. I... I thought that... Yes? The best eye doctors. The specialists. Aren't they in the big cities? I thought I... I could go to one of them. Where, Patsy? Isn't New York a kind of medical center? New York? Oh, no, that's impossible. You couldn't leave your job here in town, and I couldn't go alone. What do you think, Greg? Is that what you want, Patsy? Oh, but Lorna's job, she'd lose oh, it. Oh, as if that mattered. There are other jobs, plenty of them. Even if there There's were... There's no necessity for your taking her, Lorna. I'm leaving for New York anyway. Patsy can come right along with me. With you, Greg... Can I? Of course. I'll put you up at Mother's place. Then we'll have the best man in the city come to look at you. Uh, I'd feel better if I went with her. I don't know. Oh, I... There's nothing you could do, Lorna. Don't you see? I suppose so. You could keep me in touch, couldn't you, Greg? Let me know everything. Oh, by long distance every day. You just sit tight and let me handle this. Can you get Patsy ready? Of course. Fraulein will help. It'll take two or three days to make the necessary arrangements. Haven't you both forgotten something? Uh, have I? You and Lorna. Your marriage. Our marriage? You mustn't worry about that, Patsy. That'll keep till you're well again. We can wait, can't we, Greg? Hmm, naturally. Oh, I, I am a nuisance, aren't I? Oh, my eyes. They're starting to hurt again. Oh, do get me some eyes, dear. Uh, I'm sure there's some downstairs. I shan't be long. Greg? Yes? You did forget, didn't you? Forget? About you and Lorna getting married. Did I? You did. You know you did. Suppose I get well, Greg. Well, of course you're going to get well. 
After we arrive in New York, everything's going to be all right. Do you know? I think so, too. Well, Greg, perhaps you're being a little blind, too. You've forgotten Patsy's warning, haven't you? And her helplessness is a rebuke to your conscience, isn't it, Gregory? For you remember, in spite of Lorna's warnings, your indifference to Patsy's repeated headaches. And you know that if this girl dies, nothing can ever be quite the same for you and Lorna. It's imperative that Patsy regain her health not only for her own sake, but for the sake of your marriage as well. And now, after a day spent in making traveling arrangements, you return to the house with Lorna. We're home early, Lorna. Yes, I know. It's nearly seven. Patsy doesn't expect us back for a couple of hours yet. It must be very quiet. Think she's sleeping? I hope so. She promised me she'd try. After a while, I'll go up and peek in at her. Oh, dear, I would forget... I meant to bring Fraulein something from the corner drugstore. Oh, want me to go for you? No, I'll go. I know what she wants. You stay here. I'll only be a few minutes. Mind turning out the lights? Just leave that small one on over by the phonograph. That'll be enough. I'm going to sit over here in the dark and relax. All right. Fine. Hurry back. late to stop now. Greg. Yes. Gullible Greg. Simple, trusting Gregory. I, I, I didn't expect you to see me. Of course you didn't, my dear. That's all very obvious. Shall I leave you with your serenade? Well, this record, I, I, I knew where it was. I know where everything is. I, I, I've lived here so long. Of course. Oh, it's not what you think, Greg. I, I don't have to see to find my way around. Stop I, it, Patsy. Oh, listen to me, Greg. You're I... not blind. You never were. Well? What are you going to do? That's better. Now, will you be good enough to tell me what it was all about? You. Flattering. I made up my mind to have you, Greg. And it didn't make the slightest difference to me how I did it. Not even if it smashed things up for Lorna? That didn't matter. Nothing mattered but you. And what was I to get out of all this? Happiness? I could have made you happy, Greg. I can still make you happy. You? Try me. Give me a chance. Let's go back a bit, shall we? Tell me, how did you expect to fool a clever eye specialist? You must have known he'd find you out. I didn't expect to. No? You see, I had no intention of coming under his care. The important thing was to get you away from Lorna, to have you by myself for a while. After that... Anything could happen? Anything. And now? I've lost. We've all lost. You, Lorna, and I. Oh, you're wrong, Patsy. Lorna and I haven't lost. You see, tomorrow, we'll be married. Tomorrow? If she'll have me, then. No. No, you can't. It's beyond your control now, Patsy. It's beyond anything your selfish mind can trick up. Is it beyond... death? Perhaps my love for you was a selfish thing. But to me, it was everything. Don't you understand, Greg? Nothing will be gained by shooting me, Patsy. If I can't have you, nobody else shall. Remember when I told you that? Don't, for all our sakes. Patsy, what are you doing? Patsy! Greg! Greg! Ah! Yes, Patsy, you did it. You've killed Greg, the only man you ever really loved. You watch, fascinated and horrified, as Lorna drops to the floor beside him, weeping. And you want to tell her it's no use. And now she'll never have him. You're glad, glad. 
You hate Lorna Fessy. You turn all your suppressed grief for yourself into hate for her. Get up. You can't bring him back. What is you doing? It doesn't matter now. Greg. Greg, darling. Don't be an hysterical fool. You've got to help me. Here, take the gun. Take it and hide it, you hear? Oh, God. You want me to go to jail? Don't stop to think. There. Now you must hide it. It must never be found, do you understand? Hide it? But what are you going to do? I heard a noise. Oh, it's Mr. Gregory. He's hurt. Oh, what is it, Lorna? What happened? Tell her, Patsy. You can tell for all right. I? I tell Fraulein? Oh, what is it, Patsy? Oh, but I don't know. I... You don't know? How could I? I, I was in my room. Patsy. Oh, I heard Lorna and Greg downstairs, and their voices sounded strange. Sharp, as, as though they were quarreling. What are you saying, Patsy? It, it frightened me. I, I'd never heard them quarrel before. After a while, I got up and felt my way out of the room down the stairs. I could hear Lorna more plainly now. She was angry. She sounded as though she... She hated him. But that's not true, Patsy. You're not telling the truth. The tone of her voice was unbearable. I, I couldn't stand it. I opened the door and... There was this horrible noise... Like an explosion. Oh, I'm frightened, Fraulein. Yeah, oh, please take care of me. I didn't kill him. It was Patsy. Greg killed? Oh. Greg dead? Don't listen to her, Fraulein. I tell you, Patsy did it. She did it. Oh, this is terrible. You believe me, don't you, Fraulein? But why should Patsy do this horrible thing? What reason could she have? I don't know. I don't know. She's blind, Lorna. We both know that. She couldn't have seen to do this. I didn't know it. Then why have you a gun in your hand? Shouldn't we call the police, Fraulein? <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, with reconversion beginning, the time is drawing closer when you'll be able to buy those new things you've been wanting. That new home or new car or new radio. But with what? Why, with savings, of course. And there's no better way to save today than in war bonds. In war bonds, your money is not only drawing good interest, but it's telling those brave guys who are fighting and dying out in the Pacific that you're still back of them. So stay in the fight, stay on the job, keep supporting all the home front activities. Save waste fat, save paper, take care of your tires. And right now, let's help put over the 7th War Loan Drive by getting another bond. Remember, you don't buy bonds, you invest in them. You get every penny back with interest. And each bond that does its bit to get the war over is also helping you to better enjoy the day we're all fighting and praying for. The day of final peace. And now... Back to the Whistler. Well, Patsy, you've won, haven't you? Not only have you killed Greg, but you're having your revenge on Lorna for taking him away from you. She's going to jail for murder, isn't she, Patsy? The police are here now. The detective is questioning Lorna, looking at the body. But there's something you didn't count on, Patsy. You were blind to someone else's character. Fräulein. She stood by you all these years. But murder is something else. And suddenly you see her come back into the room and walk over to the detective. And she's holding something in her hand that freezes you with horror. Fraulein! Yes, Miss Patsy, I found it. I saw it hidden in your dresser a few days ago. I thought it was strange then, but now I know. What? What is it, Fraulein? Yeah, what is it you're talking about, Miss? This. No, Fraulein, no! Wait a minute. I thought you couldn't see. So did we all. 
But this little bottle proves how she fooled us. It's Belladonna to make her pupils dilate, to make her look blind. Hey, oh, hey, stop. Come back oh, here. Storline, oh, stop her. Effie, stop, stop. Storline, what's she doing? She's running, running out there. Wait, Miss Lorna, the detective is after but her. But she's running right out of the street. Oh, oh my. Look, Storline, I can't. Yes, they look out for me. Oh, Storline. Oh, you know, she didn't even see it. The belladonna in her eyes. She didn't even see the car. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Louis Estes, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. KNX, Columbia Square, Los Angeles. Signal Gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story. By the Whistler. Tonight, death pays a visit. I am the Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. The Crowleys are a typical young married couple, the kind of people you have living on your block. A little more prosperous than most, perhaps, drive a better car, nicer clothes, you know. Funny, too, because Jake Crowley only earns forty-seven fifty a week as assistant manager of a branch of Sellers National Bank. And the neighbors might be surprised to learn that the Crowleys have only $321.17 in their joint bank account. That's not much. A pittance, it seems, to Trina Crowley. Especially when Jake tells her about how they came to have it. Well, that's all that's left, Trina. How much was it to begin with, Jake? Almost $10,000. $10,000? Where's it gone? Where do you think? You wanted a new car, didn't you? You insisted on that trip to Tahoe last summer. You asked for this house, didn't you? Oh, so I was the one at fault. I spent the money. I suppose the next thing you'll be saying is that I instigated the whole thing. Listen, Trina, we won't get anywhere this way. We've got to figure a way out. I need your help. Well, Jake, I don't know anything about finance. If only you told me before, perhaps if, you could have... If, if, post-mortems aren't going to do any good, the thing's done. Can't you get that through your head? Yes, I can get it through my head. And I won't be talked to that way. All right, all right, Trina. I'm sorry. I'm on edge, I'm sorry. When do the bank examiners do? Next Tuesday, after the weekend. But can't you cover up some way? Isn't there something you can do? Nothing. Since that new manager's been in, I haven't had a chance to lay my hands on the accounts. Oh, Jake, I don't know what to say. It's... It's... The word is grand larceny, Trina. A 
And that's how it began. Jake had stolen $10,000 from the bank, and they had to do what they did. They were desperate. There didn't seem to be any way out, no way at all. Then, as though fate itself had planned it, the letter came. I don't like your precious cousin, Charlie. I wish he'd stay home where he belongs. It's only for the weekend, Jake. He says in his letter he'd enjoy spending our wedding anniversary. Well, I'm not going to enjoy having him. Those stupid jokes he tells. I can hardly wait to hear that cheery laugh of his. <laughs> and so the fellow says, is this the general store? And the other guy says, yes. And so he says, okay, let me speak to the general. <laughs> Do you like that? Not particularly. <laughs> well, then there's the one about the two bookies who went to heaven. Have I told that to you? Is it funny? It sure is. And you haven't told it. And I haven't... <laughs> oh, say, that's good. That's real good. Thanks. Yeah. Cousin Charlie. Yeah? I've laid out some towels for you if you want to freshen up. And your room's ready whenever you are. Oh, thanks. Well, I guess I'll go upstairs, then. Hey, where's that little traveling kit of mine? Oh, it's there with your suitcase at the head of the stairs. Huh? Yeah, so it is. Getting so I can't see a thing without my glasses. <laughs> Think I'll take my suitcase up, too. I won't. Oh, oh. oh I, I dropped the kit. Oh, here, I'll get it, Cousin Charlie. You seem to have... You seem to have a lot of money here, Charlie. Oh, the kit came open, didn't it? It's in cash. Yes, I just sold a piece of property of mine in Missouri on the way out here. Funny old codger brought it. Yes, he insisted on doing business in cash. Quite a lot of cash, by the way, the looks of it. Mm-hmm, $10,000. That's an awful lot of money to carry around. Well, I haven't had a chance to deposit it yet. You know, the funny part of it is I've been trying to get rid of that property for years and no one would touch it, and then suddenly this guy offers me $10,000. <laughs> just like a present, is it? Yes. Yes. Well, I guess I'll go on up there. Oh! Oh, happy anniversary. Oh, or maybe I'm a little too early for that, huh? Well, anyway, happy anniversary. You know, Jake, I've been thinking, as long as Charlie has a guest room... $10,000. Did you see it? $10,000, Trina. It would more than make up what I'm short at the bank. I know, but I don't... 10000 Jake. Good Lord, Jake, you... Charlie's got $10,000. Whistler fans, many of you have been asking whether the Whistler will follow the example of numerous popular programs in going off the air for the summer. Well, I'm happy to be able to tell you tonight that in appreciation of your loyalty that has made the Whistler the most popular of all West Coast radio shows, Signal Oil Company and the hundreds of neighborhood Signal gasoline dealers who sponsor the Whistler will continue to broadcast this program without interruption throughout the summer. So for your Monday night radio entertainment, we of the cast hope you'll continue to make the Whistler a regular stop on your dial. And during the week, we hope you'll stop at the friendly stations displaying Signal's yellow and black circle sign and get acquainted with the gasoline whose famous longer mileage formula helps each gas stamp go farther. Signal Go Farther Gasoline. Yes, there never was a better time to join the ever-increasing thousands of wise Western drivers who are discovering it's a fact. You do go farther with Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. When Jake Crowley found out that Cousin Charlie had $10,000 in cash with him, his eyes went cold and hard. You'd never seen him look like that before, had you, Trina? He stared intently as though he were seeing something that no one else could see. For a moment you thought it was all in your mind, that you imagined what Jake was thinking. But then you couldn't help but know. Jake had plans. Would you rather see me go to prison? Oh, it might be better, Jake. Better than this. You don't mean that, Trina. Oh, Jake, I don't know what I mean. I, I, I'm so confused. There's nothing I... to be confused about. We can't afford to be. I thought the whole thing out last night. I think I know how it can be done. What do you intend to do? Do you remember Charlie saying he couldn't see very well without his glasses? He's always been near sighted. All right. One of us has to get our hands on those glasses. We break them. 
Make it appear accidental, of course. Then... I've typed this note. Here, look it over. We'll find some way to get him to sign it. He won't know what he's signing if he can't read it. Looks all right. Are you sure this will leave us in the clear, Jay? Can't miss, Trina. All we have to do is get Charlie to sign it. What are you going to use for the... Potassium cyanide. The encyclopedia says five grains are fatal. I can buy it at a photography studio in town. They use it for gilding pictures. That way I won't have to sign for it. Oh, Jake, I'm frightened. No, you aren't. You aren't, Trina. You understand? When people get frightened, they get caught. Remember that. But if Charlie should suspect anything, if Charlie should... If Charlie should what? Charlie! <laughs> Morning. My ears are burning. What were you saying about me? Uh, nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, yes, you were. I heard you. Heard what? Well, I heard you mention my name. Oh, come on. What's the secret? Oh, well, I was just telling Jake if, uh, if you didn't like hotcakes for breakfast, I didn't know what I could fix. Hotcakes? Well, hotcakes are my favorite dish, yes, sir. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Before you two sit down... This, uh, this water faucet stuck. Hmm? Would one of you see if you can turn it for me, please? Why, sure thing. Let me. I'm a regular handyman, that's me. Now, which one is it? It's the hot water faucet. Cold water works all right, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be anything the matter with... No, it's this one over here. Hey, look out for that cold water. Oh, dear, I've splattered your suit, haven't I? I'm so sorry. Here, take this dish cloth. Oh, thank you. Here, let me have your glasses. I'll dry them Oh, that's all right. I can do no, it. No, let me do it. I can do it. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how I ever could have done it. <laughs> look out for the glasses. Oh, oh yeah. no. Look what I've gone and done. I've broken your glasses. Yeah. It was my only pair. Oh, I'm sorry, Charlie. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> Well, you've taken the first big step, Trina, and you're hoping you won't be sorry for it. Jake goes on to work, and you and Cousin Charlie lounge around the house. That afternoon, you're out on the sun porch trying to read, but you can't concentrate. All you can think of is how to get Charlie to sign that note. Then, as if in answer to the question, an article in the magazine caught your eye. And there was the solution, as simple as that. What was it Jake said? People who get frightened get caught. Yes, be calm, Trina, and casual. Cousin Charlie. Hmm? Here's an interesting article. Have you seen this? What? Uh, it's about the different specimens of handwriting. It says that your entire character can be determined just by the way you sign your name. No? Yeah. It says if you circle your eyes instead of dotting them, you're an extrovert. And if you don't cross your T's, you're an introvert. <laughs> what are you, Charlie? An extrovert or an introvert? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, I don't go in for that handwriting stuff. It's a whole lot of bunk. Oh, maybe it's not. <laughs> they have a chart here that explains the whole thing. Charlie? Mm-hmm? Charlie, write your name and let me see if I can analyze your handwriting. Oh, no, Tina. As I, I think I'd like to take a walk. No, no, it'll take just Oh, some other time, on, huh? Please, Charlie, oh, I don't Well, now, I... I... <laughs> Here. Here, now, use my pen. Hmm? Go on, now. Write your name on this piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now. Are you satisfied? Yes. Yes, I'm satisfied. So far, so good, Trina. All you have to do now is wait until Jake returns. Then the next step. Jake's late getting home that night. Charlie and you have finished supper and he'd gone into the living room. You were straightening up in the kitchen when you heard the car turning in the driveway. Jake gave in the back door. Jake! Jake, you're late. Where have you been? The stores were jammed. I had to wait a long time at the photography studio. And I got it. Did you get everything you're supposed to? Yes. Here. Trina, you're wonderful. I was afraid for a while I wouldn't Here be comes able to... Charlie. Trina, I... Uh... Oh. Jake uh, finally got home, eh? Yes, Charlie. Well, I, uh, I just come in to say good night. Oh, you going to bed so early? Mm-hmm. Gotta get my beauty wings. Well, good night. Oh, Cousin Charlie. Yeah? We... 
we were just getting ready to fix some tea, weren't we, Trina? Huh? Oh, yes, 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 we were. Why don't you join us in a cup before you turn in? Well, no thanks. I don't think so. Good night. Good night. The idea of the tea. This is it. You mean now? Yes, this is perfect. Can't you see? I'll put the water on. Jake. Let me see that note again. What's the matter with you? You've seen it. But we might have left something out. There might be some kind of I a mistake. I tell you, it's all right. No, oh, it'll make you feel any better here. Dear Trina and Jake, I trust that you will forgive me for what I've done. When one loses his desire to live, this is the only way. You'll find $10,000 in my traveling kit. I want you to have it. Call it my anniversary present to the both of you. I have no explanation to offer... Other than the fact that I've grown weary and perhaps a little old. I've lived my life now and I wish to take it by my own hand. Please try to understand. Love from your cousin, Charlie Barton. Is there anything wrong with that? No, no, I guess not. Put this in his cup. There's ten grains here. All right. Wait, wait a minute, Jake. What's the matter now? The police will ask where he got the poison. Trina, Trina, don't you think I've thought of that? Charlie must have found it in the desk. I used it last summer for developing pictures. Oh. Now, will you please get a hold of yourself? Take the tea upstairs. Oh, Jake, I'm afraid I'm going to be sick. You're not anything of the kind. You're all right. It's all planned perfectly. Now, take the tea up to Charlie. All right. Go ahead. Up the stairs. Yes, Here's your tea, Cousin Charlie. Now it's done. You and Jake spend a sleepless night, don't you, Trina? Listening, wondering, waiting. And then in the morning... I don't want to go up there, Jake. I I just can't. All right, you don't have to. Let me have the suicide note. I'll take it up and put it on the lampstand. Do we have to call the police this morning? Of course, but there's nothing to worry about. We simply tell them I went upstairs to call him for breakfast and found him... Well, that way. Jake. Jake, are you sorry we've, we've done it? Listen, Trina. I was thinking last night. There may be more than 10000 in this for us. Charlie's a rich man, isn't he? I think so. You're his only living relative, aren't you? Yes. All right. He's almost certain to have mentioned you in his will. Do you realize what that means, Trina? We'll be Rich. Rich. Oh, Jake, it must be wonderful to be rich. You bet. Trina, we're both alike. I think that's why I love you so much. And I love you, Jake. I always will. Good morning. Joy! What's the matter? Well, there's there's nothing. She wasn't... Oh, I... You know, I must have fallen right to sleep last night. That that cup of tea, I didn't get a chance to drink it. But thanks, anyway. Oh. (laughs) Well, what are you staring at me for? Did I forget something? (laughs) <laughs> well, what have you got for breakfast? Breakfast? Yes, breakfast, Trina. Oh. Eggs, eggs. Eggs, eggs, fine. How about dishing me up a platter? I, I'm kind of in a hurry, you know. I thought I'd go into town this morning, get me a pair of temporary glasses. I'll, I'll fix you something right away. Yeah. Oh, say, I meant to tell you, I used your phone for a long-distance call yesterday. I hope you don't mind. No, of course not. I had to call my foreman, one of my ranches. We're going to enlarge. Yes, finally got an okay for some building material. Figured on going up to look it over day after tomorrow. You told the foreman you'd be there day after tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Well, come on. How about those eggs? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Right away, Cousin Charlie. Well, Jake and you are lucky, Trina. It was an almost miraculous stroke of luck. If Charlie had drunk the tea after making that phone call to his ranch, you would have been doomed. A man planning suicide wouldn't be planning the enlargement of his ranch at the same time. The police would have checked with the foreman and immediately become suspicious. They would have questioned you. And from that, they wouldn't have found it difficult to piece it all together. Yes, you were lucky. But your problem isn't solved. And that evening... 
Katrina, did Charlie get back? He's in the front room, listening to the radio. Did he get his glasses? Yes. Good. That solves the problem. Oh, Jake. Hmm? Not again. There's only two days left, Trina. I know, Listen, but we... this is foolproof. We asked him to go into town for some candles for the anniversary cake. I loan him my car. Well, how did the that The skid help? chains are off and the roads are slippery with snow. I've loosened a bolt in the master cylinder of the brakes. By the time he starts back from town, all of the hydraulic fluid will have leaked out. The brakes won't hold. Call Charlie. Oh, Jake. Call I... him. Here are the keys, Charlie. Okay. Oh, and Charlie. Yeah? On your way back, take the highway along the river. You can make better time. Okay, I'll hurry. Yes, be sure to hurry. Charlie took the keys and started out the front door. And as that door closed behind him, somehow you felt relieved, Trina, almost exhilarated. Nothing further to worry about. Everything accomplished. And poor, dull Charlie was the key to that realization. You stood by the window, not bothering to look out, not wanting to. You listened for the door slam and for the motor to start. But you didn't hear either. Instead, you heard a voice calling... Trina! Hey! Listen! Come here, quick! Cousin Charlie! Sounds like he's on the porch. Open the door. Cousin Charlie, what's the matter? I... I slipped on the steps. I don't seem to be able to get up. Give me a hand, will you? Yeah, here. Be careful. Oh, oh, oh. Get him in the house, Jim. Yeah, all right. Take it easy, Charlie. Come on. <laughs> it hits my ankle. I, I'm afraid I've sprained it. Yes, he sprained his ankle. So you called a doctor who came over and taped Cousin Charlie's leg. He advised Charlie to stay in bed and rest up. And he would pay him another visit in the morning. Jake is furious. The thing is getting to be an obsession with him. I don't care, Trina. I don't care what's gone wrong. We can't wait any longer. We can't. Jake. Jake, what's gotten into you? Why do you look that way? Why do I look what way? There's nothing wrong with me. It's just that this thing's getting maddening, that's all. We won't be able to do it, Jake. You can see that. It just wasn't meant to be. It was meant to be all right, and it's going to be. No. Don't you realize, Jake, there's something... Bigger than you or me. There's nothing bigger than you or me, not now. I planned this affair, I'll make it work. No. Yes, no, I say, no. listen to me. You've kept up the insurance on the house, haven't you? Know you know I have. All right, this is the last time. This is the time we'll do it. There's plenty of kerosene in the basement. It'll work. It's got to. You don't need to... We'll burn this infernal house to the ground and Cousin Charlie with it. No, Jim. Shut up. We'll be in the garage looking over the car brakes. We won't notice the fire until too late. Charlie started at... With a cigarette, accidentally. He was smoking in bed. But he's crippled. He'll never be able to get down the stairs. Of course, that's the idea. You wouldn't do that. We can, we we will. Trina, we've gone too far to stop now. Hello, Charlie. How do you feel? Oh, a little better, thanks. (laughs) Guess I'm sort of spoiling your anniversary, eh? Oh, no, of course you are, Cousin Charlie. You have our sympathy. Oh, no, there's no need to feel sorry for me. It's just a little spring. Say, Charlie, that money of yours, don't you think Trina and I'd better put it away for you? No, I don't know. Nobody's going to rob me, are they? Hmm? No, of course not. I just thought, well, we have a wall safe downstairs, and in as much as you're laid up... Well, come to think of it, it might not be a bad idea. Oh, there's my traveling kit over there. Take it down with you. Fine. Hey, Trina... What have you got in the can there? Oh, oh, it's kerosene. We were just going down to the furnace and thought we'd heat your room up a little for you. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, oh, oh, dear. Oh, I've spilled it. I'll get a cloth and clean it up right away. Oh, now, don't you bother. It, it'll dry up. Well, if you're sure you don't mind. Oh, no, it's okay. Oh, say, I was able to pick up a pack of cigarettes, Charlie, in case you'd like a smoke. Well, thank you. But you'd better keep them. You see, I don't smoke. You don't? No. Oh, well, that's right. That's right, I forgot. Come on, Trina, we better go downstairs. What was it the poet said about the best laid plans, Jake? Seems that whatever you try, you're wrong. Perhaps Trina was right. It just wasn't meant to be. But you can't give it up now. But, Jake, regardless, why can't we tell the police it started with a cigarette? Don't be a fool. Don't you think they discover he didn't smoke? Well, we got to find something besides a cigarette. What to... Oh, I'll get it. Hello. Speaking. Oh, hello, Evans. Yes. Yeah. They what? 
They're on the way over here now. Yes. Yes, I'm glad you called. Thanks. Goodbye. What is it, Jake? Jake, what's wrong? They discovered the shortage at the bank. They must have. That was Evans, my police reporter friend. He says the cops are on their way over here now. Evans said he thought I'd like to know. He's a nice guy. But how? I thought the bank examiners weren't doing it. I don't know how. Trina, you said you loved me. I do, Jake. Heaven help me for it, but I do. We'll run away, you and I. But if we're caught... We will be if we stay here. We've got to leave, Trina. We got Charlie's 10,000. Maybe we'll be able to start it again somewhere else. Not everybody gets caught, Trina. If we play it smart and stick together, people will forget about the whole thing in a couple of years. But, Jake... Will you come with me, Trina? Yes, Jake, you know I'll come. Are you afraid? No, not anymore. They're probably at the house by now. Jake, you have to drive so fast. They'll be looking for us pretty soon. But you're doing almost 70 in the road. <gasps> Jake! What is it? Jake! Good Lord, Jake! You forgot! The brakes! The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, here's some summertime arithmetic that adds up to better performance and longer life for today's aging cars. Did you know that for proper operation, water should circulate through the cooling system at the rate of 25 gallons per minute? However, as cars grow older, radiators clog up with rust and sludge. Water hoses rot, fan belts stretch and wear out. And that's why for safe, efficient summer operation, it's wise to have your entire cooling system checked now by your signal gasoline dealer. To restore the efficiency of your radiator, your signal dealer has a special rust and sludge dissolving flushing compound that can't harm the metal. He has radiator sealer to stop small leaks and rust preventive to protect radiator and motor from further corrosion. If you need a new water hose or fan belt, your signal dealer has the finest heavy-duty quality, and he will install them while you wait. You see, your signal dealer is much more than a place to buy Signal's famous go-farther gasoline and fine lubricants. Wherever you see Signal's yellow and black circle sign, there you will also find complete conscientious signal service to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, in their haste to get away with Cousin Charlie's $10,000, Jake and Trina forgot one important little thing, the brakes. Jake had drained the brake fluid in the attempt to murder Cousin Charlie. But now, speeding along the icy river road, it was too late. You can probably guess what happened. It was pretty messy. And back home, Cousin Charlie had a caller. Oh, oh, good evening, officer. Good evening. Come in. I, I'm i sorry I took so long to answer right, the door. Is this the Crowley residence? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, it is. But uh, Mr. Crowley doesn't seem to be home. I'm Charlie Barton, Mrs. Crowley's cousin. Good. You're the one I'm looking for anyway. Oh, what can I do for you? Well, the department got a call from out west somewhere. Somebody trying to get a hold of you. Something about some property out there. Hmm? Didn't know where to reach you here in town, so they asked us to track you down. Uh, here's the name and address. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, excuse me, the telephone... Oh, sure, sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello? Hmm? Yes, this is the Crowley resident. No, no, this is Charlie Barton. I'm Miss Crowley's cousin. They... What? What? Oh, 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 that, that, that's terrible. Yes, yes, uh, too... To identify the bodies, of course. I, I, I'll get someone to drive me down immediately. Uh, the what? Ten thousand dollars? Well, that's strange. Well, I was going to give them ten thousand dollars for an anniversary present.
Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Lewis Reed, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Death Watch. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Did you ever commit a murder? No? Then you don't know, do you, how irresistible is the urge of the murderer to return to the scene of his crime. It's a very overpowering feeling. Especially if you're not even sure that... Oh, but wait, I'm getting ahead of the story. They found Lucille Doan late at night, on the floor of a not-too-lavish apartment. A neighbor noticed a light that had been burning for 24 hours, blundered in and found her. The police came very quickly. The coroner arrived shortly after. And he and Detective Rock Adrian looked over the body. Well, coroner, what do you say? Mr. Adrian, she's dead. Plenty dead. Cause of death? Do I have to tell you? You can see... I can see, but I want your official verdict for the record. Well, you can put down death from repeated blows over the head by a heavy instrument. How many is repeated blows? Mm, Twenty, twenty-five at least. How old would you say she was? I'd say around 30. Would you say she was pretty? Beautiful? She was certainly better looking than she is now. Why worry? The papers will headline her as a raving beauty. The newspapers won't hear about this case yet. Time of death? I'd say about this time last night. Well, I guess I got everything I need from you. Go ahead if you're through. I am. I'm glad of it. This isn't my favorite kind of case. You coming? No, 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 not just yet. And, uh, Karna. Yeah? Don't talk about this to anyone, especially reporters. Right. Say, you got any ideas on this one, Mr. Adrian? Uh, nothing much. But I don't think the murderer of Lucille Doan is sleeping peacefully tonight. Well, I don't blame him. I wouldn't either if I'd done something like that. <laughs> Yes, and how right you are. The murderer of Lucille Doan is not sleeping peacefully tonight. Is he, Oliver? No, Oliver Gorst is walking the streets, wandering aimlessly, paying little attention to traffic, thinking, thinking. Hey, hey, why don't you look where you're going? What's the idea? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't thinking. I, I mean, I was thinking about something else. I'm sorry. Hey, are you all right? You don't look so good. I'm all right. There's nothing the matter with me. Stop staring at me. I'm all right. Okay, brother. Okay. But you better watch out where you're going. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Watch where I'm going. Watch. Where am I going? I started toward home, but I... I'm walking downtown. I... I am almost to Lucille's place. No, no, I can't do it. I, I can't go back there. Not now. But why do I keep walking in that direction? Why? Why? Yes, why, Oliver? Why this irresistible desire to go back to the scene of the crime, as they call it? it? Seems to get worse all the time, doesn't it? It's almost a quarter to twelve, just twenty-four hours since you killed her. Now you want to go back. But that's dangerous, you know that. The police might be there right now, gathering clues. Then they'll peer through microscopes, test things, interview people, and soon they'll be combing the city for you. The murderer returns to the scene of the crime. If that's true, then why don't the police just wait there for them? Maybe they are. Maybe they're waiting there for me right now. I mean, I, I've got to be careful. I'm almost there. I, I can't go. I can't. It, it's suicide. <laughs> Here's a timely little gift offer for all you Whistler fans who drive cars. You see, July 1st, that's next Sunday, is the deadline for getting the new federal use stamp on your windshield. Well, since that little stamp has to hang on through a whole year of wear and window washing, you certainly don't want to have it peel or scuff off around the edges. So Signal Oil Company has had some special transparent use stamp protectors made up. They're neat looking, they're easy to apply, and they're free. Yours for the asking at any Signal gasoline dealer. Of course, like everything in wartime, supplies are limited, and every car will be needing one, so I'd suggest that you get yours this week. Just drive into any of the friendly stations displaying Signal's yellow and black circle sign and say, I'd like one of Signal's use stamp protectors that was offered free on the Whistler. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Oliver Gorst, you can tell yourself that it's suicide to go back to the scene of your crime. But you can't stop that irresistible desire to go anyway, can you? Your head tells you to turn around and run, but your feet take you closer and closer. You'd better be careful, Oliver. You'd better be careful. There the devil's a switch. Hey, anyone here? Hello, Inspector. They told me I'd find you here, Adrian. What's up? It's the idea of camping here and not letting the newspapers have the story. Not so loud, Inspector. Close the door. Yeah. I've got a hunch about this crime. I'm listening. Better be good. Where's Arnold and Henderson? They're sleeping. Sleeping? And just what do you do while they slumber? Wait. We take turns. For what? The murderer. I don't get it. Whoever killed Lucille Doan did it in a moment of blind fury and then rushed out of here thinking only of escape. Mm. Only then did he realize what he'd done. Now he's bound to have the jitters. Every time he picks up a newspaper, he expects to read about the crime. If we keep this thing still, our silence will puzzle him. We begin to wonder whether the police have discovered the body. He might come back for any number of reasons. But I think he'll come back lured by all the doubts and hopes and curiosity... Our silence can stir up in the mind of one who's come face to face with murder for the first time. Murder's very upsetting, you know. Yeah, especially for the victim. Well, all right, Adrian, go ahead. Some of your wacky ideas have been your most successful ones, and I'll string along, but don't take too long. Thank you, Inspector. I'll take care of the chief in the newspapers. Good night and good luck. The detective has a hunch, Oliver, and it's a pretty good one. Of course, you don't know it, but he's figured you out pretty well. Except when you committed murder, you were more surprised than upset. Yes, you couldn't believe you'd done it. You wanted to go back and convince yourself right then. But something told you not to. 
Instead, you ate a big supper. Murder made you terribly hungry. There was nothing like a good meal to buck a man up. Only now you wish you had gone back, don't you? Just to make sure. Maybe I... Maybe I didn't do it after all. Maybe it's something I dreamed. I've often thought of killing someone. No. Of killing her when she was causing so much trouble. That's it. I dreamed of killing her, and the dream was so vivid, I thought it actually happened. I have to go back to convince myself it isn't true. <laughs> She'll be surprised to see me so soon after our quarrel. I'll look around, and if I don't see any blood stains, I'll know it didn't happen. But why can't a man be sure about something like that? It's such an awful thing to do. Kill a human being. I couldn't have done it. I'd feel remorse. I, I'd have such a sense of guilt, I'd have to give myself up or, or drown myself. It goes to show I didn't do it. How could I have eaten that meal afterwards if I killed her? The food would have choked me. But I'm hungry again. I'll stop for a sandwich. That'll give me time to think. Anderson. Anderson, wake up. <clears throat> what? Oh, oh, it's you. Time for your watch. Get some coffee. More in the thermos. Oh, thanks. Look, do you really think we'll trap this guy? Brother, well, it seems to me I've been here a month already. I'm playing a hunch, that's all. I, I could be wrong. Well, much more of this, and we'll be chasing each other around with butcher knives for diversion. Don't worry, Henderson. The idea is not as crazy as it sounds. Okay, Mr. Adrian. Wake me if you hear the slightest sound, will you? Yeah. Good night. Good night, and pleasant dreams. Is there anything else for you, mister? What did you say? I said, would you like anything else? Oh, uh, well, well, yes, I think I'll have another hamburger. Well, I'm sorry, but the chef's gone. Oh. All we have is coffee and cold sandwiches. We'll be closed in about 20 minutes. Well, I'll, I'll have a cup of coffee. Okay, draw one. I wonder if he ever killed anyone. I wish I was in his place. Nothing to worry about. Lucille deserved to die. I had to do it. It's not my fault she fell in love with me, and I warned her not to, that I could never marry her. She understood all that. It's foolish to come all the way down here just to prove I wasn't dreaming. I'll call her up. I'll be pleasant and tell her I'm sorry about the quarrel and cheer her up a little. Hey, mister, don't you want the coffee? Huh? Oh, yes, uh, I'll be back. I'm just going to telephone. No. Don't touch that receiver, Henderson. Well, it might be headquarters. No. I'm not to be called here. I've left instructions with the operator to trace any call that comes in. To try to stall anyone who calls. Let it ring. What number are you calling, please? Uh, Lincoln 57431, please. Will you please hang up and dial again? I'm returning your coin. Sorry, mister, we're closing up. There's a drugstore up the street where you can telephone. It's no use. She didn't answer. No, Oliver, she didn't answer. And you know why, don't you? Really, you know why. But you don't know about Detective Rock Adrian and the operator tracing the call, do you? Hold it. Sorry, I'm closing. It's place now up around the corner. Never mind that. Did anyone telephone from here within the last five minutes? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, a man just left. Went down the subway steps over there. Okay, Henderson, bring this man with you and come on. Can you identify him? Sure I can. He just ate here. Why, what's the matter? Never mind. Come on. We better catch him before that train pulls out. Oh, 
Wait a minute. I'm afraid we're too late. Well, Oliver, you were lucky, and you don't even know it. Sitting safely in the subway train, your thoughts are far from police in your danger. They're with Lucille. Why didn't she answer? Maybe she was out with someone else. And all the time telling me I was the only one she ever loved. Couldn't live without me. If I ever left her, she'd kill herself. Well, why didn't she? That would have solved everything. Always threatening to tell my wife. Always demanding. Threatening and demanding. Demanding and threatening. Every time I saw her, there was a big row. I began to lose my control, my, my self-respect. And then... Then I knew I'd have to kill her. That's when I started having those horrible dreams. Then I... I dreamed she was a little white mouse. And asked me to give her something to eat. But I told her I hadn't anything. Then I saw my heart on a little tin plate and she began to nibble on it. The heart was pulsing and when she bit into it I screamed and grabbed the poker and began to beat her with it. Beat her and beat her long after she was dead. All out. End of the line. All out, mister. This is the end of the line. A- end of the line? Where am I? 242nd Street. Can I ride anymore? Sure, mister. You want to go back? We'll take it. Back. Yeah. I've got to go back. I forgot something back there. Yes, Oliver, you forgot something. Or did you? You can't be sure about anything anymore. The whole thing's like a dream, a nightmare. Only you can't seem to wake up. When you go home, finally, you avoid your wife. You've done it before. She doesn't bother you. At the office next day, the people wonder about you, but they only think you're not feeling well. If they only knew what's going on in your mind. And then it's night again. You're wandering the streets again. The urge to go back is there again. Ah, this job ain't so bad after you get used to it, Mr. Adrian. Something ought to happen tonight. Oh, you think so? He's hovering around the edges. That call came from a phone booth only three blocks from here. We almost had him. Yeah, that was a tough break. Quiet. Someone's coming. I hear it. He's coming this way. Stand by. Be ready for trouble. What do I do? Open the door. Fast. Put up your hands. Y- yeah, yeah, sure, mister. Don't shoot. I- I'm just delivering a telegram. All right. Come in. Who's the message for? Uh, Miss Lucille Doan. I'll take it. You wait. Hmm. Where'd you get this? Came through the office. Boss just handed it to me and told me to deliver it. Here's, um, here's two bucks. If anyone asked you about this telegram, tell him you delivered it to Miss Doan in person, not to me, see? Yes, sir. Say, can I tell my boss what happened? Yeah. And tell him if anyone tries to put a tracer on this telegram to find out if it was delivered... He's to get in touch with police headquarters. Yes, sir, I'll tell him. Thanks for the two bucks. That's all. Well, what's up? Read this telegram. Meet me for dinner at the usual place, signed Ollie. Who the devil is Ollie? That's our man. The one who phoned. The murderer? Perhaps. Well, dining with a corpse would be a novelty. Look, if he's the one, what's the point in inviting her to dinner? Maybe it's hope. Maybe he's trying to convince himself it never happened. Maybe it's an attempt to fool the police in case he's found and questioned. Well, if we only knew where the usual place was, we'd drop in for dinner ourselves. This Ollie doesn't know she's dead. If he isn't our man, he'll probably try to find out why she doesn't meet him. We'll just sit tight. Oh, no, not more waiting. Well, I think I'll water the plants again. That geranium's going to blossom any week now. <laughs> Waiter. Yes, sir. Hey, what time is it? Ten fifteen. Can I get you something? No, no, I'll wait a little longer. My companion must must have been detained. She'll be along any minute now. I'd suggest, sir, if you want steak, you better let me place your order. We have only a few left. Well, I, I don't know. She eats so little. I, 
I tell you what, reserve one steak. If she orders it, I'll take something else. Very well, I'll have one put aside. And uh, bring me another newspaper. Yes, sir. Why did I tell him only one steak? We both like them better than anything else. Maybe, maybe I know she won't come. Is this just a game I'm playing with myself, just pretending it never happened? But why? Why isn't there something in the papers? I've read a hundred since Monday, and all there is is war news. Nothing about... Uh, she's staying away on purpose, just to torture me. She knows how easily I become upset and worried. She's deliberately not answering my phone call and my telegram. Just like her to pull a trick like that. Like the time she faked a suicide and had me frantic for a week. Well, two can play that game. I'm not waiting any longer. Waiter? Yes, sir. I'll have the steak by myself. Medium rare. Baked potato. Green salad with French dressing. That's right, Oliver. Get angry at her. That will relieve the tension in your mind for a while. Eat a good meal. Go home. Get a good night's sleep. You'll feel better in the morning. But you don't, do you? And the next night you're worse than ever. Take it easy, Oliver. If you can just wait a little while longer, Detective Adrian can't keep this up forever. Adrian, I can't put the chief off much longer. He's howling for an arrest. We'll get him, Inspector. He's nibbling at the bait. Yeah, but when? It's three days since the murder. That's not long. Just give me a few more days. Days? Good Lord, the chief wants to see me the first thing in the morning. And I know what he'll say. Uh, I can guess. Oh, give me one more day. I'm sure something will break. Well, I'll try. I'll tell him you got a hot lead. The case will soon break. Thanks, Inspector. Oh, forget it. And let me warn you, Adrian, this is the last time I get involved with you and your hunches. This kind of detective work is too hard on the nerves. I'm a wreck. And my wife's complaining. But just think what state of mind the murderer must be in. Oh, Lord. What I wouldn't give for a night of quiet, undreaming sleep. I'm a sick man. Maybe I ought to go to the doctor. But I'm afraid. Afraid of what I might tell him. I have so many things on my conscience. There's only one person in all the universe who can help me, and that's Lucille. I can't fight anymore. I've got to go to her. Well, Oliver, you're going to give up. You knew you'd have to sooner or later. Yes, the murderer returns to the scene of the crime, and you can't help yourself. You may be caught, but you don't care anymore. Too bad. You will be caught, of course, because Detective Rock Adrian is still there, waiting for you like a spider waiting for a fly. But he's not happy. I've got good news for you, Anderson. Well, you don't sound very happy. This will be the last watch. You sure? Positive. When's he coming? The chief's called it off. Oh. Tomorrow the papers get the story, and we start a routine hunt. Ah, oh, that's too bad. Now, I was getting used to this retired life. I wanted it to last until that geranium bloomed. Without me, it would have died. Take it home as a souvenir, a trophy of the chase. You see, Oliver? If you could only wait until tomorrow. But you can't, can you? You're going back to Lucille right now, and nothing can stop you. Better to be caught and hanged than to have this doubt eating into my mind. I just sit at the office, my brain vibrating with every telephone call. It can't go on. Tonight I'll know. And then I can get some sleep again. And right now, that's the sweetest, most desirable experience in all the world. Oh, here's that coffee shop. I, I got this far the other night. I'll stop in and... Then go on. Now, what's yours? Uh, coffee. I guess I'll have a roll, too. Uh-huh. Draw one. Hey, mister. You were in here the other night, weren't you? Oh, yes. I, I guess I was. Uh, you made a phone call, didn't you? Yeah. Yes, I remember. Well, you look like a pretty good guy. I'll give you a tip. I don't know what's up. 
But right after you left, the cops were here and wanted to know who called. Then they beat it right down to the subway, but your train was just pulling out. Now, as I the said... Police. Yeah, and they seemed anxious. Just thought I'd tip you off. Thanks, I... I gotta get out of here. They're after me. It's true. I killed her and they're after me. I gotta get away. To Mexico, anywhere. They don't know who I am yet. I can make it. If I hurry, I can get away. Taxi! Taxi! In just a moment, the Whistler will bring you the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to tell you about the happy ending that more and more drivers are finding in their quest to make ration gasoline go farther. Now, if you think I'm going to say signal go farther gasoline, well, you're right. Well, after all, friends, what could be a more logical place to look for mileage than to the gasoline that for years has been famed for mileage? You see, each oil company has its own formula for its own brand of gasoline. Well, long before the war, when economy was still the important thing, Signal Oil Company set out to produce a gasoline formula that would give more miles. Today, of course, with certain gasoline ingredients reserved for war, no gasoline can promise you all the brilliant anti-knock performance you enjoyed in pre-war Signal gasoline, and which you'll find again in even further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But here's the important point. Even today, Signal's wartime formula still puts the emphasis on mileage. That's why if you haven't tried Signal Go Farther Gasoline in your car, there never was a better reason or a better time to get acquainted with your Signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Oliver Gorst, by a stroke of luck, you found out. At last, your mind is relieved. Or so you think. At last, you know you did kill Lucille. It wasn't a dream. No, the police are after you. But you found out in time. You can get away. As long as the police don't know who you are, you can just go home and pack your bag, buy a ticket, and go away. Nobody will ever know. And those policemen sitting back there in Lucille's apartment can wait till doomsday for you. Your move. Well, thanks. You know, I got you licked. Sure, sure. But I like to take my time about giving up. <laughs> I'm sure glad I'm not playing you for dough. You... Hey, did you hear that? Elevator. Stopped at this floor. He's coming this way. Get ready. But don't make a sound. Let it ring. Oh, I thought... Come in. Well, I'm looking for a Miss Doan. This is Miss Doan's apartment. Well, is Miss Doan here? I'd like to speak to her privately. She's not in just now. May I ask who you are? It it, it doesn't matter. I'll I'll call some other time. I'm sorry, but we're interested in Miss Doan, too. I'm Detective Adrian from police headquarters. Police? Is Miss Doan involved with the police? Very much so. Well, I'm glad. It's about time the police took care of women like that. Breaking up home, stealing my husband. I found her address in my husband's letter file. I came here to tell her that if she didn't leave him alone, I'd call in the police myself. Your name, please. I'm Mrs. Gorst. Mrs. Oliver Gorst. And I want to tell you that I should... Your address? 30 Western Street. As I was saying, Oliver and I were quite happy until this woman came along. What's the matter? Here they are, Mr. Adrian. Hello, Inspector. This is Rock Adrian. Have Oliver Gorst, 30 Weston Street, picked up for questioning? Yeah. For the murder of Lucille Doan. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. 
The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program is directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Joseph Cochran and music by Wilbur Hatch and is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood Signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Summer Thunder. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. There is a curious connection between an entry in the records of the British Weather Bureau and a corresponding item in the annals of the Police Department of Plymouth. The first indicates that at 9 p.m. on the night of August 18th, 1937, tourists and vacationers on the southern channel coast of England were disturbed by a radio warning. Attention, all vessels in channel waters between Land's End, Cornwall and Beachy Head, Sussex. Low pressure area approaching rapidly from the southwest. Violent storm in prospect. Put into the nearest port immediately. I'll repeat that. Attention, all vessels in channel waters between Land's End. The heat was oppressive, deadly. The atmosphere was so heavy and damp that breathing was an achievement. People at the watering places of Torquay and Brixham couldn't sleep and tried to pass the night over tall drinks and sodden bridge games on their verandas. So much for the weather report. The police records indicate that on the same night, a night when the heat had put everyone in southern England on edge, murder was taking shape in the mind of at least one human being. It began in Plymouth, in the second-floor apartment of Perry Elliott. Claudia, for heaven's sake, where have you been? I've been calling all over town for you. I'm sorry, Perry. It's nine o'clock. I know it's nine o'clock. Well, why didn't you call? I thought I'd better wait. Will you come to the point? Perry. I'm sorry, dear. This blasted heat's getting on my nerves, I suppose. I know. Now, come on. Let's sit down here and I'll explain. Now, I, I know this is going to be difficult for you, dear. I want you to try and understand. What are you getting at, Claudia? I've been up to Ivy Bridge. What do you mean? I've just had a talk with your Uncle Rodney. Claudia, you had no oh, please, right to... please, Perry, let me finish. He realizes now how very foolish it was to disinherit you. I think it was a good idea. For the first time in my life, I'm free. <laughs> well, listen, Claudia. I know him like a book. He's frustrated. He doesn't know which way to turn. He's discovered for once that there's something his filth the money won't buy for him. He can't pull strings anymore and watch me jump about like a marionette. Perry, you don't understand. I'm afraid I do. Did he call you? No, it, it was your aunt. Agatha? She's, she knows better than that. She's only trying to make peace in the family, Perry. I tell you I don't want his money, is that clear? He changed his will. Let him leave it that way. I said he's sorry about it. He wants to apologize. Apologize? Wait a minute. Do you know why it all happened? He didn't approve of you. He said I had married a social climber, that I was dragging the noble name of Elliot in the mud. 
Claudia. I can't understand how you could fall for it. I've said I'll forgive him, Perry. I see. He's brought you off like the rest of them. Perry, you're not being fair. And you're not very perceptive. Don't shout at me. Very well. Cigarette? No, thank you. Do you have a match? I don't know what's become of my lighter. Here you are. Thanks. Well, Perry? Claudia, darling. Tonight, for the first time in my life, I feel quite capable of killing a man. Perry! I'm rather pleased about it. It'll put me on equal terms with Uncle Rodney. What do you mean? I'm going to see him, dear. When? Now. Two hours later, an unreal calm settled around Plymouth. Nothing stirred. Crickets stopped chirping. Trees suddenly became very still. And the bridge players paused to note there was an electric feeling in the air. The mind of the murderer was tense, too. Like the atmosphere. Then it hit. Bridges washed out. Roads became bogs. And shortly after midnight, the telephone rang in Claudia Elliott's apartment. Yes? Claudia. Oh, yes, Aunt Agatha. What is it? Something terrible has happened. Rodney's dead. Where's Perry? I don't know. He and Rodney had a terrible scene about money or something. Did you... Did you notify the police? The inspector will be here directly. I'd better come out right away. Here's something for you drivers to think about. Do all Chevrolets get the same number of miles per gallon of gas? Do all Fords? Of course not. For it's an established fact that the mileage you get depends on three things. The condition of your car, the way you drive, and the kind of gasoline you use. Well, those first two factors, they're up to you. But when it comes to gasoline, that's where I come in. For the same company that sponsors the Whistler, Signal Oil Company, also makes the gasoline that's become famous throughout the West as the go-farther gasoline. Yes, for years, wise Western drivers who kept careful record of mileage found you do go farther with Signal gasoline. But what's most important is that even today, you still go as far as before the war with Signal. And I'll tell you why. You see, although certain high-octane anti-knock ingredients are reserved for war, the mileage ingredients which made pre-war Signal famous are still in today's Signal formula. And what's more, new hydrocarbons rich in mileage have even been added. Oh, but you're not interested in chemical formulas. You're interested in miles. And there's an easy way to prove that for yourself. Invest your next gas stamps at one of the friendly stations displaying Signal's yellow and black circle sign. Let your own car prove that it's as true today as before the war. You do go farther with Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. You're stunned, Claudia, as you hang up the phone. You aren't conscious of the storm raging outside. All you can hear is Perry's voice over and over saying, Tonight I feel quite capable of killing a man. He should be home in a while, Claudia. What can you do? What can you say to him now? No, he couldn't have done it. You mustn't even think of it. Go out to Ivy Bridge and see the inspector. Find out for yourself. Better take a coat. Perry's raincoat hanging on the rack near the door. Yes, it's going to be a rough trip. But you arrive safely. Evening, madam. Hello, Edmund. Is... The inspector here yet? Not yet, madam. 
I expect the storm will delay him considerably. Where's Aunt Agatha? Upstairs, madam. Be down directly. Edmund, tell me what happened. Where is Rock? I mean, the body. In his room, on the floor, exactly where I found him. You found him? Yes, madam. I found him. You... You don't seem very disturbed, Edmund. I'm not, madam. I, I see. For 20 years I served him. Now I'm through. No, madam. I'm not uh, disturbed. Oh. What are you looking for? Oh, I, I... I had some cigarettes somewhere. There's some on the table. Oh, thank you. Matches there, too. Oh, thanks. I, I've got a lighter. Could I take your coat, madam? Thank you. Hmm. Get a soaking, madam. Edmund, may I see the body? Well, I don't know, madam. The inspector said to leave everything as it oh, was. Oh, please, it's very important. I won't touch anything. Very well. This way. In here, madam. Oh. He was strangled with a chain. The marks are still in his throat. A chain? Oh, but his head, all bloody. He was struck first, madam. Oh, no. No, he couldn't have done it. Not very. Not very. Come along, madam. Claudia, Claudia, dear, where are you? Oh, Aunt Agatha. Claudia, darling. Why did you take her in there, Edmund? She asked me to, madam. You should have known better. There, dear. You may go, Edmund. Oh, it wasn't Perry, Aunt Agatha. Really, it wasn't. He said some awful things, but really... Just a minute, dear. Oh, no. I said you may go, Edmund. We won't need you anymore tonight. Very well, madam. <laughs> Oh, Aunt Agatha, I must try and call Perry. He may be home by now. You can't, dear. The lines are down. I just tried. Oh, what can I do? I'm sure he didn't do it. Of course he didn't. I'd better go back. The roads are impossible, dear. You'd be taking an awful chance. I know it, but I... Now suppose you get some rest. The storm will very likely blow itself out before morning, and you can go back to town with the inspector. <laughs> Yes, Claudia, you could use some rest, but you lie awake until three in the morning telling yourself over and over that Perry had nothing to do with it, never quite believing yourself. You finally drop off to sleep only to find Perry smiling at you from a hundred angles as he toys with a short length of chain. You're trying to tell him, trying to explain, but he continues to smile and tie loops and knots in the chain until finally... It's morning, six o'clock by your watch. All you can think of now is finding him. You dress hurriedly and leave while the others are still asleep. The storm has passed, the sky is blue, and the morning air is cool in your face as you drive back to town to your apartment. The bed's been slept in, and piled in a heap on the closet floor are the clothes Perry wore last night. The navy blue jacket and white linen pants sodden and muddy. You lay them out on the floor and then there's a suspicious looking stain on the left leg of the white trousers. Quickly, go through the pockets. A card with a red smear on it, a fingerprint in blood. Now the coat in the right outside pocket. A short length of chain. Oh no, Perry. No. Yes? Inspector Dutton, city police calling. Is this Mrs. Elliot? Yes. We're detaining your husband here at headquarters, Mrs. Elliot. Oh, could, could I speak to him? He's being questioned at the moment. If you don't mind, I'd like to come out and have a look at your apartment. Oh, uh, of course. Righto. I'll be out in 20 minutes. Very well. Well, Claudia, that puts it up to you, doesn't it? You can go one way or the other. You can produce the piece of chain and the blood-stained linen trousers and see Perry safely off to the gallows. Or you can do what you really want to. After all, does it matter what he's done if you love him? You'd better decide, Claudia. 
There isn't much time. First you burn the card. Then connect the electric iron, get out soap and warm water and a bottle of benzene. Blood is nasty stuff to get out, isn't it? It takes a lot of scrubbing. But finally it's gone, no trace. You iron it partly dry and rumple it up. There, a little dust from the floor and you can't tell it's been touched. But what can you do with the chain? There's the inspector. Quickly, Claudia, put it anywhere. In your purse, that's it. Good morning, Inspector. How do you do, Mrs. Elliot? You returned rather early from Ivy Bridge, didn't you? I was quite concerned about Perry. We couldn't get through on the telephone. Did you think of calling at headquarters? Why, well, I, I just arrived when you telephoned. I see. Now, uh, let's take a look, eh? Mr. Elliot presumably slept in this room last night? Yes. You haven't disturbed anything? No. Mm. Ah, yeah. Oh, here we are. Are these are the clothes that he wore last night? Yes. Blue jacket and white linen trousers. I'll take these along if you don't mind. Let me see. Hmm. What is it? Nothing in the pockets, eh? Well, I suppose he emptied them when he changed clothes. I'm afraid your husband is getting into this thing rather deeply, Mrs. Elliot. What do you mean? I think you'd better come along. Oh, couldn't I? Couldn't I drop down later, perhaps a half hour? I'd like to clean up and... It's rather a peculiar position to take, Mrs. Elliot. Perhaps you aren't aware of the fact that your husband's life is at stake. I... I realize that, Inspector. I'll get my purse. Yes, Claudia, your husband's life is at stake. And you realize as you ride to headquarters with Inspector Dutton that his fate may depend on what you do with that short piece of chain in your purse. Oh, Inspector. Hey? I've got a frightful headache. Would you mind stopping for a minute at that chemist's? I'd like to get an aspirin. Of course. I'll get it for you. Oh, no, please. Well, I insist. It'll only take a moment. Oh, but I'd rather. I'll be back in a jiffy. You can still get rid of it, Claudia. Look, here comes a dump truck. It's filled with dirt. Throw it in the back. Ready? Now. Missed it. You see it, Claudia, lying there in the street next to the car. Pick it up. Hurry. <laughs> here he comes. The sewer right next to the car. He's coming around the other side. He can't see you. Throw it. <laughs> oh. Oh, here we are. Well, they didn't have any aspirin. Will a bromide do? Oh, yes. Yes. That will be splendid. Reeves? Uh, yes, Inspector? Uh, Mr. Reeves, uh, this is Mrs. Elliot. How do you do, ma'am? Would you get Mr. Elliot, please? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, he's right here in the next room. Sit down, please. Thank you. Come in, Mr. Elliot. Hello, Claudia. Perry. Sit down, Elliot. Now, I want the complete story this time. I must warn you that anything that you say may be used in evidence against you. Take it down, Reeves. Yes, sir. I've said it so often I know it by heart. I'll say it again. I left Uncle Rodney's at 11.15. At 11.30, the storm broke and I got stuck in the mud about halfway home. I was there for three hours and all. That's a juicy poor alibi. I told you I can prove it. The chap who stopped to help with... Well, what about him? I asked him for his card. I was going to try to find him and well, reciprocate. What's his name? I didn't even read it. The card's in the pocket of my blue jacket, though. You can call him. The card isn't in the pocket, Mr. Elliot. You can see for yourself. Here. Why, why I don't know how... Why, it was there last night. I... All right. Where's the chain? What chain? Perry! Wait a minute, Claudia. I told you, Inspector, the man tried to pull me out of the ditch with a chain, but but the chain broke. I remember putting the odd piece in my pocket. Now, what have you done with it? I haven't done anything with it. That jacket's exactly the way I found it on the floor of your closet. You're lying, Inspector. It's got to be there. It's not there. You can see for yourself. 
All right. When the motor went dead, he thought he might, it might be a clogged petrol line, so we drained a quarter so of ethyl from his petrol tank to fill the carburetor. I spilled some on my trousers. I remember there was a red stain on them when I got in this morning. I, I never use ethyl petrol, do I, Claudia? Do I? Oh, Perry, I... Here are the trousers, Elliot. Look at them. Why, I... What? You see, Elliot? You don't have much of an alibi. Why, uh, I don't know. I... And furthermore, can you explain the cut on your hands? They look very much as if you took too tight a grip on a chain. They would quite a bit, didn't they? I, I was holding on to the shackle when he pulled me out. It was a chain. Oh, of course. It's... It's a frame-up, Inspector. Someone's been in my apartment. No one's been in your apartment. Except your wife. Claudia. You. Oh, I don't know what... Take him back, Reeves. Oh, dear me. That'll be all. Yes, sir. <laughs> you don't need to assist the Reeves, thank you. I can make it alone. Oh, I know it's difficult, Mrs. Elliot. Oh, they can't convict him on that kind of evidence. Just because he can't prove he was somewhere else. It'll go a long way. We have more positive evidence, of course. What? We know, for example, that he was in the bedroom of the deceased about the time he was killed. Oh, you're wrong. Oh, listen, Inspector, you've got to believe me. This may sound fantastic, but it's true. I destroyed that evidence. I burned the card. I cleaned the red spot in the trousers. What are you talking about? I tell you, I did. Why? Because, because I thought Perry had done it. The card had a bloody thumbprint on it. I thought the pig stain in the trousers was blood. I thought I, thought I was protecting him. What about the chain? I thought that was was what he killed Uncle Rodney with. Hmm, what did you do with that? I threw it in the sewer by the chemist when you went in for the aspirin. That's why I wanted you to stop. I'm sorry, Mrs. Elliot. You... You don't believe me? No. Of course, we'll check, but, uh, uh... Reeves! Yes, sir? Take the lady home. Oh, Inspector, please! I said I'm sorry, Mrs. Elliot. Good day. Well, Claudia, you're finally beginning to grasp the horror of the thing you've done. You couldn't have made a smoother job of it if you tried to frame your husband. There's no way out. Or is there? You do believe Perry, don't you? He didn't do it. But if he didn't, who did? Rodney wasn't what you call a model of popularity. He had enemies, plenty of them. Some, perhaps, with motive enough to kill him. Who would know? Aunt Agatha. As soon as you can get a call through to Ivy Bridge, you telephone her. Perhaps she can help. You feel better when she arrives at the apartment late in the afternoon. I'm so glad you've come, Aunt Agatha. I've made a terrible muddle of things. I wish there was some way I could help, dear. You... You believe Perry, don't you? Believe what? Well, he's getting stuck in the ditch and having the man help him. I... I don't know. What do you mean? He acted so strangely with Rodney last night. I tried to make him understand, but first thing I knew, Rodney said some things he shouldn't have said. And there was a horrible scene... Perry went into a blue rage and threatened Rodney. I had to leave Claudia. I was afraid of him. What's that? Oh, the back door blew open. Oh, I'll get it. Oh, leave it. It's so hot. On oh, Agatha, he couldn't. I know Perry has a temper, but, but he's kind and good. Oh, don't you see? It must have been someone else. But who, dear? Oh, I don't know. But Uncle Rodney had lots of enemies... There must have been someone who would gain something by his death. Don't you see? Perry had nothing to gain and everything to lose. But he wasn't thinking clearly, dear. Oh, you must know of someone else. That's really why I asked you to come here. There must be someone. Why, I don't know. Agatha, they can't convict him just because he can't prove an alibi, can they? Well, I think that's pretty important. The inspector said something about more positive evidence. What did he mean? Why... I don't know. The lighter, perhaps. The... The what? His cigarette lighter. They found it next to the body. Next to the... Well, that, that's impossible. What do you mean? He didn't have it last night. He left it in the pocket of his raincoat. I had it. I used it right there in the house. And when I came back this morning, I left the coat. 
Agatha. Somebody took that lighter out of the coat and put it near the body before the police arrived. Afternoon, madam. Edmund, what are you doing here? I mean, this thing at the door, Miss Agatha. Eavesdropping. So, that's it. You, Edmund. Better take it easy, madam. I've got a gun. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to tell you about two live-wire young Californians who typify the more conscientious, more thorough service your car gets from a privately owned signal station. I'm talking about Bud Morley and Frank Sager, who just a year ago took over their own signal station in Burbank, California. Both, of course, had had years of experience servicing cars. Well, before long, Bud Morley and Frank Sager had more than doubled their business. Now, there must be good reasons for such success, and there are. Those boys are friendly, courteous, eager to please. They not only give service with a smile, but include many little unasked-for extras. For after all, being in business for themselves, they have a personal reason for keeping customers so well pleased, they'll come back again and again. And there, friends, you have the important difference in signal service, a difference in thoroughness and conscientiousness that can add so much to the life of your car. What's more, it costs nothing extra. It's ready for your car at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealers. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Claudia, it came to you in a flash the minute Agatha mentioned the lighter. Edmund. The peculiar remarks he made when you arrived at the house last night. I'm not disturbed, he said. And then something about being free after 20 years. Yes, it all fits together now, Claudia. Too bad he's standing in front of you with a gun in his hand. You're being very foolish, Edmund. Do you think you can get away with this? As a matter of fact, madam, that's precisely what I was going to ask you. What do you mean? Edmund, you took the lighter, didn't you? You put it in the bedroom next to the body before the police arrived. Begging your pardon, Mrs. Elliot, but if I may say so, you're underestimating my intelligence. Do you think I'd be so foolish as to plant a piece of evidence which I knew wasn't there at the time of the killing? I saw you use the lighter, you know. I took your coat. Edmund, I refuse to listen to That will be enough from you, Miss Agatha. You'll have your chance to talk directly. Inspector Dutton is on his way. What do you mean? I heard you saying that Mr. Perry had nothing to gain, Mrs. Elliot. That perhaps there was someone with a bit more of a payoff, you might say. Don't listen to him, Claudia. Edmund, what are you trying to say? Mr. Rodney was determined to change the will in Mr. Perry's favor, madam. But he didn't. He'd planned to call the lawyer this morning. He told me to remind him just before the unfortunate incident. So you see, there was someone who stood to lose everything if he'd lived. If you hadn't tried to make it too perfect, Miss Agatha. Agatha! He's lying. The monster's making this up. The small matter of the cigarette lighter, you see. Only you could have made the mistake of thinking Mr. Perry had left his raincoat at the house with the lighter in the pocket. You beast! You can't prove it, you can't! You have a chance to talk, madam. And you'd better be working on your speech. Inspector Dutton is a mighty critical listener. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. 
This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. The Signal Oil Program. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, two for the money. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Presently, I'll tell you of nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. As New Year's Day 1945 draws to a close... The Signal Oil Company joins 1,800 Signal gasoline dealers in hoping that the coming year will be a good one for you and for your car, too. During 1944, you know, 150,000 cars wore out each month, one out of every 12 on the road. So yours has been a pretty lucky car so far. But it'll take more than luck alone to make today's cars last out the duration. It'll take thorough, conscientious servicing of every part. And no one gives more conscientious service than your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. Being in business for himself, he naturally has more incentive to do a better job. The kind of job that will keep you his satisfied customer. Later in the program, I want to tell you about several outstanding signal services. For each one is designed to do for your car the thing you want most today. To help it go farther. But now, the whistler. It's strange, isn't it, how a man can live his life through several decades, simply, quietly, in peaceful obscurity, and suddenly, through one small incident, find his world turned into chaos. For instance, there was Tom Barlow, who lived with his wife, Ellen, in the small seacoast village of Marblehead, and whose whole life had been spent as a lowly driver of the town carry-all. Combination taxi, delivery truck, and tow car. To everyone in Marblehead, he was just old Tom, until that night a few months ago. A raining, stormy night it was, with a feeling in the air of foreboding, if you were particularly sensitive. And the man who came to Tom, just as he was getting ready to go home to dinner with Ellen and Judy, his daughter, wanted to be driven out to Guilford Inlet. It was no pleasant trip on a night like that, lonely, miserable... But a fair was a fair, and Tom started out. Halfway there, they had to cross the inlet, and Tom was just beginning to worry about whether or not the bridge might be washed out. Driver? Driver? Yes, sir? Is that the Guilford Bridge ahead? Yes, sir, that's it. <laughs> Lucky for us, it's still there. You sure picked a night to come out to this godforsaken neck of the woods. When you get to the bridge, stop. Stop? What I said, stop. Mister, there's no need to stop. It's eight miles yet to the inlet. Stop when you get to the bridge. Okay, mister, whatever you say. How much do I owe you? Well, you're not getting out here. How much do I owe you? A dollar and a half, but look, mister. Yeah, two dollars. Keep change. You're crazy, mister. There isn't a house within eight miles of here. I like walking. But, mister, I'm not going to leave you out on this bridge alone. Good night. Well, Tom, that's a queer thing, isn't it? Strange fellow. Never did get a good look at his face. He kept it muffled up in his scarf, his hat pulled down low. You've half a mind to run after him, 
But in ten seconds, he's disappeared into the blackness. And you drive back to town, wondering, trying to make up your mind whether you should tell somebody about him or not. Then, when you're putting up the cab for the night and you happen to glance in the back, your mind is made up for you. That's what I told him, Sheriff. I said, I'm not going to leave you out on this bridge alone. Mm -hmm. What time was that, Tom? Oh, about two hours ago, at nine o'clock. I tried to argue with him, Sheriff, but he just wouldn't listen. Okay, what happened then? Well, then I came on back to the garage, and when I was cleaning out the back of my cab, I found this package. Package? What package? This package right here, what I came to see you about. Here, look for yourself. Cash, $25,000. I thought I'd better turn it in quick. Well, I'll be... Hey, Tom, listen. Huh? You left this man on Guilford Bridge two hours ago? Yeah, that's right. Nine o'clock. Sure was a queer bird, Sheriff. Had a muffler over half of his face. Could hardly hear him talk. I said to him... Sergeant, get out the car. Get five men. We're going to Guilford Bridge. Gary... See anything down there? Something here, Chief. Well, it's spot where I left him, Sheriff. Right here. Hey, Chief. Uh, Chief, look. Yeah? I found this uh, coat and hat under the bridge. Hey, Eddie, put your flashlight over here. That, that's the coat the man was wearing. And that's his hat, too. You sure, Tom? I'm positive. Oh, Sheriff, dug this muffler out of the water about 20 yards down the stream. <laughs> that's his, too, yes. Yeah. That's what he had over his mouth. Made him talk so peculiar. The hat, coat, muffler. Looks like he drowned himself, all right. You aiming to drag the inlet, Sheriff? Not tonight, I'm not. In the morning. Anyhow, with that undertow, a body would be two miles out to sea by now. That's right. Huh. Well, what do you suppose he done it for? Poor guy. Poor guy? <laughs> Tom, he left $25,000 in your cab, didn't he? Oh, oh, well, money don't mean much. If you're so low, you want to jump in the river. <laughs> money don't mean much, huh? Listen, Tom, if we don't find that man's body, if nobody claims that money in six months, you know who it belongs to? It belongs to you, Tom. Me? Yes, sir, you. That's the law. Me? If nobody claims it in six months, and if we don't find the body that fits this hat and coat. Well, Tom, that's quite a stroke of luck, isn't it? Imagine, $25,000. More than you've ever dreamed of. And it's yours. Almost. You stand on the bridge and gaze into the dark water below and wonder about your strange passenger. But perhaps you wouldn't wonder if you could see something happening at a lonely house eight miles away at Guilford Inlet. Who's there? I'm asking who questions and let me in. Who is it? Well, Mrs. Wilmy, so you don't recognize me. And after I've paid your salary, kept you living here all these years. <gasps> Mr. Ben. Yes, it's me, and don't stand there gawking. Let me in and close the door and make some hot coffee. I'm frozen to the bone. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Same dismal old place. Mr. Ben, where's your hat and coat? You're soaking wet, Mr. Ben. Where's your hat and coat? You're soaking wet, Mr. Ben. Hey, heaven, woman, can't you say anything better than that? Twenty years. Twenty years, and I come home to... Where's your hat and coat, Mr. Ben? Mrs. Wilmy, you're still a fool. Uh, uh, yes, sir. I'll get the coffee. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, sir. You still go down to the village every day and gossip like a fishwife? Uh, well, oh, sir, stop, I... Sir, stop, sir. Stop stirring me. Now, listen. While I'm here, you keep away from the village, do you understand? Order your groceries by phone, if this morgue still has a phone. Oh, no, sir. Not since you left. Barlow Manor's all boarded up. Except in my room. All the better. You'll have the delivery sent once a month then. Nobody's to know that I've come back to Guilford. Is that clear? No one. Uh, uh, yes, sir. If you want coffee... Mrs. Wilmy, for the love of heaven, stop fluttering. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> oh, me. Nothing changed. You're still afraid of me, aren't you? Aren't you? Uh, y- yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, please, sir. Go get the coffee. Uh, yes, sir. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. My brother Tom, he still drives that taxi of his, I suppose? Oh, yes. They say down in the village. Never mind your fool gossip. 
Still driving a taxi after 20 years. Mr. Happy Go Lucky. Everybody loves good old Tom. Don't they, Mrs. Wilmer? Oh, yes. He's such a cheerful man. And his wife, Ellen, is such... Get out of here. Uh, Get uh, Go get the coffee. And don't you babble about Ellen Barlow, you understand? Don't you ever babble to me about Ellen Barlow. <laughs> Yes, Tom Barlow, if you could see that scene, and your brother Ben sitting in the old family house in Guilford Inlet, perhaps you wouldn't wonder so about the stranger's disappearance. But you don't see that, and so to you and your wife, Ellen, it's like a dream. <laughs> Oh, Helen. Helen, it's like a dream. $25,000. Why, we're going to be rich. Oh, Tom, put me down. Put me down. Oh, we are, Ellen. We are. Even the sheriff thinks so. Oh, oh. We, we ought to go out and do the town. Well, we'll have plenty of time for that, Tom Barlow. After six months. Wilmy. Miss Wilmy. I'm coming, sir. I'm coming. I was just bringing your tea things. Oh, never mind the tea things. Where's my tonic? Heart's pounding like a trip hammer. Uh, right here, sir. On the train. Where's the afternoon paper? Here you are, sir. But there's nothing new about Mr. Tom and the money. Who asked you that? Uh, well, I... Mrs. Wilmy, you're nosy, aren't you? Oh, oh, please, Mr. Ben. Oh, stop <laughs> that sniveling. You're nosy, Mrs. Wilmy. But you are a good housekeeper. Uh, well, I do be quiet, try... Be quiet, be quiet. I feel like talking. Yes. Pour the tea. No, 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 don't stand up. Sit down here by me. Oh, very You're well. You're going to chat, Mrs. Wilmy. I'm expecting a um, business friend of mine today at Five Shop, a Mr. Peterson. Uh-huh. He's going to do something for me. Uh, yes, sir. But you and I will chat until he arrives. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, lemon and two sugars, sir. Oh, well. Yes. So you remember after all these years, huh? <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> Mrs. Wilmy, I'm a very rich man. I made a good deal of money in the city. Yes, sir. And I have remembered you in my will. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Oh, be quiet, be quiet. You'll be well off when I die, Mrs. Wilmy. Very well off. That's why I think you'll keep your mouth closed about lots of things. Oh, I never... I said... feel like talking. Mrs. Wilmy? Did you read that they haven't found the body yet of the man who left the money in my brother's taxi? Oh, yes. They've been dragging the inlet for weeks, sir. They can drag for years. They won't ever find the body. You know why, Mrs. Wilmer? Because I am the body. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Ben. Sure, I'm the body. Oh. I left that 25000 in Tom's cab. I wanted him to find it. I put it there. But, Mr. Ben... I'm going to break Tom Barlow. You watch. Uh, please don't tell me. I don't want to know. Six months he'll wait, thinking he's rich every day, more certain. He'll be building air castles. You watch. Oh. I know Tom. He won't wait for six months. Fools around here will lend him money on speculation. Oh. He'll get in deep. You watch. Oh. Tom, happy go lucky. Oh. Always said he could get along without money. Oh. Married Ellen on a shoestring. <laughs> shoestring? And I could have given her everything. I could have given her clothes, a house in the city. You mustn't tell me, please don't. They're happy, go lucky. I can just hear him now. Money isn't everything. Money only causes trouble. Married Eleanor a shoestring. Well, this time he'll find out what money can do. <laughs> You are listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company, marketers of famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Now the pattern is clear. Ben Barlow, after 20 years, is planning to extract his revenge for his brother Tom's marrying the woman he loved. He's planning to ruin his brother with the promise of the money he found, and then snatch it away at the last moment. And Tom, good old Tom, 
seems to be falling into the trap slowly, reluctantly, happily. <laughs> oh, 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 now, fellas, money isn't everything. Uh, we'll yeah. see if you say that when you get the 25000 <laughs> oh, I will. He's got four months to go yet. No, he's sent you his chicken. The money's as good as in the bank. Been eight weeks now, nobody's claimed it. And who do you expect going to claim it, anyhow? A ghost? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tom, uh, I hear you and Ellen and the kid are planning a trip to New York to see all the shows. Huh? Well, maybe. Well, all I can say is if anybody deserves that money, it's Tom Barlow. Uh, uh, Tom, <laughs> where were you? Well, thank you. Any person in the village won't be counting the days till six months is up. <laughs> One hundred and four. Judy, are you doing your homework? One hundred and five. One hundred and six. One hundred and seven. One hundred and seven days, Pa, and we'll be rich. Judy, I told you not to talk about that money. Oh, now, leave her be, Ellen. It don't hurt thinking about it. Oh, Tom, can't you see what I mean? Can't you understand? We've always been happy, Tom, the three of us, without too much money. And now Of course we have. Of course we have. And that's why I want you and Judy to have everything in the world. Why, you don't think I want the money for myself. Tom, listen. Let's withdraw our claim. Let's forget all about the money. What do you say? Tell the sheriff to give it to charity or something. Will you, Tom? Will you? Ma, are you crazy? Oh, she's teasing you, Judy. I'm not teasing. I've got a funny feeling about that money. But, Ellen, dear, I'm, I'm kind of counting on it. We've already run up a few bills and all, and what with this little deal I'm working... And... Deal? What deal? Oh, nothing, Ellen. Uh, Judy... What... Deal, Tom. Just a little surprise. Hey, you know what I've been thinking? We all need a little vacation. Yes, sir. Get away from town for a while. Jerry Mason says that I could get $600 for the cab. And... Tom, you're not going to sell the cab. Well... Oh, Pa, that's wonderful. We could go to New York and see Radio City and go to all the big shows and, and everything. Oh, Pa, I love you. You're so wonderful. Isn't he wonderful, Ma? Tom, you're not going to sell the cab. Please. Now, Ellen, don't you worry. Everything's going to be all right. Yes, everything's going to be all right now, isn't it, Tom? You're getting more certain of it every day. It's been four months now, and you've almost forgotten about the stranger. But, uh, he hasn't forgotten about you, Tom. Oh, so look at Mrs. Wilmer. Yes, sir. Good, good. Now, what about this man, Peterson? Uh, well, sir, Mr. Peterson uh, uh, said that uh, everything was uh, going the way you wanted, sir. Uh, that's fine. Good man, Peterson. Real good man. What else? Uh, what, what, sir? What else? Uh, well, sir... Uh, Come on, out with it. Uh, well, sir, there's talk around that Mr. Tom and... and, and uh, For the love of heaven, woman, will you go on? You told me never to mention Mrs. Barlow's name, sir. What about Mrs. Barlow? Uh, she and Mr. Tom aren't getting along so well. <laughs> good, good. So they're not getting along, huh? Now, isn't that too bad? Money isn't everything. You watch Mrs. Wilmy, he'll probably mortgage the house next. Money isn't everything. You watch, I know, Tom, he'll mortgage the house. And when you find that suicide note... Suicide <laughs> note? Oh, didn't I tell you, Mrs. Oh. Wilmy? You're going to discover a suicide note oh, in Guilford Inlet. <laughs> oh, and you're going to bring it straight to Sheriff Tompkin. Well, Ben, you have it all figured out, don't you? And it's working out just as you expected. Because when the sheriff tells Tom Barlow about the suicide note that was found at the bridge, you react just as your brother expected. But, Ellen, there's no need to worry. Now, with that suicide note found, the money's practically in our hands. I told you it was just as good as ours. But, Tom, why did you have to go put a mortgage on this house? No, don't you? You don't understand, dear. I needed the money now for that deal that I was working on. So why wait till the six months is up and lose out on a great opportunity? But, Tom, how can you spend money like this before you get it? But I'm not spending it, Ellen. I'm investing it for our future and Judy's. Oh. Why, why, Mr. Peterson told me we'd be set up for life. And as for the mortgage, well, that's just a trifle. I can pay that back ten times over the day I get the 25000 
The day you get the 25,000, Tom. The day you get it. Will that day ever come? Ben waits in the lonely house at Guilford Inlet, enjoying reports of your spending, spending, spending money you haven't got. <laughs> hey, set up ten beers for the boys, Joe. You bet it won't be long now. One ale, Tom. And one ale for Jerry. Yes, sir. Oh, hi, Sheriff. What did you have? Uh, Tom. Tom, I've got to talk to you for a second. Well, sure, Sheriff. What's on your mind? Do you know a man named... Peterson? Peterson? Well, I sure do. Come on, have a beer, Sheriff. Have any dealings with him? Well, this is important, Tom. Well, yes, yes, I did. He came to see me with a mighty attractive proposition, and I, well, I placed some money in his hands. Very much money? All I could get my hands on. Mm. Mm, mighty attractive proposition. Yeah, that's not good. It, it's not good? No. Tom, this Peterson, as he calls himself, is a well-known New York crook. What? Real name's Clark, Pinky Clark. Deals in phony stocks and bonds. No. He's skipped town, and your money's gone with him. Tom, you've been swindled. So, Tom, now you know. The first blow has fallen. All your great dreams of wealth and affluence, gone in an instant. You were smart, weren't you, Tom? Very smart. Tom, why did you do it? Uh, I was so smart, Ellen. I was going to be rich and to be a big businessman. <laughs> Can you imagine me? I wanted to make you proud to be Mrs. Tom Barlow. Oh. Yes, I wanted you to walk down the street and have people punch you out and say, Look, there goes Ellen Barlow. Oh, Tom. Guess I never meant to be anything but Tom, the taxi driver. You're right, Ellen. All along you were right. We should have withdrawn our claim like you said. Money's brought us nothing but trouble. Tom, how much do you owe the bank? Eighteen thousand. Eighteen thousand. Oh, Tom. Tom, we've just got to get that twenty-five thousand now. We've just got to. Yes, Tom, your situation is desperate now. You have to get that twenty-five thousand dollars now. It will just about pay off your debt, lift the mortgage on your house, and buy back the taxi. And then the real blow falls. The six months is up. It's the night before you're to claim the money, and it's dark and stormy. Another foreboding night like that one six months ago. And as you sit by your fireside, you're startled by a knock on the door. Hello, Tom. Well, I'm afraid I don't... Ben. Ben. Glad to see your old brother, Tom. Ben. I guess I'll have to invite myself in. Nasty night. Hmm. Nice little place you have here. Ben, what are you doing here? Now, that's a fine way to greet your brother after 20 years. Ben, what do you want? Still haven't changed, have you, Tom? Still hate your devoted brother, Ben. Well, Tom, it's taken 20 years. 20 years. But I've just about done it. Done what? Driver? Driver, is that Guilford Bridge up ahead? Huh? Stop when you get to the bridge, driver. I like walking. Ben! Don't you remember your old lucky passenger, Tom? Huh? Ben, you were... The man in the cab. No. No, the man in the cab was drowned. They found a suicide note. <laughs> ben, it was you. Twenty years, Tom. Twenty years, and I've come back. So, money isn't everything, Mr. Happy-Go-Lucky. You'll find out, you and Ellen both. Right now, that 25000 is the most important thing in your life. And you're not going to get one red cent of it. I put it in your cab. I'm going to be at the sheriff's office... With serial numbers and identification. Money isn't everything, eh? You married Ellen on a shoestring. You married the only woman I ever loved. You'll find out how important money is tomorrow morning. Now you know the whole plot, Tom. Now you know how you stand. The money you so desperately need is not yours and never will be. 
No need even to go down to the sheriff's office tomorrow morning. Because Ben will be there ahead of you. Unless... Unless... What if Ben didn't show up? What if Ben couldn't show up? Who would know but you? But that's murder you're thinking of, Tom. Murder. You've never done anything or thought anything like that. But tonight you're desperate and you think the whole thing out. It's simple, really. Ben staying out at Guilford Inlet, alone in that big house. You can borrow the taxi back for a few hours and get out there. Drop his body in the inlet and... Yes, he's brought you to this, Tom. He's driven you to murder. A night just like the last time you drove out this way, isn't it, Tom? Stormy, dismal, dangerous. And you're driving faster than you should. You're almost to the bridge, Tom. Watch out. Uh, darn that windshield wiper, I can't... Good Lord, the bridge, it's out! The Whistler will bring you the ending to our story in just a moment. Meantime, here are just a few of the signal services that are helping today's cars go farther. When your signal gasoline dealer lubricates your car, he uses the famous signal safety chart on which the maker of your car shows every lubrication point and the exact lubricant it should have. And your signal dealer checks every point against the safety chart not just once, but twice, so not a single part can be missed. The signal four-star oil he puts in your motor is solvent refined to give you a pure paraffin base oil that reduces carbon and sludge and protects every motor part with a tough, long-lasting film that resists heat and wear. His regular battery and tire checking service help you get extra months of wear. Should you need a new battery, his heavy-duty Signal Deluxe batteries are guaranteed up to two years. And his retread jobs using only the finest material help you get more miles out of every tire. In those and a dozen other ways, Signal dealers are helping today's cars go farther. You couldn't close New Year's Day with a better resolution than to get acquainted with your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer soon. And now, back to the Whistler. The next morning, a man staggered into the sheriff's office at Marblehead to claim the $25,000. He was battered and bleeding and drenched to the skin, but he was alive and able to take the money and go home to his wife, Ellen. Yes, Tom Barlow was able to jump clear of his car as it crashed through the demolished bridge. He came back to the sheriff's office just because he wanted to make sure. And he was considerably surprised when Ben didn't show up. He found out later why. Because when they pulled his wrecked taxi out of the inlet under Guilford Bridge, they found a body close by in the debris-choked water. Ben Barlow. Ben Barlow driving the other way in the early dawn to claim the money and complete his revenge hadn't seen that the bridge was down either until it was too late. Monday at 9 o'clock, the Signal Oil program will bring you another strange tale by The Whistler. The Whistler is brought to you by The Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline and motor oil, and by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil program, produced by George W. Allen, with story by Louis Pelletier and Jacques Anson Fink, and music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. The Signal Oil Program. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, the body wouldn't stay in the bay. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Presently I'll tell you of nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. But first, here are two tips for getting in extra miles of driving out of your present gas ration. One, keep your tires fully inflated. You see, when tires are soft, they drag on the pavement. It's as if you were constantly going uphill. That's not only hard on tires, it wastes gasoline, which could be taking you farther. And now, tip number two. Invest your ration coupons in the gasoline that's been famous for years for long mileage. Signal Go Farther Gasoline. No, Signal doesn't promise you all the brilliant performance of pre-war Signal Gasoline. Everyone knows certain gasoline ingredients have gone to war. But true to their tradition of quality, Signal does guarantee you, today's Signal gasoline is the finest that can be made under wartime limitations. Mileage is still its outstanding feature. And mileage is what you want today. So invest your next ration stamp with your neighborhood Signal gasoline dealer. Then see if you too don't say... Signal gasoline is your best buy today. Signal does help you go farther. And now, the whistler. This is where it was, right here. Not where the story ended, as Jim Mars thought it would, but where it really began. This is the spot where the beautiful Monica Lee's body came to the surface and was discovered by the police. They identified it and returned it to a small town down the coast where it was claimed by relatives. And Jim Mars quit thinking about it. That was six months ago. Yes, this is where it was. On the dock by the bay outside the Skyland Club. Jim Mars Skyland Club. Here comes Jim Mars. He owns the Skyland Club. He likes to see a crowd in the club, but he doesn't see one now and he scowls. He walks around the tables and up the stairs to the door that says, Manager on it. He tries it. But it's locked. Who is it? Jim Mars. Open it. Just a second. What's the matter with you, Tony? You scared of something? I keep it locked lately. No use taking chances. What chances? Everything all right? Sure, but who knows? Somebody's always beefing. They're bound to when you're running a clip joint. I thought you knew what to do when anyone beefed. You gotta be tough. That's the only way to be right. Sure, if you can't do it any other way. There isn't any other way. You know what's the trouble with you, Tony? Sure, I got ulcers. You got ulcers. You got holes in your head. All right, you tell me. You lost your nerve, Tony. What? I said it, you ain't got your nerve anymore. I'm going to keep my eye on you ever since that little blonde on the floor shore was found in the harbor. Why should it bother you? You didn't kill her. Or do you feel responsible? Yeah. Yeah, what? I brought her in here to give her a chance. She was a good, clean kid. And it was a good thing I tried to do for her. I wouldn't have cared if it had been one of the others, but it has to be her that gets washed up out of the harbor. And for that, you lose your nerve? Listen, I've heard of guys losing their head for a gal, but never their nerve. And a dead dame at that. Monica Lee wasn't a dame. She was a nice, clean kid. She didn't know from nothing. Meaning what? Meaning she wasn't brought up to understand she couldn't say no to a guy like you. Some people learn hard. You think you taught her anything? Listen, things are either right or they're not right, see? I got no time for teaching 
Oh, well, we're talking about things that ain't right. What about this club? Sure, Jim. What about it? If Monica had lived, we'd be making money by now. But she didn't. And it ain't paying, is it? No, not quite. We're losing a little. All right. We'll put enough dough on this plate to start three clubs. I want to start taking some in, see? Jim, you know you can't take it out if it's not here. You're the manager. See that you get it here, then. Well, I'm through with you. And I mean through. He's sort of a nasty character, isn't he, Tony? He's got all the courage in the world. You had it once, till Monica was killed. Maybe if you could get your mind clear, you'll think of some way to get even with him. Maybe you'll think of something. Walk. Walk, Tony. How did you happen to walk down here, Tony? Down by the dock? Is it a coincidence, or did something attract you? Yes, there's someone right over there who'll be glad to see you. She trails you down here, and she's waiting, Tony. What do I get if I bump Jim off? Nothing but trouble. It's not true what he said. I haven't lost my nerve since Monica got killed. I got it yet. I'm just playing it smart. What happened to Monica? What's that got to do with it? Hey... What's that dame doing over there on the pier? Hey! Hey, you! Stop that! Wait! Here, you can't do that. I can't do that. Jump! What? Jump! I thought you were going to... To jump? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean... It. You were wrong. All right. I guess I was. Must have been saying things. I... Yes. I guess you were. It's the place. A friend... A uh, girl. They pull her out of this water here. I can't... A girl? Yeah, she would... Something happened. And you're haunted by the memory. No, who said I was? I thought that's what you were saying. I wasn't. I said I wasn't. Oh, yes. I heard you. Well? You just came down here because it's a nice place to walk. Beautiful scene. Lovely atmosphere. No. No. I was just walking and thinking, and here I am. I'm figuring I might jump. I saw you there. I swear it looked like... It must you... have been on your mind. Were you thinking yourself? Me? <laughs> Why should I? Yes, I see what you mean. I thought maybe it was on your mind. About that girl. What about the girl? Not a thing. You mentioned it. What's the matter with you? Somebody putting drops in your drinks lately? Or is it indigestion? No, 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 it's nothing. Just a guy I was thinking about, that's all. A guy I was talking to a while ago. Jim Mars? How did you know? Do you know Jim Mars? I know a lot of things, Tony. What? You know me? Who are you? Stop, let me go. Okay, okay, I won't hurt you. Only it's so dark, I can't recognize you. That's just as well. You might not want to know. Stop it. Tell me who you are. Maybe Jim Mars wouldn't like it. A devil with Jim Mars. And your sentiment for Monica. How do you know her name was Monica? I told you I know a lot of things. Like what you were thinking about on your lonely walk tonight. You were thinking you'd like to kill Jim Mars, weren't you? You're pretty smart, aren't you? You know an awful lot. That wasn't hard to know. Jim always did give you a bad time, Tony. Who are you? Tell me. Here. Why don't you light my cigarette? Sure. Monica. Monica. No, it can't be. You should know, Tony. Monica. No, Monica's dead. Killed by Jim Mars. Dead and in the bay and now on the ground. Let's not go into details, Tony. You don't get this. I thought... thought you were dead. Do I sound dead? Do I look dead? Your voice sounds a little different, maybe, but... So help me, Monica, you look just like always. Now, let me tell you this, Tony Canello. I'm not the same Monica I was before. You know what happened, and we won't go into that. But I'm telling you now it can't happen again. 
I've come back here because I have work to do, and I mean to do it. Are you following me? Yes, Monica, of course. Haven't I always? Never mind. I just want it straight. You're not going to help me kill Jim Mars. I want to know it this minute. Yes, Monica, yes. I'm... I'll help you. Believe me, I will. And no funny business, Tony. Uh... Well, relax. I'm glad you're back, Monica. I'll breathe easier. And I wonder how Jim Mars will breathe. It's not so easy. And not very long, I hope. How are you going to work it? I'd like to scare him to death. I'm afraid it'll take a little lead, too. I'll go back to work just like nothing had happened to me. You're never to admit that you see or hear me. That's all. It's going to be pretty nice having you around, Monica. It'll seem just like old times. That's right. Just like old times. You are listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company, marketers of famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Life will be a lot simpler with Jim Mars out of the way, won't it, Tony? And it helps to have Monica on your side, doesn't it? She gives you strength and nerve. Pretty nice. But, Tony, don't ask yourself if it makes sense or not. Take what's given and be thankful, but don't be too curious about Monica. That'll keep till later, one thing at a time, Tony. Pretty awful, Tony. Monica, where'd you come from? I didn't hear you come in. Close the door. Been here long? No, just a minute. I thought I'd drop in and haunt you. But I don't seem to bother you. <laughs> you must think I'm a real person. You're real enough to me, baby, and maybe you think that doesn't bother me. You know, I feel like a new man since you got back. You've got nothing on me. I feel like a new woman. <laughs> Boy, that is a good one. <laughs> Hey, it reminds me. Jim was here the other night. Did he see me in the chorus? I couldn't tell him. I didn't mention it. He didn't let on to me. Some of the boys tell me he's acting pretty jumpy lately. Ah, good. I've instructed everyone in the chorus and around the joint that you are not here. Yeah. Somebody asks about you. They don't know from nothing. It's well, Tony. Yeah, what do you want? Boss, Jim Mars just came in the club. Where is he now? He's coming over this way. All right, Joe, leave your switch on. Sure, boss. He's right here. Hi, Joe. Are you talking to yourself? <laughs> Somebody has to tell me off and there was nobody else. Look, I've been waiting for a horse to run for three weeks. So today he runs and I'm not on him. Well, you take it from there. And he went by a mile. Well, you might as well try uh, Yabo on a seven tomorrow. Yabo? Well, gee, Mr. Mars, thanks. Hey, Joe, you remember Monica Lee? Monica? Oh, sure, sure I do. Hey, she was some chick. Uh, have you seen any way around here lately that looks like her? Like Monica? No, nobody could look like Monica, Mr. Mars. No? Uh, well, maybe you're right. Well, um... Uh, uh, where's Tony tonight? The boss is upstairs in his office. And, uh, thanks for that dog, Mr. Mars. Don't get aboard unless he's better than 10 or 1. Okay, okay. Boss, did you hear? Yeah. Okay, Joe. He's wise, all right. Beginning to work. It's a nice little gadget, huh, Monica? Ah, oh, sweet. Hey, where can I go and listen to what he has to say to you? In the accountant's office. There's no one there now. How do you work it? This switch here, kick it up yeah. like that. Now beat it. And don't make a sound because it comes through here, this door. Boy, are you getting brave. The door wasn't even locked. Oh, Tony, you can't really be that busy. Oh, Jim. How are you? Sit down. Sure, I ain't taking time you need for, uh, business? <laughs> Quit it, Jim. You know I always got time for you. Oh, sure. You can give me a minute, I guess, huh? Only make it brief, huh? Ah, oh, quit kidding, Jim. Oh, I'm kidding, huh? Well, aren't you? Yeah, I guess I am. What's eating you, Jim? Only you, Tony, that's all. Why me? This big shot stuff you're putting on with me, I don't like it, see? Oh, no, Jim, I don't see. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, okay, so I'm nuts. Just forget it. 
Make out like I didn't say a word. Anyway, maybe it's something I ate uh, or drank. Or did. What? Maybe it's something you did that upset you. Nothing upset me, I tell you. Well, I thought you said it then. And I didn't know, but what, it might be something in your past that was on your conscience. Tony, since when have I had a conscience? Oh, I heard about guys getting one all of a sudden. You talk like you got holes in your head all of a sudden. Now drop it. Want a drink? Uh, not now. I want to talk business. Shoot. Don't tempt me. <laughs> That's sharp. <laughs> Pretty sharp. <laughs> How's business? Huh? You making any money yet? Ah, well, you'll be glad to hear business is better. How much better? A couple of hundred a week. Expense about the same? About. Payroll? Practically the same. What do you mean, uh, practically? Oh, well, you know how things are these days. Had to give the dealers a couple extra bucks a night. I try to keep them happy. Quit baby and make them happy. That way they knock down too much. Mm. How about the girls? The girls? Yeah. Uh, any new ones? Sure. The few in the chorus, you know what the turnover is. Uh. Well, I guess I'll breeze. Keep it in mind what I said about this joint plan. Yeah, sure, I'll remember. Well, uh... Jim, was there anything on your mind about the girls? No, um, no, no, no. I, I just saw some frail down there last week. It looked like Monica. I, I wanted John. That couldn't be, could it? I never had one come back to life yet. You're bragging, Jim. Yes, Jim. That sounds just like old times. Uh, what was that? Who said that? Said what? You heard her, Monica. That was Monica's voice. You're nuts, Jim. I didn't hear a thing. You didn't? Well, I didn't hear anybody but you. You're crazy. Uh, that box, it must have come out of that. Well, that, that's not even on. Want me, boss? I was just trying to see if it was on, Joe. That's all. See, Jim wasn't even on. You sure you didn't hear nothing? Look, Jim, you better go see the doc. How do you know you're not the one that's nuts? I just asked myself. Oh, nuts. I couldn't be. Why would she say that? What'd she say? Just like old times. Yeah, that'd be Monica, all right. She was always saying it. But these aren't old times. No. And Monica's dead. That was her they dragged out of the bay, wasn't it? You ought to know. You identified her, didn't you? Yeah, I did. But she'd been in the bay a long time. Yeah. Well, if it was, Monica, and if she ever comes around, I'll have something to say to her. Would lead. That would make it just like old times. Well, Jim, just like old times. Or so everybody says. There's something funny going on around here, isn't there? It's almost like a conspiracy, and yet you know it can't be. And you're getting worried. It's maybe just a little too much like old times. What with Monica around. Yeah. Yeah, who is it? Jim. Hello. Monica. Monica, is that... Monica, is it you? Yes, Jim. Maybe I, I can't believe it. How can it be? Oh, you don't seem very happy to hear from me. Believe me, baby, a thousand times I've been sorry for what I did. A thousand times I'd approach you back if I could. And here I am, Jim. Well, how? Where? I don't think you believe me. But, but let me see you. I gotta talk to you, baby. Well, you're talking to me, Jim. But I wanna see you and talk. You drive me nuts. I've been seeing you day and night, hearing your voice. What's that all about, anyway? M Monica, you... You're not dead. You killed me, didn't you? Oh, don't throw it up to me. I didn't mean to shoot her. I lost my head. Sure you did, Jim. I'm sorry, Monica. Honest. Give me a chance to show you. I may. Right now. Let me see and prove to myself that I'm not going nuts. That you're real. I won't hurt you. No one is ever hurt by something he's not afraid of. Jim, I'm not afraid of you. Good for you, baby. Now, you let me see you? Oh, sure, Jim. 
I never could resist you. But it's going to be different this time. You said it, Betty. Where are you? Drop around to the club. At 11, I'll be in Tony's office. Why there? Why don't you come up here? Jim. All right, all right, all right. Good. Can't you make it sooner? Now, Jim. Be a good boy. All right. I'll be waiting. Me too, Jim. It'll be just like old time. <laughs> And now you're really confused, aren't you, Jim Mars? Partly relieved because now you know Monica is really back. But more confused because you can't figure out how she got back. You don't happen to believe in ghosts, do you, Jim? Well, you'll know soon enough. Remember, 11 o'clock in Tony's office. You alone, Tony? Huh? What do you think? I'll get smart. Okay, take a look around. I don't see it. That's tough. Where is she? Suppose you tell me who you're looking for. I don't know mine, really. Uh, that's right, you ain't. Look, I was talking to Monica today. She said she'd be here at 11. You must be haunted. Monica's dead. And who should know that better than you? I told you I talked to her today. Jim, didn't you kill Monica six months ago? Oh, I thought so. Then how could you talk to her? She was here, I tell you. I know that. Did you go see the doc yet? He said there was nothing wrong. Maybe you better have somebody check on him. You think I'm crazy? Well, I'm not. Because it could be Monica. She might not be dead. I thought you dumped her into the bay. Oh, that's just it. I didn't. That's something I've never been able to figure out. Her turning up in the bay. Unless... Unless I only wounded her and she started crawling for help and fell off the dock. Oh. So you're not even sure you killed her? Oh, I... I don't know. We'll find out in a minute. It's 11 o'clock and she's... Gentlemen, please don't get up and I'll join your friendly circle. Circle. Triangle, and I don't like triangles. Triangles? What are you talking about? Now, boy. You heard her? Who? Monica, listen to you nuts. Brother, you really blown your tongue. What do you mean by Monica? Oh, look at you, dummy. Can't you see her? So help me, Jim. You and I are the only ones in this room. <laughs> Monica. Monica, did you hear that? Tony can't see you. He can't hear you. What does it matter, Jim, as long as we can see each other? As long as we can be together. Sure, baby. Just us. Us? What are you talking about? I'm talking to Monica. You keep out of it. Jim, are you telling me you can actually see Monica here in this room? Sure. Come here, baby. Just to show Jim you, you're real. <laughs> Is she coming to you? Monica, come on, baby. Come over and prove it. Where is she now, Jim? On your lap? Don't be afraid, baby. Come on. You don't know it, Jim, but you belong in the nut house. Monica! Oh, baby, don't just stand there and look at me. Say something. Ah, uh, Jim, you better go home and hit the hay. I'll have the doc come over and give you something. And tomorrow we'll get it fixed up for you to go to some nice, quiet spot and rest up. Monica, say something. Tell me you'll forgive me for what I did. You're really going off your nut, Jim, begging for forgiveness from a ghost. And you said if you ever saw Monica again, you'd talk to her with lead. Well, go on, Jim. If you see Monica, go ahead. Talk with lead. That should show you there's nobody there. Go ahead. Start shooting. Monica, listen. Go ahead, Jim. What are you waiting for? Talk with lead. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe I will. Look out! Jim! <laughs> Boss, boss, what's wrong? With those shots, I... Uh... Hey, Tony and Jim Mars. Yes. They're both dead. Monica, Monica, are you all right? Yes. Only don't call me Monica. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, picture this situation. Pieces of steel rubbed together 2,000 times a minute. Heat up to 2,800 degrees. That's what happens to your pistons every time your motor runs. And that's why, if your motor is to last out the duration, 
It needs the seven-way protection of Signal four-star motor oil, the finer motor oil that's solvent refined. This latest, most costly process known to oil engineers, solvent refining, gives Signal four-star motor oil, with its pure paraffin base, the finest lubrication money can buy. Solvent refining gives Signal four-star motor oil triple-strength film that clings to your motor surfaces for longer miles. Solvent refining makes Signal four-star motor oil flow freely in winter cold, yet retain its body when your motor's hot. Because of solvent refining, Signal four-star motor oil forms less carbon, keeps your motor cleaner, smoother. Add it up. These features are today's best assurance of longer motor life. So if it's been a thousand miles or two months since you last changed oil, do your motor the favor that will help it go farther. See your neighborhood signal dealer and say drain and refill with signal four-star motor oil. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Tony and Jim Mars lying dead, smoking guns in their hands, and Monica standing over them. Her gun in her hand, but she hadn't had to use it. And suddenly she doesn't like the name Monica. No wonder it's not hers. Hers is Maria. Maria Lee, not Monica Lee. That explains, of course, why Jim Mars didn't shoot her, but instead turned his gun on Tony. You see, the minute she walked in and Jim met her face to face... He knew she wasn't Monica. He guessed exactly right, that she was Monica's sister, who looked enough like her to be a twin. Right away, he figured Tony was in on some kind of frame-up deal, and so he shot him. Later, perhaps, he would have attended to Maria, too. But Tony shot him at the same instant his gun went off. Why? Well, Tony's plan was very neat. He figured Jim would shoot Maria, or Monica's ghost, and he'd shoot Jim. He'd be out of any rap on the plea that he had had to... tried to stop Jim's shooting of Maria. And he'd be rid of both of his troublesome friends. Yes, you see, Tony knew Maria wasn't Monica, too. He knew from the start better than anybody. Because it was Tony, jealous Tony, who had found Monica wounded by Jim's bullet. And to get even with them both, had finished the job and dumped her body into the bay. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, the Signal Oil program will bring you another strange tale by The Whistler. The Signal Oil program is broadcast for your entertainment by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline and motor oil, and by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer, who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil program, produced by George W. Allen, with story by Hugh Keegan, Music by Wilbur Hatch is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. The Signal Oil Program. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler.
Tonight, murder has a signature. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Presently I'll tell you of nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. But first, a little boy wants me to ask a favor of you. A dime. He'd be here himself to ask you, but this little fellow is crippled, in bed. And your dime is to help him get well, so someday he may walk again. You see, he's one of the 19,000 Americans, mostly children, who were stricken last year by infantile paralysis. Few homes can afford the long, costly care required by this dread disease. But thanks to the dimes contributed through last year's March of Dimes campaign, sponsored by President Roosevelt... More and more victims of infantile paralysis will walk again. Today starts the nationwide 1945 drive to replenish this important fund. It's your opportunity to do what you can to control this crippling disease, which, but for the hand of providence, might have stopped at your home. Send your dime or more, if you can, to President Roosevelt or your local chapter of the March of Dimes. Don't put it off. The need is now. And now, The Whistler. It was an old house, set back in the trees a little way from the lake. And it had a miserly look about it. You could almost tell that its owner was wealthy and cranky and miserly and happy in her self-pity. And all the loneliness of her own life, she took pleasure in passing on to her only companion, her servant, Martha. Martha! Martha, where are you? Martha, do this. Martha, do that. Always Martha. Now, there you are. Didn't you hear me calling you? What are you doing in the kitchen? Breakfast dishes. Breakfast dishes what? Breakfast dishes. Miss Brewer. That's better. You haven't made my room yet, and you know very well that's to be tidied before you touch a thing. Another thing. I know very well you heard me calling. Why didn't you answer me? I didn't hear you. One of your moods again, eh? Well, how long is it going to last this time? Never mind. Take this envelope. I want you to row across the lake and place these securities in the bank. Row across? Be careful with them. They're worth a great deal of money. I want a bank receipt, too. Can you remember that? But it's three miles across the lake. I'll not have you wasting the motorboat gasoline. You're big and strong, and the tip won't hurt you a bit. Well, just a minute, Martha. Yes? That dress. Where did you get it? This? Yes, that. It's one of mine, isn't it? It's an old one. I didn't think you'd care. I do care. I've told you before that I'll not have you wearing my clothes until I give them to you. Go to your room and take it off. Never any money to spend on myself. Because you're a fool with money. You with your cheap perfume and penny jewelry and frilly shirtwaist. Trying to play the lady. It's a good thing I put a stop to it. I've earned my money here. I've got a right to do what I want with it. Martha, I promised your people I'd look after you. I knew how giddy you are. Your wages are well invested. But I want pretty things. While I can enjoy them. Not when I'm old. Why, you're only ten years younger than I am, you fool. I'm nearly sixty. Now go to your room. Take off my dress. No. Take care, Martha. I've had enough of this. You've had enough. How about me? I'm sick of being treated like dirt under your feet. Go to your room. And I'm sick of working for an old cheat who steals my wages. (gasps) Martha, you didn't think I'd dare slap you, did you? If you only knew how I've wanted to do that. Oh, I've dreamed of doing it. How dare you? How dare you? It was good. It felt good. The police will know about this, you ungrateful woman. The police? (laughs) No, nor anyone else. You won't get a chance to tell anyone. Not even see anyone. You can't keep me here a prisoner, a captive in my own house. I can't. And who would know? You have no friends. Nobody visits you from one year's end to another. 
Even the people in the village stay clear of your nasty tongue. You dare to do that to your mistress? Mistress? I'll show you who's mistress. <gasps> my glasses. You've broken my glasses. Yes. Do you think you can get help now? You're half blind without them. It's eight miles by road to the village. You'd be lost in the swamps in ten minutes. Yes. I am mistress now. <laughs> Well, at long last, Martha, you've summoned up the courage to do what you've wanted to do for so many years. You're a little surprised at the success of it, how easy it was. It's a pleasure to see her cringe before you, call you my dear, ask sweetly when she wants something, and then there's so much money here, enough to buy you all those things you've dreamed about. Martha? Oh, so there you are, Martha. Where have you been? Marketing. Where do you think? Well, you've been so long and it's cold in this room. Oh, so cold. Might have left the fire for me, Martha. Do be considerate, my dear. Considerate? When were you ever considerate of me? My back used to ache from breakfast to bedtime. And a lot you cared. Oh, it's different now, isn't it? Oh, it's cold, Martha. <sighs> well... Wait till I get my things off and I'll make tea. You and your back. Oh, thank you, my dear. Quite a change has come over the old lady, hasn't there? My, what a sweet thing she's getting to be. I've been thinking, Martha. So? She's been thinking. No, I mean it. That lovely dinner dress of mine, it's not old. Not really old at all. You can have it. I want you to have it. Second-hand stuff again, eh? No, thanks. I'm not having any. Now, look here. Let me show you something. Well, you bought that in the village? Yes. That, and this, and this, and this. All of them. They're pretty, aren't they? Isn't that stealing, Martha? You have no money. You must have been in my cash box. Stealing? You talk about stealing when you've stolen months, years of my life. This stuff isn't all, either. There's lots of other things up in my room. Shall I show them to you? No, Martha. Well, why don't you say something? Well, there's nothing to say. If those few things will make you happy, then I'm glad. I want you to be happy, my dear. <laughs> you old hypocrite. You don't fool me a bit. What you wouldn't give to have the police here now. <sighs> How you misjudge me. Is that a letter there? Letter? Yes, you have a letter. I suppose you want me to read it to you. Uh, please. I'm surprised somebody thinks enough of you to write my dear Aunt Bessie. Aunt Bessie? I'm motoring south tomorrow with my wife, Lillian. It's been so many years since we were last together. I thought I might stop on my way and renew a long, neglected acquaintanceship. We should arrive sometime Friday evening. Uh, affectionately, Harvey. My nephew, Harvey. Why, I haven't seen him since he was a small boy. What does he want? You read the letter, Martha. He wants to see his aunt. Today is Friday. Well? Tonight, Martha. He'll be here tonight. Tonight? <laughs> Come, my fine lady. Put on your pretties. You must look your handsomest when my nephew arrives. It's my money. I haven't really stolen from you. You can't do anything to me. Stolen from me? Of course you haven't, my dear. My poor woman, didn't I tell you I wanted you to be happy? You mean you're not going to do anything about it? Well, it's all unimportant, Martha, as viewed in contrast to a greater crime. Crime? What crime? Kidnapping, Martha. Kidnapping? You held me against my will for the purpose of obtaining money. And that, under the law, constitutes kidnapping. If you've held me in my own home, makes not the slightest difference. I didn't hold you. I didn't. You know the penalty, Martha? You're trying to scare me. Death, Martha. No, you can't. <laughs> Your nephew. I'll explain to him. Oh, come, my dear. It was inevitable, you know. Don't look so unhappy. It isn't often I have guests, my dear. Fill the sherry decanters on the sideboard. Bring out the linens, the brewer's silver. For tonight, I entertain. You can't. I won't let you. Too late, my dear. 
Imagine my nephew wanting to visit me after all this time. Ironical, isn't it? Eighteen years. Eighteen years. Then he wouldn't know you. Recognize you, would he? Well, perhaps not. He could scarcely be expected to, I suppose, but... Martha, what are you thinking? Nothing, Miss Brewer. Nothing at all. You are listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company, marketers of famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. situation is a little more serious than Martha ever dreamed it might be, isn't it? Old Miss Brewer's nephew coming, and you, Martha, threatened with prison or worse. And there's not much to do about it. Or is there? Harvey will be here soon. Even now, he and his wife are driving over the muddy road up to the house. Look. Look, Harvey. Is that it through the trees? Must be. It's the only house we've seen for miles. There's a light in the window. Oh, thank goodness. This is the loneliest, most dismal place yeah, I've ever... Yeah, that wind. Looks like rain. At least we beat that. I only hope she lets us in. What do you mean? Why shouldn't she let us in? Oh, I don't know. But she's a nutty old dame. I gather she doesn't think too much of me. I used to write her once in a while when I was younger, but she never once answered a letter. Well, then if you haven't even heard from her for 18 years, why should she be the guardian of your money? Well, after all, she's my only living relative... I'm hers. Okay, here we are. I'll pull in under this tree. Not too far from the porch. It's starting to rain. Okay, Lillian, you run for it. I'll bring the bags. Well, hurry up. You'll get wet. And there's no bell, Har. Never mind. That wind. Feel how the house shakes. It's old. You can see that. Hey, Listen. Yeah, somebody's coming. Did you close the windows in the car? Yeah, I did. Well, please knock again, Harv. I'm cold. I tell you, I heard somebody. Yes? Well, how do you do? I'm Harvey Brewer. I know. Come in. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Follow me. This must be it, Harv. In here, please. Look. Look, Harv, the fire. Oh. Doesn't it look wonderful? Wonderful as heaven. Thought I never would get warm again. I suppose I can leave the bags here for the time being. That'll be all right, won't it, miss? What do you want here? What? Oh, oh of course. Uh, please tell Miss Brewer that her nephew and his wife are here. Her nephew, Harvey. I'm Miss Brewer. You? What's the matter? <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> How stupid of me. I should have known. I'm sorry. Frightfully sorry. This is, uh, this is my wife, Lillian. How do you do, Miss Brewer? Why have you come? Why? Well, well to see you, to pay you a visit. After all, you are my aunt, you know. I... Well, I must say, I'd hardly expected this reception. What did you expect? Really, my dear Aunt Bessie, uh, if I may call you Aunt Bessie... You may not. You're not wanted here. Well, sorry, I I only thought that after all these years... That... I'm quite satisfied not to have any visitors. I want to be alone. Surely you don't mean that you'd, you'd turn us out on a night like this after we've come all this way. I didn't ask you to come, but now you're asking us to leave. Is that it? Well, as long as we understand each other now, we might as well settle our business oh, now. Oh, Lillian. Business? What business? Go on. Tell her, Harvey. Well, uh, it, it's about my money. I want it, Aunt Bessie. Money? Uh, you you came here for money? I, well, I didn't think it would be necessary to have to come to the point so, so abruptly. But, yes, I need money. I must have money. No, I... I can't give you any. But after all, Aunt Bessie, it's my money, you know. You're simply holding it in trust for me. I know it's not due for another year, but the fact of the matter is I'm broke and I need it now. What's that got to do with me? Oh, it can't make any possible difference to you whether you pay it now or a year from now. And it makes a great deal of difference to me. How much is it? How much? You know very well how much it is, Miss Brewer. 
Ten thousand. I, uh, I can't remember everything. I'm not well at all. Uh, you've got me all upset coming here. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Aunt Bessie. We didn't want to disturb you. Look, just write a check and we'll be gone. A check? Yes. I can't write you a check. I, I haven't got that much money in the bank. No, and I won't have either for a week, a couple of weeks. Not for two weeks, huh? We can wait, Harvey. Wait here? You can't wait here? We're broke, Aunt Bessie. Look, we're really broke. We've no other place to go. Not even enough gas to get there if we did. Tonight, then. Tonight's as long as you can stay. Do you hear? I'll give you some cash tomorrow. And then you've got to go. I can write you a check. Are, um, securities any good to you? Securities? Your securities? Yes. Yes, of course they are. You really mean this, Aunt Bessie? Wait. Well, it's a worthwhile trip, Art. Wait a minute, Lily. There might be enough here. Enough? Well, I should say there is. Yes. Yes, of course, here. Take these two. What? They're marked $5,000 each. They're bank stock. Really, Aunt Bessie, this is awfully good of you. I can't begin to tell you how grateful I am. They'll have to be endorsed. Made over to you, you know, Harvey. Oh, well, naturally. Naturally. Uh, uh, do you mind, Aunt Bessie? Look, uh, here's a pen. Endorsed? Yeah, of course, just sign your name. Best Brewer on the back. And give me the pen. Here you are. <laughs> As if you didn't know. <laughs> there. You both leave early in the morning. <laughs> gladly. Believe me, gladly. And that's the last cent you get. You ever come here again? Ask me for more? I'll... Well, I'll disinherit you. Yes, that's what I'll do. Now I'll show you to your room. Well, things have taken quite a turn. All Harvey wanted was money, and Bess Brewer signed over $10,000 worth of bonds to him. Or did she? And what about Martha? But then Harvey doesn't know anything about Martha. And Martha doesn't really know much about Harvey and Lillian. Not enough, I'm afraid. Asleep, Harvey? Ooh, oh, no... She's very rich, isn't she? Uh, a million, anyway. Uh, maybe more. That's money, Harvey. Yes, it is. Harvey. Hmm? Did you know before tonight that you were in her will? No. No, not until she made that threat about cutting me off. You might get it all, Harvey. There's no other relative. A million or more, you said. Oh, no. Lay that pipe down, Lil. <laughs> the old girl's good for another 20 years. I won't go to sleep. 20 years. Good night, Lil. $10,000 won't keep us forever, Harv. No. We'll be broke again soon. I suppose. But we'll have one swell time getting that way. But I don't like to be broke, Harvey. You know that. Now, wait a minute. Are you... Are you threatening to leave me again? I'm only warning you, Harv. You know how I feel. That's why we came down here. Oh, is money all you ever think of? You married me with your eyes open, Harvey. I warned you then. Mm, I know. And I had enough of my inheritance to keep any ordinary couple happy for a lifetime. How we went through it all, I don't know. I told you I was expensive. I don't plan to change. But I'll stay with you as I promised, as long as we can live like human beings. Like millionaires, you mean? Mm-hmm. And you might be a millionaire if you had her money. But, Lillian, what can I do? Don't you know? Good night, Harvey. <sighs> You're a spoiled brat, Lil. I often wonder why I love you. But there's nothing, nothing I wouldn't do for you. You believe that, don't you? Mm. There's nobody in the house but the three of us. I know. Just you and I and the old lady upstairs. Well? Just the three of us, Harv. All right, all right. What about it? Nobody knows we came here tonight. No, nobody knows. Good night, Harvey. 
Lil. 20 years is such a long time. Lil. Oh. You know you always get your way with me. Yes, she always gets her way with you, doesn't she, Harvey? And so, you didn't get much sleep that night, did you? There was too much to do. And you had to get away too early in the dark, rain or no rain. Back in the city, you think it over and try to figure if you've forgotten anything. And you wait for the news. Uh Uh-huh. Well, it's in the paper. Already? Found her floating in the lake. We're not sure whether it's suicide or just what it is. Come on, read it. No picture? Not important enough for the city newspapers. Too far away to rate the front page. Well, what do you think? We're all right. Yeah. There's not a thing to connect us. Not a wrinkle left in the bed, not a fingerprint I didn't wipe off. We're all right. I found that letter that we wrote to her. We just simply weren't there Friday, Lil. Well, that's that. What about the securities? No, nothing doing. I tried again, but the banks won't touch them without her lawyer's endorsement. But it'll be a year or more before they settle her estate. I know. What are we going to live on in the meantime? Certainly her lawyer will verify her signature. I don't like it, Lil. All we have to remember is that we weren't there Friday. It was a month earlier when she paid you off. He'll never know. How could he know? I tell you, we're all right. Yes, everything's all right, Harvey. Stop worrying. Just run down to your aunt's lawyer's office and get his endorsement for the money. Then wait and see what happens. Who knows what good luck may come. May I offer my condolences on your aunt's passing, Mr. Brewer? It was a great shock to me. Well, yes, I imagine you knew her better than I did. Perhaps. She wasn't a very friendly woman, but she was a remarkable one. And now you said you had some business with me. Uh, yes. You see, about a month before my aunt's death, I, uh, I happened to stop down there to see her. Oh? Uh-huh. And, uh, she gave me these bank securities, $10,000 worth, the money she was holding in trust for me. But I thought... Yes, that... I, I know. It wasn't due yet, but she said she wanted me to have it anyway. And now the banks tell me that your endorsement is needed in order to cash them. Yes. That's an old routine arrangement I had with her. You just let me see them? Oh, yes, of course. Right here. Thank you. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Brewer, you got these securities from your aunt? Yes, I I just told you. Right, quite. And uh, this is her signature? That's right, as you can see. You were in your aunt's presence when this endorsement was made? You saw her sign her name? Yes. Of course. We both did. I see. It may mean nothing at all. I hope for your sake it doesn't. But this is something I think the police should know about. You mean the the securities? Yes. And uh, the signature. You see, Mr. Brewer, foul play is suspected in your aunt's death. The only clue the police have so far is a set of tire tracks found in the mud outside the house. Evidently made the night she died. But, uh, I, uh, I, I don't understand. No. You wouldn't, I'm sure. But you see, Mr. Brewer, this couldn't possibly be your aunt's signature. Because in spite of her intelligence and wealth, your aunt never went to school. She never learned to write even her own name. Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, here's a gas-stretching tip nine out of ten drivers don't know about. Actual tests prove that by keeping your motor in better condition, Signal four-star motor oil not only assures longer motor life, but also helps gasoline go farther. 
You see, solvent refining, the latest, most costly process known to oil engineers, gives Signal four-star motor oil seven-way protection. Its pure paraffin base is the finest lubricant money can buy. Its triple-strength film clings to running parts and stands up longer. In coldest winter, it flows freely, yet retains its body when your motor's hot. Because of solvent refining, Signal four-star motor oil forms less carbon, keeps your motor cleaner, smoother, getting maximum power from every ration drop of gasoline. So you profit in two ways. In longer motor life and longer gasoline mileage when your car's protected by Signal four-star motor oil. If it's been a thousand miles or two months since your last oil drain, it's time for a change to solvent-refined Signal four-star motor oil. See your friendly Signal gasoline dealer, your neighborhood headquarters for Signal products and fine quality automotive accessories. And now, back to the Whistler. So, Harvey had nothing to worry about. Nothing but the electric chair. And Lillian, who had to have money to live like a human being, will spend the rest of her life behind bars. Yes, the tire tracks convicted them, of course. That was one clue they overlooked. And it was enough to prove that they were there that rainy night. If only you hadn't tried to cash those securities, Harvey. The securities that first pointed suspicion at you. Now they'll hang you for the wrong murder, Harvey. They'll hang you for your aunt's murder. When actually, you killed Martha, the housekeeper, and dumped her body in the lake. Yes, but they haven't found her body yet, Harvey. Martha was the one who killed Aunt Bessie and threw her body in the lake. But you'll never be able to prove that now. Maybe if Martha had lived, you could have gotten out of it somehow. But not now. It was all so unnecessary, too. When you killed Martha, your aunt was already dead. And by the terms of her will, you had already inherited all of her money. Over a million dollars. Too bad, Harvey. Too bad. Monday at 9 o'clock, the Signal Oil Program will bring you another strange tale by The Whistler. The Signal Oil Program is broadcast for your entertainment by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline and motor oil, and by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer, who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil Program, produced by George W. Allen, with story by Louis Estee, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. The Signal Oil Program. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Seascape. I am the Whistler. 
And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Presently, I'll tell you of nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. But first, Signal Oil Company wants to pass along this timely warning. During 1943, according to the National Safety Council, 97,800 persons were killed right here in America in accidents. Of the deaths caused by autos, one out of five occurred when roads were wet or slippery, one out of five when driver's vision was obscured. Fortunately, precautions can be taken to help prevent these two types of accidents. For instance, tires that are worn smooth tend to skid more readily. But a deep, heavy retread job, the kind signal gasoline dealers are prepared to give your tires, will restore their grip on the road, help you stop more quickly. And if a worn windshield wiper is leaving streaks across your vision, signal gasoline dealers will install a fine new Rainmaster blade while you wait. So have your tire tread and your windshield wiper checked the next time you're at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealers. You'll feel a lot better knowing your car is prepared for the wet weather driving ahead. And it may help save a life. Possibly your own. And now, the Whistler. The Atlantic coastline from the Gulf of St. Lawrence south to Cape Hatteras and beyond is a treacherous one. An ever-present threat to the thousands of vessels which have for centuries moved in streams in and out of American ports. And the keepers of the lighthouses there are men with an awful responsibility. Men who must not only fight the perils of the storm, but must battle continually against the loneliness and despair of their vigil. It's not a very attractive life. No, especially for a girl like Madeline Murray who six months ago came to live with her new husband, Richard, at their lighthouse on a rocky island off the coast of northern Maine. Good Lord. Just listen to that wind. Yes, Richard, I hear the wind. Things have been quiet for too long. You know, I got a strange feeling something's going to happen. I wish it would. Oh, now, Madeline. Well, I do. Tell you, I can't help it, Richard. I'm so weary of the same old rocks and ocean I could almost scream. It's been six months, six long months. Of... I know, I know. But I tried to tell you before we... Yes, you did. I admit everything. You were honest and above board. You said it would be lonely and cold and silent, and I said it didn't matter. That doesn't help me now. It's driving me crazy, I tell you. I'm... Oh, please, Madeline. All right, all right, I'm sorry. Just like all the other times. But I've done everything I can. Yes, what? Well, for example, why didn't you go into Bango for a vacation that time? I told you you were free to go, and Aunt Elizabeth would have been glad to have you. Oh, I just didn't feel like going. But why? It's just what you want. Oh, don't ask me why. just didn't feel like going, that's all. Madeline, look at me. You don't love me anymore, do you? No. Furthermore, I never did. Well, you can... You can go if you want to, Madeline. I can't go, Richard. That's why I'm going crazy. I want to, but I can't. Why did you marry me? You want the truth? Yes. All right. I can't go. I've got to stay here for another year. Maybe longer than that. The last place in the world they think of looking for me. Looking for you? What do you mean? Who? The police. The police? I killed a man, Richard. Oh, no, you couldn't. Yes, but I did. You have to believe it. And after I killed him, I ran away. I didn't know which way to turn. That isn't until you arrived on the scene with your lighthouse. Who was it? man I loved once. A murderous. <laughs> you surprised? <laughs> That's why I married you, Richard. Now, what are you going to do about it? Uh, why did you have to tell me? Because I don't care anymore. Do you understand? As a matter of fact, I think the state prison has a lot of advantages over an acre of rock and a flock of seagulls. They'd hang you. Maybe. It has its advantages, too. You'll find out very soon. There's only one thing to do, Madeline. All right, fine. Radio the police. They'll send me to prison, Richard. But at last, I'll be free. That's a laugh, isn't it? <laughs> I'll be free of this rock. <laughs> you. <laughs> yes, 
Yes, Richard. There's only one thing to do. Radio for the police to come and get her. That's the law, Richard. To do otherwise would be to shelter a fugitive from justice. That's what you're thinking as the long hours tick away in the stillness of your bedroom. You remember a lot of things now. The night you wandered into the Staghorn Inn six months ago and found her there at a table, looking as if she'd been crying. And how you had tried to comfort her without much success until, at last, you had explained your lonely existence at the lighthouse. It was a different story then, wasn't it? Almost as if she'd suddenly got an idea. She was interested then, yes. Enthused about the paintings you brought to town. The seascapes you'd painted during the long, lonesome days there at the top of the point. Remember how she said she was tired of the city and longed to get away from it all, just as you did. And it didn't take her long, just two days to be exact, before you were sailing back to the lighthouse with your new bride. But that was six months ago. And now you know the truth. Madeline is a murderess. It's the next day. The nor'easter hits with full fury, but you hardly hear it as you sit and stare out of a window at the top of the tower. Hello, dear. Lonesome? Madeline, please. Oh, why so gloomy? After all, I'm the one who's going to prison. I... I still can't believe it. Oh, you will in time. Now, if you were a good husband, you'd be bustling around the house arranging a going-away party for me. You're not going away. You mean you didn't send a radio no, message? No, no, I couldn't. Oh, you love it. That's why, isn't it? Isn't it? Go away, will you? Well, certainly that's it. You couldn't bear to see me go. <laughs> you couldn't take it, could you? All right, so I couldn't. But nobody else will get you. At least you'll be mine. Look! Out there off the point. Good Lord. There's a man out there in a skiff. He won't last five minutes in that surf. What's he doing? He's waving an oar. Give me that megaphone. He needs help. Take the lead, guy. You can't land on those rocks. That wave. Yes, he's going to get it. I'm going down there. Maybe I can help. All right. Here, here you go. That's it. He'll be okay in no time. Thanks. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, here you are. Sit on the couch. Got to get these clothes off. Cold. I'm cold. Oh, oh it's passed out. Better cover you up, old man. You're all in. There you are. Where's the hot water? Is he hurt badly? Yeah. <gasps> What's the matter? I don't know. Yes, he's hurt pretty badly. Bad gash on the head. Give me the brandy, quick. Yes, yes, the brandy. He's chilled to the bone. Lucky, though. That sea seemed to pick him up and toss him over the reef. Yeah. Here you are. Ah, that's it. I'll warm him up in a jiffy. What's the matter with you, Madeline? You're shaking like a leaf. Can't be. Huh? What are you talking about? Not a coincidence. Not here. There must be a reason. You know him? Yes. His name is Adams. Blake Adams. He was with me on the night I killed a man. Yes, Madeline, the night you killed a man was a night neither you nor Blake Adams will forget for a long time. You're thinking now, as Blake lies there unconscious, of the afternoon the wire came from Maxie, saying he was just passing through town. Casual he was, just as if he hadn't run out on you, as if nothing had ever happened, just as if he were looking up a dear old maiden aunt. And when you told Blake about it, you were glad you couldn't read your mind, because it was full of murder. The way to do it didn't come to you, though, until Blake suggested you ask Maxie up to the apartment for a drink, just for old time's sake. Then it was as clear as a blueprint. Maxie was strictly a one-drink man, but this time one would be enough. So it's natural you're wondering about Blake and how he came to crack up right on your doorstep. It's been six hours now since Richard brought him in. And you, Madeline, haven't left his side. And he seems to be stirring. Uh, oh, my head. What happened? Where am I? Mm, don't sit up. No, don't sit up. There, that's it. I can't see where you are. You're lucky to be here at all. Here, take a drink of this. 
Thanks. How did you... Madeline? Yes. Surprised? Uh, not exactly. I'm... I'm surprised to see you, Blake. How... What happened? Lie back now, now. You're a good patient. Uh. You've got a bad gash over your eye. Uh. Yeah, the rocks, now I remember. That skip... You must have been out of your mind to go out in a storm like that. I had to see you, baby. What about Maxie? That's it, isn't it? They know about Maxie. What do you mean they know about Maxie? He died of indigestion, that's all. Maybe. Maybe not. I hope that's what they think. I don't know whether poor Maxie could stand a post-mortem. Wait a minute. I remember now. You mixed the drinks that day. Yeah, the glass with the red ring on the top. I was to make sure he got it. Who examined him? Doc Cranston. He treated him before for indigestion. Same symptoms, same everything. So you poisoned them. In the drink. <laughs> What's the funny about that? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, baby. <laughs> Couldn't figure out why you ran away. Yeah, it's funny. I didn't see you do it. You poured all of our martinis out of the same shaker. There were olives in the glasses already, weren't there? Yeah. I get it. Poison in the olives. So that's why you're here. You don't think it's because I like lighthouses, do you? You tell me why you're here. What happened? Did you get on the wrong streetcar or something? There's no use telling you, baby. You wouldn't believe me. You try me and see Okay, here it is. I traced you here through the guy who sold your house for you. Mm-hmm. Why? Well, with Maxie gone, I... I mean, I'll... Well, uh, come on, come on. Well, you're making it tough. We were pretty good pals once after he ran out on you that time. You with... Wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me... Yeah. That... I'm trying to tell you that I love you, baby. Since way before you met him, I tried to tell you a couple of times, but I guess I'm not the Charles Boye type. It's twice as hard now. It was all my fault, Blake. I couldn't see very well in those days. I know. I, I don't know what to say. I know I'm not much of a prize, Madeline, but you could do worse. Blake. Yeah? This is on the square. Huh? What can I do to show you? Honest, baby, I'll do anything. Oh, if this is another blind alley, I'll die. It's not a blind alley, honey. It's a four-lane highway. And there's one thing you can do. What's that? You can kiss me. <laughs> You are listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company, marketers of famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Blake and Madeline have found each other out in the lonely lighthouse off the coast of Maine. And it doesn't seem to matter now that it took a murder to place their feet firmly on the four-lane highway leading over the horizon. No, Maxie's death doesn't matter to them now. They only think of leaving the lighthouse in the cold gray ocean and Richard. What about that? What about Richard? The only other one who knows about Maxie. He's just returned from a trip to the mainland for supplies, and Madeline greets him at the entrance of the lighthouse. Well, back on time. Hello, Madeline. I was a little anxious for you. The channel's so rough today. Anxious for me? Afraid I wouldn't make it or that I would? Oh, please don't, Richard. Not today. I'm just being practical, my dear. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll change oh, my wait, clothes. Oh, wait. Just a minute, please. Something I want to talk to you about. About Blake Adams. Oh, yes. The patient. How is he? Well, he's almost well enough to go. Too bad. You seem to be quite fond of him. Yes, Richard, I am. I love him and I want to go with him. What? We haven't told you because we planned to simply take the boat some night while you were asleep. You're out of your mind. You'd be picked up in a minute. They don't know about the murder, Richard. He he, he died of natural causes. You mean you're free? I mean that the three of us are the only ones who know. That's why I'm telling you we're going. Huh. A worm turns, eh? What was it you said a while ago? What am I going to do about it? You wouldn't go to the police now, would you? <laughs> so I'm holding the strings at last. I'm a little more important to you now, oh, Richard, huh? Richard, I love him. You've got to believe you me. You don't know what love is. You can take your choice, Madeline. Stay here with me or hang. Thanks, huh? What? It's 
hard to believe today that I cracked up right out there, just like a mill pond. What's evening, Madeline? I don't know. Maxie, I guess. Oh, forget it. You know, we ought to take off tomorrow. I'm feeling pretty solid. What about Richard? I'll leave him here with his lighthouse. He'll never miss you. I told him about us. He doesn't want me to go. So what? What can he do? Well, he could tell the police what really happened to Maxie. What? You mean he knows? I told him about it the night of the wreck. He says if I leave, he'll go to the police. Did you see, dear? How could I know you were coming? It seemed to matter whether I lived or died. He couldn't dear. testify against you, but... Listen, does he know you poisoned Maxie? I didn't tell him how. Good. He won't be suspicious of his coffee, for instance. What do you mean? Yeah. It's a gamble, but we got a chance. We need 24 hours. Listen, it's about three hours from the dock on the mainland to the airport. I got a pal over there with a plane. We can make Miami in nine hours with luck and catch the clipper to Rio. I'll leave tonight and get everything set up. I ought to be back here by eight in the morning. That's where you come in. You mean Richard? Yeah. You gave me some sleeping powder when I first got here. Is there any left? Yes, I think so. It's in the medicine cabinet. Okay, you take care of his breakfast. A good long doze won't hurt him. When he wakes up, we'll be halfway to Rio. Just one thing. Don't give him too much. He's got to live. And so, all that night after Blake's departure, Madeline thinks about the job she must do and of his strange interest in Richard's welfare, the way he emphasized his warning about an overdose. Richard must live, he said. But why? Blake had never been so humanitarian. No, Madeline, you don't sleep much that night. And it's about five o'clock in the morning when your eyes finally close. Suddenly you wake. You jump into your robe and slippers. Yes, it's 7.30 and Richard's bed is empty. Oh. Good morning, Richard. Oh. Hello. The door is missing. Our good patient has left. Or am I telling you anything? Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Don't try and play innocent, sweetheart. Just what have you got up your sleeve? Well, he must have left after our talk yesterday. I, I told him I was going to be detained here. Oh, I see. Well, he's an ungrateful wretch sneaking off that way after I saved his life. So you've decided to be a good wife after all, eh? I'll fix your breakfast. No, don't bother. I've had it. What about coffee? No, thanks. Good. I had a rotten night. I couldn't sleep a wink. Sorry to leave you alone, my dear. I'll be up at the light. Well, uh, darling, I was hoping you'd have breakfast with me. Won't you? Well, aren't we considerate? <laughs> I'm sorry about everything, Richard. You know, I could almost believe you. If I didn't know you better. I was so wrong, Richard. I lost my head, I guess. Very well. Have your breakfast and come up to the light. There's something I want to tell you. And if you're still bent on being the perfect wife, you can mix me a bromide for this headache. I... Yes, Richard. Right away. Uh, that's a sour taste. This is a different brand. I guess so. Now, about Blake. He knows all about your your past. Yes. And are you sure of him? Oh, what do you mean? This. Well, an article has been torn out. Yeah, off the front page. You can still make out the tips of the top headline. Go on, look at it. Well, what about it? It said reward offered. Does that suggest anything to you? I don't know. How sure are you that your little escapade is a dead issue? Oh, you're wrong. He wouldn't do it. I know him. Oh, I don't know. People do strange things for money, Madeline. For instance, at this very moment, he could be telling some interesting things to the police. You got that paper yesterday. What did the article say? Unfortunately, I hadn't got around to reading it. You know, it wouldn't surprise me a great deal to discover you might be a bit hotter than you think. Well, I think I'll go down and take a short nap. Wake me at ten, will you? It's almost nine and still no sign of Blake. Madeline tries to shrug off the suspicion in her mind, but it's there to stay and it keeps growing, growing, growing. It's 
ten now. And while Richard sleeps downstairs, you pace the floor. No, no, he wouldn't do that to you. But where is he? What could keep him this long? The double cross. It must be. Yes, so why did he warn you against the overdose? Richard is precious to him, that's why. They don't pay rewards on arrest. They pay off on conviction. And Richard knows enough to convict you. Blake isn't coming back. The next thing you will see is a boatload of police. Yes, that's it. The launch down at the landing. Your only chance. Maybe you can make it before they get here. You can just get to the mainland. Now to find your small pistol and slip it in your purse. And now down to the launch. Ah, but wait a minute. There's a boat coming in. It's Blake, and he's alone. Grab the line, honey. Here you go. Where have you been? Oh, fancy not this time. We won't be here long. You all set? You're late. Yeah. I know. It wasn't as easy as I thought. You take care of him? Yes. What's the matter? I don't know. Oh, I snap don't out know. of it. The plane's all fixed. We'll be in Miami tonight. Cost me 500 bucks. But... Wait a minute. You were careful with the sleeping powder, like I said. Yes, just like you said. Why did you say it? What do you mean? Why were you so interested in Richard's health? No. Oh. One murder rap is plenty in my league, baby. Come on, we gotta go. Wait a minute, I've been thinking, Blake. Now, wait a minute. Something I found up in the house started me thinking. Well, think on the way. We haven't time to be standing around passing the time of day. Come on. Just a minute. It was a newspaper with an article cut out about a reward. Where did you find that? You I... tore it out, now, didn't you? They're offering reward for me. Now, you're wrong, baby. They're not offering a reward for you. There was something in it I didn't want your husband to see. Here, look. Does this make you feel any better? Receipts for the charter plane and two reservations to Rio. Does that look like a double cross? I don't know. you got to believe me. But we can't stand here arguing. All right, I'll, I'll get my bag. He's meeting us down the coast a few miles with a car. I thought it'd be safer. Put that boat back there. Where? Oh, fishing boat, I guess. It's, it's following us. No, it couldn't be. Fu- Holy smoke. Where's it going? For sure. That's a Coast Guard cutter. Oh, I was right, wasn't I? What do you mean? You thought you could lie your way out of it, didn't you? I've heard of some rough tricks, but this one takes the prize. You think you're all set now with the police moving up and your star witness back at the lighthouse? Madeline, you're wrong. Listen. Put that gun away. You're way off the beam, I tell you. I'm straight, baby. I'm for you. Oh, you're for me, all right. For the money I can bring you in court. Look, I have nothing to do with this. Look, I'll tell you now, it won't make any difference to either of us. That article... You're making a big mistake, baby. Just give me a minute. And shut up with your line, Blake. You and your four-lane highway to Rio. Hello, Sly They won't need a detective for this one. For a lying rat here. Right under the nose of the Coast Guard. Madeline! The Whistler will be back in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, here's the answer to a question many drivers have asked. Does motor oil have any effect on gasoline mileage? The answer is yes, definitely. It's only logical that anything that helps your motor run better will also help it deliver more power from the gasoline it uses. That's why the seven-way protection which solvent refining gives signal four-star motor oil is doubly important today. You see, because of solvent refining, the latest, most costly process known to oil engineers, pure paraffin-based signal four-star motor oil has triple-strength film that clings to motor surfaces, seals in power, retains its lubricating quality for longer miles, and actually forms less carbon. Best of all, while you're enjoying this improved performance, you're profiting in two extra ways. One, in longer motor life, and two, in helping your gasoline go farther. So make your next oil change a change to solvent-refined Signal Four Star Motor Oil. It's one of the famous Go Farther Signal products Featured by that lubrication specialist whose permanent business is helping cars go farther. Your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. Now, back to the whistler. It was too bad that Madeline didn't wait a few seconds longer. 
or she would have saved herself a great deal of trouble and a long term in the penitentiary. But that's the way Madeline always did things. Jump first and think afterward. And that's why she ran away a few minutes after poor Maxie took the drink and died, before anyone noticed that he had drunk the martinis, but had left the olive she had poisoned untouched. And that's why she shot Blake, before he had a chance to tell her that it was he the police wanted for Maxie's murder. Yes, he had had the same idea that day. And he put poison in Maxie's martini, too. And that was the poison that killed him, because it was in the drink itself. You see, he really loved Madeline, and Maxie was the only one between them and the four-lane highway over the horizon. And when at last the poisoning was discovered, the poison traced and the reward offered for his apprehension, Blake knew he'd have to run away. That perhaps there in the lighthouse she hadn't heard of it and would go with him. That's why Richard had to live. Because after all, it, it wouldn't do to have a murder rap hanging over her head, too. Would it? Monday at 9 o'clock, the Signal Oil Program will bring you another strange tale by the Whistler. The Signal Oil Program is broadcast for your entertainment by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline and motor oil, and by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer, who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil Program, produced by George W. Allen, with story by Vic Kushner, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline, the gasoline that does go farther. The Signal Oil Company presents The Whistler. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, murder on paper. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Well, to begin with, I'm not telling this story. No. Fred Wallace is telling it. Fred Wallace is a writer of detective stories for pulp magazines. And this is the best story he's ever told. Yes. Go on, Fred. Continue your dictation. You were a writer, a police reporter, and you never held a job very long. Just why was that, Fred? I was a victim of the ponies. I couldn't stay away from the racetracks. I was hitting the 40-year mark, and I was down at Hialeah Park in Florida when I met a gorgeous blonde from California named Lita Martin, her friend Vera Durant. This Vera was a widow who was tossing money around and having the time of her life. She wasn't too pretty, not as pretty as Lita, but her husband had left her a half a million dollars. That made up for it. What more could I ask? Uh, Am I taking too much time? All the time you want, Wallace. 
Well, by the time the Hialeah meet was over, Vera and I were married and on our way to her place in Los Angeles. Santa Anita was closed, but Hollywood Park was about to open, and I'd figured on running a stable and a string of ponies. I didn't mention the subject until we'd pulled out of San Bernardino. What's the matter with the idea, Vera? I thought you were crazy about horse racing. I had a lot of fun at Hialeah, Fred. I enjoyed watching the horses run. You want some money, didn't you? Little, but I didn't go for that reason. My friend Lita insisted I spend the season in Florida just... just to get my mind off things. Well, you certainly seem to have a good time. Now that I think of it, it seems silly. It's gambling, and I don't approve of gambling. What? Well, that's certainly news to me. The way you threw down hundred-dollar bills, I thought you were an old-timer at it. It was my first time at such a place. Oh, Fred, darling, there's no reason why we can't go to the races once or twice. Once or twice? I know you've been able to get by on your gambling, but you're 40 years old. It's time you settle down and accomplish something in a bona fide business. Business? What do I know about business? But I know horses, and with a good string, I can clean up. Fred, darling, there's no need for you to clean up. All you need to do is learn the business my husband left me. And to be able to take care of that. Oh, a chemical plant. Are you kidding, Vera? I'll speak to Mr. Adamson tomorrow as to the right job to start you on. And you'll find it most exciting when you get into it. Okay, honey, I'll try. Well, Fred, you weren't exactly conscious of it at the time... But that was when you got the idea for all this. You could pick horses, but you couldn't pick women. Once Vera got home, she was entirely changed, wasn't she, Fred? She was all business and hung on to nickels like they were $20 bills. What a change. But I went to work in the chemical plant at $75 a week and tried my best to like it. I was bored stiff. And finally, I located a bookie and started playing the horses again. One day I got a bit too deep and I borrowed some dough from a guy. When I stalled him a little too long, he threatened me. He was a well-known gangster and I got frightened. I went home during lunch hour to see if I could wangle some extra dough from Vera. But Vera, honey, a thousand dollars isn't going to break you. You act like you didn't know where your next meal was coming from. You have a salary of $75 a week, friend. And a car and all your living expenses are free. Any sensible person can certainly get along on that. Sensible or not, I need a thousand bucks now and I gotta have it. Why? All right. I borrowed that much from a guy to place a little bet, but I picked the wrong guy. He turned out to be a gangster. He's put me on the spot. Oh, don't be so corny on the spot. You won't let me have the money? That's childish nonsense. I'm not kidding. This guy's serious. But do you care? No. You got more money than you can ever use and what good will it do you? None. You're a cheap little penny pitcher. You better go, Fred. Back to the plan. What good is your money? No good. You don't enjoy life and you never will. Please. What good is a lot of money if you can't use it? You might as well have a bunch of rocks in the bank. You're a stingy, selfish, self-centered tightwad, Vera. Do you hear me? Stingy, selfish, and miserable. I gave her the works. But when she pranced out of the room and slammed the door, I knew she meant it. And I knew, too, that I'd overplayed my hand. Then I got to thinking about what I'd said. That her money was no good to her and that she didn't enjoy life. All kinds of dough and she didn't enjoy life. That's what I was thinking that day on the train. If she didn't enjoy life, why should she go on living? With the prologue of tonight's story, Murder on Paper, the Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales by the Whistler. But before we go on with the story, let's consider carbon, that word you hear so often in connection with automobile motors. Well, just what is carbon and what does it do? Well, coal is carbon, so is soot. Some motor oils form the hard kind of carbon in the cylinder head, gradually building up a thick, hard crust that causes knock, loss of motor efficiency, lower gasoline mileage. It can even cause costly repair bills. 
That's why the solvent refining of Signal Four Star Motor Oil is doubly important to you at this time when you want your motor to last out the duration and you want all the miles you can get from ration gasoline. You see, because of solvent refining, which is the latest, most costly process known to oil engineers, Signal Four Star Motor Oil actually forms less carbon. And it's soft, soot-like carbon that tends to blow out with the exhaust gases. Thus, by keeping your motor cleaner, more efficient, solvent-refined Signal Four Star Motor Oil does two important things. One, aids longer motor life, and two, helps your gasoline go farther. So for your motor's next refill, ask your neighborhood Signal gasoline dealer for your best buy today. Signal Four Star Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. That's when the whole thing crystallized, wasn't it, Fred? It was as clear as a bell. As a writer, you'd plotted a hundred murders where the killer was always caught. This time, you'd shuffle them all together and plot one where the killer would never even be suspected. You didn't have the plot yet, did you? But I knew I was going to kill my wife, Vera. I grabbed my hat and left the house, got into Vera's convertible coupe and started driving. I headed out sunset toward the beach. I don't know why, except maybe I didn't want to go back to the plant. And Vera had a beach house at Malibu. I pulled up in front of it, got out, walked down the side of the house toward the beach, sort of aimlessly. Started to flop down on the sand. I didn't see Vera's friend, Lita, stretched out on the beach next door. Fred! Fred, hey! What? Oh, hi, Lita. What are you doing down here at this time of day? I don't know, just monkeying around. Oh, yeah? Well, come on over here and sit down, Fred. I won't bite you. Yeah? Okay. I knew I shouldn't have done it, but I sat down close to her. Too close. And when a guy gets that close to a gal like Lita Martin... Well, it's like sticking your nose over a can of ether. <laughs> Are you afraid of me, Fred? <laughs> <laughs> afraid? Not in the least. Why? Oh, I don't know. Something's wrong with you. <laughs> a domestic problem, Fred? No, a business problem. Business? Oh, you're worried as much about the business as you are about the North Pole. I'm going to the races this afternoon. Want to come along? No, I haven't time for that sort of thing. Besides, Vera doesn't approve of it. I got a lot of work to do at the plant, and she'll expect me to make a report to her this evening. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that you're making such an effort to learn the chemical business. But it's certainly a mystery to me. What is? How you ever took up with a girl like Vera in the first place. Vera and I are very happy. You really love Vera? And not just her money? What a thing to say. Of course I love her. What's wrong with Vera? Nothing's wrong with her. She's one of my best friends. But... You and Vera are as much alike as, as night and day. At least you were. You get a kick out of everything, Fred. Vera is such a tight wad that she never enjoys anything, except making money. She's never really enjoyed life. How could she? What? Well, she has everything to make life livable, but she'll never enjoy a minute of it. Yeah. Uh, when are you going back to town? What? Oh, I'm going back now. Oh, good. You can take me in. I'll tell the maid I'll go in with you. I'll change in just three minutes. Ah, uh, you don't mind taking me in, do you, Fred? Why, no. It's a pleasure, Lita. Glad to. And it was on that ride back from the beach that you got the idea. Wasn't it, Fred? A few blocks from the beach, you realized the convertible was pulling hard to the left. You stopped on an incline and found the valve and the right front tire was leaking. You jacked the wheel up to change, but you didn't pull the emergency brake on hard enough. The car slipped off the jack and started to roll. But a call to Lita and she grabbed the emergency, eh, Fred? That gave me the idea how to get rid of Vera. She planned to go up to her mountain place that evening because the first snow had fallen. A perfect setup. But I needed a witness for what I was going to do, so I worked it so that Vera invited Lita. 
About an hour before we left, I put the leaky tire back on the wheel, then loosened the bolt on the emergency brake to where it would just barely hold when pulled all the way back. I dropped a couple of sleeping tablets in Vera's tea just before we left. Vera sat in front with me and Lita in the rear with the luggage. After we passed the Crestline turnoff, I picked a spot on a downgrade. I pulled off to the side, facing a five or six hundred foot drop. I stopped, eased the handbrake back all the way. It held just barely. What's the matter, Fred? I put that tire back on the wheel. I thought I'd fixed it, but it's almost flat again. I can feel it. I'll have to change again. Oh, well, can I help you? Oh, thanks, Lita, but I can handle it. Hmm, I guess Vera is sound asleep. Uh, hand me the jack and that wrench under your feet. Okay. I left them out because I didn't trust my job on that tire. Thanks, Lita. I'll have it changed in a jiffy. I jacked up the right front wheel till it just barely cleared the ground, removed the hubcap, applied the lug wrench, and I was all set to throw the car in motion. I wanted to get Lita out of the car on the opposite side because she was to be my witness if I needed one. Uh, Lita, bring me that flashlight beside you. Guess I'll need your help after all. It's dark out here. Yes, Fred. As Lita slammed the door, I gave a terrific pull on the lug wrench. The car rolled off the jack and went into motion. I yelled just for effect, but it was only a few feet to the edge. The car shot over, hit a ledge about 20 feet below, and then crashed on down to the bottom. I stood there looking down, acting as though I was paralyzed. Then I turned around with a horrified look on my face and let out a terrific groan. But... But Lita wasn't there. She disappeared. I was frantic. I screamed into the dark. Lita! But no answer. My witness had disappeared. You were terrified, Fred. You stood there trembling in the dark, screaming for Lita as though she were a mile away. Then it came to you. You grabbed the flashlight and shot it around and down on the ledge below. And there was Lita, on the rocks of the ledge and blood on her face. I knew then how she'd got there. She jumped on the left running board to grab the emergency brake and gone over with the car. That's what I hadn't counted on. Lita wasn't supposed to have touched the brake. Only this afternoon she'd pulled it on. Now when it didn't work, she'd know for sure that it had been tampered with. She could tell them that the accident was no accident. I picked up a rock, started down to the ledge to give her a good bash on the head. But a car pulled up, Fred. Vera, your wife, was dead. But they rushed Lita to San Bernardino. You never left Lita's side for three days because your witness was now a good prospect for state's witness. When she came to. But I thanked my lucky stars when she regained consciousness. She knew me. But she couldn't seem to remember just what had happened. I was awful sweet to her. I told her my own private version of the accident. Fred, what... what happened? Don't you remember, Lita? No. All I can recall is a, a terrible crash. Nothing more. The tire went flat, and I stopped to change it. I jacked the wheel up and started to remove the lug nuts, and it slipped off the jack and rolled over the cliff. Well, where was I? Vera was asleep in the front seat, and you were sitting in the back seat. You must have been thrown clear when the car hit the ledge. Or maybe when you saw the car rolling, you tried to jump out. Perhaps that's what saved you. Poor Vera. She didn't have a chance, did she? No. What do you mean? Well, didn't you say she was asleep? Did I say that? Well, yes. That's right, she was. Well, at least she didn't suffer. She probably never knew what happened. Lita, you... You can't remember a thing about what happened? No, I... I can't seem to remember just what it was all about. It's... It's all very hazy. But... Did the doctor tell you? Tell me what? Well, he said my loss of memory was only temporary. At least he hoped so, and... Maybe in time... He didn't say how long, but that in time everything will clear up. In a way, I hope that won't happen. Why? I'd rather not know any more about it than I do. For your own sake, I hope... I mean, I hope you never remember about it. It was too gruesome. Lita, 
Yes, Fred? Look, it was all my fault, darling. It was pure negligence on my part. I should have put a rock under one of the wheels. There's nothing that can be done about... about poor Vera now. But you're going to be all right. And I want you to know that I'll do all in my power to make up for it. It's my duty. It's the least I can do. What are you getting at, Fred? It'll be my duty from now on to take care of you, Lita. Vera would want it that way, I'm sure. Fred, I don't understand. Later on, we can be married, and I'll always stay right by your side. After all, you and I always thought a great deal of each other, didn't we? Are you trying to say that I'm paralyzed or something? No, darling, not that, but... Haven't you looked in a mirror? I think... Lisa, as soon as you're out of here, I'll spend every dollar Vera left me. I'll have the best plastic surgeons in the country, and you'll be just as beautiful as ever. Fred, I... <laughs> you are listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company, marketers of the famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Well, everything Vera had was left to you, wasn't it, Fred? But you dumped it all on the market, including the plant and all the real estate. Turned it into cash. Married Lita, had her face fixed up, and bought another beautiful place up at Big Bear Lake. And took Lita up there. You had no servants because you wanted her all to yourself, didn't you, Fred? I watched her like a hawk because I wanted to be around if she should regain her memory. But after a while, she got to acting kind of strange. She began to ask funny questions. About what happened at night, I mean. The cloud was beginning to clear up is what I figured. It was getting on my nerves. And I knew for sure that if it cleared up and she remembered about grabbing for that break, the whole thing would come out. She'd know that I'd killed Vera. Then one afternoon... Fred, I just had another one of those terrible dreams... Nightmares. Nightmares? Since when he'd been having nightmares in the afternoon. I've had several of them. It's terrifying, Fred. I... I can't understand why I always dream the same thing. I seem to be driving a car at fast speed. There's a high wall in front of me. I grab the handbrake and pull and pull, but the car won't stop. And just as I'm about to crash... I wake up in a cold sweat. Are you dreaming? Or is it just your imagination? Well, why do you say that? If you've got something on your mind, why don't you say it? I don't know what you mean, Fred. I didn't mean to upset you. I'm not upset. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you, dear. There was a man here to see you this afternoon. I said he'd drop by later. Yeah, what man? He said his name was Jenkins. He owns the garage in the village. Jenkins? What about him? Well, it was something about your brakes. I think he said your brakes were loose. He said he'd come by later. Brakes? I don't know what he's talking about. I've never had my car in his garage. The only connection I had with him was when he hauled that wrecked convertible up the... What's the matter, Fred? There's nothing. Maybe I'd better run down to the village and see Jenkins. Why? How do I know until I get there? <laughs> Yes, Fred, you don't like the looks of this. Rush down to the garage at the village and see Jenkins. See what he's told Lita. See what he's found out. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Wallace. Well, I got a little bill here for $18 that I can't overlook. Then I had uh, had something I wanted to tell you uh, about the Chrysler convertible, the one that went over the cliff. What about it? Well, you know I hauled it up the hill and took it to my shop. I've looked it over and... Uh, yeah, it can be fixed up. I told you I didn't want it fixed up. Junk it. Junk it? Well, then you'll have to sign this pink slip over to me. I'll sign it. Give it here. But I want it junked. Well, yes, sir, but I can only get a hundred for it as junk. All right, junk it, and you keep what you get for your trouble. I don't want anything. There you are. Huh. But what I wanted to tell you was... Yes? Uh, I know why it rolled over the cliff. Why? The emergency brake wouldn't hold. I know that. And that's something I can't understand. Handle pulls all the way back to the last notch, and the brake line and barely touches the brake drum. 
I can't understand that. I can. The brake lining was worn. It was loose. The brake was loose, but the lining wasn't worn. What? Well, it couldn't have been. I relined all the brakes for your dead wife last summer. And I cinched up the emergency to where it had worked when pulled only halfway back. Well, that's what this $18 bill's for. Well, then the bolt on the brake must have worked loose. No, no, no. I checked on that. The nut was screwed clear to the end of the bolt. But it still had a cotter key in it. I've never, never made a mistake like that in my life. Well, then how would it get loose? I don't know. I don't know. Unless somebody loosened it on purpose. Maybe somebody had it in for you. It's the only thing I could think of. As I was telling your wife on the phone, what? I... I said as I was telling your wife. You talk to my wife about this? Well, yes, yes. Didn't she tell you I called? How much did you tell her? Well, I tried to explain about the... You break. had no right to talk to my wife about such things. But I just thought you ought to know. Yes, of course. I just meant that you shouldn't have bothered my wife about it. She's been very nervous since the accident. I try not to mention it to her. Oh, oh. Well, I'm... I'm sorry. It's all right, only we're both trying to forget the whole thing. Sure, sure, Mr. Wallace. So just send me a bill and I'll mail a check and just forget about this. Sure, sure. I'll I'll get the bill for you in just a minute. Never mind, I have to hurry. I have to get home right away. Well, Fred, Jenkins stumbled onto the evidence, didn't he? He doesn't seem to suspect anything. But he talked to Lita. Lita, whose memory is returning. Now she knows what happened. All the way back, my mind was going a mile a minute. Lita knew. And I had to make my plans quickly. Plans to get rid of her. I drove in the back directly into the garage. I guess that's why I didn't see the car parked in front. When I rushed into the house, Lita was standing in the hall waiting for me. Oh, darling, I was hoping you'd get back. So you knew all the time. I, I don't know what you're talking about. But whatever it is, it'll keep. Right now, come in the living room. There's but somebody... But it won't keep. The game's up, Lita. Jenkins told you, didn't he? Didn't he? Well, he said something about the brakes on the convertible, but That's I... not all. He told you why they didn't work, why the car went over the cliff, didn't he? Fred, Fred, listen, the sheriff's office... Oh, and so the... you got the sheriff's office in on it, too. Well, what were you waiting for? Why didn't you turn me in long ago? You knew about the brake. You probably even knew about me putting the leaking tire back on and jerking the car off the jack. My only mistake was in not letting you go over the cliff with Vera. Now, it looks like I'll have to do that all over again. Fred! As if you didn't know. Now I'll have to take care of you. I don't think so, Wallace. I think I'll have to take care of you. What? Fred, I tried to tell you. The sheriff sent a deputy out to see me and... No, you did Stand trap me, you dirty... Fine, Mrs. Wallace. I've heard all I need You to. won't catch me! Fred, Fred don't! Don't, Fred! The Whistler will bring you the rest of the strange story in just a moment. Meantime, Signal Oil Company wants to pass along this important war production board warning about the shortage of auto batteries. Due to increased military requirements, WPB announces 40% fewer new batteries will be produced for civilian cars during January, February, March. You know what that means. More and more cars that need new batteries will have to make the old one do. So play safe. Keep your present battery working for you as long as you can by seeing that it gets the regular attention it needs. That means stopping at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer every two weeks for his complete battery checkup. He'll add distilled water to restore the safe level and remove destructive corrosion from the terminals. If your battery seems run down, his hydrometer test shows whether it needs recharging. And your signal dealer is equipped to give you a quick, thorough recharge job. All this is part of your signal complete go farther service. Every car needs it more than ever today. See that your car gets it by stopping at least every two weeks at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. And what happened then, Fred, after you ran out the door? I saw the deputy's car, but I didn't see the other guy, the driver. Until I ran past and there was a gun in my face. I took a wild poke at him, but he just slapped me on the side of the head with the gun barrel. When I woke up, I was sitting here. Yes, Fred. Sitting in the sheriff's office. And now you're speaking into a microphone. Making a record of your confession. (laughs) 
You may have been excellent at plotting murder on paper, but when a man's emotions become involved with the real thing, it isn't so good. You see, you were perfectly safe. You'd committed the perfect crime. Neither Lita nor anybody else suspected a thing till you yourself divulged it. And the sheriff's deputy has just told you that all he came by your place for was to return Vera's purse, which a couple of Boy Scouts had found in the brush where the accident had occurred. Yes, it was just nerves, Fred. Nerves. That's all. Well, I guess that'll be my last murder plot for a long while. Yes, Fred. I can assure you that the gentleman at San Quentin will see to that. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale, the curious story of murder is legal. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Oil and fine quality auto accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, story by J. Donald Wilson, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking and inviting you to listen next Monday night at 9 when... The Signal Oil Company presents... The Whistler. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, murder is legal. I am The Whistler, and I know many things for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who've stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. This is the Strip, playland of Hollywood. Here are the most elegant gaming houses and nightclubs in the Western Hemisphere. Here are the sumptuous apartments of the great and near-great the idols of a million adolescent girls. In the apartment of David Faraday, hero of costume epics and courtroom scandals. Mr. Faraday, wake up, Mr. Faraday. It's time for you to go to Mr. Costas' party. Come on now, Mr. Faraday. It's just me, Jenny O. There are no reporters here. I hope we're not, boss. Boss, I'm coming in. I know you're tired, boss, but you just got to get up. Trial's all over. Boss, are you all right? That's blood there. Oh, Lord, help me. Mr. Faraday, you've been shot. You're dead. Yes. In the elegant apartment of David Faraday on the Sunset Strip, 
The body of the screen's swashbuckling hero grows colder. Only two blocks down the street and the guests are arriving at a party given in his honor. A party given by the most important man in Hollywood. A man who's never been in front of a camera. Clifford, darling, am I late? Oh, Pudgy was an angel of patience. I spoiled the last three takes in my hurry to get here, didn't I, Pudgy? I'm so anxious to see David, and he won't answer his phone. He hasn't talked to anyone since the trial. Even me, his fiancée, and I've been calling him all afternoon. Clifford, what do you do? Hide your winning client so that the jury can't change its mind? I've been frantic, haven't I, Pudgy? If you don't mind, Miss Lorraine, my name is Puchowitz. Puchowitz, not Pootsie. Oh. What would my wife think? Pootsie, dear, your wife hasn't had a thought since she married you. <laughs> since before, maybe, huh? I wouldn't worry about David Madeline. He was very tired and probably went home to sleep. The trial was very wearing. However, I think that he'll be here. It was very close, wasn't it? I mean, the girl's story was quite sound. But, of course, we all knew that David would get off. With you for a lawyer, how could he miss? After all, you wouldn't want to spoil a perfect record of acquittal. Well, that's really up to the jury. But it was a difficult case. So much publicity complicates any defense. Hello, Madeline. Oh, Charlotte. Oh, darling, you look ravishing. That is, for a girl whose fiancé almost went to prison. Why, if it had been Tommy, I wouldn't have slept a wing. Oh, Mr. Carstairs, you know Miss Mannering of Colossal. No, I haven't had the pleasure. Oh, you're the famous lawyer, Clifford Carstairs. Oh, I've heard so much about you. No one you have ever defended has ever been convicted. Oh, of course, Madeline. How silly of me. Naturally, you didn't worry with Mr. Carstairs defending David. Well, you flatter me. The evidence freed him, not I. Tell me, Mr. Carstairs, is it merely evidence that frees all your clients? Naturally. However, the most important factor is careful preparation. Every contingency must be taken care of ahead of time. Of course. In a sense, the, the verdict is in before the case ever comes to court. Then it must be confusing if the criminal messed up the crime to start with. I mean, before you could take a hand in arranging the evidence. Well, naturally, Miss Mannering, I try to avoid uh, taking cases that are, that are too confused. Oh. However, no case is perfect legally. That is because no defendant ever considers the legal angle before the circumstances arise. The perfect crime will never be committed until a lawyer can handle the chain of evidence from the beginning of a crime, even before its commission. <laughs> but, of course, that is impossible. Unless he were to commit a crime himself. <laughs> that would hardly be ethical, Miss Mannering. Besides, he'd be unable to defend himself, and thus the whole theory breaks down. Uh, but before we embark upon our life of crime, Miss Mannering, uh, you'll find the bar in the library at the end of the hall. Oh, I... uh, my honor, Miss Mannering. Oh, what a delightful European bow, Mr. Put your wig. <laughs> Wait, Madeline. Yes, Clifford? <clears throat> you don't seem very happy. I, I thought this was to be our night. Our night to celebrate David's acquittal? Don't be absurd, darling. Oh, what could I do, Maddie? My professional reputation was at stake. Our love, too, darling. Don't forget our love. That was at stake. It was me or your reputation. In Kansas City, I think you would have chosen differently. Kansas City was ten years ago, Maddie. Isn't it enough that I still love you without having to give up everything that I've gained to prove it? Oh, Cliff, you were my only hope. If David had been convicted today, I would have been free and we could have been married. For the first time since my divorce from Jack, I was going to be happy with you. But this way... Oh, you won your case, but I've lost mine. No, I've lost two, Madeline. What? I've loved you for a long time. Even in Kansas City. Even when you left me to marry Jack. Need we talk about that now? Yes. Jack was the handsomer, the younger, the more promising. So you married him, even loving me. And still, I loved you. Your love has strange ways of showing itself then and now. You set yourself out to break my husband. You had him disbarred, ruined his career. Was that love? Well, I knew you'd leave him after he was no longer a shiny new prize. I didn't leave, Jack. He left me. After the automobile accident, the night you had him disbarred, he said he didn't want me to be saddled with a cripple, so he just disappeared. I couldn't come back to you then. That would have been crawling, and I won't crawl for any man. But you'd crawl to David to save your career. To keep your beautiful face in front of the public. That's something else. Something you could have saved me from if you'd loved me. Instead of having David acquitted today. You'll be quite safe now, Maddie. You see, David is dead. You mean you... Something like that. Yes. <laughs> Yes. 
With the prologue of Murder is Legal, the Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales of the Whistler. Now, before we return to our story, I'd like to ask you a question. Are you planning on repainting your car before the day arrives when you can replace it with a new one? If you're like most motorists, your answer is not if you can make the present finish last out the duration. Well, right there is where your signal gasoline dealer can be of real service to you. He now features the famous Venus one-application auto polish. In one easy operation, Venus removes dingy road film to bring out the true color of your car and then leaves the renewed finish sparkling under a protective glaze of Carnauba and Ozosirite, the hardest and most waterproof waxes known to science. Made by the Whiz Company, nationally famous for finer quality automotive products, Venus Polish is just one of your signal dealer's complete line of Whiz items to make your car look and run better longer. Next time you're at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealers, look over his Whiz products. You'll find motor rhythm, metal polish, car wax, radiator cleaner, upholstery cleaner, and many other upkeep items. Like all your signal dealer services, Whiz products have proven their ability to help your car last longer and go farther. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Madeline Lorraine, the glamorous picture star, has just heard the startling news that David Faraday, her fiancé, is dead. What makes it more startling is the fact that Clifford Carstairs, the famous lawyer, has practically admitted to her that he murdered David, his client. <laughs> but it, it's so funny. Did you understand me? <laughs> yes, Clifford, darling. David has been murdered. Well, I thought you'd be pleased, but... Oh, I... I am, darling. I am. <laughs> Just that it's so funny, so so horribly funny. You wouldn't risk losing a case, but you'd risk this, this crime. Oh, you're a born comedian, Cliff. Poochie should hire you. Stop it, Madeline. <laughs> Why? Don't people laugh when they're happy? My career's safe. So's yours. Our love is safe. Why, it's wonderful. But what about the police? You and me. Uh... Are we safe, too? Mm. Yes. Yes, I think so. The police will discover that Jack... Your former husband committed the murder. Jack? Well, I don't understand. Is he here? How did you... How could he... Oh, be... One at a time, sweet. Yes, yes, he's here in Los Angeles. I saw him last week. I had occasion to cut through Pershing Square on my way to see a client. He was... He was sitting with his wooden leg propped on a bench feeding the pigeons. He's changed, Madeline. I hardly recognized him. He didn't see me, but I made inquiries. I can find him when I need him. But I still don't understand. If you killed David, Shh. I... Well, you did, though. So why should the police... Very simple. Elementary matter of preparation. Oh. Faraday was shot with a gun registered to your husband. Uh, you've had it for years, but uh, no one will know that. Also, there are the marks of a peg leg on the balcony. The room was broken into. He had uh, plenty of motive. And besides, I think I can persuade him to confess. Uh, that is, if I make it sufficiently profitable. No, Cliff. No, we can't do it. Between us, we wrecked Jack's life. We can't make him pay for our crimes, too. Don't be silly. He won't be convicted. None of my clients ever is. Your glamorous friend was quite right. I've wanted to arrange my own crime, set the evidence beforehand, and I have. This is perfect, Madeline. It'll be a clear case of self-defense. With me as his attorney, Jack is a cinch for acquittal. It's precious, Cliff. Darling, you're a genius. You arrange everything the way you want it, don't you? It's wonderful. And so funny. So terribly funny. <laughs> yes, you planned the perfect crime, haven't you, Mr. Carstairs? Madeline thinks it's very funny. Funny and clever, Mr. Carstairs. Yes, Madeline Lorraine's husband, her first husband, that is, is a cinch for acquittal. That is, if he cooperates. And he will. Won't he, Mr. Carstairs? You know he will. Hello, Jack. The 
down. Glad to see you again. I'll bet. You were pretty sure of me, weren't you, Carstairs? Pretty sure I'd come when you sent for me. You came, I see. Ah, the great Carstairs wins again. Someday you'll overstep yourself like I did. I'm waiting. Why be so bitter, Jack? I've always liked you personally. You know that. Sure, you only broke my career. Had me disbarred for one little slip. And I get drunk and lose a leg in Madeline. That's all there was in my life. My career in Madeline. I'd be dead now, but for two things. Watching her rise in the world and waiting for you. Well, that was a long time ago, Jack. Why don't you forget it? I did what I had to do. There was no rancor in it. It was nothing personal. Won't you believe that? Maybe. How is Madeline? I guess she's going to marry that Hollywood heel. Too bad, Carstairs. Looks like you lose out again. I've got to hand it to you, though. You protected him. I hadn't thought you had so many scruples, Carster. He was my client. I had to protect him. Uh, I have another client now, though, and uh, I need your help. Well, well. I never thought I'd hear the great Carster yelling for help. You should have thought of that before you had me disbarred. Sorry, chum. Well, I told Madeline you wouldn't be any good to us. But she insisted that I contact you. Why didn't you say so in the first place? I didn't consider it was necessary. You know I see Madeline. I know you still love her. The story, please. You uh, do, don't you, Jack? The story, fast and good. Well, uh, Madeline, like all figures in the public eye, had some things in her past that the fans might not have approved of. It was essential that she keep them a secret. So? Well, David Faraday knew of these things and uh, was using them to blackmail her into marrying him. Late this afternoon, she met him at his apartment. The colored boy was out. No one saw her. They quarreled. Uh, she had that uh, old gun of yours in her bag. She shot him, Jack. The poor fool. Poor little fool. Is there any chance for a car, there? If it comes to open court, not one in a million. I'd do what I could, naturally, but there's not one chance in a million of getting off with less than life. How can you keep it from coming to court? By acting fast. They haven't found the body yet. When they do, the newspapers will be howling for a conviction. It's election year, and the D.A. will take a fast confession and not ask too many embarrassing questions. That's where you come in. Wait a minute. I'm not burning for anyone else's murders, wooden leg and all. I'm not asking you to burn for it, Jack. You see, I know this D.A. He won't even fight a self-defense plea if it uh, looks good at all. Uh, with Natty, there's too much supplemental evidence. They'd have to make it second degree. With you, it's a cinch. I'm Faraday's lawyer. My dictaphones will show his reactions to your being in town. How he wanted to send for you. How he, how he was afraid of you. Clear cut. Self-defense. Oh, Madeline would never chance. But I'd stake my reputation, even my life, on getting you off scot-free. What makes you think they'll believe this confession? Even if he did have a motive for getting me there. In the first place, that gun was registered to you. In the second, I've checked over the scene. He had a paper knife in his hand. I arranged the room to look as if a fight had occurred. Also, there are marks of a peg leg in the soft ground outside his balcony. In other words, if I don't cooperate... The police will probably pick you up anyway, precisely. And if I do? I am empowered to offer you the sum of $10,000. Fifteen. I won't haggle. Sorry, Carster, I can't see it. It's a fine deal. I go to the chair for Madeline's murder, and you pay $15,000 over to my widow. Maybe you'll even throw in a crypt at the cemetery, but it's not enough. Uh, let me restate my position, Jack. Perhaps I didn't make it clear. On the one hand... You confess the circumstances of Faraday's death, and I'll guarantee to get you off. On the other, I tip off the district attorney, and 90 to 1, they indict you anyway. Without my support, I don't think you'd have much chance of acquittal, especially when the blackmail attempts that you made on Faraday come out. I never tried to blackmail Faraday, and you know it. No, as his lawyer, i be in a position to know these details, don't you think? Did I ever tell you I hated your guts? Frequently, in Kansas City. I didn't say it loud enough. Well, Carstair, you've got me over a barrel. There's not much I can do. Good, but I want it in writing. Don't you think that's uh, too risky? And besides, it wouldn't be worth the paper it's written on. Maybe, but that way I know you won't double-cross me. I'd trust Maddie if she were in it alone. With you, I want a contract, you might say. Something to hold over your head. Very well. 
We'll make it out right now. Okay, you phrase it, but put in the money and that you guarantee my acquittal. Hmm, we don't trust one another or even like one another. But in this, you have my word. Well, Carstairs, we're partners now. We've a contract for crime. Shall we drink to our new venture? And to how much I hate your guts. <laughs> Yes, a good legal partnership. Practically a corporation, if you add Madeline. And three such brilliant people, too. They're sure to make a go of it, wouldn't you say? What? Uh, who was there? Quiet, it's me, Jack. Jack? Oh, darling. I, I mean, it, it's four in the morning and I have to be on the set at six. Can't you wait, Jack? I heard what you said the first time. Let me in the French door. Jack. You haven't come near me for ten years. Tonight I thought maybe you needed me. I do, Jack. I have for a long time. I sent for you often. You never came. I wanted you to have your chance. Because I didn't have mine. You've got everything now. You're a big star. You've a fine home. Jewels. What more could you want? Well... Safety. I'll give you that, darling. Was what Carstairs told me true? Yes. Poor kid. But nothing's going to happen. I just wanted to tell you that. This is one case Carstairs won't dare lose. I know. But that's not what I want. What do you want, Maddie? Do I have to tell you, Jack? After all this time, do I have to say it? Yes. I guess I... I don't belong in Hollywood, Jack. I'm a fake. I go around being Madeline Lorraine, hard, indiscreet, sophisticated, just as Hollywood as I can be. But underneath, I'm just Mrs. John Tennant from Kansas City. Do you mean that, Madeline? Don't you know when you're being proposed to? And don't say this is so sudden. Not... Not now. Oh, darling... <laughs> I've tried so hard to be tough. I thought I was. Until tonight. And when this happened, I couldn't put on the act any longer. What about Carstairs? Oh, he wants to marry me when this is over. And you? Not anymore. You know what I want. All right, Madeline. If that's what you want, truly. <laughs> Tell no one anything. We'll go through with this. When it's over, I'll have $15,000. We'll go away someplace. Brazil's a good spot. Start over. Ten thousand should see us through. I thought you said fifteen thousand. I need the rest. I have a debt to pay. A ten-year-old debt. Yes, you'll go through with it, Jack. The papers next morning have the story. David Faraday, swashbuckling movie star, was killed in a drunken brawl. His confessed slayer is John Ternant, ex-husband of actress Madeline Lorraine. Ternant allegedly came to the star's apartment at the request of Faraday's lawyer to sign an affidavit regarding his divorce with Miss Lorraine, which took place in Kansas City eight years ago. An argument ensued, and Faraday, according to Ternant, seemed intoxicated, attacking with a paper knife. In the struggle that followed, the actor was killed. The renowned Clifford Carstair is representing Ternant. Gentlemen of the jury, the defense rests. Firm in the knowledge that no American would convict a man for defending his life from a foul murder. You were wonderful, Cliff. Thanks, Maddie. Let's walk down the hall a minute. It's a good policy for me to leave the room now, and besides, I want to talk to you. All right, Cliff. Well, Cliff? Uh, what? Well, you wanted to walk and talk, you said. Well, yes, I, uh, I, uh, well, I want the date for our wedding set, Maddie. Oh, don't rush me so, Cliff. Rush you? Why, it's been two months since David's death. You just keep putting me off. You think that's fair, Maddie? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't given it very much thought. Well, you still love me, don't you? That hasn't changed, has it? 
Well, everything changes, Cliff. There's nothing certain, except, of course, a car stare verdict. You always win, Cliff. You always win, except this time. Oh, I told you the verdict was a cinch. No, I didn't mean the trial. I meant me. You lose me. Oh, Maddie, you can't do this to me. I don't see that I'm doing anything to you. I'm just doing something for me. Not for Puchowitz, nor our public, nor David, nor you. Just me. I'm going back to Jack, Cliff. After the farce in there is over, we're going to go away and start all over again. Oh, Madeline, you... You owe me more than this. Do I? I'm sorry, Cliff. I... I only killed a man for your sake. That was your idea, Cliff, not mine. And then that night, when you told me about it, and about how you were going to use Jack to protect us, well, it was suddenly so horribly funny that I laughed. Remember? In that instant, faced with a murder, I realized what I really wanted. And it wasn't you at all, Cliff. It wasn't Hollywood or my name in lights, either. It was Jack. And going back to being simple. Being just his wife. And it was so tragically funny. It doesn't amuse me, Maddie. What if I were to expose your connection with Faraday in the killing? Remember the contract you signed with Jack, dear? You can't touch him without putting yourself in the chair. As for me, well, I don't want my public anymore. They can think what they please about me. I'm a different woman, Cliff, than the one who came to your party that night. And if I've been foolish, I'll atone for it. And that's my answer, Cliff. And it won't change. I'm sorry. The great Carstair has lost this verdict. <laughs> But that's not all of this strange story. The Whistler will be back to tell you what really happened. Meantime, I want to answer a question which, judging by the number of inquiries, must be puzzling a lot of drivers today. It's this. Since certain gasoline ingredients have gone to war, aren't all of today's gasoline the same? No, indeed. If you've tried many brands in your car, you've already noticed the difference in performance. And I'll tell you why. Each oil company has its own refining method for its own brand of gasoline. Well, as thousands of Western drivers who keep a close record of their gasoline mileage know, the signal refining method has for years been famous for its extra mileage. Signal is frank in telling you that with certain ingredients reserved for fighting planes, signal can't promise all the brilliant performance you enjoyed with pre-war signal gasoline and which you'll again find in further improved signal post-war gasoline. But the name Signal still stands for the finest quality gasoline that can be made. And Signal still places the emphasis on mileage. That's why with gasoline ration, Signal Go Farther Gasoline is more than ever your best buy today. If you haven't tried Signal Go Farther Gasoline in your car, there never was a better reason or better time for getting acquainted with your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, of course, Jack was acquitted. You won again, Carstair. Everything turned out just as you said it would. Except, of course, Madeline. You killed a man for nothing, but it was a perfect crime. The evidence was arranged as only a lawyer could do it. But then, Jack was a lawyer too once. You know what a good lawyer with, shall we say, $5,000 can do, don't you, Mr. Carstair? Thousand here and there to the proper people that tip off to the police. You've done it often enough yourself. A frame-up, they call it, don't they? Hello, Carstair. Remember me? Reynolds, district attorney's office. I want to ask you a few questions. Oh, well, sit down. Thank you. Always glad to help you, boys. Good. Then answer this one. Why did you kill David Faraday? What? The colored man says you came in that afternoon. Says you paid him to say he was out. Says he was scared to talk before. Why, that's ridiculous. He wasn't anywhere around. Then you admit you were there. I admit nothing. How about the gunsmith downtown? He says you paid him $1,000 to file that identification number on a gun. 
You haven't got a chance, Carstairs. I've been framed. It's an open and shut case. Funny, we'd never have thought of it. We got the tip from that guy you forced to confess to the crime. He skipped to Brazil. Afraid uh, we'd make him stand trial for perjury. We wouldn't, though. In our business, we know how easy it is for a smart lawyer like you to frame a guy and force him into a confession. I've been framed, I tell you. It was his gun. Tell that to the judge. Maybe he'll believe you. No, Carstair. Even you can't talk your way out of this one. Yes, Carstair. Framed. But in this case... Frame for a murder you did commit. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, the Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The curious story of the Bells of Aberdovey. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, story by Robert Libet, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking. Remember to let every traffic signal remind you you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, the dead man laughed. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who've stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. That a man should laugh is not strange. That Henry Baker laughed, and under the circumstances, was very strange. Or so the reporters seemed to think. But then they didn't know. They had no idea of why Henry laughed. And so they didn't see the humor of the situation. But suppose we start back at the beginning, and perhaps it will be clearer. In the beginning, there was Charles Finch. Charles Finch, aging, gray, growing bald, with a pronounced bulge at the girth. A man respected and admired in the community. President of a large construction company. Successful, or so it seemed. But it all started the day Charles Finch sat across the desk from his partner, Malcolm Guthrie. Big, bluff, and hard. And Charles said, Guthrie, you can't do this to me. You can't! Can't is a word you taught me never to use, Finch. And I learned the lesson well. I not only can, I'm doing it. In fact, I've done it. I am now sole owner of the Finch and Guthrie Construction Company, and you're out. Completely. Malcolm, how can you do a thing like that? You know what this company means to me. I started it. I built it. Made it successful. Why, it's my whole life. I've sacrificed everything for it. Marriage, a home, happiness, everything. You can't know what you're doing to me. Oh, Finch, you're a fool. A fool? Yes, a fool. If you gave up everything for this, a fool if you let it mean so much to you. A fool if you didn't protect yourself any better than you did. Well, I'm not a sentimentalist, Finch. I'm a hard-headed businessman. I saw my chance to feather my own nest and I took it. You'd have done the same if you'd been smart enough. 
But you weren't. No. So I won. And you're finished. You cold-blooded swindler. Get out, Finch. All right. All right, you don't have to throw me out. I'll go. But you haven't heard the last of me yet, Guthrie. I'll pay you back if it's the last thing I ever do. Oh, yeah? I'm scared to death. What'll you do? Kill me, I suppose, eh? Might not be a bad idea. Yeah? Well, you'd better make it good, Finch. You'd better figure all the angles. Plenty of people know how you feel about me. And if they found me plugged, you'd try for it. And you know it. So you better figure something practically perfect, Finch. If you can. Okay. Maybe I'll do that. I'm not worried. You haven't got the guts or the brains. Go on, Finch. Beat it. Beat it. Get out of here. And I don't want to see you around here anymore. Don't worry. You'll see me again. Only once more. And it'll be the last look you'll ever have of me or anyone. You're as good as dead now. So long, Guthrie. With the prologue of tonight's story, The Dead Man Laugh, the Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales of the Whistler. Now, before the story continues, the Signal Oil Company wants to pass along the War Production Board warning to drivers about increasingly serious shortage of tires. Due to stepped-up military needs, the already low quota of new civilian tires for the first quarter of this year has been cut over 30%. Well, it's plain to see what this is going to mean. With so few new tires available... The only way to be sure your car will have tires is to keep your present tires in sound condition so they can be successfully recapped. Little injuries to the outer walls must be promptly repaired before they can spread and weaken the important inner carcass of the tire. And retreading must be done before the present tread is worn too thin. This requires two things. One, frequent inspection by the man with the experience and know-how of your signal gasoline dealer. And two... The finer quality workmanship and materials that the name Signal stands for. Yes, and there's a third point. Your cooperation in not putting off this service until you have a flat and your tire is damaged beyond retreading. The tire shortage is now. Your tires need Signal's go farther service now. And the place to get it is your neighborhood Signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Charles Finch, Malcolm Guthrie has only himself to blame for what is coming, doesn't he? He gave you not only the motive for murder by swindling you out of your share of the company, he gave you also the idea for murder, his murder, which you promised to carry out. But how, Charles? How? You haven't figured that out yet, have you? And as Guthrie said, it has got to be good, very good because you don't want to die for it, do you? And so you rack your brains for the perfect crime, and you're lost in thought as you walk home along your usual path through the park. Lost in thought until... Hey, mister. Huh? Mister, you uh, couldn't help a fellow out, could you? I haven't had a bite to eat all day. Oh, oh, sure, I... I... Say, haven't I seen you around here before? Well, maybe... I sort of stay here in the park sometimes. I haven't got a home to go to. Yes, yes, well, here. Here's a quarter. Gee, thanks, mister, thanks. It's all right. Yes, it's all right. Now what's on your mind, Charles? Why are you standing there, staring after the shabby tramp as he shuffles off to the hash joint on the corner? What's that look in your eye? And what did you mean by, it's all right? Yes, that's it. Of course. What could be more perfect? Yes, <laughs> perfect, isn't it, Charles? The very idea you needed. And what makes it so funny is that Guthrie furnished this for you, too. It was he who, one day, as the two of you walked through this park, pointed out the tramp. Yes, the very same tramp. And what was it Guthrie called him? A dead ringer. A dead ringer for me. Yes. Yes, Charles. 
a dead ringer. Same age, same size, same graying, balding head, same punch. It was a funny coincidence at the time. Now it's funny, but in a different way. Because that shabby old tramp has started the ideas going around in your head. And you follow him, don't you, Charles? Watching him go into the hash joint, order some food, and sit down. You pace up and down in front of the door, watching him eat. And by his manner, you realize something that's almost too good to be true. You go in and slip into the chair beside him. You mind if I sit down here? Yeah, huh? Oh, no. No, I guess not. You know, I'm surprised you're able to eat sandwiches so well with your false teeth. <laughs> I never can. Oh, I, uh, I get along all right. Say, uh, it was swell of you to stake me to this. I, uh... Uh, maybe I can pay you back sometime. Oh, forget it. Forget it. You you haven't got a job, have you? Just who are you, mister? Cop? Cop? Oh, certainly not. What's your racket? No racket, I assure you. This is strictly legal. Strictly on the up and up. Yeah? Well, I've been plenty careful so far. I never been pulled in by the bulls, and I don't want to begin now. I assure you what I have to offer will get you in no trouble with the police. What do you have, mister? Oh, oh, uh, ham and eggs, please. Huh. Okay. I'm listening. Well, it's this way. I want you to help win a bet for me tonight. Huh? Yes, I have a friend of mine that, well, uh, I bet him that I could pick up a hobo off the street, clean and dress him up, and pass him off as a polished businessman. <laughs> I think you're the man I need. You're just about my side, so my clothes will fit you. And you can have them to keep after you. And, uh, what else goes with them? Oh, yes, yes, uh, hundred dollars. I might even throw in a bottle of scotch, which is more valuable these days. <laughs> mm. For one night's work. You got a lot of dough for just a joke? Well, I, I'm not financially strapped, exactly. No, I guess you're not. But, uh, you're sure this is legal, all right? You know, I can't afford to take no chances. Absolutely. No, oh, here's my card. It has my address. I'll expect you there tonight. Hmm. Hey, hey, this is a long walk. Way out to... Oh, here. Here's five dollars. That should get you there. And don't spend it on liquor. I'll have plenty of that and good stuff when you get there. Okay. Don't worry. For the rest of this lettuce, I'll be there. With bells on. Oh, we can do without the bells. As a matter of fact, since this is to be a surprise, be sure to keep it a secret. Better come in through the side door from the side street. And don't let anybody see you come in. Huh? Well, he, uh, he might come early. I wouldn't want the joke spoiled just by his seeing you go in. Are you taking chances? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll get in all right. About eight, then? Yeah. Fine, don't worry. You'll see. It'll be a great joke. In fact, <laughs> it'll kill him. Yes, it will, won't it, Charles? You've figured the perfect way to kill Malcolm Guthrie, and this tramp is going to be a big help. A big help. You'll never get another chance like this one. Never. Maybe that's why you're so nervous as you pace the floor of your home, waiting for him to come. Supposing he doesn't. Suppose he got drunk with that five dollars. Suppose he's lying in some gutter somewhere right now. You'd never find another perfect double like that. Even to the false teeth. You were a fool to trust the hobo, Charles. He's probably taken your five and headed out of town. But no, there he is, right on the dot of eight. And you breathe a sigh of relief as you open the door. Hi, mister. Well, hello, hello. Come in, you're right on time. Glad you could come. Wow. Ooh, some way out she got here. Hey, you weren't kidding when you said you was well-heeled. Oh, it'll do. And it won't be long before you fit right into the surroundings as if it were yours. Well, I don't know about that. I kind of feel like a fish out of water. But if you think so... You were careful about coming in. Nobody saw you. Oh, no, no, I'm sure nobody saw me. Wasn't nobody in sight. Good, good. Now, if you just step into the bathroom over here, you'll find everything you need. Shaving things. Take a good close shave, a hot shower... Then put on the clothes I have hanging there. Christmas! Look at that! A real monkey suit. And brother silk underwear. Yes. Put it all on. 
Don't leave off a thing. Everything will fit you, I'm sure. Hey, this is almost like a dream. <laughs> I never thought I'd be decked out in a monkey suit like this until I was laid out for my own funeral. A monkey suit for his funeral. He doesn't know how right he is, does he, Charles? And Guthrie, if he only knew what plans were unfolding, he wait impatiently for the tramp to complete his change. It's very important that it be complete, that he resemble you closely. Will he? Did you figure it right? Well, you'll know in a moment. The door opens and you clench your fist. Well, how's this? Well, I wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> Not bad, huh? Perfect. Perfect. Hey, uh, how's about a slug of that stuff you promised me? Oh, yes, yes, certainly, certainly the scotch. Here, I'll pour you a glass. Here. You know, I did just like you said. I didn't have a drink all day. Hey, that looks like good stuff. Don't see much of that anymore. Yeah, try this. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Hey, that it's the spot. Hey, you know, you know, I think I'm going to like this kind of life. Here, have another. Help yourself to the bottle. No falling. Well, thanks. Hey, when uh, when do we get the payoff in this joke? Oh, any minute now. By the way. What's your name? Uh, Baker. Henry Baker. 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 <sighs> that one tastes just like another. Hey, you know, this is the life. <laughs> Funny thing. I almost didn't come up here. No? Why not? Oh, I don't know. Seems sort of fishy. Money guy like you picking me up to do a job for real letters? <laughs> yeah, I figured there must be some catch to it somewhere. But all I gotta say now is that this... Hey. Hey, what's up? What's the big idea? Look, uh, what's... What, what's the gun for? You, you you ain't gonna... Hey, mister, cut it out. No. Don't. Don't shoot. <laughs> That's it, Baker. End of joke. Okay, Charles Finch, that's the first step. Or should I call you Henry Baker, who answers the description of Charles Finch, lying dead on the floor, his face disfigured just enough. Now it's a simple matter to take out his false teeth, exchange them with yours, put on the clothes of the tramp, and then, quickly, sprinkle kerosene over the body, the room, and set a match to it. <laughs> In five minutes, the fire is spread to the drapes, the furniture, and now it's time to get out, fast. Not too fast, Charles. No one in sight, but don't hurry. Now at the corner, pause, look around. Not a soul in sight. You're clear, Charles Finch. Oh, pardon me, Henry Baker. Charles Finch lies dead in his home, doesn't he? The flames licking away any telltale identification and completing your job. And you're on your way to pay a debt. But take it slowly, Charles. Tomorrow, Thursday, will be Guthrie's chauffeur's day off. He'll drive home tomorrow night by himself. And you'll be waiting beside the garage. Until then, you take a room in a cheap hotel. You're Henry Baker, hobo now. But next day, you stop in and see about the ticket you ordered for Mexico. It'll be ready Friday afternoon, the day after you get Guthrie. Just right. Perfect. Everything's all set. All you have to do is wait for tonight. And uh, how would Henry Baker do that? Why, sit in the park, of course. Hiya, brother. Got a match? Yeah, sure. There you are. How's it going? Okay. Same as usual, I guess. Ain't it the truth? It's getting tough to be on the street these days. 
Well, like as not, a guy will just come up and offer you a job right on the straight. Uh, say, uh, that's your paper there? Yeah. Mind if I take a look? Oh, go ahead. Thanks. Hmm. Wealthy clubman murdered. Hmm. Say, is that in this town? Yeah. Germany, somebody's always bumping somebody else off. Yeah, it seems so. And this guy was burnt up. Couldn't hardly identify him, it says here. Yeah, except his dentist identified his false teeth. I read it. Yeah, probably some dame. Sounds like a dame. <laughs> Playing with fire. <laughs> hey, what am I laughing about? Only means trouble to me. Trouble? Sure, them dumb cops. When they can't find the right guy in one of them things, they come down here and run us all in. You mean they arrest your, us bums? Sure. Just a routine roundup. You know, like they're always doing. Keep us there a couple of days just so they can tell the newspapers they got some suspects. Well, I hope they get that guy real quick. Otherwise, me and you better hit the road for a while. Yeah, I'm not worried. That's just what I plan to do. Hit the road. But I got a couple of things to attend to first. Yeah. Just a couple. Yes, Charles, another 24 hours and you'll be on your way to Mexico. Free and revenged. But now it's time to get started. At 11, you're waiting in the shadows by Guthrie's garage. He's always arrived home from the club about this time. Everything is perfect for the climax. Up with your hands. Hey, uh, what? what is this? Get back in the garage and you will find out. Okay, okay. All right, keep your hands up. If it's money you want, my wallet is... I'm not interested in your money. I don't understand. Turn around, you'll see what I mean. I I still don't get it. Maybe if I stepped into this shaft of moonlight. Finch. Yes, Guthrie. Are you surprised? But but the papers... The papers said you were dead. Murdered. Yes, I know. You thought I was dead, and so did the police. It's just what I wanted them to think. Now, when they find you, they'll never dream Charles Finch could have done it. Will they? After all, a dead man can't kill, can he? Look, Finch, you don't know what you're doing. You can't do this. Can't I? You told me that once before. Said I didn't have brains enough or guts enough. But now you see your mistake. I did have guts enough. I've always, already, I killed a man. And I did have brains enough because the police think that man was Charles Finch. So I'm free. I'll never be caught for this. Look, Finch. Finch, let's... Keep your hands up. Let's talk this over. Keep your hands up. All right. All right, I'll, I'll pay you anything. Give you the business. I've got enough to take me to Mexico. To start over after I take care of you. Finch, give me a chance. For God's sake, I'll do anything you say. That's right. Get down on your knees. Crawl, Guthrie. Crawl. That's the way I wanted to see you. I'll confess everything. Confess it all. Give you back everything. Do anything. I said, Finch. Don't. Don't! <laughs> Well, Charles, your revenge is complete. And back in your shabby hotel room, you sleep soundly. There's no qualm of conscience, no ache of remorse as you walk through the park next morning. You did what you had to do, and you're satisfied. All that needs to be done now is to go to the ticket office and get your passage to freedom. It's all so simple, isn't it? Hey, Paul. Hmm? Me? Yeah, you. Come on. Get going. Huh? What's the matter? Cops. Cops? Come on. Don't waste time. Come on. It's like I told you yesterday, a roundup. Only I didn't expect it so soon. Come on. Get moving. If we stroll out the other end of the park, they may miss us. They started back there and... Uh-oh. Okay, you two. Wait a minute. What's the matter, copper? I ain't done nothing. Never mind. Get over there and get in the wagon. You too, bum. But, officer, you have no right Is to... Is that so? I said get over there and get in the wagon. But I've done nothing. I... Tell that to the show-up crowd. Come on. You're going in. Ah, this is something you hadn't counted on, isn't it, Charles? 
But then there's nothing to worry about, is there? They can't possibly connect the hobo Henry Baker with the murders. And your friend, the other hobo, told you they'd only keep you a couple of days. That means only that your trip will have to be delayed a little. But what difference does that make as long as you get away in the end? You're fingerprinted and photographed and stood up in the line under the lights. But you're not worried. Not really. Step forward when I call your name. Alonzo Allen. Alonzo Allen, alias Allen James, vagrant, 37, 5 feet 10, 132, dark complexion, brown eyes, brown hair. Picked up on suspicion. Free arrest for vacancy. All right, step back. Henry Baker. Yes. Yes, I'm Henry Baker. Henry Baker, vagrant, 54, 5 feet 8, 170. Gray hair, blue eyes, picked up on suspicion. No record. Something is wrong. You sense it, don't you, Charles Finch? As the silence lengthens, you stand there straining. The perspiration pops out on your forehead. You listen intently, waiting for that step back. Your eyes strain into the blackness out there, but you can't make anything out. Not even those faces staring up at you. What's wrong? How could anything be wrong? Henry Finger, step down. No, no, not that way, out here. We want to ask you some questions. What did you say your name was? Henry Baker. What other names have you used? None. Sure of that? Of course I'm sure. My name's Henry Baker. Okay. Now, take a look at those. What? They're... They're just fingerprints? Yes, your fingerprints. The ones we made a few minutes ago. Well? Take a good look. Notice the little whorls there. Very distinctive ones, see? Yes. Okay. Now take a look at these. Notice anything different? Mm, no. Neither do I. They're the same fingerprints. They're yours. And it doesn't take an expert to see it. So what? So nothing. Only this second set of prints we got off of a liquor glass in the burned house of a guy who was murdered a couple of days ago. Guy by the name of Charles Finch. That name familiar to you? I never heard of him. Okay, that's your story. But we're booking you. Booking you for murder. But that's not all of tonight's story. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, here are two tips for making today's ration gasoline go farther. Tip number one is from Uncle Sam. It's carpooling, and it's saving gasoline for millions of motorists. Take the case of four men driving to work, each in his own car. By riding together, three of the men can leave their cars at home. Gasoline, tires, and wear and tear are saved on three cars. Yes, carpooling really works. And now tip number two. This one is from thousands of Western motorists who for years have kept track of their gasoline mileage and found they do go farther with signal gasoline. Do I hear you saying, but today's gasolines aren't what they used to be? True, certain ingredients which gave gasolines their... But there's the important point. Today, as always, Signal is producing the finest quality gasoline that can be made. And Signal still places the emphasis on mileage. If you haven't tried Signal in your car, it's high time you discover that all of today's gasolines are not the same. Invest your next ration coupons in the famous longer mileage gasoline. Signal Go Farther Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. Yes, Charles Finch, you forgot about the fingerprints. You made the mistake of pouring the tramp a glass of liquor. The glass was found beside the body. Of course, later, they found your prints all over what was left of the home. And so they booked you for murder. But then, not exactly you, Charles Finch. They booked Henry Baker for the murder. They convicted Henry Baker. They sent him to the execution chamber. And the reporters wondered why. Just before the switch was thrown, you threw back your head and laughed. Laughed long and loudly until suddenly you could laugh no more. They didn't see the humor in the situation. 
you were the only one who saw that. Because you were the only one who knew you were being executed for your own murder. The murder of Charles Finch. You couldn't tell them who you really were without exposing yourself to another murder. That of Malcolm Guthrie. So you died for murdering yourself. And when you laughed, it was a dead man laughing. Monday at 9 o'clock, the Whistler will bring you another strange tale, the curious story of how murder opens a gate. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Lewis Herman, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Gateway to Danger. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. It's too bad in a way that old Horatio Alger isn't grinding out dime novels anymore because he could have grabbed off another bestseller for himself by simply writing the story of Eddie Vincent, uh, up to a point, of course. For Eddie was a real rags-to-riches success story, born in a charity ward, selling papers on the streets while the other kids were playing ball and going to the movies. Yes, he came from the wrong side of the tracks, but from the first, everyone knew he was going places. The only trouble was that he didn't care how, so long as he got there. There were mumblings in the senior class at high school when he picked off the prize scholarship to college. The same mumblings that echoed through the anterooms later in law school. But no matter, Eddie Vincent had arrived. Right-hand man to the district attorney. Yes, it was a thrill at first, sitting in with Ryan on all the big cases. But after a few years of it, he began once again to feel that itch he couldn't scratch. The opportunist without the opportunity. Well, breaks don't grow on trees, Eddie. Sometimes you have to make the breaks yourself. Yes, spend a few months on it. Give it a lot of thought. Then maybe, for example, on a particularly foggy night at the prison across the bay, you might have a stroke of luck. Hey, what do you think?
District Attorney Ryan. Yes? What? When? I see. Tell the warden I'll see him as soon as I can. Oh, Eddie. Yeah? Warden Campbell is on his way here. Warden Campbell? Yes, yeah, Bugsy Malone just escaped from prison five hours ago. About three in the morning. Check with headquarters and tell Lieutenant Connolly I want a detail of five men. Yes, sir. Five men. Uh, where do you want them assigned? Well, tell Sergeant Gregg to put a man at every entrance to the building. No one is to be admitted without appointment. Call me if there are any questions. <laughs> You're being pretty careful, Chief. Yes, I know. Maybe I'm flattering myself, Eddie. He's probably forgotten all about me by now. Malone? Yeah. Let's see, it's more than ten years since I last saw him. I had your job then, and Bugsy Malone almost lost it for me. Oh, I guess you don't remember. Oh, I think I remember the headlines. He had a protection racket or something? Yes, and we never could pin him down. He's the cleverest criminal I ever tackled. We never would have nailed him except for one bad mistake. Oh? What was that? He figured he could beat any kind of a rap, even murder. It finally got so he didn't stop at breaking windows and tossing acid when his customers refused to pay up. Hmm, I see. But before we were through, we had him on five first-degree accounts. Huh. A sixth-grade schoolboy could have pulled a death sentence out of the average jury. That's what almost lost me my job. Huh? I sold out, you see. You did what? Uh, there was nothing else to do. Malone had this whole town terrified, including the jury. So I sold out for manslaughter. Fifteen years. He's tried to escape twice, and that got him ten more. <laughs> a guy like that ought to know better. I don't know. Looks like he made it this time, just as he promised. He promised? Eddie... I didn't get those guards over here to play pinochle. No, Malone's too well known to hide out very long. He knows it. He's just hoping it's long enough. Long enough for what, Chief? Long enough to keep his promise to put a bullet through my head. With a prologue of tonight's story, Gateway to Danger... The Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales of the Whistler. Now, before the story continues, here are two timely tips for making your ration gasoline go farther. When you start your car these cold mornings, don't race the motor. Even though your car is standing still, a racing motor burns up as much gasoline as a car traveling 60 miles an hour. And secondly, be sure you're using the gasoline that gives you the maximum miles per gallon. Now, if you think I mean signal gasoline, you're right, and for two good reasons. For years, Western drivers who have kept a careful record of their gasoline mileage have found they actually do go farther with signal gasoline. But that's only the half of it. Although certain gasoline ingredients are now reserved for war, the ingredients which gave gasolines their flashing pickup and speed, Signal Oil Company is still producing the very finest gasoline which can be made today. And the famous signal formula still places the emphasis on mileage. Since the only way you can get in extra miles of driving today is to get the most miles possible from every ration gallon, you really owe it to yourself to give signal gasoline a trial. Invest your next ration coupons with your neighborhood signal dealer and see if you don't agree with thousands of Western drivers who say you do go farther with signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. So, Bugsy Malone is back in circulation again. After ten long years in prison, it looks like a clean break. Too clean, almost, as if it were tailor-made by someone on the outside. There are still no leads the next night at 10 o'clock, when Eddie finally says goodnight to the D.A. and starts home. Just for a change, he takes the long way, a lonely road leading through the hills above the city. Stop now. Huh. Hello, Bugsy. 
You're right on time. Yeah. Where are you staying? Never mind. Okay. You didn't slip up anywhere? No. How can I miss with them keys? You couldn't have been followed. <laughs> What's the matter? Nervous? I don't do this every night. Neither do I. Where's the door? Here. You can count it later. This goes with it. A rifle? Yeah. With a telescopic sight. I, I, I don't get it. What do I want? You're still interested in Mr. Ryan, aren't you? What's that got to do Listen. with... Listen. He lives in Shelton. Now, don't give me that. I know where he lives. Mm -hmm. So you're planning to walk into the Sterling Hotel and introduce yourself to the dozen or so cops in front of his apartment? Well, I don't know. He has a house in Shelton, about 50 miles south of town. He's going there this weekend, on Friday night. And no one knows it except me. Here's the address. It's on a hill, sort of an estate, with a wall around it and a gate on the drive. They'll get there about nine and stop at the gate. There are two big lights on either side of the gate. Hmm. Uh, I, I still don't get the rifle. There's a hill right opposite the gate with trees on it. With that silencer and the scope, you can't miss. Oh. But just one thing, Bugsy. You know the chance you're taking? Every cop in the state will be on your tail inside of an hour. It's still better than a pen. All you wanted was a chance. Now, if you slip up... Yeah, yeah I know. It's strictly my own idea. You got rid of the keys? Yeah. Okay. It's your baby from here on. We won't see each other again. Unless. Unless what? Unless you get caught. And if you do, Bugsy, I'm going to hang you. That's right, Eddie. Sometimes you have to make the breaks yourself. The DA's done a good job. Been in there pitching for ten years now. Good for perhaps ten more. And uh, that's too long for you, isn't it? Too long when you begin to feel that old itch again. That urge to climb up there where the real money is. And there's plenty up there for a smart DA. One smart enough to inherit the job, for instance. Uh, you can see it now. Ryan's car pulling out of the darkness into the circle of light at the gate. He gets out. Fumbles with a lock for a second, right under the light like a duck on a pond. The faint whine of a bullet. And you're the district attorney. Yes, Saturday morning the headlines will scream. They'll swear you in and you'll promise the suckers you won't rest until the assassin sits in the death cell. As a curtain raiser, it'll be made to order, won't it? You've tried not to think of it during the week. But now that Friday, the day of days, has arrived, your mind wanders in spite of yourself. You had to get out of cell block seven first, and there was no other way. Now, uh, assuming it was an inside job, because... Eddie. Huh? Oh, oh I, I, I'm sorry, Chief. Uh, have you something on your mind? Uh, no, no. Uh, please, go on. Uh, you were saying you talked to Campbell at the prison. Yes. It was an inside job, and I don't mean inside the prison. What? The key to his whole plan was his escape from cell block seven... You remember the Myers case several months ago? Yes, Chief. There were some keys presented in evidence. The same keys, oddly enough, that Malone used in his escape. Well, what do you mean, those keys were returned? Someone could have had them duplicated. Someone on the police force, perhaps, or even someone in this office. Oh, but, but why? I don't know, but I intend to find out. The police can take care of Malone as far as I'm concerned. I'm vastly more interested in the man who had those keys made. <laughs> well, it's still a theory, of course... Far more likely some guard at the prison. Yeah, maybe. Oh, uh, by the way, Eddie, we're leaving at seven tonight. We? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> no, don't get the wrong idea, Mr. Vincent. I'm not afraid. It, uh, well, it just takes two to open my gate. Gate? What? <laughs> yeah, that's a fact. It's on the blink. You see, it has a bar you have to lift. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> yes, maybe I am, but that's true about the gate. Seriously, Eddie, I want you with me in case something breaks over the weekend. But, you see, I've already arranged for one of the men... I'm sorry, Eddie. You'll have to cancel whatever plans you had. Well, I can't, Chief. Uh... Say, what's the matter with you? I, I, I really don't know. Very well, and we leave at seven. Well, I'm expecting an important call from Lieutenant Connolly. If he calls, tell him I'll be back late this afternoon. I'll tell Miss Quinn. 
Think I'll go out for a little lunch. Yeah, good idea. You look like you need it. But Eddie isn't thinking about lunch as he walks down the street, unconscious of the milling crowd. No, his mind is on other things. It's funny, isn't it, how you can spend six months building a beautiful house of cards, only to have them fall flat in a split second. That gate, of a million gates in the world, that had to be the one it took two to open. What's the matter, Eddie? You still might pull it off if Bugsy hits the right one, and if that locksmith detail doesn't happen to hit the little man on Shannon Street who did it for you. Now, you've got to stop it. Find Bugsy and... But where? He's gone. You said goodbye to him for good. Eh, it's too late. Got to be another one. Wait a minute. What about the car? That's it. Ryan's car. Up in the public garage. Hello, George. Hello, Mr. Vincent. How's the garage business? Oh, okay. The DA's car in? Sure, second car down. There you are, Eddie. No one around. Take off the gas cap. Ah, take out that pound of sugar you bought at the grocery store. Now the sugar goes in the gas tank. It'll take about ten blocks for that sugar to hit the carburetor. And at 7.30 in the evening, it ought to be easy to persuade the D.A. to wait until Saturday. Let Bugsy sit on the hill all night. He's got $500 in his freedom. Has <laughs> Lieutenant Conley called yet? No, not a word, Chief. Ah. Well, what time is it? Um, six. Well, I'll have to call him from down there. Come on, let's go. Oh, you may as well wait here, Chief. I'll go and pick up the car. <laughs> My car's been in the shop for the last couple of days. Had to borrow one from the department. It's right outside. Come on, let's go. You should have known it wouldn't work, Eddie. It was too simple. Too many ways out of it. Something must be wrong with your head. No one in his right mind would have depended on a kid scheme like that. At least he's letting you drive. That's something, anyway. You're ten miles south now. Coming into Bellevue. Forty miles to go. That's about an hour, Eddie. One hour to think of something. But you can't think. Your heart is thumping like a trip hammer. Your Adam's apple is a ball of sandpaper. You're way ahead of schedule. Nine o'clock, you told him. Maybe you could hurry. Cover the 40 miles in less than an hour. Arrive at eight instead of nine. No, no. That wouldn't work either. Bugsy didn't operate that way. He's probably been there since this afternoon, sitting on the hill with a rifle across his knees, waiting. Here's Bellevue. You've still got a chance. Take it easy, Eddie. Be calm. Think. Uh, this is Bellevue, Chief. Yes, I see. I, um... Huh? I'm a little hungry. <laughs> Why not wait till we get home? Uh, there's a nice little steak place down here, and we're ahead of time. Suppose I buy us a dinner. Well, I did want to get down there early. Oh, come on. Forget you're the D.A. for once. <laughs> okay. But I'm going to stick you for the best steak in the house. <laughs> There you are, Mr. Ryan. Uh, I'll be back in just a second. Order me the next best steak in the house, will you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eddie. You have a better idea now. Thinking a little more clearly. Still have plenty of time. First, over to the drugstore across the street. Yes, there's a phone booth. Now the book. Ah, there it is. Hamilton Steakhouse. Get the phone number. Hello? Hello, headquarters? Give me Lieutenant Connolly. Not there. Okay, Lieutenant McRae, then. Hello, McRae. This is Eddie Vincent. I'm having dinner with the DA in Bellevue. It's a place called Hamilton Steakhouse. The phone is Washington 15401. Yeah, thought I'd let you know. Okay, got it? Yeah, we'll be here for a half hour at least. Right. 
Now, wait a couple of minutes, Eddie. Let it settle. That's it. Plenty of time. Okay, now. Hello, headquarters. Listen, I've got a hot lead on Bugsy Malone. Tell the district attorney I'll meet him at his office in an hour. He's gone. Well, that's too bad. No, no one else will do. Never mind. You'll find out who this is soon enough. Oh, you know where the DA is. That's better. Make it eight o'clock. Took your time. Your steak's getting cold. Oh, uh, well, I'd better check with headquarters. Nothing doing yet. Smart boy. Did you leave the number? Yep. You know, Eddie, I wouldn't be surprised to see you, District Attorney, someday. You're hoping that desk sergeant was as dumb as he usually is. It might be embarrassing if they traced that call. But it's five minutes now. Ten minutes. Fifteen. What happened to them? Where's the call? He's finishing his pie now. There isn't much more time. Oh, I feel better, Eddie. Come on. You can finish that cigarette in the car. Oh, what about another cup of coffee? Oh, we'll have some when we get there. Oh, waitress. Yes, sir. How much do we owe? That'll be, um, three dollars and eighty-five cents. No, no, this is mine, Chief. (laughs) Thanks. Now you only owe me six lunches. (laughs) Okay, let's get out of here. Oh, by the way, Eddie, yeah. I meant to ask you, why did you make that phone call across the street? Uh, oh, we all do, sir. Huh? Our phone's been out of order all day. past eight, Eddie. Twenty miles to go. And two strikes against you. There's only one thing left to do. Well, snap it up a little, Eddie. You can do better than thirty miles an hour even in this hack. Okay. You know, I still think I was right on that key business. We found a little joint on Shannon Street. Yeah, I'm almost sure he was the one. Been mixed up with a lot of suspicious characters. Uh, Did you find anything? No, that's the trouble. The old boy died last month. The warden still swears the guards are all okay. Naturally. What else can he do? Yes, I know. Monday, I'm going to make a thorough check on every man who had access to that evidence. Good idea. Oh! What's the matter? Uh, My stomach. Hey, look out. Look out. You're going off the road. Give me that wheel. Chief. Chief. Are you all right? Uh, Just my knee. Uh, I... I must have got a cramp or something. I... Hey, hey, help me, will you? Yeah, sure. Gee, I'd better get you back to the city. I know, I'm okay. Here, uh, take it easy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Hold on there. That's right. Uh, thanks. There you are. It's okay now. Be stiff in a minute, though. What about you? Huh? Oh, I, I don't know. Something seemed to grab me all of a sudden in my stomach. Uh, how about the car? Oh, oh it's not bad, I... I'll have it pulled out tomorrow. What's going on down there? Car off the road. Anybody hurt? No. Hey, I don't suppose you have anything for pulling us out of this ditch. Sure. Got a chain right here in back. Can you beat that for luck? But you don't suppose we can drive it. I, I well, mean, why the not? Cars... It's just eased over on the side. Yeah, but what about your knee? Oh, I'll take a hot bath when we get there. I can't get over our luck. A guy with chains. <laughs> that would happen one time in a thousand. <laughs> yeah. One in a thousand. Three strikes. You're out, Eddie. On the home stretch now. Winding up the narrow road toward the gate. Toward the day of judgment. The pearly gate of Valhalla. Ha, <laughs> ha, That's a laugh, isn't it? Maybe St. Peter will be there to give you a hand when you step into that circle of light. 
Okay, you can stop here. Uh, come on. I'll show you how the Ryan Gate operates. Uh, what's the matter? You're as white as a sheet. Uh, I, I don't know. I guess it's my stomach. Oh, well, I'll fix you up when we get inside. Uh, I can't. I, I can't move. Come on, snap out of it, Vincent. You're yeah. acting like a baby. Oh, I'm not. Here, come on, I'll give you a hand. Thanks. There you are. Now, I'll go over behind that pillar and raise the bar. You go up there and pull the pin when I say so. No, no. Shut up. I'm going to slug you in a minute if you don't get hold of yourself. Now, pull that pin when I tell you. Thirteen steps to the gate, lad, Chevy. Not even a chaplain to see you off. But Bugsy sees you now in the telescope sight. He's just the right distance to aim but not quite close enough to recognize you. A good shot, too. Probably has a nice, solid rest for that rifle, with the center of the gate right where the telescope sight lines cross. Here we are, Eddie. He's squeezing the trigger slowly now. One second more. <laughs> That's not all of tonight's story. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, a word on that driving bugaboo you hear so much about, carbon. Just what is carbon? What causes it? And how does it affect your motor's performance? Well, so does carbon, soft carbon. Coal is another form of carbon, hard carbon. There's not a motor oil made that doesn't form some kind of carbon. But here's the important point. Many motor oils form hard carbon, the kind that causes knocking, overheating, loss of efficiency, and lowered gas mileage. That's why the new solvent refining method used in making pure paraffin base signal four-star motor oil is acclaimed one of today's greatest advances in motor lubrication. You see, because of solvent refining, signal four-star motor oil actually forms less carbon, far less by actual test than many leading brands. And because it's soft, soot-like carbon, it tends to blow out with exhaust gases, keeping your motor cleaner, running better. Today, when gas is rationed and motors have to last through the duration, this extra efficiency you get from a clean motor is more important to you than ever. More reason than ever for making your next oil change a change for the better. A change to solvent-refined Signal 4-Star Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. Yes, Eddie Vincent knew the cards were stacked against him, that he didn't have a chance. The gate that took two to open, the borrowed car, the telephone out of order as if someone did it on purpose, the desperate lunge into the ditch, only to have a car happen by just in time to keep him moving inexorably toward his appointment at the gate. No, Eddie didn't have a chance, and he knew it as he walked toward the gate latch, into the circle of light, and into Bugsy's sights. He was waiting for it, his mind frozen into a stupor, his legs moving like those of a mechanical robot. The sharp report, a blinding flash of light across his consciousness, a cold hand on his heart, that was all. District Attorney Ryan is still behind the stone pillar, working at the gate lever when... That you, Mr. Ryan? Connolly! What are you doing here? Say, did you hear my tire blow out? <laughs> scared me to death. What's the matter? Well, that's Bugsy Malone. What? We cornered him this afternoon. I've been trying to get you since 8 o'clock. Well, where is he? <laughs> In the morgue, he reached for a gun. Good. Hey. Hey, what's the matter with him? Who? Him. Uh, good Lord, Eddie. 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 Passed out, huh? I, uh, passed out nothing. He's dead. He was sick. Did he hit his head or something? No, I don't know what happened. Must have been a heart attack. There isn't a mark on him.
Next Monday at 9 o'clock, the Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The curious story of Death Marks the Double Cross. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking and reminding you to let every traffic signal remind you you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, danger is a beautiful blonde. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Danger is our next door neighbor through all the days of our lives. And sometimes we meet it in a most casual way. Take, for instance, Van Stevens, young, unmarried, an engineer with a construction company, temporarily employed on a defense job in a small coast city, and bored in his strange surroundings. It started casually that Saturday night after he came out of the movie. It was early, a beautiful night, and he had no desire to go back to the drab hotel room just yet. But there was no place else to go, so he just strolled down the main street of town, Slowly, leisurely, pausing on a corner to light a cigarette and puff it slowly. He noticed the car because it was one of those big, slick-looking convertibles, the kind he wanted when the war ended. The second time it went by slowly, he saw her. She was very nice, young, blonde, lovely. He waited. Back around the block she came, and this time she pulled up to the curb near him and stopped. Hello. Hello. You've opened the door before, no doubt. Oh. In other words, isn't it a beautiful night for a drive? Well, isn't it? Yes. That's what I said. <coughs> you weren't going somewhere important? No, no, not at the moment. In fact, I was faced with a rather gloomy prospect of going back to a lonely hotel room. <laughs> And it is a beautiful night for a drive. Uh, I suppose it was on the golf course at Beeritz. What? Where we met. That's as good a place as any. Yeah, only I've never been there. But I have a good imagination. I remember so well those evenings at Monte Carlo when you'd say to me, Van, you must sit beside me at the casino tonight. You bring me luck. You called me Van in those days, remember? Never Mr. Stevens. <laughs> and I used to call you... Uh, what was it I used to call you? Well, it might have been darling, mightn't it? But yes, it might have been at that. Or maybe the mystery woman. Beautiful, fascinating, and unpredictable. Especially unpredictable. That's not very flattering, Mr. Stevens. You might have said especially beautiful. 
guess I might have and meant it. <laughs> okay, you win. <laughs> you're not only beautiful and fascinating and unpredictable, but you're too fast a worker for me. How come? How come what? All this. You're not happy about taking a drive with me, Mr. Stevens? I'm delirious, but why me? Well, you're not unattractive, you know. Yeah, but... Baby, didn't your mother ever warn you about picking up strange men on the street? My mother was rather unusual, Mr. Stevens. And she taught me that when I wanted something, there was only one thing to do. Go out and find it. Okay. Who's kicking? Drive on, baby. Drive on. Well, then, you never know what's going to happen to you on a Saturday night in a strange town, do you? You relax on the upholstered seat of the convertible and watch this blonde young lady as she drives. It's just about too good to be true, especially when she pulls up in front of a beautiful home close to the sea, a regular mansion, and says... Would you like a drink? You're driving. Well, come on, we'll go in. This is the swankiest roadhouse I ever saw. It's not a roadhouse. I live here. Come on. Inside, it's even more unbelievable. This layout cost a hundred thousand anyway. There's probably twice that on the walls and art treasures. And as she helps you out of your top coat van, you say, "Not a bad little place to hang your hat." We mm, like it. Probably have two or three more scattered around the country. No. Just a cabin up at Anderson Lake. I gather you're not worrying much about any wolves howling at your door. Not that kind, anyway. Touche. Hey, isn't that a Picasso? Oh, you're interested in art, Mr. Stevens? Well, at times, yeah. Well, then perhaps you'd like to take a look around. We have some very nice paintings scattered all over the house. You think we can find our way without a guide? There's no one else here, that's what you mean. We have only one servant left, and this is her night off. Cozy, isn't it? Whole place to ourselves. All 50 rooms. Oh, it's not that bad. We'll take a look as soon as we have that drink I promised you. The tour starts. Room after room of rich furnishings. Only you're not thinking so much about the beauty on the walls, but uh, more about the beauty walking beside you. Finally, you're standing in her room and she's saying... I did this one all by myself. I studied interior decoration. Very nice. You're not looking at the room, Mr. Stevens. I don't have to. To see a beautiful sight. Thank you. May I excuse myself for just a minute? Sure. Sure. Take your time. So you relax on the satin upholstered chaise long. If this is a dream, you say to yourself, just let me go on dreaming forever. And then you open your eyes again and there she is. But she's changed her clothes. Sorry to take so long. Okay. I see you changed into something more comfortable, as they say in the movies. You like it? What man wouldn't, baby? Mm. Nice perfume you're wearing. Mm. You like, like it? I like everything about you. I'm glad. Come here. that, too. You're not bad yourself, Mr. Stevens. Don't go away, baby. Well, you do something for me. Anything you ask, baby. Look under the bed over there. Under the bed? <laughs> okay, I'll play games. Just lift up the cover there. Okay. Hey! I thought you said we were alone. Yeah, Mr. Stevens. Because you see, the gentleman under the bed is quite dead. (laughs) 
with the prologue of tonight's story, Danger is a Beautiful Blonde, the Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales of the Whistler. Now, before the story continues, a word about a boy who's mighty important to you. A boy in uniform. Maybe he's your kid brother, your son, your husband, or that friendly kid who lived down the street. Today, he's in a hospital in the Philippines, his shattered arm in a cast. But a Red Cross worker is writing the letter he wants to send home. Or he's been wounded on the battlefront and is receiving a life-saving transfusion of blood plasma secured by the Red Cross. Or he's a prisoner of war in a German camp and, oh, so grateful for the boxes of food furnished by the Red Cross. Yes, in a hundred ways, our boys in uniform depend on the services of the Red Cross. And because the calls for those services are greater than ever today, the Red Cross needs your help more than ever. Give all you can now during the remaining Red Cross week. And when you do, remember, you're not giving to the Red Cross. You're giving to the most deserving guy you know, G.I. Joe. And by the way, there's another friendly way you can make life more pleasant for our G.I. Joes right here at home. When you're driving and you see a serviceman on leave waiting for a ride, pick him up. Remember, short lifts make longer leaves. And now, back to the whistler. Stevens, you really got yourself into something, didn't you? And uh, not exactly what you expected. A strange girl picks you up on the street, takes you to her swank home, leads you to expect uh, something romantic, and then shows you a dead man hidden under her bed. And now she's saying to you... All you have to do is help me hide him permanently. You mean you want... The place out in the garden with some newly turned earth wouldn't be noticed. But I'm not much good at digging graves. Oh, baby, you can count me out. I don't know how this guy happens to have a hole in his head, and I'm not asking any questions, but count me out on any part of it. You said you'd do anything for me. Yeah, but well, I don't go off the deep end for any woman. Oh, no, lady. Pardon me, but I'll be seeing you. I think you better wait, Mr. Stevens. Oh. Yeah, I see what you mean. I didn't think there was enough to that outfit you're wearing to hide a gun. I warn you, I know how to use it. How can I doubt it with the evidence staring me in the face? Good. And if you'll just pick up our late departed friend and come with me, I'll show you the place. Yes, you really got yourself in for something, Van. And there's not much you can do about it now, not with that gun in your back. So you pick up the corpse and carry it downstairs and out into the garden. She gives you the shovel and shows you where to start digging. There's just enough light from the deserted street to see her standing over there with a gun on you. You look around. There's no house within shouting distance. Only a gas station down the street and it's closed. In the back of the garden, there's a drop-off, an arroyo running on down to the sea a few hundred yards away. You're stuck, Van. And then the awful thought comes to you. What will she do with you? She can't let you go to spill the story. There's only one answer, and you remember something she said. Make it plenty big. And you know she meant big enough for two. You'll be in there too, Van, yes. Unless you do something. And so you do it. A shovel full of dirt right in her face. <laughs> Yes, a shovel full of dirt in her face knocked her off her feet, eh, Van? And at the same time, you were rolling down the arroyo, through the brush and cactus, over the rocks until you landed at the bottom. Then you take off for the beach running. There are no shots, no footsteps following you. And you're away, free. Down the beach to town, catch your bus into the hotel and fix up your scratch face and hands. And now, decide what to do. Go to the police? Yes, probably you should. 
But you're not going to. Not just yet, are you, Van? Because you can't get that blonde face out of your mind. And you want to be sure before you do anything that will send her up to the gas chamber. That kind of thinking has gotten many a man in trouble, Van. But you go to bed and get a fitful night's sleep. Next morning, Sunday, you're up early, but there's nothing in the paper that you get with your breakfast. Nothing at all. You hadn't really expected anything. But when you get down to the desk, you find there's something in your box. There's nothing written on the envelope. You say a young lady left it here last night? Uh, late last night. She told me to put it in your box. All right. Hmm. That looks awfully green. Yeah. One crisp hundred dollar bill. And no note? No nothing? No. I wish I knew your secret, Mr. Stevens. Yes, Van. You wish you knew the secret, too, don't you? Now, more than ever. One hundred dollars to keep still, and it's pretty obvious there'll be more if you live up to the bargain. But play it smart, Van. Find out more about this girl. You don't even know her name. Catch a bus. Ride out along the beach to the last stop. Walk on from there till you spot the house sitting back from the beach. There's a police car sitting out in front of it. Better stop in at the gas station. Maybe you can find out something there. Hi. What can I do for you? You run out of gas or something? No, I, I was just walking. I saw there was some kind of excitement around here. Oh, yeah. Lots of it. More than we've had in a long time. They found a body down on the beach this morning. Oh, huh? somebody drowned? Maybe so. But he got a bullet hole through his forehead first. Murder, huh? Mm-hmm. Looks that way. Yeah, the cops been going through the neighborhood with a fine-tooth comb. Well, they don't know who he was? Oh, sure, sure. Everybody knows him. Alfred Hamilton. Snooty young society guy. He lives not far from here. Over in that house? Where? Oh, Ridgely's? No, no. He used to be over there a lot, but he didn't live there. Well, I noticed there was a police car out in front of that house. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's all part of the excitement. Not only is this friend of Ridgely's bumped off, but Doris is missing. Doris? Yeah, Doris Ridgely, old man Ridgely's daughter. That's uh, Ridgely the art collector, isn't it? Sure, sure. You know, he's about the richest guy in town. Nice old offer. And Doris, his daughter. I remember I've seen her... Blonde, isn't she good-looking? <laughs> that ain't the word for that kid. Brother, she's a doll. She's beautiful. Yeah, but rather hard, spoiled. Doris? Nah, why, there ain't a nicer kid in town. Yeah, and she's missing, too. Lord, she might even be in the drink herself. Only her car's gone, too. They think she murdered this guy, Hamilton? Oh, how should I know what they think? Only, if you ask me, she couldn't have. She's too regular. When was this guy murdered? Oh, last night. And I can tell you exactly when. Ten minutes to eight on the nose. Well, how can you be so sure? Because I heard the shot. Of course, you know, I didn't think anything of it at the time. But I did notice what time it was because I was just getting ready to close up. Did you tell the police that? Oh, sure, sure. Where'd the shot come from? Oh, how should I know? It was just a noise. Maybe from the house over there. Maybe from the beach where they found him. Tell me something. This is very important. Yeah? Was Doris in the house when you heard the shot? You know, that's funny... The cops asked me that, too. No, she, she wasn't there early in the evening. But she came by and went in sometime. I, I can't remember whether it was before or after I heard that shot. Like I said, I, I didn't pay too much attention. You see, it, it, it was about the same time. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Hey, hey. Who are you, anyway? Nobody important. So long. Now, how do you like that? Who do you suppose he was? <laughs> Now you're on to something, Van. You think you've got something figured, don't you? Doris didn't murder Hamilton at all, did she? She was covering for somebody else. And you've got to find her and bring her back. Why you, Van? Why should you get mixed up? Love, maybe? But anyway, where could she be? The police don't know. How should you... But wait. What was it she said about a cabin in the mountains? Yes, at Anderson Lake. Okay, Van. The bus station can probably tell you how to get to Anderson Lake. Uh, anybody here? Yes, yeah, sure, young fella. What can I do for you? 
Got everything your body needs here at Anderson Lake. Groceries, notions, drugs, fishing and tackle. I'm looking for somebody, Pop. I thought you might give me directions. I'm the person to come to. Can tell you about anybody in Anderson Lake. Who are you looking for? Doris Ridgely. She's got a cabin up here, hasn't she? Yep. How do I get there? You don't. Huh? Why not? Wouldn't do you no good. Well, why not? Nobody there. But I'm sure Doris is up here and i got to find her. Well, if you've got eyes in your head, you wouldn't have to go to no cabin. What? If you'll just look across the street over there, you'll see her car in front of Jake's cafe. She's inside eating. Okay, Pop. Thanks. Yes, she's in Jake's cafe, all right. And you wait and watch until she finishes eating and comes out. And as she gets into the convertible, you slip around the other side and open the door. Hello, baby. Nice day for a drive, isn't it? Even. Don't reach for your bag. I'll take it instead. And I'll just take a look inside, too. Uh, just as I thought. The gun, you still got it. Well, I'll just keep it this time if you don't mind. Look, Mr. Stevens. Just a minute, baby. I'll do the talking. First, I'll give you this $100 bill back. Even if I had a price for this sort of thing, it wouldn't be a hundred fish. That's all I had last night. I said even if I had a price, I don't. I'll keep my mouth shut until I'm ready to talk, or you are. Don't you think I have anything to talk about? Look, baby, I don't know much about this, but I know a lot more than I did last night, and mostly I know a good kid when I see one. If you're really in trouble, I'm sorry, but I don't think you are. I don't think you killed this heel, Hamilton. I think you're covering up for somebody who did. No. I'm not. I killed him. He was threatening me. He was threatening to tell something about me. I killed him. That's all there is to it. I don't believe you. All you did was try to get me to help you cover up somebody else's wound. No, my own. Okay. So you're not ready to talk yet. So let's go for a drive, like last night. Oh, I notice you got a bandage on the chin. I'm sorry I had to clip you. I didn't like the prospect of sharing that hole in the ground with that stiff. Oh, you mean you thought I... Oh, no, I never intended to shoot you, no. Well, how'd you think you'd get away with it then? Just let me walk away to tell the cops? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, okay, keep your chin up. Of course you didn't know. You were mixed up in something you knew nothing about. You couldn't have killed this guy Hamilton any more than you could have killed me. So, come on, come clean. Yeah, I can't. Look, whoever this is you're covering up for, they'll be found out eventually anyway. And probably they had good reason for what they did from what I hear about Hamilton. And the jury will take that into consideration. But now you've got to get yourself off the spot. And me, too. We're accessories to the murder now. I know, I know. Why are you doing this? Why did you come here? Come here. Does that answer your question? No talking now. Come on, start driving. We'll be back in town in two hours and we'll settle it all with the police. Well, Van, feeling pretty proud of yourself, aren't you? The strong man of action coming to the rescue of the lovely lady. And she's uh, grateful, you can see that. The way she smiles at you, weakly, wonderingly. But maybe later when it's all over. Stop dreaming, Van. You're almost there. You're back in town and driving down one of the main streets toward the police station when suddenly Doris puts on the brakes and you wheel up beside a squad car. Hey, what's wrong, baby? Not a squad car. We want to go to the police station. What are you doing? Officers! Officers! Yes, ma'am? Arrest this man. He's wanted for murder. Be careful. He's got a gun. But that's not all of tonight's story. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, let me ask you a question that's mighty important to drivers today. How many miles per gallon of gas are you getting these days? If you're among the great majority of drivers who don't know the answer to that question, then here's a point well worth remembering. For years, more and more Western drivers who keep close track of their gasoline mileage have been switching to Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. And what's more important, the switch to Signal has actually increased since gas rationing. And here's why. Although certain gasoline ingredients have gone to war, Signal's standard of quality still guarantees you the very finest gasoline that can be made today. 
and Signal still places the emphasis on mileage. Naturally, no company can promise you all the flashing performance you found in pre-war gasoline. And we can only hint at the brilliantly improved Signal gasoline you'll be able to buy after victory is won. But what you're interested in today is getting the most possible miles from every ration coupon. And for that job, you'll find Signal Go Farther Gasoline your best buy today. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Van Stevens, that will teach you to trust a woman or to dream about love and such things. You have lovely young Doris figured for an innocent heroine, and now she's turned into a villainess and is trying to pin the murder on you. At the police station, you're both up in front of the chief of the Homicide Bureau, and you can hardly believe your ears. Yes, they were both at my house last night. They left together. I heard a shot, and when I went looking, I found Mr. Stevens standing over Alfred's body, down on the beach. But I tell you, I didn't kill him. It's all a lie. I know you didn't kill Hamilton, Mr. Stevens. But I saw him. I... And you are a pretty clumsy one at trying to frame an innocent man, Miss Ridgely. But... Oh, I... I did it. No, you didn't either. You might as well stop all this, because you see, we know who killed Alfred Hamilton. Oh, no. No, no, he didn't do it. Oh, please, you've got to believe that... Miss Ridgely, if you think it was your father who killed Hamilton, you're mistaken. Mistaken? Yes, because we have pretty conclusive proof that Hamilton's death was a suicide. And if you hadn't messed up the evidence by trying to destroy the body, it would have been much easier. I don't understand. I'll explain. When you came home last night, you found Hamilton on the floor of the study, shot through the head, with your father's gun on the floor beside him. Yes, that's right. You immediately thought your father had killed him. But why? Because Hamilton had been blackmailing Ridgely for years. That's how he lived. We needn't go into why, because the suicide closes the case. And it will never be made public. Oh, thank heaven. But why did he commit suicide? Because your father finally had evidence against him and was prepared to expose him. Mr. Ridgely told Hamilton that about 7 o'clock last night. Then left him in the study and came down here to police headquarters to turn in the evidence. Hamilton feared exposure more than Ridgely did and shot himself with your father's gun that he found in the desk. He was a pretty weak sister to try as tough a racket as blackmail. And I thought... You shouldn't have jumped to conclusions. We were called when your father got home, found blood on the floor, and you gone. It all began to make sense when we found the body and the gas station attendant gave us the exact time of the shot. We knew where Mr. Ridgely was at that time. He was here. We checked back and found that you, Miss Ridgely, couldn't have arrived until shortly after the shot was fired. The condition of the wound almost proved suicide. And I have a report here that adds the last word. They've just found Hamilton's fingerprints on the gun that you and Mr. Stevens have been carrying around. So, the case is closed. I, I can't believe it. Technically, I could hold both you and Mr. Stevens on a charge of obstructing justice. But I suppose you've learned your lessons, and not much would be gained. So you're free to go. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You will probably be called in for the coroner's inquest. But until then, Miss Ridgely, I've called your father. He's waiting for you at home. Thank you very much. Well, baby, it was nice. Oh, Mr. Stevens, I owe you an apology. Uh, maybe now we could have that drink. Look, baby, you're a nice kid. You're beautiful, fascinating, all those things, especially beautiful. But, baby, if you ever see me walking down the street, just go on by, please. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The curious story of death marks the double cross. 
The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with story by John Dunkel and Hazel Lytle, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking, and suggesting you let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, The Master's Tree. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. There's an old adage about letting sleeping dogs lie. But sometimes that's not so easy. Sometimes they won't lie still. Sometimes they walk in the night. We might have warned Alice Towers and the people of the little English village of Wickley about that. But they probably wouldn't have noticed. The mysterious disappearance of Philip Towers five years ago was all but forgotten. And the flood that had just engulfed the surrounding countryside was still the main topic of conversation. And that was when Alice Towers came home, arriving at the little station on the 1015 road. Miss Alice! Oh, Miss Ellis? Yes? Oh, it's Anthony. Dear old Anthony. Welcome home, Miss Ellis. Oh, thank you, Anthony. Oh, it's so glad to hear that. Welcome after all these years, Miss Alice. Even after I married, I was always Miss Alice to you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You didn't mind, did you? Oh, of course not, Anthony. And it's good to see you. Miss Mildred sent me down to meet you. She and Mr. Jeffrey be waiting at home. <laughs> The weather be so miserable. Oh, of course, of course. I wouldn't have had them chance a cold. You've had very bad weather for some time now. Aye, aye, the flood was terrible. Here, yeah, let me take your bags to the car. Oh, yes, these are all, I think. We can get the trunks tomorrow. This way, Mum. <laughs> you know, I'm just as glad that they didn't come. Now I can have a talk with you alone. How are they? Have they been all right, Anthony? Well, Mum, as, as well as can be expected. Well, what do you mean? Well, with Mr. Philip and you gone, and Mr. Philip was always Miss Mildred's favorite brother, and then when he married you, you were the favorite of all of us. Oh, thank you, Anthony. It's been a long time, Miss Ellen. Yes. Five years, Anthony. Five years. And uh, what about uh, Mr. Philip? I've never found a trace, Anthony. Oh. For five years, I've searched two continents without a trace. It just disappeared from the face of the earth. I can't understand it. Nobody can. He was so fine a man. And you were such a happy, devoted couple. Yes. We were happy. Here, Mum. The car's right over here. It's still yes. raining. Uh, hurry and you won't get wet. Oh, yes, of course. I, I'll slide in on your side, eh? Yes. Uh, I'll put the bags in the back. Ah. Uh, uh, I levy in front of a roaring fire at Miss Mildred's in a jiffy. So, Anthony, you're 
You're still taking care of Mildred's place? Aye, just as I used to take care of your gardens at the master's place. Oh, he thought so much of you, Anthony. You were one of his favorite people. Maybe, Mum. That was because he loved flowers and trees so much, and so do I. <sighs> I mind how he used to sit out in the gardens all day. You and the master used to sit under that cherry tree on the edge of the cliff there and look out at the sea. And I'd bring you tea out there. Yes. That was Philip's favorite tree. Besides, I think he loved it almost more than anything. Maybe so. He was strange in some ways. Is, is the cherry tree still there? Why, uh, uh, yes, ma'am, I, I think so. I, I don't rightly know. I didn't notice it when I went out to look after the flood. Was there much damage? Oh, yes, ma'am, frightful. The brook, the brook that went by the house, it tore up everything. The garden, the orchard... Even the house was badly hit. Oh, no. Oh, the topsoil's gone, the ground uprooted. Oh, Anthony, I want to go out there. Why, of course, Mum, I'll take you out to look it over, but it's not a pretty sight anymore. No, Anthony, I mean, I'm going out there to live. Oh, no, Mum. Why, it's... Why not? Uh, well, it's badly damaged. Well, we can fix the damage. Oh, but Miss Alice... It's, it's what? Well, well, it's like a dead place. A dead place? I don't know how to tell you, but uh, there's something queer there. It's almost like a smell of death over it. And since you left, it's been vacant these five years. Well, with Mr. Phillips' disappearance... What and... are you trying to say, Anthony? Well, it's just that... Will you know how these village people talk? Oh, you mean they've decided it's haunted? Well, somewhat like that, Mum. Oh, Anthony. You know they say that about any vacant house out on the moors. Yes, I know, but... But nonsense, you... Anthony, nonsense. I'm going back to the master's house. And I'm going to live there. All right, Mum. But somehow, I, I don't like it. Whistler fans, can you answer this question? Who brings you the Whistler? I hope you said Signal Oil Company. We asked that same question four weeks ago, and we were pleased to learn that so many of you gave the right answer. Frankly, we were surprised, in view of the fact that the Whistler has been adding so many new listeners each week. You see, the Whistler is now the most popular Pacific Coast program, thanks to your interest. And naturally, we of the cast want all of you to know our sponsor. For you new Whistler fans... If you have trouble remembering names but can remember faces, let me give you this tip. Visualize for a second the Signal Oil trademark, the black circle sign with the yellow letter spelling Signal Gasoline that so conspicuously identifies a signal service station. It will pay you to remember that circle sign when you need gasoline because that is the station that supplies the gasoline that does go farther. Ration coupons are precious these days. So do as thousands of motorists do who keep a record of mileage and discover for yourself that Signal Gasoline is the gasoline that does go farther. And now, back to the Whistler. Alice Towers, back in the English village of Wickley after an unsuccessful five-year search for her missing husband, Philip, has announced her intention of going back to the lonely old Towers home by the sea, against the advice of old Anthony the gardener and Philip's sister and brother, Mildred and Geoffrey. It's utterly ridiculous, Alice. You can stay right here in the village with us. Well, of course, Alice. We've made all the arrangements for you. You can spend the rest of your days here with us, if you wish. Surely you understand. The old place out there is my home. It's where Philip brought me as a bride. It's where we spent so many happy hours together. But it's not the lovely place it was then. Perhaps not. And Philip is not there either, but... But living there, I'll have my memories of him. I'll feel close to him. I don't understand you, Ellis. You're not the type of woman to brood. You're much too matter-of-fact to go on spending your life living with a... Ghost. Jeffrey. Well, what would you call this, this compulsion to bury oneself out there on the moors? I don't know, Jeffrey. I only know I must go. And that's enough for me. If Alice feels she must go, then we will lend her every assistance. 
We can drive out there tomorrow and look it over. See what must be done. Anthony can help, and we'll stay with you until you're settled. Thank you, Mildred. Not at all, my dear. Now I'm going to bed. You two can stay up till all hours if you wish. Good night, Jeffrey. Good night, Mildred. Good night, my dear Alice. It's good. Very good to have you back. Thank you, dear. Good night. Well, Alice. Well, Jeffrey. Your mind's made up? Yes. Nothing I can say will stop you. Why do you want to stop me, Jeffrey? Because I fear for you, Alice. I fear for your staying alone in that godforsaken old place. Oh, come now. You're not going to tell me the ghost stories, are you? Not the kind they mean, of course. But there are other kinds of ghosts, Alice. Ghosts of the mind. What do you mean? I only mean it's not good for a young, attractive, vital woman to bury herself in a lonely past. You need life, not death. Death? But we don't know that Philip is dead. Well, there doesn't seem much doubt of it now, does there? At any rate, it might as well be, as far as you're concerned. Jeffrey, why don't you want me to live there? I've just told you. Besides, the place is ruined, unlivable. It'll take months to fix it up. There must be a reason. A better reason than all of this. Perhaps there is, Alice. You never liked Philip very much, did you? No. You were the only one who ever noticed that. You even hated him, didn't you? Sometimes. And why not? Why should I have loved a brother who always got the best of it? The family fortune, the home out there, the adoration of everyone. And the only woman I ever loved. Jeffrey. You needn't look so surprised, Alice. You knew it even then. Perhaps you liked it a little secretly. Sometimes I thought you might even return my feelings. You were my husband's brother. But sometimes it seemed your affection was more than that. It was, it was your imagination, I Jeffrey. I think not. Now, Alice, I've waited five long years for you to come back. Now that you have, I won't let you go so easily again. I won't let you go out there and bury yourself in the past. Living, Philip stood between us. Dead, I won't let him stand between us any longer. Jeffrey, could it be that you're trying desperately to keep me away from that house? Because of something you're afraid I might find? You're suggesting I might have done away with Philip? No, Alice. I hated him, but I couldn't have killed him. I've told you my only motive, Alice. I love you. I want you to forget Philip, the past, that house, and be my wife. If you go out to that house, you're lost to me. And perhaps to the world. <laughs> Well, Alice, your homecoming is not quite as simple as it might appear to the villagers of Wickley. It begins to take on something of the qualities of a nightmare, doesn't it? Haunted houses and secret motives for perhaps murder. It promises to be very interesting. But then you don't frighten easily, do you? And you've made up your mind. So the next day, bright and early, you all drive out to the lonely house on the cliff. Day, anyway. Well, Mildred, why did you have to bring that dog along? He's off again. He's liable to get into anything. Oh, never mind, Jeffrey. Prince can take care of himself. Besides, he loves to run around the old place. Let him. Oh, my. Just look at that. You see, Miss Alice? The water did a lot of damage. Oh, yes, but the house isn't as bad as I expected. I could live in it just as it stands. Well, it wouldn't be very comfortable, Alice. Oh, dear, no. But if Alice insists, we can fix it up. Oh, dear. Just look at the garden while there's nothing left. No, Mum. It would have broken the master's heart to see this. Yes. But the stream must have been diverted right through here. Yes, practically dug a new channel right through the garden and over the cliff down there. Took a lot of earth with it, right into the sea. Why, well, Alice, where are you going? Why, just down by the cliff for a moment. Why don't you and Jeffrey go on back to the house? Be careful down there. The ground's still soggy and lively to give way. Oh, I'll be, I'll be careful. Anthony will take care of me. Aye, Mum. Oh, it'd be like a wasteland. There, now, uh, watch your foot in, Miss Alice. Oh, thank you. Miss Alice, watch your step. Oh, dear. Ah. There'll be no need to worry. It'll be there all right. What? The tree. The master's cherry tree by the cliff. 
I looked while you was in the house. The ground be all dug up around there. But the tree be still safe. I must see it. Aye, ma'am. Right there behind the big rock. There. Right there. Anthony. Strange. It's very strange. What, ma'am? It's in bloom. Everything else on the estate is ruined and dead. Cherry tree is in bloom. Stop, Miss Ellis. Don't he go out there? That ground be loose and might give way. And it's a hundred feet down to the rocks. Oh, yes, yes, of course. It's enough to see that anyway that the tree is there. Philip's tree is there. And in bloom. <laughs> That might be some sort of omen, mightn't it, Alice? But for good or ill, who can say? At any rate, you decide to stay. Move in right now. Jeffrey and Mildred protest. But when they can't dissuade you, they offer to stay for a night or two with you and help to get the house fixed. They send Anthony into the village for linen and food. And after dinner, you all make the beds and settle down for the night. There are strange noises as the old house rocks in the wind. And you can't sleep very well, can you, Alice? And so, in the early light of dawn, you're up and about. And you're not the only one. Now what be that blast you dug up to? Down by the cliff he be, too. Bad enough having to get up early without having the plain nurse made to a blooming dog. Like he be stuck in crevasse or something. But be down by cherry tree. Bad, blasty dog. Why, miss me. Miss Ellis. Oh, Anthony, I, I didn't think anyone was up yet. Quiet, friends, quiet, please. Come on, doggy, come on. What on earth be you doing down here all by yourself this time of day? Oh, I don't know, Anthony. I, I, I couldn't sleep. So I just walked out here to look at the ocean. and See, it's the way Philip and I used to. Now, Miss Ellis... It been good for you to grieve, so... I'm all right, Anthony. And look at your dress. All covered with mud. Oh, well, I slipped on the path. Oh, shame. And such a nice dress. It's all right, Anthony. Oh, but it bains. I know what you was going to do. You come down here to sit under the tree and stare and dream. Just like the master used to do. How quiet he used to be off in his dreams. A body could have walked up behind him and bashed him one before he knowed it. Anthony! Oh, oh. I beg your pardon, Mum. I forgot myself for the moment. I I wasn't thinking to what I was saying. It's no matter. No you matter. had me so upset that you coming out here and... But uh... why, Anthony? Why shouldn't I come out here? Why don't you want me to get near the tree? Uh, why, why? Oh. Oh, oh, only because, Mum, it may not say. Remember, I told you this soft ground. Oh, yes, of course, Look! Oh, that blasty dog, he's gone and started digging under Master's... Anthony, oh. stop him! Stop him quickly, you've got to stop him! But why, Mum? Good heavens, if you've gotten already, the soft round you just told me about! Prince! Prince, come back, Prince! Prince! Good doggy, good doggy, good dog, Prince. Anthony, you must keep him away from here from now on! You hear? You must keep him away from here! You must keep him away from here! Don't you worry about that. Now, why should that chance meeting with old Anthony bother you, Alice? But it does, doesn't it? It seemed to strengthen some vague fear you had before you couldn't understand. Now you're beginning to, aren't you, Alice? Because now it's growing into suspicion and terror. Later that day, you have another conversation with Anthony that doesn't help much either. I tried, just like he told me to get workmen from the village to come up and help us rebuild the place. But I couldn't get none. But why not? We'll pay them well. Oh, but that'd be nothing to do with it, Mum. They just won't come. Not for any price. Oh, now, Anthony, we're not going to let village ghost stories upset our oh, plans. Oh, Miss Alice, I tried to tell them there was nothing to stories. But they won't come. They do say so much... Well, so much mysterious is about the place. And they've heard about cherry tree a blooming there on the cliff when the rest of the place be in ruins. That only makes them more sure that... The... That what? Well, they, they do say... 
I, I mean some folks think the master never did leave here. That he be here now, alive or dead. Oh. Mm, I'm sorry, Mum. I, I, I didn't mean to frighten me. I... It's all right. It's all right. What do they think happened to him? Will there be some talk that he might have been murdered? Do you think he was murdered, Anthony? No, Mum. Do you? No. Of course not. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Alice. Perhaps I shouldn't have said nothing. It was only that those men refused to... We'll talk about it tomorrow, Anthony. Yes, Mum. What is it? Alice. But Alice, what are you staring at? What is that? Oh, that? Oh, my dear, that's nothing to get so excited about. Well, it's just an old walking stick that, that Jeffrey found half buried in the mud out in the garden. Yes, I dare say. It's Philip's old stick. Didn't get all the mud off it. But Alice, mm. are you well? <sighs> Sit down. Well, of course, dear. Yeah. Well, this, uh, what is it? Uh, Why should this old walking stick give you such a start? Well, I, I couldn't find it after you. He left. I've always naturally supposed he took it with him. It was just seeing it here. My dear, my dear. Well, how inconsiderate of us not to have thought. I'm so dreadfully sorry. It's all right, Mildred. It's, it's all not all right, Alice. Can't you see what this house is doing to you? Only two days here and you'll jump as a cat. Jeffrey! You've got to get out of here. Forget the whole thing before you crack up. Alice, for once I'm beginning to agree with Jeffrey. Please, dear, won't you come home with us? I can't leave. I mustn't. I can't understand why not. I'm beginning not to understand you at all, Alice. Jeffrey's right. It's perfectly obvious that Philip's gone. Gone forever. And therefore it's... Well, it's silly and stupid of you not to go on with your life without... Oh, Mildred, please! I don't know why you two and all of you can't let me alone. What is it you want of me? Why can't you let me alone? Alice, my dear. Come, Alice. Leave me alone. Yes. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Well, Alice, you letting all this talk of Philip's ghost get you down? You can't do that, you know. You can't go to pieces like this. After all, it's only in your mind, isn't it? This fear, the fear that's growing, you've got to stop it. Perhaps when the others have gone, yes. And they're going. They're going to give you your wish to be let alone. They've already packed and Jeffrey's come to say good night. Alice. Yes, Jeffrey? It's raining again, isn't it? Yes. More of the cliff will break away. Fall into the sea tonight. Alice, for heaven's sake... Don't you see, you must get away from here. Won't you please reconsider? Consider. I'll say it again, I love you. I want you to come away with me. Be my wife, forget all this. Become once again the loving, gay, lovely girl I once knew. Will you? No, Jeffrey, no. I might have once, but not now. Not yet. Maybe later. No, Alice. If you don't leave this house now, you never will. I can promise you that. What do you mean by that? I mean that very shortly you'll be quite mad. Or dead. I don't understand. I don't understand either why you must stay. Why you feel you must find out whatever it is you must find out. All you need to do is forget the past. And all will be well. If I could believe that. Very well, Ellis. I must go. Mildred's waiting in the car. Anthony will drive us in and then come back. Mildred insists that he stay you can't be here alone all night. I'll walk the door with you. Alice. Good night, Chester. Goodbye, Alice. Prince, come here. Take that bastard dog, sir. He'll be off digging under Master's cherry tree again. Must have some choice morsel there. I can't get him to call. What? I'll get him. Prince! Prince! Dear Prince! Looky, there he comes. You must have a way with him, that one, sir. Now look at him, flying up the path. Yes. Oh, but look there, he's, he's got something in his mouth. No wonder he was digging. Come here, boy. Oh, but you look at that, the biggest bone I ever saw. Well, Prince... No! 
Alice. No. Yes, sir. Alice. What is it? Oh, no. Forgive me, Philip. Forgive me. Alice, what are you saying? Forgive me. I didn't know what I was doing. Sir, you could do I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I thought I hated you, Philip. I thought I hated you. And that day when I came up behind you, I had the walking stick in my hand. You were staring out at the sea. You didn't notice me. And I... I don't know what came over me. Oh, I, I don't know why. I don't, Babbling nonsense, Anthony. I don't know why. Come, let's I don't get know. the house. Philip. Philip, I'm coming, Philip. I want to tell you why. Oh, I didn't. Why did you oh, oh, catch her, Anthony? Oh, She's running out. Why? Sir, let's take her over for the cliff. Why? For the monster's tree. Stop her. Oh, Alice. Alice. Alice, come Alice. back, Alice. Oh, sir, that be so grown. Alice. Alice, come Alice. Too late now, Anthony. The tree, that whole piece of cliff, gone. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime... If you're driving one of today's overage cars, here's an important point to consider. In races, you've no doubt noticed that most of the entrants get off to a pretty good start. But soon some start dropping behind because they haven't the stamina to keep up. Well, motor oils are like that, too. Most of them are okay for the first few hundred miles. But today, when cars have to last out the duration, your motor needs the full-time protection of an oil that can stand up and take it right through to the last mile. And that's why more and more drivers are switching to Signal Pen, the pure Pennsylvania oil with the fighting film. Signal Pen not only guards moving parts against wear and seals in power, but actual tests show that the fighting film of this super oil doesn't break down, not even under extreme heat. So make your next oil change a change for the better. Stop at Signal's black and yellow circle sign and say, drain and fill her up. With Signal Pen Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, at last the mystery of Alice Towers and the house by the sea was cleared up. Alice Towers, the ever-loving wife, had actually killed her husband Philip in a fit of rage. Then she buried him under his favorite cherry tree and spent five years abroad, uh, looking for him. His money, of course, had made it pleasant looking. When she returned for a visit, she heard about the flood and began to worry about whether it might have uncovered Philip's grave. She shouldn't have started worrying, because once you start, well, you saw what happened to her. She ended up on the rocks, literally. Jeffrey and Anthony heard her confession, babbled in her delirium, but no one else ever did. Because, you see, nothing could be proved. It was all in her mind. The walking stick had no trace of blood, no trace of crime at all. The bone which the dog dug up, and Alice must have been mistaken for one of her late husbands, was actually only a large soup bone Anthony had given him the day before. There was left only the tree. The master's tree, blooming in the midst of ruin to be explained. And Anthony had the answer to that, too. I knew how much he thought of that tree. So when the real one was washed away by the flood, together with the earth under it, I planted a new one. That wasn't the master's tree at all. The evidence of her crime was destroyed long ago. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The curious story of accident according to plan. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. 
This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Larry Roman and John Dunkel, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Marvin Miller speaking, and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther. With signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, The Man Who Bought Death. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Love makes the world go around, so they say. But it also causes a lot of trouble. Take, for instance... The case of Eddie Ford and Ruth Spray. They were in love, had been for a long time. Childhood sweethearts and all. The kind of thing that usually brings nothing but happiness and good fortune. But Eddie and Ruthie were born on the wrong side of town. They grew up on 2nd Avenue, and that's not exactly the best environment. Eddie's love for Ruth began to show itself in the wrong way. At 7, he stole an apple for her. At 14, he stole a car to take her for a ride. At 17, he'd spent his first night in jail. And at 22, he is firmly established as a small-time crook about town. But he and Ruthie are still in love, just waiting for him to knock over a big enough score to get married. Meanwhile, Ruth works as a dancer in a cheap nightclub. And sometimes Eddie goes over and sits at a table with her between floor shows. with you tonight, Eddie. Oh, I'm sick of being broke. Well, why don't you get a job? What do you think I am, a jerk? Working for 20 bucks a week? I don't know how to do anything. Yeah, I know it, Eddie. I know how I could have plenty of dough, though, if I could get some operating cash. Yeah, well, how much? All I need is a C note. <laughs> Might as well be a million. Of course, if I had a hundred dollars, I'd give it to you. You know that. Yeah, I know. Hey, Eddie. I thought I told you to stay out of here. You told me. Who do you think you are, a cop, Pete? Go on. I don't want you in a place. A cheap grafter, and I don't want you hanging around the girls. Uh, Eddie's all right, Pete. Look, if he don't stay out of here, I'm going to fire you too, Ruthie. Oh. All right, Eddie, take distance. I got a job for Ruthie. Yeah, what kind of a job? The kind of job I pay you for, baby. There's a guy over there who's throwing money around like confetti, and he wants to meet you. Oh, oh, that big moose with the brown suit, I suppose. Yeah, that's him. He's smiling at you, Ruthie. <laughs> Is that what you call it? Hey, maybe you better go over to his table, sugar. Yeah. Maybe Eddie needs some dough. Shove off, Pete. Where you looking? I'll be right over. Okay. Now, there's nothing personal unless you understand, Eddie. Just don't want you in here, that's all. Mm. I'll see you backstage after the show, huh, Ruthie? Mm-hmm. All right, Eddie. Eddie. Huh? You uh, love me a little? Ah, huh? uh, you know I do. <laughs> Honey. And if this guy's loaded, I want him. You understand? Okay, Eddie. I'll see you after the show, huh? Okay. <laughs> Yes, Eddie and Ruth are in love, but business is business. So Ruthie goes to join the big moose in the brown suit. She walked up to his table, smiled prettily, and said, Hello. Hello, baby. Sit down. Build yourself a lap. Thanks. You're, uh, you're on the town tonight, aren't you? Yeah, and, uh, 
You're going to join me, youngster. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like an interesting way to spend the evening. You know, um, that bottle looks like champagne. <laughs> that's funny. That's just what it is. <laughs> and I bought it for you, oh. lovely. Nothing's too good for Frankie Ferrari's girlfriend. You're in the big league now, sweetheart. You talk a great game. <laughs> Stick around and watch me play it, baby. I just hit town tonight, and I'm fat with that stuff. Want to help me spend it? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I got a lot of talent that way. Well, <laughs> what are you doing after the show tonight? Oh, nothing. Well, that is nothing that you're not going to be in on. You're a lippy little dame, aren't you? I like them, lippy. I think you and I are going to get along, baby. Keep the next couple of weeks open. You're going to be busy. <laughs> well, uh, look, let's talk about that later, huh? Because I uh, got to get backstage. Floor show goes on a few minutes. Okay. Uh, I'll meet you out in front five minutes after the show's over, okay? Five uh, minutes? <laughs> you must dress like a fireman. I don't waste time uh, at anything, thank you. <laughs> So that's the way love works on Second Avenue. Ruth steers the big bankroll lady's way. Well, that's one way of filling a hope chest. After the show, Eddie's waiting backstage to give her the proper instructions. Now look, with his 12 o'clock closing, this guy's going to be looking for a speak when he meets you. See? Yeah. Now you steer him down 12th Street. When you pass the alley between Washington and Adams, I'll let him have my persuader behind his ear and you run. You bring back the first cop you can find. That'll keep you in the clear. And I'll have the dough and be gone a long time before the John Dimes get there. Yeah, okay, Eddie, I'll do it. <laughs> Maybe this will be our big break. Okay, okay. Down 12th Street, you're leading him to a speak, see? Well, this looks like it might be very interesting, doesn't it, Eddie? You scurry out the back door of the nightclub while Ruthie makes a quick change and meets the amorous Frankie out in front of the club. Well, uh, where do we go from here, Curly Lark? What do you feel in the mood for? Oh, I feel in the mood for fun. Man, it's been 12 o'clock closing, silly. Oh, that's for the squares, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, don't you know any joints that stay open? Oh, yeah. I, well, I know one, but it's pretty expensive. Oh, dough don't mean anything, baby. Where is this joint? So on 12th Avenue. Shall we get a cab? No, it's only about a, oh, about two and a half blocks. All right, so we'll walk. Oh, I love to be out, walking around at this time of night. Not this time of year. Ain't the fresh air just wonderful? I don't know. I never noticed it. Oh, you would notice it if you had to work in a gin mill like I do. Hey, uh, what's a beautiful dame like you doing dancing in a flea bag like the Club Modern? Mm. Haven't you ever had a better offer? Want to make me one? Could be if uh, things work out. Oh, this is 12th Street. We've turned down here. What's the matter, kid? Don't you like me? Oh, sure I like you. I love big men with money. <laughs> Looks like I'm made to order chicken. I weigh 260 and I make all the money I want. No limit. Yeah, well, how do you do it? Oh, I'm an operator. And that's all the conversation we're going to have on that subject. Oh. Hey, hmm? this is a nice dark street. How about a kid? Oh, no, not here. I, well, the space's only a block away. Can't you wait till we get there? <laughs> okay, baby. I like my dames with spirit. Up to a point. Stick around. You know, Frankie, I wouldn't be at all surprised if you turned out to be the kind of man that I could learn to love. Yeah? Yeah. Well, uh, listen, baby. Oh, oh, oh. Eddie. Oh. Run, will you? Give me a couple of seconds, then yell for the cops. Yeah, well, Eddie, you'll be dead. Beat it, beat it, go on. Help! 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 What do those signs mean? Ring around the moon, they say, means rain tomorrow. Rosie Sunset said to forecast a fair morning. And that big black circle sign with the yellow letter spelling signal gasoline? Well, there's the sign that never fails to mean most miles from your gas coupon. Yes, more and more wise western drivers are daily discovering that it's not just a slogan, it's a fact. You do go farther with signal gasoline. And for good reason. One, true to its 14-year tradition of quality... Signal Oil Company is still producing the very finest signal gasoline that can be marketed today. 
And two, the famous signal formula still places the emphasis on mileage. So if you haven't tried signal gasoline in your car, may I suggest there never was a better time nor a better reason for looking up the station in your neighborhood displaying signals yellow and black circle signs and getting acquainted with your signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. Yes, love on 2nd Avenue can lead to all sorts of things. Like the slugging of a big spender in a dark alley. And Ruth carries out her part of the bargain like an old hand at crime. She runs screaming from the scene and brings the cops down in a hurry. Right here, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it happened right here. Oh, there's nobody here now. Hmm. What's the matter with you? You've been drinking? No. I tell you, I was walking along here with a man. What was his name? His name was Frank. Oh, Frank something or other. I can't remember his last name. Uh, you better change your brand, lady. You're uh, having hallucinations. Somebody in the alley, they must have lost their marbles. Oh, yeah? I ought to take you down to the station. But I ain't done anything. Okay, okay. Get out of here. Go on home and don't be bothering policemen. Uh, take it away, Jerry. This is a false alarm. <laughs> Funny, Ruth. You know that Eddie sapped Frank Ferrari to the sidewalk just a few minutes ago. And now, there's no sign of either Eddie or Ferrari. That's very funny. You can't see the humor in the situation, though. And you hurry to Nick's all-night restaurant to keep your rendezvous with Eddie. He's there in a rear booth waiting for you. Hello, baby. Hello, Eddie. Hey, look, the funniest thing happened. Keep it down to a college cheer, will you, baby? Sit down. Eddie, I, I, I waited to give you a chance to get away, you know, before I started to scream for the police. By the time I got back with the police, well, it couldn't have been over, guess, three or four minutes. Well, there was nobody there. Well, you're nuts. That guy was as cold as a witch's foot. Well, he wasn't there, Eddie. At least thought I was crazy. Gosh, I must be losing my touch. But a guy must have come through and beat it. Oh, probably just didn't want to get mixed up with the newspapers or yeah, something. Yeah, so. I thought you said he had a lot of dough on him. What? He did, Eddie. I, I saw it. Oh, nothing but chicken feed. Well, there it is. Seventy-eight bucks, three twenties, a ten, five, and three singles. You're lying to me, Eddie. Oh, me? Why would I lie to you? I shook him down. That's all the dough he had. Gee, Eddie, you lied to me, punk. Now, take it easy there, baby. I, look, I, I know he had a hundred dollars, Bill, because he showed it to me. There wasn't a C-note on him when I got him. That's true, Eddie. You understand? Hey, what's the matter with you, baby? I I don't mind you robbing anybody else. And I never beat when you spent every cent that I could make. But I won't stand for you lying to me, Eddie. No dame talk to me like that. <gasps> oh, Eddie. <sighs> Keep the hundred dollar bill. It'll never do you any good. It'll do nothing but get you into trouble, and I hope it kills you. <laughs> After all of these years, the love affair between Eddie Ford and Ruthie Sprague hit the rocks. And just because Eddie stole a hundred dollars, he did steal it, you know. Frank Ferrari was carrying a hundred and seventy-eight dollars when Eddie knocked him unconscious and robbed him in that alley between Washington and Adams. Eddie hated to lose Ruth, but business is business. Next day, he called on Bill Larimer at Bill's house in the suburbs. Eddie'd always wanted to do business with Larimer. You see, Larimer was a wholesaler in counterfeit money. Wholesalers sell it for 20 cents on the dollar to the shovers. Those are the people who actually cash it. Eddie had always wanted to be a big-time shover. He'd had a little experience, and he knew all the dodges. So this morning, he walks into Bill Larimer's apartment. I want to buy $500 worth of 10. Yeah, what are you going to use for money? This C note? Hundred dollar bill, huh? Yeah. Where'd you get it? Go on, look it over. It was made by the mint. Yeah. It's 
good, all right. You know, there's something about a hundred dollar bill. It feels different, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I like them. You can square a lot of beasts if you got enough of them. You're not kidding. Hey, George. Yeah? How'd you like to print up some hundreds for me? One, ten, twenty, hundred. Don't make no difference to me. Hey, me. Yeah, take a look at this C note. Did you make a good plate on it? Yeah. Yeah, that is photograph oak here. I could swing it. Hey, wouldn't it be a little tough? Shoving hundreds? With all the dough there is floating around these days? <laughs> That'd be duck soup. You push a couple of those a day, Eddie, it'd be in the dough. Yeah. Well, how about it? You gonna make some up? What do you say, Jack? Will you buy them? I'll take a thousand dollars worth the day they're finished. Okay, Bill. You just placed an order. Well, uh, give me those fifty tens. I gotta go get rid of them so I can buy some of those hundreds. You better not try to shove hundreds in that suit. You huh? gotta get a front to get away with that, Eddie. Take some of the dough you make off those tens and buy yourself a front. You're gonna be in the dough, kid. Eddie took a little trip out of town and spread his phony $10 bill. In railway stations, department stores, restaurants, and grocery stores, and was never questioned. He was gone about 10 days. When he came back, he thought of calling Ruthie, but decided he'd better call Bill first. He was pretty excited when Bill told him the hundreds were ready. He went right out there. Bill was glad to see him. He showed him the $100 bills, and they were beauty. That George was a craftsman, Bill said. There they are, ready. They're perfect. The best job George ever did. Yeah. See their beauties, all right. Think you can pass them? I wouldn't be afraid to pass those at the Federal Reserve Bank. Look, here's a hundred you brought in. I'm going to mix it up with the rest of these. Now, see if you can pick it up. Gosh. Gosh, I can't tell. Which one is it? I could hardly tell myself if I wasn't an expert on it. Hey, you been selling these C-notes to everybody as the town flooded with them? I haven't sold a patch of them, even. Just got them from George today. You got virgin territory, son. Well, that's good. Okay, here's a hundred bucks. Give me five of them. Five? Is that all the bill you got? No. I'm not going to sell you a hundred bucks worth. Give me two hundred. Well, okay, here you are. Now you're still in business. Well, do you think I can pass C-notes in this outfit? Hmm. Yeah, you look like a gentleman. You paid some bill for this trip, didn't you? Eighty-five bucks. Counterfeit money. Where are you stopping? Oh, I'm stopping at the Towers, best hotel in town. Oh, boy, you ought to see my luggage. Cowhide. Real cowhide. Yeah? Now you're operating, Eddie. Let me give you one tip. Uh, you can probably get away with spreading a couple of these centuries here in town. You probably won't be caught up with. But then they're going to start working. So you better get out of town. Oh. Don't you worry. In the first place, I'm not going to get nabbed. And in the second, if I do, I'm not going to talk. If you do, you'll be saying your last word, Teddy. Yes, Eddie, be careful. Now you're in it for keeps. In the big time. A real big shot. So now you decide to call Ruth. You find her at home, too. And you make a date to meet her at the Towers in the cocktail lounge. You want her to see your new clothes. Want to impress her with the fact that you're living at the best hotel in town. Plenty of money. You can't be blamed for wanting to gloat a little, can you? So, Ruthie meets you and you sit and sip your drink. Well, honey, how about letting bygones be bygones and let's start all over again, huh? Yeah, but that was a dirty trick, though, now, wasn't it? You stole that hundred dollars from me. Oh, but you framed the thing so I could get the dough to start operating, didn't you? Yeah, um, I'd have given you the money, Eddie, but... Well, I, I just don't like the idea of you lying to me. That's what I was mad about. Did you say was mad? You're not mad anymore? No. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not mad, Eddie. Uh, yeah, I, I could never be mad at you. Hey, hmm? you want to see something pretty? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Take a gander at this. Well, it's a dollar bill, isn't it? That's right. I'm lousy with them, baby. You know where I got them? No. Well, what you don't know won't hurt you, baby. Uh, look, I, I know you got to go to rehearsal, but how about me coming up to your place about uh, 5 o'clock? Oh, well. Why don't you take the night off? Oh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy some presents for you, oh. and I want you to be there when I bring them. Okay, Eddie. I'll be home at 5. But look, i I, I got to go now. Okay. How about a kiss? Uh, here? Oh, in front of all these people? 
Well, oh, sure. You're uptown now, baby. You can get away with things here that they'd never stand for down where we live. We're in a big time now, honey. For good. Don't be so sure of yourself, Eddie. In your racket, that's not good. Take it easy. But you can't get over being a big shot, can you? You can't resist going to a swank department store to buy your girl a real present. Uh, thank you, miss. Yes, may I help you? Yes, yes. I uh, want to buy a lapel pin for my girlfriend. I, I don't know much about things like that. Would you mind helping me out? Well, of course, I'd be glad to. Oh. If you see anything in this tray that you think she might like. Well, she's a blonde, about five feet one, blue eyes, and wears black most of the time. Oh, well, let me see. I think she'd probably like this penny of very much. Oh, that one, yeah. Mm-hmm. How much is that? Well, it would be just a minute. It's $35. I have to add the luxury tax to this. Oh, that, that would be about $42, yes. Oh, that's okay. Uh, can you take it out of this? Oh, my, a hundred dollar bill. Oh, I'm sorry, it's all I have. Oh, well, of course, that's perfectly all right. I'll have the change for you in a moment. Yes, Eddie, wait for your change. You stand there smoking your cigarette. And after a few minutes, you begin to worry, don't you? You try not to show it, but you sense that something's wrong. Then you look around and see him. The man with the unmistakable aura of a store detective. He comes up the aisle and stops a few paces from him. Something's wrong, Eddie. But they never arrest a man for shoving queer dough. They follow him. Try to find out where his source is. You've only got one of the bills on you, Eddie. You can say you won it in, in a crap game. They can't prove anything. But then you turn and see them. Two uniformed policemen coming down the aisle. And suddenly you're not so sure. You're not calm now, Eddie. You're scared. Panicky. You've got to get out. Run. Run, Eddie. Run. You got away all right, Eddie. But you've got a bullet hole in your shoulder. You switch cabs five times and cover your trail. But your handkerchief won't stop up the blood that's pouring from your shoulder. You've got to get attention. And Ruth is waiting for you. You finally get to her little flat. You get out of the cab a block away from it. And wait until the cab pulls away before you start walking. You're tired when you get there. Weak from loss of blood. Yeah. Now, let me in. Oh, Eddie. Eddie, what's happened to you? I don't know. I think the cops in this town are going crazy. Oh, have you been shot? Yeah. Yeah, they got me through the shoulder. Well, what are you going to do, Eddie? I'm going to stay here till the heat dies down. Well, come on in the bedroom, Eddie. you got to lie down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I don't feel so good. Now, let me take a look at that wound. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Let me lay down, will you? Oh, baby, baby, how did it happen? I tell you, the cops are going nuts. Oh, here, honey, let me put this pillow on his shoulder. I think the best thing to do with a baby is just to lay still so it stops bleeding. What happened, Eddie? Well, this morning when I got to town, I bought some phony hundred-dollar bills. Counterfeits, you know. Queer money? I don't go pure on you. Of course I've been well, shoving queer money. What do you think? Robbed a bank? Well, then why did they shoot you? I don't know. I don't get it. Even if they knew the bill was queer, they wouldn't send for the riot squad and start shooting up the department store. Oh, don't you think we ought to call a doctor? Oh, sure, yeah. That'd be a brainy move. But, Who's that? Yeah, I don't know. I wasn't expecting anybody. I better right? get in that closet and hide. Yeah, but... Whoever it is, get rid yeah. of them now, will yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, of course. Your name is Ruth Craig? Yeah. Looking for a friend of yours, a guy by the name of Eddie Forbes. Know where he is? Well, no. No, I, I ain't seen him. Well, yeah, we'll just come and take a look around. Well, no, we can't come in. We'll just... No. Oh. All right, boys, take the joint down. But... Ah. What's the matter, Craig? Cut your finger? Huh? What's oh, that no. blood doing on the floor? Hey, guy stood there for a while and went through that door over there. I know. Think... Nice of him to leave a trail like that. Get your guns out, boys. This guy's hotter than a four-alarm fire. Oh, no. Now, you stay out of the way, Miss Sprague. There's liable to be some fireworks. We're going in after that guy. We're coming in after you, Forbes. 
Will I kick this door in, be standing there with your hands up, or we start blasting? Uh, come and get me. Oh, no, I didn't know. No. Kick that gun out of his hands, Lord. <laughs> cold meat, Sergeant. Hey, he's trying to say something. Uh, you haven't got long to live, Ford. If you want to say anything, spit it out. Oh, what's the matter with you, cop? You crazy? Shooting a guy for... Hat and queer doll. What are you talking about? Oh. <laughs> He's gone, Sarge. Guy must have been nuts. What was he talking about? Queer doll. Oh. That's what you were after him for, wasn't it? Passing part of his money? No. Where'd you ever get that idea? We had this guy bracketed for that quarter million dollar bank robbery in Capital City a couple of weeks ago. He even tried to spend some of the money today. That's how we got on his tail. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, here's a $64 question that every driver should have a ready answer for these days. If one of your tires should suddenly be ruined, what would you... Tires are still hard, mighty hard to find, which makes now, before you have tire trouble, the time to take advantage of your signal dealer's complete tire service. By catching and repairing small injuries before they spread and ruin the carcass, and by suggesting retreading before the tread is worn too thin, your signal dealer can add thousands of miles of tire wear. And because of your signal dealer's experience, plus modern equipment and the best of materials, you're assured the quality kind of job that can make such a big difference in tire life. So make it a point soon to stop at one of those friendly stations displaying signals, yellow and black circle signs, and have your tires inspected. There's no one who can give you finer or more complete tire service than your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, Eddie Ford died for his crime. But the police were after him not for passing counterfeit money, the crime for which he was guilty. No, they cornered him for a crime he didn't commit, a crime he didn't even know had been committed. Remember how Eddie got that $100 bill from the heavy spender Ruthie steered his way? The counterfeiters made an engraving of that same bill, printed a few hundred of them, and sold some back to Eddie. But every cashier in the country was watching for the serial number on that bill and on all the counterfeits made from it. The heavy spender had picked it up illegitimately from a bank in Capital City. And Eddie died because he didn't know that. Ruth, her wish came true. Remember when she was sore at Eddie for lying to her? She made the wish that that hundred dollar bill he held out on her would cause his death. Yes, wishes do come true sometimes. And love ends up in funny ways. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories. And by your neighborhood Signal Dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Ray Buffum, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal.
The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Highway of Escape. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the heart of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Frances Block was never meant for the desert, but fate put her there set her down solidly in the center of an expanse of creosote brush and Joshua trees, cactus and hot, dry sand, and a scrubby little group of nondescript shacks huddled in the shade of a few scraggly umbrella trees. Known to the truck drivers passing through on Highway 441 as the Duncan Wells Tourist Camp, just Frances and Pete Crawford, her stepfather. For her, it was a prison. For him... It was a living, and the only one he knew. It was on a particularly hot day in July that she decided she couldn't stand it any longer. On a Sunday morning when the temperature stood at 90 degrees at 8 o'clock. And Frances knew there was always more money than usual in the cash register on Sunday morning. Five, ten, eleven, fifty, twelve, twenty-five, fifty, eighty-five, twelve, eighty-five. Oh, Morning. Oh, uh, hello. You open for business? Uh, not yet. Kind of early. Hmm, not even gasoline? The pump's locked. Hmm. How far is the next town? 17 miles. To Warrell. Okay, I can make it, I guess. Hmm? Thanks a lot. I better get going. Um, just a second. Yeah? You, uh, going through to, I mean, uh... Los Angeles, yeah. Do there by noon. Can you take me? Huh? I've got to get out of here this morning. Right now. Oh, come on. You could take me if you wanted to, couldn't you? No, I, I'd like to, but... Oh, please. Look, I'll give you five dollars. Yeah, sorry, sister. There's company rules. No riders. I'd lose my job. Oh, they'll never know. Look, mister, you don't know what it means. It's life and death. Yeah? Yeah. It's life and death. Death if I stay here in this... This... This prison. Oh. I can't take it any longer, you see? You've got to take me away. You've got to. Hey, what's the matter? You sick or something? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sick. Look, look, I'll make it ten dollars. Ten dollars to Los Angeles. Yeah, but... That leaves me only, uh, two eighty-five. My bag's right there. It's all packed. I won't tell the company. They'll never hey. know. See? Just you and me will know, and I'll get off in Los Angeles. Well, for ten bucks, you can take the train. Oh, no, there's no trains here. Just trucks. Guys like you. There's a train from the next town, ain't there? Yeah. Yeah, how about that? You can take me to the next town. That's all. Just in the next town. Well, uh, I don't know. I could... Morning, Francis. Oh. There's a little lady here uh, wants to ride into town with me. Hey, sorry, mister. She's made a mistake. I have not. I'm going, you hear? No, Francis. You're not going. You can't stop me, Pete. You can't stop me. I'm not going to stay here. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Well, uh, look, uh, mister, maybe, uh, maybe you two better talk this over. I... <laughs> I just thought I'd run it so well, but... Uh, she gets this way ever so often. She'll get over it. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll see you on the way back, maybe. Huh? Yeah. So long. Uh, so long. You did it again, you filthy... No, 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 no there, Francis. I know how you feel, gal. This ain't no place for a young filly like you. But can't you see? There ain't nothing else I can do. Ever since your ma died, you I... You killed her. That's what you did. Francis, that's an awful thing to say. Just the same as if you shot her with a gun. Bringing her up to this godforsaken hole. Making her work when it was so hot she couldn't breathe. Well, you're not doing it to me, do you hear? Now, wait a minute. You ain't talking to me like that. Oh, no. Well, listen, you dirty desert rat. I've had all of you I'm going to take, and I'm getting out of here today. This morning. In five minutes if a car comes. You're still my stepdaughter, Francis. Until you're 21, I'm afeard I'm doing the deciding. 
Oh, now, come on. You just trot on back to the cabin and lay down for a while. You'll feel better in no time. Get away from me! You'll understand about your maw someday. I know this place ain't much of a spread, but it was ours, and we built it together. Come on. I said get away from me. Please, Francis, just this once. For me. All right, Pete. Hey, wait a minute now. Put that knife down, Francis. You ain't in no condition to... All right. You ask for it. <laughs> Friends, have you picked up your free federal use stamp protector yet at your signal gasoline dealers? The deadline has already passed, you know, for getting your new use stamp on your windshield. And since that little stamp has to hang on your windshield for a whole year, you'll naturally want to protect it from moisture or scuffing so it won't peel off. That's why Signal Oil Company had these little use stamp protectors made up for you. They're smart-looking, transparent, and water-resistant, so you can wash right over them without affecting your use stamp. And, of course, they're free, one of the little extra services your signal dealer offers to keep your car looking its best. Unfortunately, like all things in wartime, the supply is limited this year. Since every car will be needing one, I'd suggest that you get yours without delay tomorrow, if possible... Just drive into any of the friendly stations displaying signals, yellow and black circle sign, and say, I'd like one of the use stamp protectors that was offered free on the Whistler. And now, back to the Whistler. He's dead, Francis. It's over, and you're free now. You stare at him for a moment as he lies there on the floor in the middle of the small lunchroom, very still. For the first time in your life, you notice he has a kind face, a peaceful face. No look of fear on it. Just peace, deep, enduring peace. Yes, you're free now. You can leave any time you want to. Today, this morning, the next five minutes, if a car comes. You jump as a car pulls up out in front. Quickly, Francis. Move the body behind the counter before the driver comes in. That's it. Now, take it easy. Just relax. He mustn't know. Hi, beautiful. How about a cup of java? Hey, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Uh, coffee isn't made yet. Uh, a cigarette? A scarce these days. Uh, no. <sighs> well? What? Are you going to make it or shall I? Make what? A coffee. Say, are you sure nothing's the matter? Okay, something doesn't matter. Um... I'm scared of my stepfather. Huh? He, he's horrible. I live here alone with him. I can't stand it anymore. That's oh, too bad. Oh, please. Please take me with you. To Saguaro anyway. I won't be any trouble. Oh, now, now wait a minute. Hold everything there. Now, now, now take it easy. Where is your stepfather? He's, he's asleep in his cabin. He's drunk. He wake up. Yeah, I, I, I see, yeah. You, uh, you got any money? Twelve dollars. But I can work once I get to a big town. Oh, I don't know. Oh, please. Please. I've been driving all night. I was going to grab a little shut eye here for a no, few I hours. I gotta go now. He, he might wake up and he might. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Well, okay, come on. You know, after what you told me about that stepfather of yours, I got half a mind to go back and punch him in his nose. He's got no hold on you. What does he think he is? Hey, listen. Let's do his thing right. Go back there and tell him right off. No, we can't. I'd like to anyway. I suppose it wouldn't do any good, only make trouble for you. Beats me, though, how any man can treat a gal as nice as you like that. You, uh, you are pretty, you know. 
Thanks. Hal. My name's Hal. All right. Hal. What's yours? Francis. Oh, Francis, huh? Nice name. Uh, you hear that? What? The motor. Betsy doesn't like this heat any more than we do. How far are you going, Francis? Los Angeles. Yeah, it's a nice town. Um, we could have a lot of fun there. We? Yeah. Hey, you and me. I, um, wasn't going that far. You but... might change your mind, huh? I don't know. Maybe. Los Angeles is a nice town, isn't it? Come on over. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there. That's better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Los Angeles is a great place. You know, I can get a couple of days off and... Uh-oh. What's that? Betsy means it this time. Hey, what was it? Uh, 17 miles a suara from that camp? Yeah, but... Yeah, we've come five. She wanted to go back. I gotta get to a phone. Oh, no. No, now, you look, can't. Francis, don't worry about him. I'll be ready for him. No, but I can't go back. I'll, I'll walk. Are no, you doing nothing of the kind? Look, baby. All you need is someone to take care of you. And from now on... I'm the guy. You can't. Why can't I? Let me out. Told you to let me out. I don't want you to handle it. Stop the car. Stop it. Get hold of yourself, baby. Don't you trust me? No. I mean, yes, but... What about Los Angeles? You aren't forgetting, It's not you, I said. It's not you. Just don't ask me any more words. Stop the car. That's all I want to know. Just sit tight and let me handle everything. We made it. Now, where's the phone? On the wall by the door. Yeah. Well, what you gonna do, sit there? Yeah, I'll wait. I'll be sure you do. What do you mean? Eh, nothing. I guess I got the jumps, too. And don't worry about him. If he comes out, just let out a yell, and I'll be here in a second. Smile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's better. <laughs> you know, baby, I kind of like you. Keep that chin up. Yes, Francis, keep your chin up. You could use a little courage now, couldn't you? There's a chance he won't look behind the counter, just a bare chance. But if he does, there you are in a stalled automobile 20 miles from nowhere and not a car in sight. But wait a minute. Around the curve, a car. Hurry, Francis, you've got to stop it. Wait! Wait! What is it? What's the matter? Take me to the next town. Hurry! Well, what's the matter? Uh, my uncle. It's my uncle. Something wrong? Yeah, yeah, he's hurt. Quick, I've got to get a doctor. Well, you're a mighty lucky young lady. I happen to be a doctor myself. Where is he? Oh, no! No, no, it's bad. It's, it's horrible. I don't want now, you to... Now, you just let me decide that. Uh, here, I got my case. You take me to him. He's in the lunchroom. I, I'd better wait here. Yes, yes, I understand. You just relax now, and I'll take a look. It might not be as bad as you think. Just wait there in my car. Don't stand there like that, Francis. Do something. The car, his car. That's right. Hurry up. Faster, 60, 70. Keep your eye on the center line, wavering like a snake between the wheels. Twelve miles now between you and the camp. Five miles to Saguaro. 75, 80. Almost lost it on that turn. The accelerator's down to the floor. Faster. Open your eyes, Francis. You can move. Open your eyes and crawl out of the car. You're okay. I, I'm okay. Better get off the road. Yeah. Take off cross country. 
to be watching. Watching the road. Cross country. down. Goodness sakes alive, a body can't hear himself think around here. Oh, oh, sorry, Matty. I don't know why in the world you keep that thing banging away night and day. Well, it's the dead blasted tubes. It gets louder and softer all of a sudden. A fella from Sarawa coming up to fix her. Oh, I ain't seen him. I should be here this afternoon. Think I'll go out and take a look around. Jake Watson, you stay right in that chair. You've been a mighty sick man. Hey, Matty. Matty, look. What? They're coming up the walk. Well, where could she come from? Hey, she's sick. She almost fell. Uh, well, Dad, blast it, do something. Well, you stay right there. What's the matter, honey? I, I don't know. Oh, there now. Just take hold of my arm. Thanks. Ma, you look all tuckered out. Come in. Thanks. Now, don't talk. We'll just get you out of this hot sun. Uh. Wouldn't surprise me none to find you was in my sunstruck. No hat and all. Land sakes, whatever you doing walking around out here? Now, hush yourself, Jay. Can't you see the poor thing can't hardly walk? Let alone listening to you jabber. Now, there, now, you sit down there, and I'll get you a nice cool drink of milk. <clears throat> you been walking far, miss? Yeah. Any particular reason? Yeah. I cracked up my car. Any more questions? No, no, I just thought it a mite peculiar you picked this time of day to go walking. I'm oh, sorry. Now, Jake, suppose you quit jabbering and let the poor girl rest a spell. She's about done in. Yeah, she's been in an accident. Car went off the road. Well, I declare. Ain't hurt none, are you? No, just tired. Well, here, you just lean back and take a good drink of milk. You'll feel better in a jiffy. <laughs> There go them tubes again. Oh, turn it off. Yeah. yeah. Attention, please. Be on the lookout for a young woman in blue slacks and a yellow jacket, probably driving a Buick sedan, license number 8X43H7. About five feet, four inches tall, blonde hair, name Francis Block. Wanted in connection with the murder of Peter Crawford this morning at Duncan Wells. Lancy. Repeat. Hey, hey, that's you. Get out of my way. Oh. Look out, Jake. She might have a gun. Hey, wait a minute, young lady. Let go of me. Hey, Maddie. Maddie. Four, she, she's gone. Oh, here. Here, let me help you up. Her? No. That's what we get for being good Christian. Hey, turn the radio off. Hmm. A murderess. I knew there was something slick about that girl. Well, that's all right. She won't get fur in this heat. Not in the desert. It's hot, unbearably hot, 110 in the shade. You can't keep going much longer, Francis. Feet swollen and blistered, bruises that ache with every step you take. Three in the afternoon. You've been walking two hours since you left the farmhouse. 120 blazing minutes. The head is full of sun, the flat horizon wavers, dust in your nose and throat. You've got to have water. Water from the clear, sparkling fountain in the square of Wilkins Corners, the little town ahead. You've got to take a chance. Maybe they haven't heard about you here in Wilkins Corners, Francis. Maybe they don't listen to their radios. Look at that sign down the street. Coffee, hamburgers. Take a chance. You may not get another one for a long time. Morning, miss. Uh... Like something to eat. Well, it's come to the right place. Hamburgers, hot dogs, barbecues, whole wheat, white, rye, apple, peach, boysenberry, cherry, lemon meringue, coffee, milk, and coke. Hamburger and white coffee. Hamburger. Hamburger. <sighs> Mustard, ketchup, or tomato sauce. Ketchup. Mm. Be right up. Pre-war service now. <laughs> We've reconverted. <laughs> yeah, hi, Billy. What you doing down at Swirl? Oh, I'm mighty busy today. Barbecue and whole wheat and coffee. Special. Special. What you mean, busy? Why, I don't mean to tell me you ain't heard about the killing. Huh? What killing? Well, sure. Found a man stabbed to death at Duncan Wells Tourist Camp. Yeah? Yeah, a guy who runs it named uh, Pete Crawford. No. Yeah, dead on a mackerel. Then the killer got away, they say. Sheriff's got posse out. Well, I'll be... Hey, Leif, did you hear that? What? A killing over to Duncan Wells this morning. Pete Crawford. Well, you don't say yeah. he gets a killer? Nope. You better watch out. 
Might be serving him a meal long by now. <laughs> hmm, stabbed, was he? Yeah, with a bread knife. Yeah. Doc Lawton was coming down from Cactus Garden. Now, he claims he talked with the killer. Well, why'd he nail him? Oh, you know Doc, but scared of his own shadow. That's too bad. Yeah, it is. They say old Pete Crawford didn't have an enemy in the world. I mean, it's too bad Doc didn't do something. Oh. You know, the best time to nab a murderer is right after he's done his job. It surprised me none to see this thing end up as... Well, there's another one of Sheriff Bradshaw's famous unsolved mysteries. Oh, well, I don't know. You know, murder's a funny thing. Ain't like going down to the feed store for a sack of barley. Takes planning, yeah. thinking. There's a thousand ways a killer can trip himself up. Oh, yeah. Just one false step along the way and it's all over. Yeah, well, maybe so. You know, I'd like to see that killer right now. <laughs> Probably pacing the floor somewhere, wondering if there was a slip-up. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in old Doc Lawton's shoes, yeah. being the only witness. <laughs> Bet you the old boy's looking six ways before he leaves his house. Here you are, George. One hamburger. Yeah. Oh, there you are, miss. Hamburger on white, and I'll go get your... Co- hey. Well, what's the matter? Now, where do you suppose she went? Forgot your hunger in a hurry, didn't you, Francis? A half minute more in that restaurant and it would have been all over. You're tired, worn out, but you can still think. A thousand ways you can trip up, make a false step, that's what he said. But you'll show them, won't you, Francis? First, get out of town and keep off the highways. Remember the sheriff's posse. The railroad, that's it. All the freight trains have to stop at that water tower a half mile out of town cross-country again. Through the brush under that blazing sun, keep away from the roads. And finally, the cool shade of the water tower with the drops splashing into a puddle there in the shade. You sit down and rest. Let your eyes close. Then... Someone's coming. Look, there's a piece of iron pipe in the corner. Remember where it is. Oh, beautiful. Hell. Thought you'd be here. You almost gave me the slip back there. What do you want? Gave you quite a run, didn't they? Hey, well, mind if I sit down? I got some talking to do. Mm. Yeah, it's better. Nice and cool here. You know, maybe I'm a sucker, but I still think you're pretty nice. Beautiful, but dumb. Do you think you could get away with it? I don't know. I'm so tired. I know you're tired, baby. Probably a little loony with a heat, too. No one in his right mind would have done what Shut you... Shut up! Did. You don't have to rub it in. Now, listen to me. I can help you, see. I'm the only one who can help you get out of this. And we got a chance to let you play ball, understand? Help me. You! <laughs> Ow! Sorry, baby. Maybe you'll listen to me. All right, Al. I'll listen to you. That's a way out of this. It's a short chance, but you'll have to take it. Wait a minute. Here comes a train. Get back there. It's afraid it'll have to stop. Here, let me take a look. The pipe. If I can... Now. No, I can't tell yet. Oh, wait a minute. Yep, yep, it's afraid of... So you were going to help me, were you? You didn't fool me. That's one mistake I didn't make. Yes, Francis, you were careful. You could see through his offer to help, couldn't you? Now, no slips, Francis, no false steps. The train is stopped for water. You hide, trembling behind the shack at the water tower. Then as the train starts up, you grab the rung of the ladder on a passing car, up the side. Now across the top and down the side before anyone sees you. But wait. There's a guard on top moving towards you. Down the tops of the cars. Don't look back. Watch where you're going. No false steps, Francis. No false steps now. <laughs> The 
The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a word about today's pre-war bargain in gasoline mileage that's helping more and more wise Western drivers stretch their ration gas stamps. I'm talking about the good pre-war mileage you still get in Signal Go Farther Gasoline. Yes, it's true. You still go as far as before the war with Signal. And I'll tell you why. You see, the gasoline ingredients which you've heard are reserved for war are the very volatile, highest octane components, such as isopentane. That's why Signal Oil Company frankly admits no gasoline today can give you all the pep and anti-knock performance you found in pre-war Signal gasoline, and which you'll enjoy again in even further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But when it comes to mileage, that's where Signal gasoline still shines. For today's signal formula still contains not only all the high energy components that gave pre-war signal gasoline its superior mileage, but also new high mileage hydrocarbons have been added. You can prove this for yourself by keeping track of your mileage. You'll find it's as true today as before the war. You do go farther with signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. No false steps, Francis. That's what the man said. And you are going to be so careful. But then how could you tell what kind of a false step it might be? And now it's all over. And everyone knows the answer to the killing of your stepfather. Well, it's all cleaned up now. Found the murderer dead right there between the railroad tracks. Oh, terrible thing. Terrible. Of course, without the doctor's testimony, they might never have known how it happened. The doctor? Sure, sure, according to the radio. doctor says he went into the lunchroom and found that fellow leaning over Pete Crawford with a knife in his hand. Boy, the doc practically witnessed the murder. Then the girl didn't do it. Oh, I knew she was innocent, the poor little thing. Yep, yeah, yeah, she was innocent, all right. They figured the murderer was going to try to shut her up, too. That's why she had to defend herself with that piece of light lead pipe there. <laughs> Doggone it, he was already wanted in New Orleans for killing ten days ago. Terrible thing, terrible. Only one thing I can't figure. What's that? Well, after she got the murderer like she did, what do you suppose she was running away from? Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Eleanor Beeson, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood Signal Dealer 
bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, let George do it. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Kathy was beautiful. There was no denying it. A redhead, one of the all-too-rare variety, with pale white skin and big luminous brown eyes. Delicate, fragile as a Dresden doll. Her beauty was always there for her to depend on when she got into a tight spot. That is, until she met an artist named Alan Blair and fell in love with him. Until then, men were nothing more to Kathy than a source of amusement, an endless parade of suckers, ready to jump when she crooked her finger. But Alan didn't jump. He didn't melt when she flashed her irresistible smile. He didn't come running to comfort her when she pouted. Maybe that's why she fell in love with him. And maybe that's why one day she told him about it. <laughs> what? What did you say? I love you, Alan. Oh, no, not that. <laughs> Alan! Alan, stop <laughs> well, it! after all, Kathy, did you think I'd fall for that? But it's the truth. You never loved anyone in your life, darling. Except yourself. You don't know what it feels like. Well, you're wrong, Alan. I mean... Uh, uh, uh. Sit over there. Please, Alan. No, that won't work either. There you are. Yeah. Okay, Miss Booby Trap. You can relax until the next sucker comes along. I'm checking out. You can't. You hear me? You can't just walk out Shut on up. me. Shut up. That's exactly what I'm doing. I won't shut up. You're going to be sorry about this, Alan Blair. You're going to come crawling to me on your knees. Now, listen, baby, don't tell me what I'm going to do. I could have just walked out, taken the easy way. But somebody had to tell you off, and I wouldn't let George do it. You better practice in front of the mirror, sweetheart. Your act's getting rusty. So long. You're not going to get away with it. I'll... I'll kill you, that's what I'll do. I'll... No. Let George do it, you said. Huh? Let George do it. Hello? Hello, George. George, this is Kathy. You can work fast when you want to, Kathy. Three weeks later, the people of Evansburg are stunned when you announced your marriage to George. Dull, drab, uninteresting George Morrison, 15 years older than you. The staid, respected member of the city's board of supervisors. George is stunned, too. Kathy, I... I can hardly believe it. It's, it's thrilling, isn't it, George? Well, it was so sudden, I... I hardly knew what to think. I, I'd always loved you, Kathy, but... I never dreamed that this could happen. Love is an unexpected thing sometimes. You, you do love me, don't you? Oh, of course I do, George. You're all I'd ever hoped for. Everything I'd ever dreamed about. Gosh, Kathy. I'll bet this will be a surprise to the folks in Evansburg. Wait till we get back from our honeymoon. Well, I get a kick out of telling them. <laughs> You're too late, Mr. Morrison. Huh? What do you mean? I wired the papers yesterday. <laughs> Yes, Kathy, you're interested in getting the news around, aren't you? But why? You know you still love Alan. Yes, and hate him at the same time. And he won't care a rap whether you marry George Morrison. You can't hurt him this way. Or can you? At least the marriage is giving the people of Evansburg plenty to talk about. Down at the Elite Beauty Salon on 6th Street, for example. Yeah, I hear they got back from the honeymoon last week. Really, Charlotte? Has she been in yet? She has an appointment this afternoon. Hey, don't wiggle so much. I might burn you. Ouch. See? Say, Louise, why don't you try a cold wave next time, huh? Oh, never mind that. Tell me more about Kathy. 
I don't know anymore. She was playing the field, and all of a sudden, she takes off with old George Morrison. You suppose she really loves him? <laughs> I don't know how any woman in her right mind could tie up with that clam. Why, he ought to be in a museum with the rest of the specimens. Well, there must be some reason. Yeah? Well, you tell me, then. George, dear. Yes, Kathy? George, you remember what we talked about on our honeymoon? Uh, no. What? My portrait. Oh, oh, yes, yes, the painting. Well, you haven't mentioned it, George. Frankly, my dear, I'd forgotten it. I I've been so busy yes, and... Yes, I know, you've been so busy. Well, what about it? Well, go ahead, dear. Go right ahead. Find yourself an artist. I've found one, George. Uh, yes? How long will it take? Oh, about a month, he says. Mm, he must work rather fast. Uh, that's not very long. Yes, I know, but I think it will be long enough. On these hot summer days, you Whistler fans know how much peppier and full of life you feel right after a shower when you're fresh and clean. Well, that goes for your car's motor, too. Yes, a clean motor is naturally a more efficient motor. That's why it's so important these days to use the modern, solvent, refined motor oil that helps keep your motor clean. Signal four-star motor oil. You see, because of solvent refining, which is the latest, most costly process known to oil engineers... Signal four-star motor oil actually forms less carbon. And what little there is is soft, like soot, tending to blow out with exhaust gases. Thus, by keeping your motor cleaner, Signal four-star motor oil actually helps three ways. One, keeps your motor running peppier, smoother, quieter. Two, cuts down on the repair bills often caused by hard, abrasive carbon. And three, helps stretch ration gas. That's why, if it's been a thousand miles or two months since you last changed oil, you'll be doing your motor a real favor by driving into one of the friendly dealers displaying signals, yellow and black circle sign, and saying, drain and fill her up with signal four-star motor oil. And now, back to the whistler. Kathy didn't marry George Morrison for money or social position. And the unofficial investigating committees at the elite beauty salon and in the city hall corridors are puzzled, groping for a reason. On the afternoon after her discussion with George about the picture, she makes a call at the Garden Court apartment, 328 at the end of the corridor on the third floor. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Alan. Well, that takes care of the greetings. Are you going to ask me yet? I don't know. Was this trip really necessary? Please, Alan. All right. Come in. Thank you. Oh, you have a nice apartment. These are your murals, aren't they? Mm-hmm. They How are. How long have you been here? A month. Sit down. Thanks. I heard you'd moved into town while we were on our honeymoon. <laughs> Things get around in Evansburg, don't they? Uh, cigarette? Oh, thanks. <sighs> hmm. Good to see you again. Comfy? Yes. Okay. Okay what? Spill it. What do you want? Don't be like that, Alan. I'm not fond of quiz programs, sweetheart. Suppose you come to the point, hmm? You're making it very difficult. And you're not here to play games. I told you once it was all over. Finished. Something I don't even want to be reminded of. Maybe I didn't make myself clear enough. Well, Alan, I, I didn't understand then. I do now. I want us to be friends. Why? Well, I, uh, I... <laughs> I've got you there, haven't I? You're a very pretty girl, Kathy. You look swell on magazine covers. But I don't want you in my apartment. Now, suppose you run along. 
I'll see you in a few years. You don't understand, Alan. George, that's... I know, your husband. Well, he wants me to have a portrait done. Oh. Oh, oh, this is strictly a business deal. No other artists in town, of course. Oh, it isn't that, Alan. He's seen your work and he won't hear of anyone else. I told him you'd be difficult. Oh, you missed it. Impossible was the word. You won't believe me, will you? You still think there's a catch in it somewhere. Right. Well, there isn't. I'm trying to do something for you for once. What can you do for me? Well, I thought if you did a good job on my portrait, George would give you a chance at the commission for the murals in the new city hall annex. Oh, 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 no, no, no. Wait a minute. What's he got to do with that? He's a supervisor, and they're going to select the artist in August. Kathy, now look at me. Now, I want this straight. Is that why you came here? Yes. If I didn't know you'd sell out your brother for two bits... Please, Alan, I mean it this time. All right. I'll do your portrait. You could hardly keep from laughing out loud, Kathy. It was quite a triumph. You're thinking now how important that portrait's going to be to you, how necessary it will be for Alan to finish it on time. You tell him George must have it in a hurry, how you and he will have to work late at night. And you can imagine what a conversation piece that's giving them down at the Elite Beauty Salon. And she was there till almost midnight? That's what Jessie said. She lives on the same floor, you know. His studio's in the penthouse on the roof. And she heard him up there till ten minutes to twelve. Mm-mm. I wonder what old man Morrison thinks of that. Well, Henry sees him every day down at the city hall. Seems happy as a lark. Well, maybe he doesn't know. Of course, we could be wrong. They haven't been seen out together. <laughs> yes. No, not yet. But you're working on that, aren't you, Kathy? While Alan works, you're making careful notes the way his apartment is laid out with his living quarters on the third floor and the studio upstairs in the penthouse on the roof. Hold still, Kathy. The light's bad enough without you changing position every minute. I'm sorry, Alan. Oh, excuse me. Yes? Okay. Well, what else? Oh, yeah, that'll be fine. About eight. Nine fifteen. Uh, what? Every night the phone rings at exactly nine fifteen. Oh, that's Manuel. I, I set my watch by him. Who's he? The houseboy downstairs. Calls every night to catch my order for breakfast. Oh. Well, no. Helen, I'm all, I'm awfully tired. Couldn't we go downstairs for a drink? Mm, I don't know. It might not look so hot. Oh, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Ten minutes. <laughs> That's better. Is there a mailbox around anywhere? Yeah, there's a chute by the elevator. Oh, good. I'll drop this off on the way down. <laughs> Almost forgot it. An important letter, wasn't it, Kathy? And after you mail it, you and Alan go into the bar downstairs. There's a faint smile of satisfaction on your face as you note a raised eyebrow here and there. A pair of heads coming together in the corner. Ten minutes should be long enough. The next evening at home, George seems to be worried about something. George. Yes? Is something bothering you? Uh, why? You seem strange tonight. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Kathy. I, I guess I've been working too hard. That's all that's worrying you? Well, I... What is uh... it, George? Oh, it's so stupid I shouldn't even tell you. You haven't lived in Evansburg as long as I have, Kathy. You don't know how mean and vicious this town can be. What are you talking about? It's, uh... Well, it's about Alan Blair. What do you mean? Kathy... Did you ever know him before you came to Evansburg? Oh, yes, slightly. Mm-hmm. I meant to tell you, darling. You see, um, he's painting here under the name of Stanley Simmons. Mm-hmm. And uh, when Charlotte told me about him, I didn't realize that he was... I see. What's the matter? I received an anonymous letter at the office today. And... Here. Oh. Mr. Morrison... Because I respect and admire you, I feel it is my duty to tell you that your wife is... Signed, friend. I wonder who... I'm sure, I don't know. Why, of all the... the horrible contempt... I just wanted you to see it. 
You're accusing me. No, I'm not. I... You uh... have no right. There was nothing. I didn't accuse you, Kathy. You believe them, don't you? You swallowed their dirty little tails, hook, line, and sinker. Kathy, I only wanted you to... You don't have to tell me. You're part of this, aren't you? I'm trying to tell you I didn't. Give me that letter. There. That's where it belongs, in the (laughs) wastebasket. Oh, George. Why did you have to show me that? Oh, Kathy, please. (laughs) Believe me, honey, I wouldn't have shown it to you had I... had I thought that it would... Kathy. Oh, please. Leave me alone. Just for a while. Okay. I'm sorry, honey. Please go. Okay, dear. I'll be in the den if you want me. Now. There. Good. He didn't tear it. Kathy. Hello, Charlotte. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, that's all right, dearie. Kind of slow this afternoon anyway. Here, let me help you with your thing. Oh, thanks. I don't know what I'd do without you, Charlotte. <laughs> I'll hang the jacket up. Well, I suppose you want a shampoo and a facial. Mm-hmm. You always make me feel better, Charlotte. Oh, good. Say, what's the matter, dearie? Oh, it's nothing. Well, it doesn't look that way to me. Here, lean back. Take it easy. Oh, Charlotte, i just got to tell someone, huh? Tell what? Now, you mustn't breathe this to a soul. I don't know what I'd do if I got around. Well, you know you can trust me, dearie. Well, it's it's George. Uh-uh. We had a horrible scene last night about Alan Blair. Oh. I thought he was going to hurt me. It's all been so ridiculous. Mr. Blair's been so careful to be businesslike. Why, and... sure. But I didn't know your husband had such a temper. Well, I couldn't explain to him. He just went up in a rage. I'm... Oh, I'm so afraid. And it was all so innocent. Alan's been working nights because George wants the picture done by next week. And the other night, Alan and I got awfully tired and decided to go down to bed. Devoted, gullible George. He was just the man for your plans, wasn't he, Kathy? And he's coming through nobly, just as you'd suspected. Kathy... I have half a mind to go down and see this fellow Blair. Why? Well, it's time we clear this thing up before it goes too far. It's getting around City Hall, and I... Well, I'm not going to sit here and do nothing. There must be some way to stop it. Kathy, let's forget that darn portrait. I won't. I like it, and he's going to finish it. He has nothing to do with it anyway. Charlotte started it. Charlotte? The beauty operator. Why? I don't know. She has it in for me for some strange reason. Then why do you continue to go there? Well, I didn't know about it until yesterday. Mm -hmm. I started to say something to her, and then I realized it would only make things worse. I see. Well, you'd better go back tomorrow. Why? Well, you can tell her that if she isn't careful, she'll have a slander suit on her hands. George, I'm not going to see that woman again. Very well. I'll go. You're in the clear, Kathy. You've been very careful not to depend on outright lies. Half-truths are more effective and safer. Charlotte will irritate him. He'll accuse her. There'll be an ugly scene, and then... Now, wait a minute, Mr. Morrison. You can't talk I like can't, that to me. I can't, eh? Well, now, you just listen to me. This ugly talk about my wife and Mr. Blair is going to stop. Understand? I had nothing to do with it. You don't tell me you had nothing to do with it. You jealous old fool. Jealous? Yes, jealous. All right, listen. One more peep from you and your gang of gossip mongers about Alan Belair, and I'll have a lot of you in court. Well done, Kathy. It's there now. He's shown his hand in public. And nothing he does from now on can change it. Murder comes in two parts, you see. Motive and opportunity. The motive is complete, solid. You've cemented every brick in place with those clever, delicate hands of yours. Now, the opportunity. Hello, dear. George! Oh, George, I'm glad you're home. What's the matter? Oh, I 
I've been terrified all evening. What? There's been a man out there. He was looking in the window. Did you call the police? Well, the phone's dead. I couldn't. Well, this is serious. I'm going to call the police. No, don't leave me here. Well, you can come along. But George, the police can't be here all the time while you're away at all those meetings. Well, we'll see about that. Oh, George, I... I'd feel a lot better if there was a gun in the house. A gun? Yes. At least I'd have something to rely on. I don't know. You're asking for trouble with a gun in the house. You give the other guy a good reason for shooting first. So you don't care? You'd just as soon I were alone here at night with a prowler in the house. Oh, it's not that, Kathy. I, I just don't... I do. If I meant anything to you, you wouldn't even discuss all it. All right. All right, Kathy. I'll buy a gun tomorrow. Now let's go and see the police. But, of course, the police find nothing, Kathy. When you cut the telephone wire, you were careful to keep on the cement walk, and there were no footprints. And Evansburg took note of the fact that on the afternoon of July 23rd, George Morrison walked into Tyndall's sports shop and bought a 38 automatic. As simple as that. Motive and opportunity. You've built a beautiful frame, Kathy. Now all you have to do is put George's picture in it. Here you are, my dear. Thank you, George. I do feel miserable. It's so hot. Well, this ought to cool you off. Here. That's good. Oh, darling, it's quarter of nine. You better run along. Kathy, must I pick up that picture tonight? I told Mr. Blair you'd be over around nine. You'll be thrilled with it, George. Well, I don't relish leaving you alone like this, especially oh, after don't all... don't even think about it. That prowler's had the scare of his life of the police after him. Mm. Uh, you wouldn't like to come along? No, I'd be so miserable with this headache. I'll be an angel and run along. I can't wait to see it over the fireplace. Uh, very well. You stay where you are, and I'll be back before you even know it. <laughs> gone. You act quickly, Kathy. The other car parked around the corner. He was being greased, you told him. Quickly. You know the garden court apartments like a book, the trade entrance at the rear, deserted at nine o'clock. The back stairway to the roof and Alan's studio in the penthouse. The east window is always open. You noted that, too. You crouch behind the chair next to the window. Twelve minutes past nine. George's new gun gloves, no fingerprints. Pitch black outside. You're lucky. No one will see you leave. And there's George arriving right on the dot. You knew he would. Now, just one more piece of luck and you're in. Just one more. The telephone has to ring at 9.15 with Manuel's breakfast routine. And Alan has to come up to the penthouse to answer it. The seconds seem like hours. You can hardly breathe, Kathy. Waiting, waiting... He can't fail this time. Be right with you, Mr. Morrison. That's my houseboy. Oh. Yes? Uh-huh. About nine? Sure. Right. All right, Alan. Kathy. Surprised? Put, put away that gun. No, Alan. Not now. Not after all my careful plans. <laughs> but, Kathy, I don't understand. What have I ever done? Kathy. Don't. It's done. No. Careful, Kathy. Don't be too obvious. Hide the gun under the chair cushion where they'll have to hunt to find me. Mr. Blair! Oh, oh. Yes, here comes George. Out the window now and down the back Mr. stairs. Mr. Blair! That's Mr. Blair! It. It's done, Kathy. It's perfect. <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a question for you drivers. Are you getting as many miles per gallon from the gasoline you're now using as you did before the war? Well, the answer is yes if you're using signal go-farther gasoline. 
For it's true, you still go as far as before the war with signal. And I'll tell you why. You see, in every gallon of gasoline, there are some ingredients which give pep and anti-knock, and other ingredients which give mileage. Well, those anti-knock ingredients are the ones reserved for war. That's why Signal Oil Company frankly admits no gasoline today can give you all the pep and anti-knock you found in pre-war gasoline, and which you'll be enjoying again in even further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But those mileage ingredients, which made pre-war Signal famous as the go-farther gasoline, they're still in today's Signal formula. And in addition, new mileage-giving hydrocarbons have been added. That's why, if you're interested in stretching your gas stamps, and who isn't, you'll find it's as true today as before the war. You do go farther with Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. Ten minutes after leaving Alan's studio, Kathy is home again, safe in bed with her headache. There wasn't a hitch. No one saw her leave. The car is back in its place around the corner. Even the gloves are disposed of in the kitchen incinerator. George is late, naturally, unavoidably detained. And of course, Kathy isn't surprised when a police car drives up about ten o'clock and she admits Captain Murchison of the Homicide Squad. I... Don't quite know what to say, Mrs. Morrison. What is it, Captain? It's... Oh, it's my husband, isn't it? He visited Alan Blair's apartment tonight. I sent him over for the portrait. What happened? Mr. Blair was murdered. Murdered? Oh, no, he wouldn't... George was jealous, but he wouldn't... He didn't. What? He asked one of the patrols to drop over here while he was gone to sort of keep an eye on you after that prowler business. Boys were kind of worried when they found you'd gone, Mrs. Morrison. But uh, when did they come here? Around 9.15. They figured they'd better tell your husband, so they phoned him at Blair's apartment. They were kind of surprised at what they heard. Why didn't you broadcast it? What do you mean? Mrs. Morrison, Blair didn't hang up that phone. He just thought he did. Otherwise, I can't see why. Can't see why you gave the officer a play-by-play report when you shot Blair. Well? You ready to go? Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Ann Lockwood, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.